A rider on horseback swings his sword, severing the arm of a blue-haired boy. This is the recurring nightmare of our protagonist, Chris, as he's forced awake by his comrade. Lewis was concerned on the movements that Chris was making in his sleep, and wondered what kind of nightmare the boy was having. This seems to be a dream that Chris has often, because this was the day he lost his arm. The two men are on guard duty and are in the middle of transporting goods. Another man begins to mock Chris, saying how if his arm just fell off his body, and laughing at him. But Chris tells the man to mind his business, and the two bicker back and forth. This transportation job seems easy, Chris thought, because no one in their right mind would mess with this armed caravan. The group arrives at their desired location and begins to unload the cargo. Chris notices another member of their group that was supposed to be acting as a forward scout conversing with another group of mercenaries. It seems the group was set up from the man who was making fun of Chris. The world of mercenaries sure is a cruel one. Lewis steps up, asking the opposing group to stand down, and if they do, he will compensate them. The group recognizes Lewis from his nickname, Rapid Shot. Seems like he's made quite a name for himself, but instead of receiving praise, the the group just begins to laugh. Rapid Shot was the name Lewis received because he could only last 3 minutes. That's a low blow, they gotta leave my man alone. Chris urges Lewis not to lose his cool and tells him that he has his back, but the two understand that they should not resort to violence. They ask the group of bandits what they want so they can resolve this peacefully. The biggest and baddest of the bunch steps up saying that they know damn sure what he wants. Now Chris is certain that the man who hired him is hiding something. He sees the futility in fighting the group and advises the merchants to let up whatever they're hiding, but the situation is escalating and the bandit's bloodthirst can be sensed by Chris. He tells the merchants to run away, but with a sneak attack he launches his dagger towards the talkative man from before, giving the merchants enough time to flee. The dagger is blocked and now Lewis is surrounded, but he's holding his own. Chris tells Lewis that they're gonna split up and the mercenary leader is now infuriated and orders his troops to capture them all. Chris runs into the forest with the bandit leader and some henchmen on his tail. Although Chris is crippled, he's a jack of all trades, and instead of wallowing in his disability, he's gained in a plethora of different skills. We see all the different jobs that Chris had growing up with only one arm. Surviving like this has made him work twice as hard, but now the henchmen are gaining on him. He pulls out a wire trap and debates where to put it, and with a quick motion, he launches it into a tree next to him, creating a thin line that decapitates the first henchman who runs through it. One down, he thinks. But the bandits are now furious and continue the chase. Some time has passed and we see all the creative ways that Chris dispatched of the mercenaries, but now he's out of tricks. The last mercenary coughs up blood dying from a poison trap that Chris laid out for him. His back is turned to a riverbank and now he has nowhere to go. Chris thinks he dealt with all of his pursuers, but the bandit leader approaches him saying that not all of them are dead and walks right through his poison trap unaffected. Chris is puzzled on how he survived and wonders what on earth this monster is doing attacking an ordinary merchant. Chris is breathing heavily and falls to the ground, and the heads of his comrades are tossed to his side. The fear begins to set in. The mercenary leader said they put up a decent enough fight, but they still were no match, and asks Chris if he knows what he has around his neck. Chris struggles to believe that Lewis was defeated so easily, but quickly understands that he needs to flee. The leader informs him that his necklace is an artifact, and artifacts are treasures of great power that can turn any piece of equipment into a deadly weapon, and the value of these pieces could fund a family for three generations. Chris begs for the leader to spare him, and the leader says since he's in a good mood, he might just let him off the hook, and even thanks Chris for dispatching of his henchmen. Chris is not convinced, however, and the bandit leader soon reaches down towards him. Chris has one final trick and spits glass shards into the eyes of the mercenary leader, blinding him momentarily. Chris is not afraid to use any underhanded tactic and apologizes to the leader saying how he's not gonna die like this, but before he can make his next move, the leader lets out a wide arcing slash, severing the remaining arm of Chris. Now our boy's a chicken nugget man, it's not good. Chris falls onto the leader's chest and is grabbed by the hair. The leader throws him towards the end of the cliff, and knowing that his end is near, Chris can only stare at his now lifeless arm. The mercenary leader's laugh is interrupted as something is wrong. Where is his artifact? Chris didn't lose his arm for nothing and laughs at the leader with a necklace in his mouth. What a savage move. The bandit leader does that pat down you know you do when you don't feel your phone in your pocket the first time, and the realization immediately sets in. The artifact is in Chris's possession. It can't be, the leader says, as Chris swallows the artifact and jumps into the river below. Chris can't put up his middle finger anymore, so this is almost like his last F you to that guy. Man, that's pretty sick. The leader jumps off after him and Chris can see the desperation in his eyes as the two plunge into the river. Chris lifelessly sinks and accepts 
accepts his fate and smiles, thinking how the leader will never be able to get his artifact from Chris's stomach. And thus, the life of Chris has come to an end after 39 years. 39 years? Chris looks good for 40, man. But before he can fully fade into darkness, a strange voice talks in his head and starts listing all the powers and talents that Chris has. And right before the leader can get a hold of Chris, a huge explosion occurs. Chris opens his eyes confused on what just happened, but is pleasantly shocked to see that his arms are back. He now thinks that this is the nightmare that he's always had since he was 15, but something feels different now, as a soldier calls out to Chris, warning him of an impending attack. This is the first time that he can actually recognize the knight that took his arm. Every time he had that dream, he was unable to dodge the strike, but something feels off. He feels pain in his right arm, almost like he knows what it feels like to have it severed. Chris closes his eyes and drops down and accidentally dodges the strike. I dodged it? What? Chris questions. Is this really a dream? A system screen shows Chris that he's gained some experience, which further confuses him, but he hears the call for retreat. We now see Chris back at the tent, pinching the cheeks of his old childhood friend, Lind. Chris remembers his old friend and is excited that it's really him, but in his mind, he knows that this can't possibly be Lind. The Lind he knew died long ago. If this really isn't a dream, he needs to do something fast. He opens his pant leg and checks the cut. In his past life, Lind lost his leg due to an untreated wound. But this time, Chris won't let his friend become crippled. Chris treats Lind's wound and vows not to let any of the past events occur again. Chris finishes treating Lind and thinks how lucky he was to find some white grass near the camp. This herb alone will not be enough to completely heal the boy, so he's gonna need to find some other herbs to enhance Lin's regeneration. These are all things that Chris learned in his past life from his former teacher as he finishes wrapping Lin's leg. Lin admires Chris's careful work, and Chris reflects on his past life where Lin even sacrificed himself to save him. Chris thinks he owes him more than just fixing his leg, and just then, the commander walks into the tent. The boys silently await their orders. The man informs them that they are a new reserve unit of the 7th Infantry, and they're training will begin, but they will not be listed as official soldiers. The soldier looks to the biggest kid in the room and makes him the leader. Another freckled boy comments on how they won't be official soldiers, sitting next to a bearded man that's sharpening his axe. There's a lot of personalities in this tent. Chris is analyzing the situation and notes how the group is just full of rookies, and how he understands it is the commander basically told them to act as cannon father. In the coming days, Chris will have a lot to do. He notices Lin sleeping and wants him to rest with the injured leg. We find out the army is stationed in the Zaytor forest and Chris and the boys are following the hunting party. An older red-haired man asks his commander why these newbies are following them. The commander tells him that Chris brought along some cigarettes in exchange for tagging along. The red-haired man wonders how Chris managed to make some high-quality cigarettes, noting the boy must be talented. Some rumors are beginning to spread about Chris's resourcefulness, and the commander offers the red-haired man the cigarette, but he declines. The hunting party stops, and they're given orders to catch five rabbits each, and are warned not to venture too deep into the forest. Chris thinks that this is a piece of cake, and will use some extra time to search for the herbs that he needs. Chris finds many useful herbs and has a satisfied look, but gets a prompt saying that he's gained some XP. He still thinks he's seeing things and slaps himself in the face. Why is this artifact so loud, he says angrily. Just what is this thing, he wonders. It keeps screaming in the back of his head. Chris always knew that artifacts were not that simple, but to be this complicated is beyond him, and he wonders why the bandit leader was ready to die for this necklace. He still needs to find more information about this, but before he can finish his thought, he hears the sound of a bee flying past him. The bee is trapped in a web, and today is Chris's lucky day. Chris finds a honey ant, which is a quite useful creature. He collects the ant and frees the bee from his trap. Chris baits the bee back to his nest, and once he reaches it, he collects the sweet honey from the nest. The scene shifts to the other boys in his group who are unable to catch a single rabbit. You see, Chris is the only hunter among them. The sun is setting, and the commander barks at the two boys lounging around. Since they have time to sit and chat, they must have already completed their task, the commander assumes. The boys are fumbling their words, but Chris returns just in the neck of time and drops off the horde of rabbits. The red-haired man from before wonders if Chris managed to hunt all of those rabbits by himself and is impressed with his skills, but nevertheless his struggle was in vain, since there isn't enough for all his comrades. Chris wonders on how that could be possible, since the commander said he needed five per person, and he's quite annoyed since he put so much effort into this, and he wants to see the red-haired man try to do it as well. The freckled boy is worried, and we come to find the name of the leader of Chris's squad is named Digo, and the axe-wielding 
named Bearded Man is named Toki. Chris made sure to collect their share, but maybe he miscalculated. But he thinks to grab one of his rare herbs to use instead. Maybe this can help, and at the same time, he might even receive some praise for it too. If he offers it to his superiors, surely they won't refuse. The commander signals the end of the hunt, and it's time to return to camp. The punishment from failing the task is a scolding, and according to the military rules, they'll be managed from here on out. Chris quietly gets the attention of the red-haired man, and has an offer that he would want to hear. The man instantly refuses, but Chris urges him to at least hear him out. The scene shifts to nighttime, and we see Chris with the freckled boy waiting. He laid another trap in an attempt to catch a deer, and we find out that the herb that Chris wanted to trade is called Red Pull, and Red Pull is a favorite snack of a red horned deer, and surely it's going to take the bait. The freckled boy is concerned, but Chris reassures him and tells him to hold his breath and focus. Deers are very sensitive and will notice the slightest movement. The freckled boy wonders if they can really catch it, but if they can, they're finally gonna have a proper meal. Chris, however, is focused on his goal and the deer approaches. Chris puts his hand over the boy's mouth because soon they're gonna have their fill. As the red deer spots the snack, it approaches but immediately notices the boy's presence and tries to flee. Chris grabs a rock and hits it on the head and gets a prompt saying that his throwing skill has leveled up. It wasn't enough, however, because Chris is not used to throwing with his right arm, so there isn't enough power. He understands the situation and calls Doki to surround the deer. They appear to be cutting off all the exits as Chris appears and forces the deer to run in a certain direction, saying how now it's up to the soldiers. The red-haired man is hiding behind a tree and the scene flashes back to when Chris is originally voicing his plan. The plan is to trap the deer by guiding it to follow a predetermined path. Chris says that the red-haired man must play a part in this hunt as well, and if he can trust them, they're gonna catch the deer for sure. The beast falls into a trap and runs into the two soldiers who are holding a rope that they had prepared earlier. It catches it by the neck, but the beast was stronger than they anticipated. It yanks the two men with it as it desperately tries to run, but before it can get the chance, Chris appears with a large rock in hand and bonks the deer on the head. Chris killed the deer and gained some experience, and later, we see the group sitting around the fire excited for their meal. We see the meat being cooked as all the men around are drooling over the savory smells. One of the kids asks what the deer is so famous for, and is told that for common soldiers it's just another meat, but for nobles it acts as a strong aphrodisiac. The kids are hoping they'll be rewarded for this, and Chris turns to the red-haired man saying how he's pretty good, and the hunt wouldn't have worked without him. Chris smiles, but the man tells him to eat, but Chris is busy refining some flower petals, and shows the man that they can make a powder from it. The powder is a great seasoning, and he sprinkles some on everybody's steak, and all of their minds are blown from the flavor. It might not be royal cuisine, but it'll do. Everyone is happily eating, and the red-haired soldier wants to confirm Chris's name. He's happy with his efforts, and relieves him from night watch and hunting duty. Chris smiles and thanks him and back at the barracks, Lind is relieved from finally being able to get a good night's sleep. The boys enter the tent and Chris hands Lind some food and tells him that he's been asleep because of the medicine that he was giving him. Chris checks his wound and thinks that in a past life, the cut was not the issue, but rather the infection that came from it. This time though, there's nothing to worry about, and Chris asks him if the food tastes alright. A loud shout can be heard outside the tent, scaring Chris. Catch them and leave none alive, they hear. Outside the tent, and Chris is wondering what on earth is going on. The commotion was caused over a spilled pot of soup, and the anchored superior orders someone to catch those dogs that are making a mess of the camp. Arrows are shot, and groups of soldiers are beginning to argue. Linda inquires on the situation, and Chris tells him that it's just some stray dogs. But what's wrong with their faces, though? The dogs are constantly annoying the soldiers, and they look like they're having fun doing it. Chris says that he can catch the dogs, and the red-haired man asks if he's really up to the task. If they do nothing about it, the morale of the troops will be affected. The man wishes them luck and leaves the boys. Lind inquires on who that guy was, and Chris says that he's just one of the soldiers who joined them for the hunt. Lind asks how Chris plans to catch the dogs, but just like always, our boys is going to set up some traps. Lind argues that even soldiers traps didn't work, but obviously he doesn't know how good Chris's traps are. The conversation continues and Lin asks why they are on dog catching duty, but Chris tells him that this will be a good opportunity to get some food, but thinks to himself that it's a good excuse to to join the next hunt, and he needs more herbs. Deco calls out to Chris with some herbs that he requested him to find. Lind picks one up and asks, isn't this just normal Darnell? Chris thanks Deco for his work and informs the two that this leaf acts as a strong drug for the dogs and is crucial in capturing them. He sees Chris set up a sticky trap and comments on its completion. This is what they need, they'll check on the traps tomorrow. And during the next day, they come out and we see multiple sleeping dogs with a sticky-like substance around their mouths. Chris tells the red-haired man that they had plenty of sleeping drought, 
The reason the honey ant was so important was its skills to weave webs with different effects based on what it ate. The man compliments Chris's talent and warns him for more packs of dogs. Chris uses this opportunity to join the man's scouting party and if they will allow it they will catch all of the remaining dogs. The man looks at him and says that he's just a regular soldier, he doesn't have this kind of power, but Chris doesn't buy it. Chris remembers from his previous life that this scarlet red hair, well built physique and undisguised fortitude, this man is Duke Van Ludwig's illegitimate son, Guillen Ludwig. Chris has been gaining his favor because of this fact. Guillen tells him that as a reward for the deer he will let him come but only if he takes care of the remaining dogs. Some time passes and Digo warns Chris that they're venturing too deep inside the forest and they almost reach the border. Chris takes the lead and says to deal with these dogs quickly so they can return. Chris stops and lets go of the string that he had in his hand. Did you hear that? Digo asks. They found the pack but see a scout from the eight gates with a flute in his mouth. This flute has been antagonizing the dogs causing all of this commotion. Back at the camp, Chris asks Digo if he ever killed somebody and he responds saying that he did once on the battlefield that Chris was supposed to lose his arm. Chris tells Digo and Doki to get ready. They continue to watch the scout and Doki hides in ambush. Chris tells Digo it's time to go and Digo begins to fight. Jumping at the scout with halberd in hand with a wide strike, he cleaves the tree in two. The scout barely manages to dodge and falls back and readies his weapon. But now Chris joins Digo and since it's a two on one, the scout tries to flee. The two boys give chase but Chris notices that the scout is reaching for his dart blower and orders Digo to take cover. The darts hit a tree but the scout uses this opportunity to get away. He jumps over a tree branch and turns to see if his pursuers are gone. The scout just needed a little bit more time and he would have completed his goal. Now he's scared to return empty handed. All of a sudden an axe is hurled towards the scout that he barely manages to jump over. The scout is surprised that another soldier is on his tail but before he can adjust he falls into another one of Chris's traps and hits his head on the ground. Doki stands on top of him and mercilessly kills the scout which makes Digo sweat with anxiety. The two boys asked Chris how he knew that the scout was going to go this way. Chris informed them that this was the quickest route back to the eight gates camp. So now their job is finished. There's still some dollars remaining and Digo asks if it's okay to let them get away. But since they dealt with the man controlling them, they should be all right. In the middle of a bunch of dog corpses, Chris sees a white wolf with many scars. These creatures usually live in the Seoul mountains. So how is one here right now? Chris wonders if the scout gathered these dogs to try to catch the wolf. But as soon as he thinks this, the wolf succumbs to his injuries and falls. Chris says that the scout actually had a pretty good plan, but now he is going to reap the rewards. As Chris approaches the wolf, he notices that a single wolf cub survived. Vigo notes that it doesn't really resemble the wolf, and I mean, look at this thing. Is this not just Appa from Avatar? These writers ain't slick. Chris wonders if this could be a half-breed. Back at the camp, the soldiers are enjoying a hearty meal. The freckled boy is watching carefully as the soldiers are eating juicy meat and he goes back into the tent lamenting on how hungry he is. Lin reflects on the new post Chris has been assigned and wonders what on earth he did to get put up to such a dangerous job. Lin reflects on the days before the army where Chris convinced her to join him with him. If they can become chieftain, all of their troubles will go away, a young Chris says. Lin argues that if Chris can become chieftain then surely he'll become the prime minister. As the two kids joke around, Lin didn't know that Chris was serious from back then as his friend won't stop until he reaches the top. The freckled boys had enough and even though Chris has caught the dogs, none of the boys from the unit are even allowed to smell the meat. They could have at least gifted them some bread and the freckled boy wants to go out and steal some food instead. Lin reminds him that if he's caught, the entire unit will be at risk. But before he can go through with his plan, Chris comes into the room with a rack of meat and tells the boys to start a fire. The boys are all around the fire happily eating their meal but Lin asks Chris why he isn't eating as well. He responds saying how he already ate but Lin tells him that there's another man looking in their direction. We get a close up and the man has chapped lips and malnourished features and he's intently staring at the food. He looks hungry and the group wonders if they should offer him some food. But everyone else realizes that if it wasn't for Chris, they would also be in the same boat. The starved man sits down and apologizes for his stench since he was assigned to clean the pig pen. Poor guy. The group relates how the higher ups don't even give them bread, much less any meat. Lin says if you can become a commander, you might even be able to taste some good pork. But lowly soldiers like them don't get so lucky. The man says he needs to find some food and drinks for a few of his friends back at the barracks. Chris asks how many and the man surprises him with 20 people. Hey man, that's a, that's a little reach and bring a couple of your boys man, you brought 20? Chris knows that 20 is a large number for just a few guys. Chris was going to save the meat but he realizes that it might just be better to help all the hungry soldiers during hard times. What's done is done and now all the starving soldiers are ecstatic they can finally get a good meal. I mean, I guess he gets bonus points with God or whatever they believe in in the story. The scene shifts to the next morning and we see the baby wolf 
wolf drinking from its bowl. Chris wonders of the father of this little wolf trying to determine it from the features of the baby. He speculates the red eyes and unique lines it might be a descendant from a golden wolf and one day it might even be able to breathe fire. Uh, that's a little overpowered but whatever. Linda asks Chris if he decided on a name and he responds with beeline? Linda is disgusted with this choice and Chris throws out another one. Gantong? Chris might be a good hunter but he's definitely not good with names. He tells all the boys he's kidding around and he says let's just call it Pumpkey, short for pumpkin, which honestly is a pretty Pretty perfect name if you ask me. A commander comes in and calls the soldiers to come outside for an inspection and to assemble. Chris wonders why there is a sudden inspection and the soldiers line up. Chris curses their leading commander and the man calls for Chris. He approaches and the atmosphere is intense. The man who called Chris is the centurion and head of the 7th infantry, Kennery. The centurion thanks Chris for his outstanding service with his most notable achievement being dispatching the enemy scout. As a result he appoints Chris as a decurion and looks forward to see his growth. Chris humbly accepts his promotion and all the soldiers he fed are now cheering for him. It's always cool to see the love spreading around like that. Kennery notes that Chris is quite popular and asks him if he bribed the men with drinks. Chris awkwardly dismisses the comment saying how he's actually a little shy, but the cheers don't stop. And one man even calls him a meat magnet. Wait, 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 that's, that's a little sus. At least add the, the no homo after that, but I, I think we know what he means. I think. As the ceremony is finishing, Chris sends a tense shift in the air as the veteran officers look towards him with disdain, almost as if they want him to be as close to the ground and never climb the ranks. Because when Chris climbs the ladder, he threatens the older soldier's hierarchy. Chris returns to the tent and his friends wonder if they need to call him commander now. The offer is tempting, but Chris is just fine for him. Now the group needs to begin preparing because their growth won't stop here. It's time to prepare for another scouting mission. Some time passes and the boys wonder where Chris has taken him. They've been marching for 4 hours now and I guess Chris's last name is Goggins at this point. Everyone is exhausted and Guillen approaches Chris warning him on the dangers of his new role. Scouts are often killed the most in battle, and most times even before the fight begins. Take a look at your friends, Chris. Do they have what it takes? As Guillen is trying to lay the seeds of doubt into Chris's mind. But Chris believes in his friends, and they won't die that easily. In his past life, Guillen was named Guillen the Guillotine after murdering his brother. But some events led up to that, so for now they should be alright. The scouting party arrives at the swamps and the boys take a second to rest and look around at their location. Chris hands his comrades some honey to revitalize him after such a long journey. We find out that the main reason Chris joined Guillen on the scouting mission was to gather an herb that's indigenous to swamp environments. As Chris sifts through the muddy water, he finds the mud made in grass that he needs for the future. But being a scout sure is tough, especially from all the marching. But the boys end up returning to camp and Chris goes to the centurion's tent. He's stopped by the guards and Chris tells him his name and rank and says that he has a report from his previous scouting mission. One of the guards tries to haze Chris but he's having none of it. He kicks the man in the shin and as soon as he bends over he knees him again in the face and tells him to take this as a lesson and not to make the same mistake again if he values his life. The other guard raises his spear towards Chris, but Chris grabs it and tells him to stop. Before the situation can escalate, another Decurion, Pedal, approaches and takes Chris's side saying how Chris needs to debrief his report. Chris begins debriefing to Pedal about the scouting mission in the swamps. Pedal was actually impressed with the report, but all Chris can think is why the Centurion isn't doing this job and why he sent Pedal instead. Pedal notes that Kennery likes to drink a lot and then we find out some backstory on the Centurion. He was once a knight from an important aristocrat, but he got too close to the Baron's wife and was fired out of jealousy. He got close with the Baron's wife? Chris is surprised at this turn of events. Kennery was then demoted and sent to the infantry in the hopes that he would just die on the battlefield. Naturally, Kennery thinks of this place as a cemetery, and it finally clicks inside Chris's mind why in his past life the 7th infantry was annihilated. Kennery fell into desperation and depression and let his soldiers die. If Chris doesn't do something now, history is doomed to repeat itself. Chris is looking for something outside of the forest and swears that it should be the midpoint between opposing camps. He looks over the hill and finds what he's looking for. Jackpot, he says. He looks over the hill, hiding in some tall grass, and spots the eight gate soldiers delivery routes. And he sees two carriages that are lightly guarded. Usually 5 to 10 soldiers are guarding these transports, but he thinks his plan will work and returns to camp. On the way back, he grabs some dogskin. 
A tired Chris returns to camp and starts preparations for his daring mission. He asks for a few sticks and knives and begins making some makeshift equipment. He's using the sticks and knives to make spears and the dog skin to make shields. Thinking of how the gear of the 7th Infantry is pretty garbage, Lind wonders if they're preparing for war. Chris just replies saying, what, is, what are you talking about? They're already at war. Chris tells the boys to grab the weapons and come outside. Starting today, Chris will train these nubs on how to wield weapons. He signals the start of the training and the boys begin to spar. Some older soldiers notice the training and some of the veterans start to approach and give tips to the boys, which starts a chain reaction that gets the entire camp involved. Everyone now is getting better by association. Chris thinks that this atmosphere is much better for the camp. The only problem now is Kennery. Today is the start of the change, so there's not much that they can do. Now, Guillen approaches and inquires about the training. And Chris tells him that today was effective, but he can't help but think to himself how long Guillen plans on hiding his true identity. He looks like a kind person, but his deed from Chris's past life begged to differ. Will he really murder his brothers? Chris is now intertwined with Guillen's fate as well, and Guillen tells him that the only way to save the 7th Infantry is to kill Kennery. The air becomes thick. Chris can see the merit in this plan since the drunkard Kennery could lead them all to their dooms. And maybe even Pedal can become the new Centurion. Maybe, maybe, this is the only effective way. But even Kennery has those who support him, and thanks to that, it's gonna be hard to approach him. If he dies, they might quickly take revenge on Chris. It might be the quickest solution, but not the best. Guillen remarks that Chris does not have a fun expression, smiles, and says that there's another way. Almost if he was testing Chris. The scene shifts and Chris is seen entering his tent. He calls his boys to attention and to grab their equipment. They are departing on a mission. Some time passes and we see Chris plucking some fruit from a tree, noting how they made it just in time. The five boys loiter around the tree and Chris says it's time to go deeper. The sun sets and in the cover of darkness, Chris reminds his squad, from this point onward, they will be in enemy territory. Watch your steps. The freckled boy wonders if it's too dark and Doki seems pretty hungry too. Chris pulls out the fruit that he collected from before. The fruit's name is Hoger's Sorrow. The after effect from overdosing is blindness and it's usually regarded as a poisonous fruit. But if you wrap some white grass around it, the effects are lightened and the user can gain night vision. The effect lasts for 24 hours, so they need to move fast. SEAL Team 6 arrives at the enemy camp and needs to figure out the number of enemies. Chris asks Lin what he sees since he has the best eyesight, and Lin notes that there's five enemy soldiers around the fire. This might be too much for the group. If they let one of them escape, it may signal the end of their operation. They need to lure them into the dark where they have the upper hand. Chris thinks to use the team's youth to their advantage. Without military garb, would the eight gate soldiers assume that they were enemies? It's a risk, but it might be worth trying. The enemy soldiers converse around the fire and hear movements in the bushes and ready their spears. They ask whoever's there to show themselves, and a ragged looking Chris walks out wearing only a worn tank top and some ripped shorts. The soldiers let their guard down and assume, since he's just a child, maybe he's a runaway slave. The enemy squad leader signals his men to lower their weapons and approaches Chris and asks if he lost his way and even offers him some turkey. Chris puts on a timid look and begins to run away. The soldiers take the bait and start to chase Chris. Chris falls and the soldiers catch up. These guys are now furious and yell at Chris asking if he has a death wish. But before the man can finish scolding Chris, an axe politely ends the conversation, severing the guy's head from his shoulders. Now in the dark and without their weapons, the eight gate soldiers are helpless and are systematically dealt with. The two remaining at the camp wonder what is taking so long and one soldier says he will go check on them. Before he can get the chance however, Digo plunges his spear into his neck. What is going on? The guy says. Doki buries his axe into him, killing him, and only one soldier remains as Chris is chasing him in the dark. The man is terrified but turns and tries to fight, but has met with two spears from Lind and the freckled boy, killing him instantly. The freckled boy throws up since this was the first time he's killed the man and I can't really blame him for that. And this is probably the same story for most of the crew, besides Digo and Doki. Chris watches but knows that experience is necessary to build an elite squad. The next day comes and the 8 gate supply line is running just as usual. Chris and the boys suit up in enemy apparel and walk towards the caravan, stopping it. The man transporting the goods thinks that these are just some new recruits, and this really happens often since there's a lot of casualties in war. But back at the location of the night raid, 8 gate soldiers 
soldiers are investigating the scene. They can obviously tell that a struggle has taken place, and all the men are busy searching for clues. The commander inspects the congealed blood from the floor, and one of his men calls for his attention. The commander's veins bulge from his face as he sees the members of the squad that was assigned to this location disposed of inside the bushes. He curses the Cirque and trash. Back at the main camp, Canary wakes up with an empty bottle by his side as daylight breaks through his tent. He walks outside to see many soldiers diligently training. Petal greets the centurion, and Canary comments on how they're training pretty early in the morning. Petal comments that they need to become better in order to survive, but before he can finish, he's stopped by Kenry, who has seemed to have enough of this conversation. Petal asks if he plans to ban them from training, but Kenry just ignores his comment and mentions that they're short on supplies. The 7th Infantry is basically at its limit and been abandoned by the Duke. Kenry doesn't want Petal to share his fate and tells him to join the 6th Infantry, but the man quickly declines. Kenry turns at the sight of a carriage approaching. No one's expecting a carriage. The men turn to see Chris is actually the one steering the horse towards him. The carriages have the insignia of eight gates and they're filled to the brim with the supplies that they need. The carriage was filled with alcohol and meat and Petal asks how on earth Chris got his hands on this. He replies that it wasn't too big of a deal and they just stole it from the enemy. Later that night, we see Chris in the middle of some veteran soldiers as they throw a party to celebrate their hero. Chris is the one who filled their stomachs and brought them alcohol. Then the fire rages on. One of the soldiers with a scar on his face named Ralph tells Chris that it's been so long since he had a hearty meal. Now, the decurion that leads the tent guard that tried to punch Chris in an earlier chapter comes up and bows to him, apologizing for his subordinate's actions. And it asks Chris if he has any punishment, he will allow it. Chris says it's alright and nothing more needs to be done, which Ralph reacts to saying that Chris is a pretty good guy, and all the men start to laugh around the fire. The scene shifts to Kennery, who is looking at Chris with a depressing stare. He thinks to himself how this kid is only 15, but he managed to kill some enemy soldiers and even stole an enemy supply carriage. What reckless behavior. But this reminds Kennery of his past self as an ambitious young boy who strived to be the best. He grips his cup tightly, but suddenly the attention of the entire camp was turned to a drunk man that's using a spear as a crutch. The man is stumbling around and the soldiers begin to laugh telling him that he just needs to go sleep it off and that he's just too drunk. He stumbles around a bit before slamming his spear into the ground and yelling at the top of his lungs, I will survive! All of the soldiers turn with a serious look as this resonated with all of their primal instincts. All of them want to survive. Nobody wants to die in this battle. And even Kennery is taken aback. Chris thinks how this soldier is right. The 7th Infantry doesn't need to die. They can all live and they can all live together. The soldiers gather around the men and Petal turns to see Kennery retreat back into his tent, but is shocked to see that he left his alcohol behind. Maybe this is the start of a change. The next day comes and Kennery steps out of his tent, dripped out in full cladded armor and he says to the 7th Infantry that starting today, he will oversee the official training. Today is the second day of training and we see Ralph and Chris working hard. Running is today's warm up and while he's working out, Chris notices that Kennery has taken some interest in him. This might not be the best news because getting such attention so early could go both ways. As he's thinking this, some conversation is stirring up between himself and Ralph and Ralph notes that Chris is not too bad of a runner. Chris only wonders why this guy won't leave him the fuck alone. I mean, Ralph does look pretty funny though. Now we see the training in the afternoon and this consists of Kennery showing off his mask mastery of the spear. It wasn't a night for nothing. Chris approaches him and asks him politely if he could teach Lin some archery. Lin is a little rough and he struggles to even draw the bowstring, but because of his perfect vision, this could be a match, and this was also evident in Chris's past life. In the same training session some time later, we see the soldiers participating in a drill. They are both blocking and striking each other with spears. Before Chris can switch positions, however, he is called by Kennery and goes to his tent. As he enters, he sees Guillen who's just leaving, and Kennery mentions that that was a messenger from the 6th Infantry. Chris can only admire Guillen's acting skills, and Kennery tells him that there is a combined training with the 6th Infantry that will begin in two days. We must show them what we've got, and he asks Chris if he has any ideas. Chris nods and says that they should attack the 8 gate delivery routes. Kennery thinks his boy is kidding, but Chris says the supplies that he stole will only last for another three days, and real battle is best experience to create hardened soldiers. Kennery disagrees since they'll lose many men charging at the enemy like that. Chris says that this does not need to be a frontal assault and they'll prepare accordingly. An attack from the shadows will minimize the risk. Kennery asks Chris how many times he attempted to steal cargo, but he replies saying that only once. 
But even so, the enemy should have taken some precautions. They are sure to defend their supplies with elite soldiers, so they're gonna need the cover of night. Chris breaks down the plan, saying how the enemies are not fools and won't fall for the same trick twice. First, they will need a strike team to eliminate the enemy scouts, and after this, the main force will move in. And if the strike team fails, the main force can retreat back to camp, ensuring that only a few men will be expended in the worst case scenario. Kenry ponders and thinks he'll need to add Ralph and Petal to the strike team. Chris is excited that his commander sees the opportunity and thanks him for his decision. They'll depart at noon, assemble all the Decurians Kenry orders. Now, all the Decurians are aware of their role. Some soldiers voiced their concerns, but the strategy was never based on ordinary soldiers. In reality, the whole plan is based on the strike team of seven men, the five boys that we know, accompanied by Ralph and Petal. Now we see the strike team arrives at their intended destination. Chris asks Lind if he can see the enemy. Lind counts four scouts in total, and Ralph is shocked that he can actually see that far, and I'm with him, that's that's pretty fucking crazy, the guy's like a hawk. Chris asks Lind what route they will take, and Lind responds saying that they're moving right, and if they can get to the next ridge, they might be able to see the enemy's main force. Chris agrees, and tells his men that they will attack from the rear, and they will leave no survivors. The two soldiers spot the group, and Chris throws a rock at one of their heads, just to piss them off I guess, and it gets the intended effect as the angry soldier now rushes to intercept. They fall for the trap because they're dumb as hell, chase two boys, and all of a sudden an agile Doki makes the first move. He slices one of the soldiers, killing him instantly, and now the enemy is aware that they're in an ambush. Another soldier raises his sword to swing on Doki, but is cut down. The remaining soldiers begin to panic and disperse. Ralph cuts through one of them and only one is left. Chris calls for Lin to snipe the guy, but the soldier quickly notices this and breaks for a different direction, but he's caught by Petal and stabbed through the stomach. The freckled boy watches, but can only admire the Decurian's skill. The group is interrogating the surviving soldier, and Chris understands how the enemy adjusted their troops to protect the supply lines. The strike team has finished its first objective, but Chris tells the crew that they have more work to do. He orders the freckled boy to notify the main forces that the time has come. They need to finish what they started. We now see at the eight gates camp, the supply carriages have arrived. Chris is seen, again dressed in enemy apparel, talking to the Eight Gates commander. The commander asks him about any emergencies while he was on duty, and Chris replies telling him that nothing's happened. Chris then says that there's a new order that requires him to audit the supplies. The commander wonders who gave the order and bites his lip, but orders his men to show Chris whatever he needs. The man basically shows Chris where everything important is, and Chris looks to Lin and inquires if he checked that thing that he asked about earlier, and Lin replies saying that he did. The audit concludes and Chris notices the man in charge of the supply camp. Chris turns to leave, but the man giving it to her inquires on where Chris is from. It's pretty weird since they've been stationed in the same place, but he's never seen him before. Isn't that kind of suspicious? Bro, this guy had to lose his head being curious George over here. I mean, look how Deco is looking at him, man. This might be the smartest soldier in their whole army, honestly. It's a shame that, he's, that he didn't get to show his skills. I'm sad. Chris orders the boys to get in position and wait for the signal. Chris hides behind a tent, knife in hand, and begins the assault and launches his knife towards the enemy commander. Instead of going at its intended target, another soldier steps up and eats the knife in his neck, which incidentally saved his commander's life. The commander is now in shock at the attempted assassination and yells that they're under attack. Chris is disappointed that he didn't get to kill him right away, but his throwing skill increases. He begins to reposition and a little side note, it looks like Chris understands the interface a little bit better since he says dismiss and the window prompt vanishes. He opens the tent to the oil storage and sees another soldier inside. This bozo can't put two and two together and asks what Chris is doing. Chris fumbles his words a bit, but the man tells Chris that they're under attack and he needs to grab his weapon. Now we see that the commander is frantically searching for the assassin, and apparently the guy just left Chris inside the tent, because now we see a huge explosion. This was a signal that Chris was referring to, and just in time, Kennery leads the main forces in to attack. The camp is now in the midst of confusion, and the commander is conflicted on what to do. He's trying to relate orders, but now there's an attack from behind. Chris and SEAL Team 6 engages, and Digo begins the fight by giving a man a small haircut, and now the soldiers are completely unorganized and scared. The combined attack decimated forces and their morale. And now here's a cool shot of all our different favorite characters improving their kill-death ratio. The commander stands in the open with all hope lost wondering how this could have happened. The fire combined with the frontal attack leaves them with no hope of winning. One of his men prepares a horse and tries to get him back to his senses. As the commander mounts his horse, Chris is looking for him since this was the last piece they need to eliminate. With a precise throw, he lodges his knife in the back of the fleeing general, but this isn't enough to kill him. But next, out of nowhere, an arrow is 
dislodged in the back of his head. Man, Lin's accuracy is deadly. Night comes and the 7th Infantry celebrates their victory. All the soldiers are gonna drink their fill tonight. The next day, Chris wakes up and debates getting in his morning cardio. He finishes his workout, but is confused that even after all that training he did, he still didn't get a system prompt. He thinks that he's progressing too quickly during the war environment, and now, since he has both arms, everything is different. For him, for Lin, and even the 7th Infantry. Ralph is ordering the troops to keep running and converses with Chris. Tonight, they will have a joint training with the 6th Infantry and Guillen comments on how much the group has changed, even without killing Kenry. The lifeless bunch and desolate group has turned into a motivated battalion of soldiers. Chris says the whole time they really needed Kenry, and if he gets to choose his own title, he wants to be a knight just like him. Chris wonders why Guillen is still keeping up the act and being very cautious. Why is he posing as an ordinary soldier? The answer is obvious. A bastard son is not allowed to be a commander. This is why he's been avoiding his father and brother, and secretly searching for talented people to amass his own power. Chris has an epiphany and wonders if he can use Guillen's battle experience to level himself up through the system. Chris asks for a spar but is nervous about his own skills, but he needs to do this to test his own power. Chris ready with spear in hand asks Guillen why hasn't he drawn his sword. Guillen smiles at the cocky brat and tells him that the battle has already started. Guillen lets out a murderous aura that stuns Chris and knocks him back to the ground. Chris then receives multiple prompts saying that he's gained XP, and Guillen charges at the boy barehanded. Chris wonders what this aura could be and if it was intentional, and we now learn that aura is the final goal for every warrior. This is the last step for them to throw away their humanity, and Chris is awestruck at the aura that Guillen is exerting. Guillen asks Chris if he's scared, and of course he is, but this is the only way for him to get stronger and it's a rare opportunity. He's gonna have to go all out. He gets multiple prompts saying that his level is still too low, and the closer that Guillen gets, the stronger the pressure that he's feeling. Chris is stuck in the hallucination, and Guillen draws his sword. With a few well-placed slashes, Chris loses both of his arms, and in another follow-up attack, he is struck down. Guillen wakes the boy up from the hallucination with a flick to the forehead, bringing him back to reality. Chris is breathing heavy and wonders what on earth just happened. Was that really just an hallucination? What did he do? Guillen vaguely answers that it's still too early for Chris to wield a spear with such shaky knees. Guillen says that maybe he can become a second-rate soldier, but being a knight is out of the question. Another prompt pops up saying experience is reaching its limit. Chris is happy with the progress but is still shaken up over what just happened. Just how strong is this man to best Chris with only his aura? Chris approaches Petal, still shivering, and begs him to omit himself from the joint training today. Chris then becomes a caterpillar and Pumpkey licks his cheek. I mean, he's gonna need something like that after today. It was pretty rough. He wonders if they'll postpone the training due to the rain. And the next day, the rain continues. Two guards complain about the weather and two hands appear out of nowhere behind the guards. And the next panel shows the guards unconscious on the floor and an eight gates assassin pulls out a mysterious vial containing the virus called White Demon and puts it in the mouth of the unconscious soldiers. Chris gets Pumpkey to drink from the bowl and he apologizes to the baby wolf for not spending as much time with him as he wanted. Lind and Doki enter the tent and remove their hoods, and Lind informs Chris that someone attacked the guards. Although, the guards were only knocked unconscious without any injuries. Chris now has a worried look on his face and immediately runs out of the tent. This seems to be an event that he recalls from his last life. This news doesn't sit well with Chris and we can see him with a worried face. He runs out of the tent and seems to recall this event from his past life. Though it didn't affect his squad, whatever they did to those guards will have a massive impact on the infantry, unless Chris can do something about it. He enters Petal's tent and asks if he was the one who assigned the Porter patrol shifts. Petal says he did and even right now he's working on next week's schedule. Chris inquires on which squad the guards who got attacked are from and Petal tells him that it was from the Curian Ralph. Petal says there shouldn't be anything to worry about and this puts Chris in a very tight spot because he can't just openly reveal that he knows about the curse because Petal will get suspicious. He examines one of the soldiers who was harmed and lifts his eyelid to see many black marks in the white of his eye. This must be the first stage of the virus and no one suspects the thing. However, Chris tells Ralph that if anything changes, please let him know. The virus Chris is worried about is called the White Demon and it enters a person's body and covers them with ice until they freeze to death. Due to this, people refer to it as a curse rather than a disease. And during the crisis in Chris's past life, more than a hundred doctors died trying to treat this. The first scientist who used this disease in battle was Anshin Rezones. I might be botching the pronunciation of that, I apologize in advance. And Chris curses the man, noting how this disease is extremely contagious and deadly. As time passes, the doctors understood that the white demon was, in fact, a disease, and as such, they found a cure. 
The cure that was found has a primary ingredient of the mud made in grass which Chris collected in the swamp. First you need some boiling water and then all the liquid must evaporate and the last step is to add some pulvis extracted from old growth blue herb. And now the medicine is ready. Ralph bursts into the tent and his guard is in critical condition. His teeth are becoming black and this is the middle stage of the disease. The man struggles to eat the medicine but Chris forces him to consume it. The only thing left to do now is wait. The infected man said that he heard about these symptoms before and is sure that this is the white demon. This shocks everyone around them, but Ralph is still unaware of what he just said. And one of the soldiers informs him that this is a curse from the snowy mountain region that inevitably leads to death. And even the population of a small city was decimated because of this curse. Digo says they need to burn the bodies of the soldier to stop the spread, but is grabbed by Ralph and telling him he's not burning his own men alive. Now the group is in a very peculiar state, and both Ralph and Chris's men start to escalate the situation. It seems that a fight is about to take place. Chris is inspecting the soldier and notices the back spots on his eye are already disappearing from the medicine. Digo starts to yell at Chris now, saying, Get away from that man, now! Lynn nervously tells Chris that maybe he should listen before another soldier came in with the same symptoms. Chris orders his men to get Digo out of here before he lights the tent on fire. Digo breaks free from the boys and points his spear at Chris. If he doesn't move now, he will attack. Ralph, seething at the young Digo, is being held back by his own men, and Chris tells Digo that he won't interfere and to put the spear down. When Digo relaxes, his guard, Chris snatches a spear from his hand and orders everybody to catch him. Digo is now infuriated. Now, Commander Kennery enters the room and asks Ralph to explain the situation. Kennery understands that he needs to burn the men to save the rest of his soldiers, and calmly orders Chris to step aside. Chris finally lets out that this is just a disease, it's not a curse, there is a cure. Please. Trust me. Henry thinks Chris has lost his mind and Digo yells saying not to listen to Chris. Digo begins to cry as his words reach the crew. They need to burn them now or they're all gonna die. I know this better than anyone, Digo says and we have some backstory on the poor kid and we come to find that he was from the city that was annihilated from this curse. Chris is shocked that one of the members in his squad is a survivor from Tresidy. Is this why he acted like this? Digo continues and that once it starts, the curse has a domino effect and it's impossible to stop. Chris tells Kennery again he knows how to treat this disease as Digo cries out, Chris, I lost my whole family. You don't know a thing. As the man is crying on the floor, Ralph gives Digo an old fashioned karate chop to the neck and puts him to sleep. Kennery tells Chris again to stand back and these are his orders. It seems Kennery is taking Digo's side and this is getting very bad. Chris has to change the situation. If they start burning people alive, it will deeply affect the soldier's morale and it will be the end of the 7th infantry. Chris tugs on his shirt and says quietly, don't you want to be a knight again? Kennery is shocked at these words and turns to Chris. Chris says it won't be easy, especially for those who are close to the Baron's wife. But Chris knows a way how even the jealous Baron will acknowledge and help him. Just trust me, Chris says. Digo awakes and jumps up and the freckled boy asks if he's calmed down. He immediately leaves the tent yelling for Chris and goes outside to a shocking sight of Ralph hugging the two infected soldiers and crying to them saying how he's so happy that they're finally okay. He's hugging his men so hard that it actually starts to hurt them. Digo is in awe that there could possibly be a treatment for this horrible curse. Digo doesn't understand what he's seeing, but a friendly hand sits on his shoulder. Chris told him, didn't he? He knows how to cure the white demon. Chris returns to Kennery and informs him that the soldiers are now healthy. Kennery is relieved, but still says that they should set up a temporary hospital and send other infected soldiers from other units to the 7th Infantry. The next coming days, we see Chris is working non-stop treating infected soldiers. As Chris exits the tent, one of the men grabs him by the hand, calling him his savior at the top of his lungs. All the soldiers begin to chant, all hands Savior Chris, we've beaten the curse, they chant in unison. Chris is a little shy and thinks that they're overdoing it a little. But all Kennery can do is look at the boy and wonders who the hell this kid really is. But right now, Chris is just an exhausted soldier. But Kennery asks him to break it to him straight. Chris starts to break down the situation. This was the first attack from the eight gates. They want to capitalize on the confusion and attack them. So they're going to have to prepare immediately. Kennery is going just to do that. And Chris takes his men and goes off to set some traps. Finally, we know that the freckled boy's name is Throt. 
so I'm gonna call him that from now on. Chris orders Thrott to go get some dry logs, but since it's been raining the last couple days, finding dry logs will be near impossible. They are in desperate need of some firewood for Chris's plan. However, Chris has an epiphany and asks Digo where the supply carts they stole from earlier is, and is told that they're still inside the tent. Chris orders Digo to go inside and destroy the carriages. Chris brings the carriages outside, still filled with meat, and begins to burn them. Throt notes that this is a huge waste of meat, and I can't blame him, the hungry guy. But this is part of Chris's elaborate scheme. The eight gate troops will think, due to the scent of burning flesh, that the 7th infantry is suffering heavily from the disease. Chris thinks that they will definitely not want to miss this opportunity, and right on schedule, we see many armored 8 gate soldiers charging at the 7th infantry. The soldiers are blinded by their orders and immediately start stepping into traps. One of the enemy men triggers a pitfall that swallows tens of soldiers at once. Chris uses this opportunity to make his appearance from the shadows and orders all of his archers to fire at the enemy. Now they're stuck and confused, and all the arrows begin to fall on their position. The eight gate soldiers try to signal for a retreat, but they are blocked and surrounded. Though the fight is not looking good for them, the eight gate soldiers won't go down without a fight. They are holding out desperately for reinforcements. One of the soldiers is about to run his spear through a 7th infantry swordsman, but is stabbed through the back. The man asks if the scared soldier is okay, and to get his head back into the battle, but shortly after, the commander is shot down in front of the scared soldier, which makes him fall deeper into his despair, thinking that he's the reason this man died. Chris yells at the man, snapping him out of it. This is a battlefield. What are you, a baby? You need to survive this battle. You want to see your family, don't you? The soldier thinks about his wife and child, and steals himself and charges back into the fray. The enemy is putting up more of a fight than he anticipated. How long will this last until they receive help from the 5th infantry? They don't need to win, but just make the enemy back down to minimize their own casualties. Chris knows that he needs to make a decisive move. He prepares his daggers and throws it with incredible accuracy into the neck of the 8 gates commander. Now the enemy chain of command is in shambles and their morale should be crushed inside of this chaos. We see a head flying past Chris, and Chris turns to see Kennery absolutely being a boss, slashing enemies down one by one. Kennery apologizes for being late, but has a bad feeling about this battle. Why are the 8 Gates men defending so ferociously? An explosion is heard behind Kennery, but he's occupied at the moment with two enemy swordsmen, but he can't help but hear the sounds of his own men screaming. A crazed berserker-like man is seen ravaging the 7th infantry. This behemoth cut a man in two, and the last soldier in front of him is frozen in fear. Kennery yells at the man to get away from him, but has to fend off two soldiers of his own. He finally understands. They are waiting for the reinforcements, and this isn't good. Kennery is the only one who can deal with that man, but he's being bogged down by the eight gate swordsman. The screaming stop, and Kennery thinks that someone is facing this monster. But who? Who could it be? Of course it's our boy Chris! as he holds one of his makeshift spears to the monster of a man. The guy looks down at him with a lifeless stare, and this feeling reminds him of his duel with Killian. The man can tell Chris's rank by his shoulder pads and says that he's impressed to see a Decurion at such a young age. Chris steals himself ready for the impending attack, and in an instant the man appears in front of a Chris, asking to show him what he's really made of. Chris barely blocks the strike and the man continues to talk. A Decurion, huh? How long can you last? Lin draws his bow in an attempt to help Chris, but the man is quick to turn his attention to him. Before he can connect with Lin, Digo emerges from the fire with a fierce shoulder check, pushing the monster back. Chris orders Digo to drop his spear and use only his shield. Digo will defend and Chris will attack. The two men stand in front of this behemoth, surrounded by a ring of fire in this ominous scene. This panel is really sick. Chris tells Digo that this man is of a knight level. The man is annoyed with these two boys that think that he can match up to him. I'll tear you to pieces, the man yells as he charges at the boys. His leg, however, bursts with blood. It looks like this guy had some prior wounds, but still continues his attack as he winds back his sword. Digo takes the brunt of the attack and raises his shield, but the attacks are heavy, and Chris yells for Digo to hold his ground. The man thinks Chris is annoying with all this yapping around and decides to kill him first. He raises his sword ready to bring it down on our protagonist, but Digo unfazed blocks his attack. Chris uses the opportunity to launch an offensive of his own and he stabs at the man but is narrowly blocked. The man thinks that Chris's spear skills are nothing special and since he's left handed, he should be able to anticipate where he will attack. The berserker switches back to Digo and hits him with a heavy attack that sends shockwave through the boy's body. You dare stand in the wolf knight's way? He says infuriated. Digo is reaching his limit and with that last strike, his shield is broken. The man is happy with the sight of breaking Digo's shield, but Chris sees an opening. This was all a part of his plan. The man was unaware that initially, Chris was right handed and he powerfully thrust his spear towards the man, cutting him along his face and nose. 
The man is taken aback at this sudden change of target and sends a strike towards Chris that brutally breaks his left arm. That's disgusting. Look what he did to our boy. The hell? The man is fed up and sends a strike to finish off the helpless Chris. No! The eagle screams. Chris, all of a sudden, has a green glow around his previously broken arm. His artifact activates, but Chris has no time to think, but he notices that his arm is now fully healed. He feels as light as ever, and as soon as the man sends an elbow strike at Chris, he blocks it effortlessly. The man thinks that his wounded left knee won't let him go all out. But in this moment of hesitation, Chris lodges a knife into his neck with a cold look on his face. Digo is left speechless, and Kennery finishes off the soldiers that were tying him down, and he's worried about Chris. But all he can hear is his soldiers screaming that they won! Chris wipes the sweat from his forehead and Kennery wonders how on earth the kid managed this feat. The 5th Infantry finally shows up, talk about timing, but this signals the end of the battle and the 7th Infantry is victorious. Kennery stands before the commander of the 5th, Madri, and he orders Kennery to return to the main department. He asks if Kennery was the one who killed the Wolf Knight. Kennery shakes his head in disapproval and tells Madri that it was one of his young Dakurians. Madri is shocked that such a young lad managed to defeat an enemy soldier of knight level. Madri makes sure that Kennery isn't just fooling around, but Kennery assures him with a serious look and tells him what he said was true. Some time passes and the boys are seen sitting around in the carriage, and Lind holds something out to Chris, saying, how Petal asked him to bring it to him. It was Chris's shoulder pads that he repaired. This makes our boy really happy. Chris reflects on his past life, he was weak and crippled, and always stuck around those with talent in order to protect himself. With a determined look in his eyes, Chris vows that he doesn't want to stand back while others take the glory. He wants to reach the top along with his friends. And let's not forget Pumpkey too. The scene shifts and Chris exits the carriage and Kennery signals him to come close. Chris inquires on where they're heading and Kennery tells him that they're going to the Third Oda. The three Odas are the top ranking officials in the military. Chris recalls that the Third Oda should be Baron Van Ludwig's oldest son, Weehane Ludwig. The two approach Weehane and he's pleasantly surprised that a boy managed to kill the Wolf Knight. He begins to announce that he acknowledges the 7th Infantry and Kennery is promoted to Battalion Commander, unofficially of course. Weehane calls to Chris and appreciates his contributions to fighting the White Demon and bringing down one of the 8 Gate Chiefs. For this, he will be non-officially promoted to Centurion. Centurion is a commander who controls 100 men, and it's basically Kennery's old job. Weehane offers to put the new shoulder pads on for Chris. What an honor. The man adjusts them carefully and pats Chris. Weehane stares intently at Chris, admiring his young look, and asks if he needs anything else. One thing that Chris suddenly remembers about the man was his sexual preference. Which means we can assume that he wants to do some naughty stuff with her boy. That's disgusting, oh my god. Chris kneels and tells the man that during the attack, Chris found some useful information. Eight gates are harboring unique soldiers. He continues saying that they have an elite unit of soldiers that were trained for many years, numbering in the tens of thousands. Weehane is a little slow on the uptake and Chris continues. Since the enemy has a secret elite squad that prefers guerrilla warfare, their target would be to destroy the heart of their forces. Weehane mocks Chris and asks if he means that the enemy is targeting him. Weehane says that their cavalry is the best in the continent, and no matter how strong the enemy is, they will be handled accordingly. Chris continues his logic, saying that it will be very difficult for cavalrymen to assist in chaotic situations, and they should look to prevent the attack. Weehane takes this disrespectfully and asks Chris if he's trying to lecture him. Chris now quickly apologizes and the sly man accepts. This is a typical arrogant commander in my book, but Chris knows that he needs to suck up to him for now and he tells the man in two days he will end this. So please, let me try. And if I fail, feel free to teach me a lesson however you see fit. Weehane agrees and says he will personally teach the lesson later if he fails. Oh, I hope we're talking about military tactics here, guys. Chris begins and asks the third Oda what he thinks about a surprise attack on the eight gates supply routes. Speaking frankly, the enemy is aiming to finish the war before winter. If something happens to their supply routes, they will mobilize the guerrilla units in order to end the battle. They can use this desperation against them and have an elite squad of their own to destroy the opposing guerrillas. If this works, the enemy morale will be in shambles, securing their victory. Two days later, Kennery and Petal overlook the eight gate supply route. They are here just as Chris said. 
Henry orders his troops to charge and they chop down the ill-prepared eight-gate soldiers and set fire to the supplies and quickly retreat. The enemy is confused on why they are running, but immediately understand that their goal was their supplies and horses that are now in flames. Chris is seen training in the forest alone and he notes how good he has gotten with his left hand and should further analyze the artifact since it saved him in his last fight. The promise of experience is what confuses Chris the most. In his last battle, the system told him that his experience gauge has been reset and as a result, his body experience changes. So he leveled up? What? Chris noted a huge increase in reaction speed and physical movements, almost like he was a different person. It seems that Chris gets unique skills when the experience reaches its requirements. If that is true, then will Chris be able to use Aura as well? We see a flashback of the one-armed Chris sitting next to another man, and that man tells him that he is going to show him swordsmanship. The man tells him to watch, and it's hard to put into words. For instance, the man throws a wood log in the air and spins his sword faster than the eye can see, creating a vortex like appearance. The log meets his eyes and he slices it in many different directions. The log keeps its shape momentarily but crumbles into six precise pieces. In the man's opinion, talent is the ability to see something and replicate it instantly. Can you do the same one-armed man? In simple terms, talent is mastery. Back in the present day, Chris picks up a similar log and tosses it into the air. He's finally acquired talent. He spins his spear creating a similar vortex as he pierces the log. He has a smile on his face and thinks the things that he couldn't do before are now things that he can do now and has an excited look. Linda enters the scene and asks Chris what he is up to. Well, j just something like mastery, Chris says. Time passes and we see many squadrons lined up in a bigger camp. The man asks Chris, the young centurion, if he's gathered his team yet. Chris said he did with some outside help that surprises the other officer and makes the man a little bit angry. Even Lin asks Chris who is he talking about, but he just vaguely answers saying, you know, just someone with a rich father. We get a flashback and see Chris talking to Guillen and Chris asks him if he can help him create his elite team. Guillen laughs at Chris saying how he's always asking for the impossible, but Chris has a serious look and asks him if there's really no way. Guillen responds saying of course there's a way, but what, you expect me to do it for free? Chris wonders on what this man could possibly want, but Guillen looks at him and responds saying to pay him a visit once the battle ends. Chris wonders if they will have a place to return to, but is reassured by again saying that a place like that will soon be created. Back to the present, Chris continues his training with the boys and now they're gonna focus on group attacks. Lin starts the fight and strikes the foes from distance and Dogi closes the gap and strikes with his axes. Digo and Chris then strike from behind. It's a simple but effective strategy that makes our four boys attack as one. Digo asks if this really works with only the four of them since Throb is in the hospital due to his wounds. Chris's only concern is that his soldiers won't follow a 15 year old boy who's been promoted unofficially. His top priority is to show them what he's got. The eight gate soldiers have took action and every man is called to their station. Chris thinks that Henry must have pulled off the surprise attack. No more preparation. Now is the time for battle. The two battalions of men square off with both commanders locking eyes. Digo looks a little nervous at his first large scale battle and they look at the enemy and surmise that they have around 3,000 soldiers. And one of the soldiers even notices that the enemy is using injured men at their front lines. We see some Zerk soldiers bantering back and forth and others praying to God. The 7th infantry numbers only 100 men but finally has a bigger part on a daunting battlefield. The objective hasn't changed for Chris, regardless of where he is. He will fight and he will win. One of the commanders with a long-winded shout calls for his army to charge and we see both sides engage in a gruesome melee. Chris and the boys take up the rear and get into formation and we see cavalrymen start decimating the Eight Gates infantry. As one of the soldiers begin to rejoice at this sight, he's cut down and possibly the funniest death I've seen so far. Like even his friends still smiling at him, this is horrible. The Eight Gates infantry will not let up so easily and continue the fight. A commander with an X-shaped scar on his forehead leads the charge for the eight gate troops to build morale and gets his men to follow him. This is the band of guerrillas that has the goal of disrupting the Zerg forces chain of command. Chris sees his target and moves his own squad to intercept. The elite enemy squad is making quick work of the Zerg foot soldiers and the Zerg commander signals for their own squad led by Chris to move out. The man with the scar laughs at this thinking that Zerkian soldiers cannot match his own Faultus warriors. The eight gate soldiers are now building momentum and the Faultus soldiers that have only 50 men are cutting through Zerk infantrymen. Chris is approaching at their location and engages at their rear. The Faultus commander is now in a tough spot since their rear is being attacked heavily but he advises to keep advancing. Doki slices the neck of one and Chris, Lind and Digo take care of their respected enemies. The cocky general thinks that his men should have taken care of these pathetic Zerks by now but turns 
turns to see a horrific sight. Only a handful of his men remain. Chris removes his spear from one of the corpses with a bloodied face, locks eyes with the man. Before they can fight, his subordinate signals the call for retreat, and he's left in shock at the situation. How could his mighty soldiers be eliminated by a group of kids? The tide of battle is turning back to the Zerk's favor, and the men are noticing that the enemy is letting off the attack and beginning to retreat, signaling their victory. Chris takes this moment to uplift the morale of the troop, and with a yell, he introduces himself as Chris, the one who's defeated the White Demon, the slayer of the Wolf Knight, and the leader of the squad who slaughtered the Faultist soldiers. Get up, my comrades. We've achieved our goal. Who will be victorious in battle? Who will fight along their savior, Chris? All the men shout and raise their weapons in the air, and as the battle continues, Chris sidestep a spear thrust. As he sidesteps it, he now thinks that he can predict enemy movements and his reaction time has improved. He can see all of their movements. He stabs a soldier through the chest, but another slash almost gives Chris a haircut, which makes him leave his spear in the soldier's body. He quickly pulls a knife and throws it with intense speed right between the eyes of the second soldier. A third soldier descends on the now helpless Chris, but another Zerk soldier removes the arm of the enemy soldier and cuts him down. This is Markson from the 5th Infantry and he tells Chris he'll accompany him from here on out. Now, we hear shouts from all the surrounding squads letting Chris know that he's not alone. I mean, what a sick scene, I'm getting goosebumps from this kind of stuff. Chris orders the men to charge with him and resumes his onslaught. Chris notes how his soldiers morale is high and this is the perfect opportunity to crush the Eight Gates army. He yells to his soldiers that victory is secured and to keep pushing forward. The bloody Digo looks towards Chris. The battle is over. The once mighty Eight Gate army, 3,000 strong, is broken and defeated, only their dead left behind. We are victorious! The men scream at the top of their lungs as their primal instincts take over. Chris is relieved they won, but starts feeling the after effects of the battle and begins to lose his footing. Gien catches him, but like, bro, where the hell were you at this whole time? I wanted to see him put some work in, Any anyway. He thanks Chris for his amazing job, and now, at the Eight Gate's enemy headquarters, the remaining Faltus warriors enter the tent. The man unknowingly assumed that they have been victorious and smiles towards the disappointed commander. The man kneels and apologizes for his short-sightedness. Only 12 Faltus soldiers remain. The man in the tent is shocked at this turn of events, and the Faltus commander's eyes widen with rage and fear. It's all because of him, the blue-haired boy. If it wasn't for him. The scene shifts back to Chris waking up from his long-winded battle. Markson is by his side and thankful that Chris is finally awake. Chris inquires on the state of the war and is informed that the eight gate forces have retreated and it's been a great victory. Chris is pleasantly surprised by Pumpkey, who is probably probably missed him after all this time, but there's no time to sleep around. Chris has business to attend to. He mounts his horse alongside Markson, and they arrive at their location. Chris sees a flag with a fortress emblem, and this means something of great importance. This signals the presence of Baron Van Ludwig. This is the award ceremony. The ceremony begins with the promotions of Lind, Markson, Ralph, and Diego, each receiving the position of Centurion, along with 5,000 silver coins. Damn, our boy's finally getting what they deserve, huh? Next, Kennery is called to the stand and prays for his feats of disrupting enemy lines and attacking supply carriages. He regains his title of knight, and this basically goes all with what Chris planned the entire time. Some of the men in the army disagree with this, since once a man dishonors himself as a knight, in some eyes, they are not worthy to have the title again. This is our man Kennery, he was chopping people up, if he's not a knight, I, I don't know who is. But instead of accepting his promotion, he asks for gold instead, which shocks all the onlookers, especially Chris. Kennery apologizes for his harsh words, but the Baron awards him 5,000 gold coins instead. I mean, at least he's balling now. And now the moment we've been waiting for. Centurion Chris is called to the stand for scouting enemy supply routes and abducting enemy supplies, curing the white demon, for uniting the Zerkian soldiers in the midst of battle and leading them to victory. He's awarded a medal of merit. All the surrounding soldiers cheer at their hero and savior Chris, and the Duke thanks Chris for his excellent results. He humbly accepts and returns the thanks, and the Duke stares at Chris with cold blue eyes. Don't you by accident want to climb even higher? Chris thinks the Baron is perceptive, but pretends not to be shocked. Tell me what you desire, Chris. The Baron says. Chris's eyes widen and he smiles. This is a chance he's been waiting two lives to receive. He didn't come all this way to lead only 100 men. He won't waste this opportunity to etch his name in history. Chris says confidently to allow the Duke to let him become a knight. We see a lot of conflicting expressions on all the surrounding soldiers because no one could have expected this. Even the third Oda starts cursing at the little brat. But Guillen just smiles at his longtime friend. The soldiers erupt with cheers. Chris the Knight, Chris the Knight, they chant. The Baron thinks that this was Chris's goal all along. Not bad for a young lad. 
and by the Baron's power, he promotes Chris from the 7th Infantry to the position of Knight, and the soldiers continue the chant. Chris looks over and is signaled by Guillen to meet him when he is done. The scene shifts to this conversation and Guillen congratulates Chris on the promotion. Surely Guillen didn't call him here just for that, right? They stop the pleasantries and Guillen tells Chris that when he returns, he should seek the group named Centuria. The matter is not urgent and Guillen tells him to take his time and then departs. And back at the 7th Infantry camp, the soldiers are celebrating the achievements of Chris as he sits beside Kennery and asks him why he rejected his knighthood. Kennery ignores these words and gives him a blank stare and says no matter how much he looks at Chris, he can only see him as an ordinary soldier. Chris is a little confused, but he asks Kennery his relationship with the Baron's illegitimate son and even asks the man if he's a little drunk. Kennery said he vowed never to drink again. Kennery also asks Chris if he means to ally with Graf Gien. What are you gonna do next? Chris looks up to the sky and not even he knows, but if one day he calls for Kennery, Will he come? Kennery lets off the soft smile and replies, Anytime, Chris. And this is the end of our boy's journey with the 7th Infantry, and man, there was a lot of ups and downs, but this is one of my favorite parts of the story, personally. But it's time for bigger and better things. Now our boys arrive in Daybed City, and Lind, farm boy at heart, is in awe of the sprawling commotion. The soldiers laugh at someone being so amazed by a simple city. Chris tells Lind to stop letting everyone know that he's a hillbilly, and ironically, Lind is being lectured by someone who lived down the street. Chris arrives at his room and lays down after a long journey, and after Chris's nap, he exits his quarters and Digo comes up to him with an important question. Chris says that he'll go with him after he's completed some tasks, and he needs to visit a certain place. Being a knight apprentice gives Chris a lot of freedom, and actually, a little side note, Chris wasn't promoted to knight right away, he became a knight apprentice first. And I guess that makes sense because, you know, he's only fucking 15, but impressive nonetheless. But being a knight apprentice allows Chris to maneuver the city. He arrives at his destination after about a five minute walk, and he walks into the small potion shop. He inhales the smell of herbs and gets right to the point. He asks a salesman if he has a herb called Whitefinger, and man, this thing looks disgusting. Chris says that the importance of this herb has not yet been discovered, and in about 15 years, people will recognize it as a core ingredient for improving one's body. Chris offers a deal for one year, he will pay one copper coin for one white root finger. The man does not think that that's enough, and Chris sweet the deal, saying how after the first month, he'll double the price. The man is still not interested, but Chris is not fucking around. What about five copper coins? This changed the man's tune and he shakes his hand, but the lady on the second floor says they'll agree on four copper coins, saying how it's important to build trust in a long-term relationship. The man reluctantly agrees and Chris has a deal. Chris pays the man in advance and now we see the scene shift to nighttime. The moon is shining and Chris is seen walking with Digo in a nearby forest. Digo asks Chris what his real goal is. He answers vaguely saying how he wants to go to the barracks and get some sleep, but Digo tells him to stop joking around. What are you really trying to achieve? Achieve, Chris. Chris looks into the distance and tells him, The top, Digo. You mean a noble? No, even higher than that. I am an unknown and pitiful man, but I always wanted to be a part of something great. Digo starts to kneel and Chris is a little curious on why he's doing so, but Digo swears an oath to Chris saying how he's met the man he wants to follow and will serve Chris until his dying breath. Chris is taken aback by this proclamation and he accepts and appoints Digo as his first knight. The next day comes and Chris is analyzing the city's military structure. He notes that the camp is actually pretty big and the organization is much better than the 7th Infantry. Even cavalrymen are training here. Digo was even accepted into this unit and man, I, I love to see the boys moving up in life. The place Chris is most interested in, however, is the drug depot in the barracks. Chris doesn't need to labor around and collect herbs. But knight apprentices are not allowed to use the drug depot, so he's gonna need to get permission first. The chief of the camp, Streak, introduces himself to Chris as he's browsing around. Chris returns the formalities and Streak asks him to follow. They sit down in his office and gets right to business. This camp has no room for slackers. Doesn't matter who Chris is or if he's a war hero. And even assumes that Chris is the Baron's illegitimate son. Chris wonders who's spreading this misinformation, but Streak continues and informs him that his position allows him to leave the camp by finding a knight to follow. But if he wants to stay here, he needs to prove himself. Chris, with a determined look, says, give me a hundred cavalrymen and I can show you what I'll do. The guy puts his hand on his face and wonders why this teenage boy asked for a hundred elite cavalrymen. The man slams his hand on the table, saying he'll never trust the lives of a hundred men to an arrogant brat like Chris. There are rules in this camp. Prove yourself in a duel, then we can talk. 
Chris keeps his cool and understands. He gets cocky and says to allow him to fight three enemies at once. That should suffice. This further enrages Streak. How can this boy fight three soldiers alone? A single opponent is enough. We meet at the dueling grounds at noon. Chris accepts and some time pass and Lind even hears about the situation and is concerned on how Chris is handling it. But once he wins, everything should be fine. Chris is facing Paler and he's known for his strength around these parts and has never lost a duel. Chris says that this might be true, but the man doesn't have real battle experience. Lind further says that Paylor won 10 duels in a row and has garnered the nickname Paylor the Undefeated. Chris is unfazed and confident in his abilities as he swings his spear. He gets a notification that his spear mastery has increased to 32. Chris isn't even worried about the duel but is worried about leveling his XP. Once he hits a wall like this, it's hard to gain levels through physical training. The two kids see winter snow, and now we're taken to the duel between Chris and Paler. Paler says he won't go easy on the boy, but this is what Chris wanted. The surrounding soldiers start betting on the outcome, and Paler is the heavy favorite. They're underestimating our boy for sure. Only Linda Digo know the true skill of Chris, and Chris begins to take note of Paler and comes to understand that he has a similar build to Digo. Let's see if he can match up. But before the match starts, Chris looks at the ground and notices that the snow has melted and the training grounds are covered with a thin layer of ice. Shriek calls for the start of the duel and Paler wastes no time and charges right at Chris. He thrusts and slash, but Chris dodges and blocks the attacks. The two lock eyes and begin to exchange blows and Paler wonders how long Chris can last just defending. Chris only thinks this guy is talking too much and Paler notices something wrong with Chris's sword and sees an opening. But before he can get that opportunity to capitalize, Chris shuts down the attempt. Paler is shocked at the boy's sheer speed and they distance themselves. Paler charges in with another thrust, but this was a bait by Chris. He made him come in and the slippery footing made it easy for Chris to exploit his movements. Paler slips and Chris pounced on him spear in hand. Chris knocks the sword out of Paler's hand in midair and the helpless man falls to the floor, but is greeted with Chris's spearhead as he tries to get up. Chris is the winner of the duel and he gives Paler a lesson saying how in battles there are numerous variables. Chris confidently walks past Screet and tells him that if now, he can use the drug depot. Screet is mad about the money he just lost, but agrees that this was their deal. Digo and Lin nod with approval at their commander's success, and now we see Chris in the drug depot and finds many useful herbs that the soldier that was in charge of inventory tells him that they were just about to throw all of those out. No, 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 this won't do. From now on, bring Chris all of these herbs. We now see him in front of a steaming bath as he praises that the Baron does not cut any corners. He adds a combination of white finger and other herbs to the water. Even Chris's past teacher was unaware of this concoction. Bathing in this water will turn an ordinary person into a vessel for accumulating inner energy. The process will take at least a year, but it's good to start now. Chris submerges himself in water and reflects on his duel with Paler. He's disappointed that he still needs these underhanded strategies and is too weak. It's no time to fool around. Chris needs to find his teacher. We're now introduced to the chakra, the key, the cursed energy, whatever the hell you want to call it of this story. So in this, it's going to be called Wise, and it's the mysterious energy that separates ordinary soldiers from the elite. It's almost like comparing a tiger to a rabbit. However, there was an instance of a rabbit being able to kill a tiger. Chris's old master, Tai Kiel, even taught a one-handed cripple like him martial arts. Chris is stressed, however, because where on earth is he going to meet him again? It's been over a month, and there isn't a single trace of his old teacher. He did remember that he met him in daybed before, but he struggles to search his memory for more clues. Chris curses himself for not having all the details, but how is he supposed to know he was going to go into the past? Chris then has a revelation. That's right, Taikyo had a daughter. Later that night at the Crossroads Inn, we see Chris sitting down with the boys sharing a drink. Doki, with a pretty blank face, says his like second line of the whole story so far and just says how beer doesn't taste good. Even Chris chimes in and congratulates him for speaking in a full sentence and that kind of cracks me up a little bit. I guess Doki didn't know the language and Lind has been teaching him for a little bit. Chris takes a sip and ponders on viable candidates for his master's daughter. Chris begins eyeing up the waitress as she takes their order for another four portions and he remembers that his master's daughter is supposed to have magnificent eyes and the chances of this waitress being Ellis is quite low. A drunk Doki says his second line for the entire chapter and I'm all here for it. Chris notes that the waitress's build and stride is similar to Digo and thinks that it's a pity that such a beauty is in a place like this. The waitress scolds Doki telling him how if he complains again he can leave. And Chris says that this short temper is another reason that he believes that she cannot be Ellis. The door swings open and Chris looks to see who it is, and just like his motherfucking plot armor, his former teacher walks into the bar. Well, this wasn't much of a problem, was it? The lady at the desk asks Taikyo what he needs, and he says he wants some food and a room for the night. It turns out that this waitress was in fact Ellis, and immediately, one drunk man tries to smash. 
but Ellis has a fiery temper and quickly rejects the poor guy. The man didn't take this lightly, however, and grabs her by the collar, saying how she doesn't even have a husband. Who is she to reject him? The situation escalates, and Chris stands from his seat, and the drunk man continues to ramble on. But now, an enraged father grips the back of this guy's head and slams him into the ground. If you're gonna put your hands on a girl, you might get a concussion. Taikil says a pretty smooth one-liner there, and I guess don't put your hands on women, because you might die. I don't know about concussion. Concussion. He, he hit him pretty hard. He begins to yell at the man that if he does something like this again, he will regret it. Chris is shocked because the Taikyo he knows never showed emotion like this. Don't mess with the proud father, I guess. Ellie grabs his coat and tells him to stop, causing a commotion. And Chris finally gets to this realization that the waitress is indeed Ellis. The two men stand up and Chris calls for Digo, who towers over the soldiers blocking their path. Ellis now scolds Digo for trying to help her. Question mark. She needs to get her priorities in check. He's trying to help you, woman. Chris approaches and tells Taikil not to pull his weapon from his coat, and he asks Chris if he wants to fight too, and he's ready to tear him apart. But Chris slowly defuses the situation, and he introduces himself as a knight apprentice. The soldiers immediately recognize him, and they realize that Centurion Digo was the one in front of them. They quickly apologize for their wrongdoings, and Chris lets Taikil know about the strict rules in Daybed, and if anyone dies in this bar, Ellis will be held responsible as the owner of this inn. Taikil realizes he took it too far, and finally, Ellis warms up to him and thanks him for doing that. Takio takes his leave and Ellis is confused on how he caused such a ruckus and left. Chris says that the man will return and Ellis wonders what his connection is to him. Another baddie comes up to Chris, but this savage doesn't even look at her. Apparently, this is the fourth time someone tried to hook up with him. Bro, what? Like, I was not getting girls like this at 15. I don't, I don't even get girls like that now. Fuck Chris. Ellis notes that Chris is quite popular, but Chris quickly declines the girl and asks for how much the price is to stay here for the night. Ellis responds that the price is three copper coins and the gold digger chimes in that a man like Chris doesn't need to sleep in this place, which annoys Ellis. She asks who this bitch is, that's her words, not mine, and she's introduced as Sir Zarin's third daughter. The drunk boys have no idea who Zarin is and make fun of her for not even being a noble. Chris sighs with his hand to his forehead and, and even Doki chimes in, me angry. I love this guy, man. Chris calms his friends down, like what are you guys alcoholics? How much did you drink? That's enough. The next day comes and Chris sits and looks towards Taikil, notes how he's a regular guest here. He caused some problems before, but now he seems pretty quiet. Chris needs to progress things, however, and asks a leading question to Ellis. By the way, don't you miss your dad? She says that she does, but it doesn't matter how she feels. If he wanted to see her, then he would have came. Chris adds that, don't you think he's looking for you secretly? But Ellis quickly knocks it down, saying that her father isn't the type of person to pee from far away, and he would have found her already if he was looking. Chris just thinks if that's the case, and smiles as he gets up and asks to have a cup of tea with Taikil. Chris thinks that Taikil isn't really talkative and starts the conversation by asking if he came from Central Shed. He agrees and asks how he knew, but Chris just responds saying that he's seen many nobles tying waist straps the same way he does, and they all come from Central Shed. Chris inquires on what made him come all the way up here, and Taikil just says that this is his hometown. Any family? Chris asks, and this is quite a shocking question to Taikil as he's startled by it. Chris begins reading the man saying how his eyes are filled for concern at the waitress, and you care for her as you look at her. For lovers, there's too big of an age difference. Could Ellis perhaps be your daughter? Taikil is shocked at this acute observation, but we all know Chris is fucking cheating right now, so this isn't fair. Chris calls to Ellis and Taikil has a nervous sweat. He offers a seat and says this man has something to tell you. Chris exits the room and Ellis is confused with the situation. We see a next shot as Chris watches outside the door at a loud scream from Ellis. What? It's a big realization there, but you know, Chris just helped speed things up. Chris looks intently at Taikil and asks him to teach him the art of wielding weapons. Chris says he's a knight apprentice, but still doesn't have a teacher. Taikil asks further on what he means, and he said that Baron Ved Lugwood promoted him to the position of knight apprentice, but didn't appoint a knight for him to follow. Chris rejects ordinary knights, and he wants to learn from Taikil. He doesn't want to have the regular skills of an intermediate knight. He wants to master the powers of wise, so he can rule the entire continent. Taikil thinks this isn't too big of a deal, since he does owe Chris one for speeding up the process of meeting his daughter again. But before he agrees, he asks Chris how how he found information on him. Chris thinks that if he avoids answering this question, it's going to lead to suspicion, but comes up with the on-the-fly answer saying if Taikil heard about Baron Van Lugwood's illegitimate son. Taikil assumes that the two are connected, and he said through him he learned that there was rumors of a retired knight from the Royal Guard coming to Daybed. Chris couldn't miss this opportunity to be taught by a former member of the Royal Guard, and he could have never imagined that Ellis 
was his daughter and Atlas is like a sister to him and man he, he's really milking this look at his face man he, he's lying through his teeth right now Taikil tells Chris that maybe this is what they call fate as he takes another sip from his tea but informs him that he's never had an apprentice and asks Chris to spar the scene shifts to an open field as Chris readies himself for the spar and Taikil admires the boy's fighting spirit Taikil signals for the start of the spar and readies his foot to push off the ground he tells Chris that it's time to dance and he lunges towards the boy with incredible speed as soon as as Chris tries to swing at him to stop his attack, he immediately dodges and goes into his blind spot. Chris is shocked at the speed as he turns around, but receives a heavy blow that he barely manages to block, and the impact can be seen going through his back. Chris is sent flying back a couple meters as he regains his footing, and wonders how hard Taikyo can hit with just a wooden stick. Taikyo wonders if all the boy has is self-confidence, but Chris can only think that it's incredible that it's so hard to just avoid his attacks. Then Taikyo charges in again and lets off three simultaneous strikes of his spear at Chris, which catches him off guard. Three jabs at once? Chris doesn't know how to react and can only block two of the strikes with the remaining one hitting him right in the chest. Chris eats the blow but says now it's time to unveil some of his tricks. He returns and lunges at Taikil, showing off some of his own talent by recreating the move that was just used on him. Taikil is shocked that the boy actually just copied him. Chris says that, you know, you saw for your own eyes, didn't you? Taikil can only think what potential this young boy has and is truly interested in him now. But the scene fast forwards to Chris being forced to yield with Taikil's spear at his face. Chris wants to go again, but Taikil smiles and lifts him from the ground. Do you really want to learn from me? He asks. Chris says that this was exactly what he wanted from the very beginning, and he wants to be taught by Taikil. Taikil reminds him that he's too weak right now and to come meet him in three days. Chris lays back on the dirt, reflecting on the situation, thinking how tough this training is going to be. And he had 12 chances to hit Taikil, but failed to even graze his collar. What was the reason? Chris mentioned that he defeated high level 8 gate soldiers on the battlefield, and there it's considered to be well trained. Did he not take this spar seriously? No, that can't be. He tried his absolute best today. Maybe he was overestimating himself. Perhaps this is the true difference between a regular soldier and a wise knight. And now we see Chris conversing with Scree, and he tells him that since he's Baron Van Ludwig's apprentice, he cannot let anyone beat him. And if he doesn't have a knight to follow, he can always come to him. Scree, I love the enthusiasm, bro, but I think you're a little weak compared to Taikyo, if I'm gonna be honest. Chris tells him not to worry and that it was just a simple spar, but his face says otherwise. He tells Screet that he's just a little exhausted right now and he wants to get some sleep. Scree can only wonder who on earth beat Chris to such a point. Nighttime comes and Ellis is sitting next to Taikyo and tells him that it's a bit uncomfortable to call him dad, so she'll just call him by his first name. Taikyo tells her to do as she wishes and they continue their conversation. Ellis asks why he left their stepmother and her. Taikyo sighs and says that he didn't know it was going to turn out like that. He was moving up the military ladder but was starting to feel ashamed of what he was becoming and how he spent 20 years of his life running away. He never really wanted to live a life like that. Ellis then asks him what happened to her birth mother but Taikyo has a very dark look in his face we don't actually see what he says but we see the reaction of Ellis who has a tear in her eye some time passes and Taikyo apologizes but Ellis grabs his hand in this very touching father and daughter moment and tells him that it's fine as she wipes away her tears Ellis changes the subject and asks Taikyo what is he doing with Chris now Taikyo responds saying what about Chris but Ellis is not stupid and knows that Chris has asked him something. Taikyo says that he asked him to teach him to master weapons, and Ellis excitedly gets closer to her father and asks him to teach her as well. Taikyo feels a little confused, but Ellis continues saying that she always wanted to be a knight since she was a child. Ellis' stepmother never liked her fighting, but still, this is a dream that she wanted to pursue. Her talents are wasted in this inn since she's not that good of a cook and she hates all the housework that she's forced to do. Taikyo agrees, and now we see Ellis training with Chris. Chris is given some hand weights and asks if he's really meant to train with these on. Taikyo tells him that his body is still way too weak to wield the weapon, so first he needs to improve his stamina. Chris wonders why Ellis isn't wearing the same bracers, and she just gives him a sly look saying that's because she's his daughter after all, as the two begin to start their run. Pumpkin now joins the two on their run, and Ellis asks if the good wolf likes running with them. She asks Chris where he found this absolute treasure, and Chris just tells her to stop talking and keep running. Now we see Chris doing squats and pull-ups with the weights still on. Chris thinks that in his past life, the training was not this rigorous. Was Taikyo going easy on him since he was crippled? He loses his strength on the pull-up bar and slams to the floor. It's hard, isn't it? Taikyo remarks. 
Chris wonders if this training is even necessary, and he wants to master the skills that he needs to be a knight. Taekil reminds him that he'll never improve without the basics, and he can't master these so-called skills until he gets the stamina that he needs, including building his muscle mass. Taekil tells him to come back in a week, eating and resting well is also a part of his training. Chris finally gets a chance to relax as he soaks himself in his herbal bath and he thinks that he has to endure this training. The scene shifts back in three days and Chris returns with kind of a smug look on his face. Taekil is a little shocked that he came back so early and he thinks his recovery speed is incredible for having such a weak body. Chris just tells him that he knows how to use some medicinal herbs. Ellis is seen running and wonders if she became slower. But Taekil tells her that she didn't get slower, it's just that Chris got a lot faster. Chris gets a prompt from the system saying that his experience has increased. He pulls up his artifact screen and jumps for joy that finally he got some levels from physical training. And now, the next panel, we see a shot of Chris looking absolutely jacked reading a book. Lind enters the tent and asks Chris what he's been up to these days. Chris thinks that it would be very beneficial to have the three boys train with him, but currently they're under Streak's command. Lind leaves his book and lays down on the bed, and Chris asks him if he really plans on spending all his money on books. Lin tells him that this is the only source of entertainment he has for now, and the last time he participated in the last strategy meeting, the superiors told him that a kid shouldn't meddle in military affairs. It almost feels like the three boys aren't even centurions at all. He wants to ask Chris something. If it continues like this, will it be alright? Because right now, the three boys are not capable as anything as soldiers. Chris thinks that this is exactly how he felt in his previous life, and how can he help train the three boys? Chris closes his eyes and knows what he's certain about. If you want to change something, you have to climb higher. Lin says that the only way he knows is to stay alive on the battlefield. He was just feeling a little down and wanted to complain to Chris for a little bit, and tells him that Commander Streak was looking for him. Chris wonders why he didn't start with this information, since technically, Chris is his superior. Lin just laughs it off saying that he'll start working hard from now on, Sir Knight Apprentice. Chris thinks that the boy is just a lousy messenger, and he enters Streak's tent and asks if he was looking for him. Streak sits down and gets right to the point and asks Chris to stop utilizing the drug depot. Chris is shocked at this request and Shriek tells him that the amount of herbs that he used has exceeded the yearly amount and he's had to pay for them out of his own pocket. And last night he was caught by his wife and we see the proof on his face with a very distinct slap mark. This is a little taken aback and Streak asks him to please understand his situation. Chris thinks if he can use this situation correctly, he still may be able to salvage the herbs. He slams his hand on the table and begs for Streak's forgiveness. He'll take responsibility for what happened, but it might sound weird, but please make Chris in charge of the drug depot. He'll solve all the financial problems in two months. Streak wonders how confident the boy is, and Chris tells him to just give him three soldiers under his command. This was a good plan as we see the three boys approaching Chris, and he tells him that this is the start of their official training. Chris tells Taekil, you know, since you need money to buy flowers for Ellis, maybe you can train my three friends as well. He laughs and agrees and says that he'll take in any students as long as they can endure his trainings. Chris leaves the three in his care and then moves on to finally figure out the financial struggles of the drug depot. We see him in casual clothes and he's thinking about how he can solve this issue. Even if the four of them were to collect herbs non-stop, they still wouldn't make it in time for two months. Taking into consideration that they have to endure all that training, it will really make it impossible. Chris walks into a pretty shady alleyway and sees two thugs and thinks to himself that it might be better to utilize the city's underground. The two thugs ask who the hell Chris thinks he is, and he introduces himself as a knight apprentice. He tells him that he's here to see their leader. But they just get into his face saying how they're gonna be nice right now if he goes and walks away. Chris scoffs at the two morons saying how you're in control of this district but you don't know who I am? How do you even survive with such poor management? This gets its intended effect as one of the thugs winds his fist back to punch Chris. It's easily dodged and Chris thinks it's been quite a while since he's last been in a fight. He gives a mean right hook to one of the thugs face that just sends him flying with teeth coming out of his mouth. Chris is pleasantly surprised by the power that he unleashed in just one punch. The second thug actually has a brain on his shoulders, seeing his friend get knocked the hell out and decides to take Chris to his base. He tells him give him a second and he'll go talk to the boss, but Chris doesn't have that kind of time and just kicks the door open. He immediately says how it smells horrible in here, and then asks if this is Murdoch the hunting dog, the leader of these thugs. Do you ever clean this place up? Chris says, and Murdoch asks him to name himself, and Chris yet again tells him that he's Knight Apprentice Chris and he's come here to bargain. Murdoch obviously didn't see what happened outside and tells his aide to attack Chris. Chris gets his hands up and thinks that it's a good time for a scrap. 
These bozos charge in Icarus with various weapons, but he makes light work of the first man and bends downward to dodge an incoming kick. He sends a punch over his shoulder, knocking out the second Moron, and bozo number three sweats a little, but still tries to strike back at Chris, but is instead greeted with a nice head kick. Thug number four tries to swing a wood object, but Chris breaks it with his hand, which makes the man quite confused, but the strike unveiled Chris's armor that he had covered under his clothes. The guy is sent into next week and Murdoch is wondering what these idiots are doing. They can't even deal with a single kid. Murdoch apparently didn't get the memo and tries to punk Chris again, but misses. Chris uses his face as a stepping stone to launch to the air, and the man is now seen with a footprint on his face, and turns to see where Chris is going, but sees a shin flying to his face, which too, knocks him unconscious. Some time passes, and Chris tells Murdoch to wake the hell up, and now we see all the other henchmen with their hands in the air, completely surrendered to Chris. Chris asks what kind of leader he is to wake up last, but Chris has a job for Murdoch. Collect some herds for me, it's not too bad, and if he does, will be paid handsomely. Chris returns to training camp and now that he's dealt with the herb issue, we see the three boys running in despair. They yell for Chris wondering if he's trying to get them killed. They can't take this anymore. Tykeel's the devil. Chris tells the boy that they did good today and he has somewhere to take them. He puts the three boys in the same herbal bath that he uses and says that all these herbs cost him his monthly salary. Ouch. Chris thanks the lady who changes the water in the bath noting how hard it must be to change the water. He prepared a small gift for her, a potion, pure dream. If you apply it to your skin every day before bed, her skin will get clean and gentle. She's shocked and wonder how much this will cost her and Chris replies saying that a single bottle costs 30 silver coins, which further shocks the lady who wonders how a small potion could be worth so much and if it's really okay if she can use it. Chris says it's okay but in exchange asks the maid to spread rumors of the potion among the noble servants and every month he'll give her a bottle for free. Man, Chris is a businessman through and through. His plan is to use the money from selling the potions to provide a salary for Murdoch which in turn creates a loop that pays for all the herbs he needs to collect and therefore he'll be able to focus on training. The scene shifts and we see Chris laying in bed wondering if she should just be a merchant instead. A mysterious blue cloud enters the room and Pumpkin barks to alert Chris. Before before he can understand the situation, strange fumes get to him, causing Chris to become dizzy. He needs to work fast and take the antidotes just in case he was poisoned. This smells like sleeping powder which is made of marine blue. The smell is too sharp. It was not created by a herbalist and is probably from those incompetent bandits. Two masked figures try to calm down Pumpkin, and Chris wonders how these men got into the camp. They turn to see Chris and throw a knife in his direction. They must have known where Chris's tent was. This had to be planned beforehand. Chris charges at one bandit with great speed and hits him with a devastating punch. The man is groaning and his comrade asks if he's okay and Chris asks the two if they are insolent enough to attack a knight apprentice inside a military camp. Leave here immediately. The two start to run and Chris asks Pumpkin to lead the way. The two bandits are running back confused on how Chris was still awake. That much sleeping powder should have kept him down for two days. Before they can finish the thought, Chris appears behind them with Pumpkin. The sweat is visible on the bandit's face and they are confused on how they followed him all the way here. Chris clenches his fist and asks to bring their leader to him now. The two men are frozen in fear but Chris just stands there firm with his arms crossed, asking these two morons what they are doing. Time is money you know. Bring their leader here now. The two are still confused on what to do but another red haired man approaches asking what is going on. The two bandits turn to him but he strikes one of them down for their failure which shocks Chris. This man turns to Chris and apologizes if his subordinates cause him trouble. It was nothing personal. Chris asks why he was targeted and he tells him that the reason is the recipe for pure dream and if he answers his question he can leave now. Bro, he's not gonna leave after you try to assassinate him. Chris assumes that the criminal ringleader is the illegitimate son and the man turns around again interested in what Chris just said. And the soldiers who attack Chris are part of Backdagger. So this is the so-called Backdagger guild. But as soon as those words left his mouth, in an instant he was surrounded by many cloaked figures. The man asks Chris what he wants and he responds asking for their leader. The man says that he is responsible for the Backdagger but Chris can't trust this information. But there's only one way to find out. Chris throws a pouch of money towards the man and asks him to make a bet. He tells the man that there's 50 gold coins in that bag and he wants Backdagger to come under Chris's command. One of the hooded figures asks if he's crazy, but the leader has a serious look and inquires on the condition of the bet. Chris tells him that they will duel with a single dagger and the leader smiles. The two lock eyes and begin the duel. They circle around the arena and Chris notices some holes dug in the ground. The leader has a wicked gaze and throws a dagger at Chris while he's off balance. But Chris catches the dagger and does a spin in midair and hits return to sender, launching the dagger with incredible speed. The dagger pierces the leg of the bandit leader and Chris gets another level up in his throwing skill. 
and he tells the man that that dagger wound must be quite painful. The leader is now infuriated and orders his men to kill Chris, and Chris tells Punky to stay close as the horde of assassins descend on the duo. A loud shout is heard, screaming at the men, enough! Chris is happy that the man behind the voice is finally here, and now we see the true leader is Gien? He greets Chris and invites him inside the tent. He orders the men that we previously thought was a leader to clean up this mess, which he agrees promptly. Chris compliments Gien's hideout and he responds saying how Chris sure took his time, seeing how they promised to meet up right after the battle. Chris said that he had a lot of matters to take care of, and Gien adds that he never told Chris his name, but it seems that he already knew. I mean, well, Chris is a goddamn cheater. He lies saying how it was about his connections. Isn't that right, a legitimate son? Gien questions if Chris is being taught by the Royal Guard, which I guess he's referring to Taikil. Chris nods saying how it's quite expensive, but Chris asks Gien how he found out about Pure Dream. Do you have some info on that? But Gien tells him that that was a request from a merchant called Zarin, and he has no connection to the attack. Anyways, good luck with managing Backdagger. What? Which catches Chris off guard too. You won the bet, didn't you? Are you not confident in yourself? Chris laughs this off, and the two walk outside. Gien informs the men that from this day forward, Chris is the guild master of Backdagger. Wait, for real? Just like that? Man, Chris, you're not even hiding your plot armor. Gien takes his leave, and the man from before introduces himself as Fox, and he is Backdagger's second in command. But his expression hints that he doesn't yet accept the 15 year old boy as their leader. Chris has his forced order for Fox and tells him to bring him the merchant Zarin here tomorrow evening. How the fuck did our boy just become the guild master for a bunch of assassins? This is getting crazy. The next day comes and we see Chris talking with Taikil on the training grounds, asking how his boys are doing. Taikil says Chris can see for himself, and in contrast for the first days of training, the three are now running with unmatched look of determination. Taikil tells Chris to come close and drops his staff. If you lose your weapon during a battle, what will you do? Chris answers saying how he'll just pick up another one. But Taikyo breaks the spear on the ground and tells him, what if you don't have the opportunity? Chris thinks and answers saying he'll use his body as a weapon, which makes Taikyo smile at the correct answer. And starting today, he'll teach him Taijutsu. Chris excitedly agrees and Taikyo is a little confused saying how people are usually disappointed in mastering Taijutsu. But Chris responds saying that he would be disappointed if he was placed in the same row as everyone else. Now, Chris thinks to himself that this situation is perfect. He has a flashback to when Lin told him that the period with no interventions will last for at least two years. And if the future changed, he managed to gain about a year or two. And in this time, Chris will get everything that he needs. We shift back to the back dagger camp and Fox is mixing some herbs, still wondering on how on earth Gien let Chris become their leader. And even wonders how Chris's bottle is worth 30 silver coins. They bring Zarin, chained up and blindfolded, and send him into the basement. They remove the bandages from his mouth and he yells to spare him and he'll do anything. Anything you say? The man begs for his life, just tell him what he needs to do. Fox tells him from now on, never mention Knight Apprentice Chris name anywhere. The man asks if there's anything else, and Chris appears walking down the stairs and asks how everything is going. He informs Chris that he promised to never mention his name again and if they should just let him go now. Chris thinks if they let him go now, there's going to be trouble later. Fox's men untie his arms, and as Zarin unties his blindfold, Chris tells the man to hold on. He tells Zarin that if he removes his blindfold, he will see his face, and then Chris will have to kill him. Is he okay with that? The man obviously isn't and starts sweating profusely and kneels towards the floor. Chris pulls up a chair and he begins to question Zarin. Was it his idea to assassinate Knight Apprentice Chris? Zarin stutters saying that it wasn't him and he was only ordered to get the recipe for Pure Dream. Chris orders his men to cut off Zarin's tongue which shocks everybody. But come on guys, you're an assassin guild. This should be like eating breakfast. The two men are prepared to cut off Zarin's tongue but he pleads saying that the order was given by him. He ordered the assassination of Chris. Chris now has this terrifying stare and orders his men to break one of his fingers. The man screams in agony, but at least he has his tongue. Chris reminds Zara to answer his next question very carefully. What name are you supposed to forget? Chris! Chris! Looks like one finger wasn't enough. Please give me another chance, Zarin cries out. This is your last chance, Zarin. Whose name are you supposed to forget? I don't know who you're talking about, Zarin answers. Good, you're not a merchant for nothing, Chris says. He leans in close and whispers into Zarin's ear. We are Backdagger, the shadow of Daybed. If you interfere with our blades, we will target your dear third daughter that you are so proud of. Chris leaves the man and orders to let him go, and he tells Fox to come with him. Chris hands Fox the recipe for Pure Dream and says he'll teach him when the time is right. Fox is confused on why Chris is giving him something this important, and Chris responds saying how he smells the scent of herbs from Fox, and he also has some powder under his fingernails. He further asks 
if the sleep drug was created by him. Chris plans to increase production of Pure Dream and it seems Backdagger has a herb specialist. Fox finally understands Gien wouldn't just pass his title to just anybody. Nighttime comes and uh, Zarin is depressed in bed. I mean, he did have a long day. His third daughter sings and comes into the room and wants to tell him about the perfect candidate she's found to marry. She's found a wonderful man at the end and she can't get him out of his head. Night Apprentice Chris is the one destined to be her husband after all. This made me laugh so hard. I mean, look at Zarin's reaction. Zarin starts to tear up and his daughter is confused at why he's responding like this. He just asks her to leave him alone. I mean, seriously, look, look at his finger. The next day comes and Chris is asked to come out of his tent. Night Apprentice McCoy introduces himself and says Chris is being called and to follow him. Chris asks who sent him, but the other boy just gets in his face, calling him a peasant and don't speak to him informally. Chris basically says, relax bro, we're the same rank, and the man steps off saying if it wasn't for his orders, he would have torn Chris apart. Sure buddy, sure you would. Chris follows and the boy leads him into a castle, and Chris continues to wonder on who called him. The boy tells Chris to go in and we see an assortment of delicious foods prepared on a long table. Chris steps inside and is greeted by the third Oda, who laughs saying, Chris, it's been a long time since they last spoke. He asks him to sit down, and this wine was delivered from Highgard. It's sweet and fades on the tongue. As both men have their glasses filled, Chris is a little freaked out by Weehane's weird outfit and asks the reason why he was summoned. Weehane sips from his glass and tells Chris not to rush. He invited him for some small talk. He continues to go on listing the many achievements of our protagonist and even commenting on how it's quite a long list. But after some time, Weehane realizes his stubbornness didn't let him see the whole picture. He gets to the point and asks Chris to come serve under him. If he wants to become a knight, you'll need to hear his wishes. If Chris carries on the family name, he will comfort him with tangled embraces. Embraces? What embraces, you weirdo? Chris thinks. Chris asks if Weehane plans to promote Chris and grant him their family name for free without asking for anything in return. Weehane starts doing a little feminine move on the tip of his wine glass and says Chris can return the generosity slowly, day by day. Chris thinks this sweet talk won't fool him, his attention is clear from his expressions. Chris appreciates the offer but wants to achieve these things because of his own abilities and thanks Weehane for the delicious meal. Weehane is now agitated and asks Chris if he will regret this decision. Chris tells him that he won't and he's long decided on the path that he'll take and decides to decline his offer. Weehane tells him to leave and behind closed doors the third Oda is seething with anger. Chris is disgusted seeing the man's expression like he was just rejected. And that would be too man, he wants to clap his cheeks, that's disgusting. The next day comes and Chris is called by Streak and is asked on what he's been up to lately. Streak orders Chris to go to Highgarden in two days and tells Chris that he's gotten to some real shit this time. Chris was asked to protect the third prince and Lind wonders why the troublemaker decided to come here. Chris responds saying that apparently he wants to express his gratitude to the soldiers from the last battle. Lin says that he heard a rumor saying that the prince was once stung by a bee and punished his knight guard by cutting off his arm. Lin and Chris look over the list of guards but they don't see Lin's name which makes the boy cheer in excitement. Fast forward and now we see Chris walking alone in the forest, noting how he has two days to prepare and find information. He assesses the situation and thinks that his mission won't be hard and maybe Weehane assigned him to this mission out of spite. Chris returns to the backdacker camp and is greeted by Fox and asks him what happened to his face. Chris scolds Fox and tells him that he should have brought the results of his experiment to him first. Fox thought he was confident in his calculations, but Chris changes the subject and asks Fox to look over the list and tell him if he sees anything suspicious. Fox browses over the list but sees nothing wrong. Chris further breaks it down and asks if there's anyone under Weehane's direct command, but Fox responds no. Chris is in thought that the third prince might be a troublemaker, but his guards are lacking in number. These aren't even knight level guards. This situation is weird. It's almost as if they want something to happen. Chris orders Fox to dismiss everyone from their tasks and send all of the units to high guard and daybed to look for suspicious travelers. Fox says with the flow of people, it would be impossible to check everyone, but Chris states a condition. Only search for talented people of an advanced level. He also asks for caltrops and several metal wires. Chris is now seen conversing with Ty Keel and he also agrees that this guard duty seems like a problem. He asks Chris if he committed a crime but he declines. Ty Keel wonders why he wanted to see him. Chris asks about what he should do if he encounters an enemy stronger than he is. Ty Keel says bluntly to just run away and if I can't, Taekyo asks Chris to get to the point, is there some kind of trump card? Taekyo responds that there is and Chris is dazzling with excitement, when Taekyo responds that his trump card is regular and intense training, combined with battle experience. Chris is disappointed and reminds Taekyo that Ellis wants an interesting dad, not a boring stuffy one. Taekyo asks Chris what Ellis has to do with this and hands him a spear. He'll teach him some useful tricks. Chris wonders why Taekyo has a spear as well and regrets commenting on his daughter. Taekyo says he'll understand during the spar and Chris reminds him that he cannot be injured before his mission, but Taekyo already knows that and just 
Chris says to just begin. We now see Chris sitting at the table and one of his men give a report from his mission to inspect talented individuals. He hands Chris a report from High Guard, saying that there's five skilled soldiers there and another four in Daybed. So a squad of around ten, huh? Not enough to carry out an abduction. There must be something else. Chris needs to make preparations, and we fast forward to the mission that Chris was dreading. And to make matters worse, we have the same dumbass knight apprentice from before, who is also looking annoyed to have to spend the day with Chris. He thinks that it's unfair that Chris has to lead them, but Chris just responds saying that he has to earn some achievement on the battlefield before he can talk. Chris orders his soldiers that it's time to depart for High Guard. The men are marching in two lines and complain about the hot weather. Chris notices something in the bushes and orders the squad to stop. Chris thinks he spotted a goblin. The annoyed knight apprentice from before thinks Chris is stupid, but from the bushes a swarm of goblins approaches. The men are shocked, but Chris calmly orders them to be ready to charge and exterminate the goblins. Surrounding them, they make quick work of the goblins, but wonder where they came from. The triangle is supposed to be a safe haven between the three major cities, and monsters are unlikely to attack within this territory. Chris is worried that this happened on the exact day of the escort squad. Chris orders his men to make a small stop, and Chris ventures into the woods and meets up with Pumpkey, who has blood all around his face. I guess he was busy hunting. I mean, he is a wolf after all. And Chris begins to set his traps and he returns to camp. McCoy asked him what he was doing for so long as the commander and Chris just lies saying that he was so nervous he had to take a shit. McCoy is disgusted but Chris informs everyone that it's time to move. Later in the day Chris orders his men to be alert since another group of goblins are there. They are easily dealt with but the group notices that at this rate they won't be able to arrive at High Guard before sunset. Chris orders the men to stop and rest for the night but McCoy has a problem with this. But how can Chris ask all these men who risk their lives to march all night as well? McCoy says that they'll be risking their lives if they arrive late for the prince. Chris continues to annoy McCoy saying how he seems to forget who's in charge here. Nighttime comes and the men are preparing to sleep and McCoy wonders why they all have sleeping bags. Chris can only think that this man is unaware of how the world works. He needs to be ready for anything. One of the soldiers offer their sleeping bag but McCoy declines and Chris jokingly tells him that he can share his. This infuriates him even more and he even promises to kill Chris one day. The next day comes and Chris orders the men to eat and get ready to march and they soon arrive at High Guard. The guards shake Chris's hand and inquire on why they were so late. Chris informs him that they were stopped by some groups of goblins, which shocks the guards. Goblins in the triangle? Chris notes that they weren't big in number and maybe they were just scared away from their caves. And asks when the prince will arrive. Speaking of the devil, a carriage with the prince arrives. Chris bows and introduces himself as the leader of the escort squad. The young prince tells Chris to raise his head and wonders what Chris is staring at. Does he want him to gouge his eyes out? That's not very nice of him to stay after the first meeting. Chris has a nervous sweat and assumes that the rumors are true. We are introduced to the third prince, Eric Serrato Gauche, and he tells Chris that he's heard rumors about him, but he seems that he's really nothing special. The mayor of Highguard greets Chris and tells him that they made all the preparations to depart immediately, and Chris thinks that this guy is talking to him like they're removing a bomb from the city. Chris reorders his men to move out, and their destination is daybed. Two of the soldiers start whispering, and one of them asks to resume the story the other was saying earlier. Before he can finish, however, the escort party is ambushed. Chris was expecting something like this and rushes to meet the enemy. He orders his men to hold their ground and the soldiers in the rear to protect the carriage, while the soldiers in the vanguard go to destroy the enemy. Chris is hacking and slashing down the enemy assassins, and one of the men he hit is in awe of the weight behind his spear, questioning if it's made of steel. There are more enemies than Chris anticipated, and even Sir Nelson, the prince's knight, is struggling. Two assassins lunge at Chris while he's thinking of a way to deal with the enemies, and the only thing for him to do is to go all out. We get a flashback of Chris's training with Taikyo, and he taught him a useful AoE ability that resembles a snake tongue, which we see Chris execute on the two assassins, cutting them up with ease. His spear looks like it's curving around his arm. We see a cry towards the prince, and one of the assassins has him with a blade to his neck. Chris turns and throws his spear into the chest of the man, freeing the prince, which leaves him speechless. Yeah, not so impressive, huh? But just then, another assassin approaches trying to kill the prince. Chris gets down into a position that resembles a track runner, and we get another flashback to Taikil teaching him another technique that will help him land a devastating hit from this horse stance. We see Chris gather energy into his pivot foot and launch, leaving the ground with incredible speed. He zips faster than the eye can see and quickly handles the assassin about to kill the prince. This skill is called dash, and we see the enemy assassin die upon impact. Chris continues his assault, dealing with the assassins one by one and he receives a cut to his arm, but his armor took the brunt of the blow. 
He smacks the assassin who hit him, and then Chris calls out for the prince's condition, but it doesn't look like he's having too much fun. Chris calls out to Nelson, informing him that he's going to take the prince and meet him at daybed. The assassins also hear this, but before they can pounce on the prince, Chris throws a smoke bomb and makes his escape. With the prince in Chris's arms, they make their getaway, and they meet Pumpkey, which startles the young lord. He notices that assassins are still on their trail, and Chris runs with Pumpkey by his side, passing the previous area where they fought the goblins. Chris throws another smoke bomb, baiting the assassins into the field of traps. One gets hit by the wires, which makes the others try to start cutting at them, but instead, they fall into the cow troughs. It halts their chase, giving Chris enough time to make some distance. The bandits begin to argue and send men to take their injured, and leave the rest to continue the chase. One of the pursuers says, what kind of dumbass brings cow troughs on a mission? But why are you even asking that? Of course our boy did. He loves setting up morons in his traps. But now, Chris is unfortunately out of tricks. But Pumpkey turns to his pursuers. They try to kill the wolf, but it gathers fire in its mouth and lets out a wide cone of flame that decimates the assassins. I told you Pumpkey was OP. Chris tells the prince to sit for a break, but the prince is quite anxious about his pursuers. Chris says they'll just wait until he can check his bleeding and the prince agrees. And Chris asks if he knows the way to daybed. Obviously he doesn't and he thinks he's going to need to keep Chris around for his own safety. He politely asks Chris to escort him to daybed, which Chris humbly accepts. But just like that, two more assassins arrive. It seems like the amount that Chris can handle. See, Chris is a simple man. If he doesn't see a chance of winning, he runs. He takes off all his armor covering his arms and the soldiers are confused on what this guy is doing. Chris continues saying how this is probably a bad idea to fight without a weapon, but he still has the feeling that he's going to win. This angers the two assassins who immediately take their stances and point their blades at Chris. They lunge at him, but one is immediately met with a powerful kick, sending him flying. The second assassin is stunned seeing his friend fly on airline Chris, and in that moment of hesitation, Chris gives him a powerful punch to the stomach. The two are injured, but still conscious, but it appears they underestimated Chris. They are baffled that he spent half a day running with the prince in hand, wearing armor, but still has the energy to keep up speed in combat. Just who is this kid, they think? They realize now that his title of hero isn't just for show. They are no match for Chris. He's a monster. The two men exchange glances and then dart away. Seeing the futility and throwing their lives away, the prince is excited and curses the fools who try to attack a member of the royal family. Chris knows the employer of these assassins must be someone powerful and keeps him on edge. Ideally, he wanted to capture one for some intel, but he cannot risk the prince's life. The prince compliments Chris and notes that he might even be better than his soldiers. Chris keeps the humble guys, but thinks of the man responsible, but only one comes to mind. The Duke rolled Gauche. Now we see the two men return to Rado Spen, that same Duke's knight, to inform him of their failure. He can't believe his assassins failed because of one knight apprentice. If you want something done right, you need to do it yourself. Rados calls for his weapons and mask and clenches his fist in regrets for underestimating Chris. He's gonna need to go all out. The forest is covered in darkness and Chris tells the prince that they should rest, instead of continuing on. The prince is anxious to get to a safe place and demands to know the reason. Chris explains that the enemy knew the time and place of his arrival. Isn't that weird? The prince doesn't follow. Then Chris continues. They launched their attack right when they left Highgard. No one knew you would arrive except for those who were in the royal family. He then asks the prince if he knows what would have happened if he stayed in Highgard. The prince then assumes that Van Ludwig is responsible, but Chris didn't mean to implicate him, because he's the one protecting these borders. Before Chris reveals who he thinks it is, he tells the prince that he has no evidence and this is just his personal assumption. The prince is getting impatient and tells Chris he won't punish the name of who Chris speaks. Chris smiles at the prince now caught on and continues his explanation. But the young lord is getting impatient and wants Chris just to get to the chase. Wehain Ludwig, the baron's oldest son. He knew about everything and was even the one who assigned Chris to escort him. The prince thought that Chris was assigned because of his skills, but the escort party was not sufficient enough to be assigned this mission from the start. The prince thinks Chris is kidding since did you see what he just did back there? He just killed like 10 dudes. He's more than acceptable for his role. He promises Chris that he won't pursue Weehain in any way just yet, and he asks Chris if they'll stay here for the night. Chris tells him that he told Nelson they will arrive at daybed in the evening to throw off the enemy. Not everybody sleeps in the woods, so it will prevent them from running into other travelers. Chris's monologue is interrupted by the growl of the prince's stomach, so first things first, Chris is going to need to get something to eat. Chris lends the prince his sleeping bag and they chill around the fire, and the prince thanks Chris for saving him. Chris just smiles saying how the prince is really a good guy after all. This is the first person to ever tell him something like that, and everyone else just shivers in fear. Chris tells them that they don't know what kind of person that he is, and the sympathetic nature that he has. The prince is flustered at what Chris said, but Pumpkey soon arrives. Chris pets his wolf companion and asks them where he learned that fire move, and not to do it again without his command. He barks in agreement, but Chris tells him to keep quiet since the prince is fast asleep. 
Chris leans in a tree watching over the sleeping prince and thinks that his throwing skill is at 49 points and something must happen at 50. Chris has been taking notes of his reaction when his throwing skill was at 40 compared to 30 and a flashback shows Tykeel smacking Chris on the head. Chris seems to be stuck on a topic that Tykeel is trying to teach him. It's hard to learn in one day, but if he can understand it, will he succeed? Tykeel agrees but tells Chris it's time to fight with swords. Chris protests because of his upcoming mission but Tykeel gets serious. Most knights die in vain. Are you that eager to meet your ancestors, Chris? If not, watch carefully. Intuition can save you from a stray blade. Your sword cannot. The opponent's breathing, the voice movements, the sound of their sword cutting through the air. Feel everything. And Tykeel swings on Chris, but he blocks it with his arm. Do not block. Dodge. You never know what kind of weapon you will be hit with again. Tykeel thinks to himself that the boy has talent despite his age and his amazing reflexes. His intuition is sharp and even thinks that he would have to die once to improve to this extent. Well bro, you're not that far off. Tykeel says that this is the last repetition and Chris closes his eyes and feels a blade slice his shoulder and dodges backwards. A sweat drips from his face. What was that? This is Salgi, or Killing Intent, one of the skills every true knight possesses. Killing Intent is the energy that shows one's determination to kill their opponent. Tykeel never even moved. How does it feel, Chris? Everyone interprets Salgi different. In Tykeel's case, he differentiates the enemy's breathing. Chris doesn't fully understand, but he feels a sword out of nowhere like he's being cut. You don't have to learn it right away. Comprehension comes with experience. Back to the present, Chris is immediately awoken by a wave of killing intent. You sense Salgi at your age, Rado says? Chris is worried on the strong energy that he's feeling, and his only weapon is a short sword, and he isn't confident that he can win. This guy even has wise. Rados, in a similar outfit to the previous assassin, stands ominously in front of Chris and Pumpkin. Chris orders the wolf to protect the prince and tells the two to run straight into the forest. The prince is confused since it's only one guy, so what's the big deal? But Chris screams, run now! This guy is not the same as the ones before. Hurry! The man yells at the prince saying if he tries to run, he's gonna cut his legs off, causing the boy to fall in fear. The situation is looking bleak. The baron must be involved for a soldier of wise to be sent to kill the prince. Chris staggers back. What do I do now, he thinks. Rados curses the boy for looking away during a fight and lunges at him, sword in hand, ready to kill him. But just then, out of nowhere, Guillen blocks the strike. This guy is the best timing, I swear. Rados is shocked at his arrival. So you get scared too, huh, Chris? Guillen says calmly. Guillen greets the prince and introduces himself as a soldier of Baron Van Ludwig. He apologizes for this tactless greeting, but he's gonna save them from this assassin. Fox, dressed as an ordinary soldier, looks towards Chris. But Guillen signals the two to stay back and protect the prince. Guillen hands Chris his scabbard and tells him not to lose it. It costs more than his life. He looks towards the assassin and notices that the two are quite alike and understand each other's power. They brace and charge in head first into one another. The clash of their swords creates great shockwaves around them. So many strikes and slashes at once, it's hard for an ordinary person's eyes to keep up. They are trying to count the amount of hits per second, but each one sets a powerful gust of wind past them. Chris, just by watching, is increasing his swordsmanship as a prompt says that it raised to 52. So this is a battle of wise. In this fight, Guillen thinks he's stronger, but speed can go both ways. He's confident that he can win in a drawn out battle, however, the two separate and gaze on each other intently. Rados, with lightning enveloping his figure, sends a strike towards Guillen, which is blocked. As the two men lock swords, Guillen gets the upper hand and breaks Rados' weapon in two. Without a weapon and a torn mask, Rados needs to retreat since he's failed his mission. Guillen orders his men to give chase and Chris returns the scabbard. Costs more than my life, huh? The prince is in the back of Fox and Weehain greets the group. He's so happy that he's safe and sound. From now on, the prince will be protected by Ben Ludwig's personal night squad. Who the hell are you? The prince asks and Weehain introduces himself. The prince smiles. Weehain, you say? He is then escorted to the carriage and he waves goodbye to Knight Apprentice Chris with a smile on his face. And Chris and Weehain lock eyes. Weehain is slightly annoyed, you could say. Chris is relieved to be back in his tent next to Pumpkey. No place like home. And the next morning comes, and Chris is already ordered to step outside. McCoy is calling him and Chris wonders what's going on, but soon handcuffs are slapped on his wrist. McCoy relays the order to arrest Knight Apprentice Chris for being a suspect of assassination. What? What in the politics is going on right now? Chris is being escorted and can't believe he was cuffed just like that. This situation is bad. They pushed all the responsibility onto him. This is a perfect opportunity to make Chris fall in line. Is Weehain behind this? Doki looks towards the men with rage visible on his face. He tells his boys to calm down and he's gonna be back soon. They arrive at court and McCoy apologizes. He tells Chris that there's nothing he can do. Wow, he actually feels bad. Seems like he likes her war a little bit. Bonus points for McCoy. Are you worrying about me, McCoy? Chris says mockingly. Behind his smile, he is indeed worried. Chris arrives in the hall with groups of men sitting around three tables. Even the Baron is present. They begin the trial and the Baron tells Weehain to give a complete explanation. He begins saying that the Baron's night squad saved the third prince and finished the mission. But some Something felt off. The enemy shouldn't have been able to infiltrate 
infiltrate the triangle without being spotted. Weehain assumes that their traitor is among them. In this given situation, he finds Knight Apprentice Chris's actions extremely suspicious. Even though he's an apprentice, he stays at the barracks and visits the city often. He's also seen in the company of lowlifes and visits an unknown man's house frequently. Chris is concerned that they have this much intel on him. Weehain is convinced that Chris cooperated with the spies in the army and planned this incident. He put a member of the royal family in danger. Chris can only think that this guy is full of shit. The Baron orders Chris to give the identity of the unknown man. Chris, under pressure, thinks that he should just stick with the truth. The unknown man is former Royal Guard Knight Tykeel. Ludwig is familiar with him. Keep him out of the investigation, he says. One of the men on the board asks what reason Chris had to plan this incident. Weehan responds saying that it's simple. He wants to prove his reputation by saving the third prince. He is eager to climb the ranks. Chris knows that this was planned very carefully by Weehan. He's even prepared counter arguments. The truth doesn't matter here. It's all for show. They are toying with him. Execution probably isn't in the cards, but Chris can't stand to lose everything that he's achieved. A rumble can be heard outside the door and the third prince barges in. His face looks a little stuffed, I think he had a good meal. He greets Chris and notices his desperate situation. The third prince wants to be a part of this trial as well. Any objections? They are not and the prince takes his seat. He immediately shouts that Chris is innocent. Weehain has a stressed look on his face and continues saying not to let the boy blind his judgment. He just wants to gain your favor. But again, like a boss with his feet on the table, Prince says that this is all BS and once again, Chris is innocent. Weehain tries to argue but the Prince asks where the hell Weehain was when he was being attacked and chased in the woods. It was Chris who saved him and now they're trying to execute him? Weehain is visibly upset and before he can say anything, the Prince orders Nelson to gouge his eyes out. He looked at me aggressively. My life feels threatened. Man, I'm starting to really like the Prince. What are you doing, Nelson? Gouge his eyes out. Nelson reaches for his sword a little anxiously because he doesn't want to commit to act. Weehain cries for his father and the Baron says there seems to be a misunderstanding. His son would never have ill intentions towards the Prince. He continues that his judgment is correct. Chris is in fact innocent. In the next panel, we see Chris and the Prince sitting side by side, laughing at Weehain's expression during the trial. It's a pity they didn't push him a little bit farther and they probably could have seen him shit his pants. The Prince tells Chris to continue his story on how he earned the Medal of Honor and Chris reenacts the actions of the day on the battlefield and the prince is in awe of his skill and praises Chris. The prince urges him to get right to the main topic and Chris is a little confused on what he means. Come with me to the capital, the prince says, which puts a puzzled expression on our protagonist's face. Chris is lost for words, but the prince says that even Nelson likes the idea. Does the prince really like me that much to go with him to the capital? If he does this now, it will withhold Chris from earning even more achievements on the battlefield, but he can't get on the prince's bad side. Chris asks to tell a story and the prince agrees. Chris takes a deep breath and tells the story of the first time he was on a battlefield. His good friend Drans stood right next to him. He lost both of his legs in the battle and died in Chris's arms. It's hard for him to abandon this place right now. The prince tears up and Chris changes the conversation and asks him if he thinks the eight gates is a pain in the ass. The prince wipes away his tears. Of course I do. Isn't it obvious? Chris gets on one knee. Give me three years and I will conquer the eight gate stronghold Wolfsden in your name. Really? For me? Chris promises the young lord it'll be done and vows. The prince has faith in him and asks him if there's anything that he needs. I want to reward you with something in my means. Since he's asking, we don't see what Chris really asked for, but the prince seems mildly disappointed. But this is more than enough for Chris. Chris leaves and is relieved he found a way out of that mess, but there's still much to do. He still remembers the fight with Guillen and Rados. He's still not on that level. If Guillen wasn't there, Rados surely would have killed Chris. He needs to become faster and stronger and needs to master the power of wise. Chris arrives back at his tent and overhears his boys arguing on how they're going to save him. Chris enters and asks what these doofuses are planning. To rescue me, huh? You don't fear the Baron's forces, just the three of you? Lind, who knew you were so brave to come up with a plan like this? Lind diverts the plane saying how it was all Doki's plan. Yeah, the guy who has four lines in the entire story. Good one. The boys begin to argue and Chris bursts out in laughter. What is this feeling? That's right. There's no rush. Chris is not alone. He has allies who would die for him. He hugs the boys and thanks them. He feels much better now. Lin definitely thinks he hurt his head on that last mission. Chris dismisses this remark and says that all the drinks tonight are on him. The boys are drinking in Ellis's inn and she inquires on what happened at court. Chris was proven innocent and asks Ellis if she found her preferred weapon. She responds saying how she's going to use a rapier since it suits her. Doki chimes in saying how a skinny sword doesn't suit her, but Ellis argues that he's just a drunk. And then the two agree to a drink off with Lin as a referee. Ellis is seen as the winner as Doki is slumped on a table. <laughs> Ellis is, is becoming a fan favorite too. The next day comes and the boys continue their training. Taikio works them hard and tells them whoever is last is going to get more work. 
The story fast forwards to three months later and we see the boys doing the herbal baths once again. We can assume that the boys kept up the same routine every day for the past three months. Chris closes his eyes and reminisces on his old life, where his old comrade told him that Wise has nine stages. In the flashback, the man continues saying that there's a lot of information uncovered about it and there's several training methods. Do you know them, Chris? Chris, at the time, only knew the basic method where Wise is passed down through generations. This is the first method in the so-called Nine Floored Tower. Researchers divided the comprehension of Wise in nine stages. If a kid passes the first stage, he will be comparable to an adult. However, Chris won't be able to master it. Why? Because I only have one arm? No, he says, because you're too old to master Wise. It's not a matter of age, actually, but one needs a body with a special structure. The fundamental training of Wise is being able to absorb mana that flows around you. In simple terms, the first step is feeling the mana with your body. Back to the present, Chris clenches his fist excitedly. He's got it. Lynn is confused, but doesn't know that Chris just unlocked Wise. Wise. Fast forward and now Chris is out of the camp and a soldier informs him that someone from Central Shed is looking for him. Chris thinks that he was sent by the prince and he comes right on time. The man introduces himself as Sick Million from Central Shed. Chris shakes his hand and asks where the book is. The man just shakes his head nervously and fortunately it's prohibited from exporting that book but instead he came himself. Chris is a little disappointed and asks what he means. Six says that he's been studying the Nine Floored Tower and the Strike of Arrows for 10 years and reintroduces himself as a researcher from Central Shed and he's researching methods to comprehend whys. Sick Million? This is the first time Chris has ever heard of such a man. Sick excitedly states that there isn't too many people focused on the basics, but Chris believes that a foundation is the most crucial part. Sick is delighted by this response and gives an analogy saying that in order to forge a good sword, you first need good quality steel. Mastering the basics provides the best conditions for perfect training. A way to allow the comprehension of the origins, Chris says. Sick is further impressed by our boy, and after this conversation, Chris recalls just who in fact this man is. He is the original author of a book from his past life, The Basic Method to Awaken Wise. We are shown a flashback where Chris learns that unlocking wise is time sensitive, and the author of the book that he was reading was Sick himself. Now we see Chris conversing with Streak asking for a vacation, but Streak can only agree since Chris now has the backing of the third prince. He says that it's fine as long as the drug depot is in order. Chris is now seen talking to Taikil who asks Chris if it's really possible. Chris is explaining the herbal baths and the methods to unlock wise to Taikil. Taikil finally understands how the boys were recovering so quickly. Chris asks the man's permission to include Ellis in the wise activation training, which he agrees. Ellis walks into the inn and expresses her desire to become stronger. The only reason why Taikil is fine with this is because Chris is the testing dummy. And back at the tent, Chris is meditating on his control of flowing mana, and he thinks back to Sick informing him that just being able to absorb mana does not mean you can use wise. One can comprehend wise after two stages. The first is the seal, and the second is awakening. In order to create a seal, first you need to control the mana around you. Once you succeed in drawing a circle of mana in the air, or gathering dispersed mana into one place, a symbol will appear on a part of your body. That is the seal. Chris experiments trying to conduct mana between his fingers, but is unable to control the flow. Four weeks pass by and the boys are sweating from their daily training, reminiscing on the passing month. The boys wonder if they feel mana yet, which Chris instructed them to tell him if they did. Toki just wonders if mana is edible, and that's just typical for his character. The scene shifts to Baron Van Ludwig coughing up blood into a handkerchief, foreshadowing that his life doesn't have long left. Gien is by his side, and the Baron asks where Weehain is, and Gien informs him that he returned from a mission in Highgard. The situation is dire, an heir needs to be appointed. Weehain is indecisive and weak, and his second son Molt is only interested in fine arts. The Baron thinks if only Gien was a legitimate son. The Baron asks Gien to swear an oath of loyalty to Weehain, which shocks the man. He needs you, Gien. Can you do that for me? Gien responds yes, and another voice is heard entering the room. Weehain yells at Gien to leave the room like a dickhead that he is, and the Baron asks him to keep his promise. A soldier bursts into the room, saying that there is trouble. Back at Chris's tent, he managed to create a mana circle with his finger. The next step is getting his seal. Sick explained that a seal's image depicts different abilities based on the symbol. The benefit of the nine floored tower is sustainability. There is another way to comprehend wise called the strike of the arrow. And don't ask me what that means, it didn't explain it yet. Chris interrupts the man and asks if there's a way to fuse the two methods into one. Sick is perplexed and doesn't recall an event of this happening. Chris asked this because in his previous life there was many ways to train wise, meaning that there's still a lot of information that's undiscovered. Chris will be taking a huge risk, but without risk, there is no success. 
Chris will try to combine the two symbols, and even if he fails, his efforts will not be wasted. He begins channeling mana into his foot, noticing the high temperature that he's feeling. A circular symbol appears on his foot, with a five stack of bricks in the shape of a wall. He did it! A prompt shows that his wise comprehension has increased to level 10. He goes excitedly to Taikil to tell him the news, and he notices that Chris has a similar aura to other wise users. A soldier arrives on horseback calling for Chris with an urgent order for all troops to assemble. The Eight Gates is invading. It's all-out war. Typical plot armor timing for Chris to get Super Saiyan right before a huge war, but I mean, I'm excited for it. Chris accepts the order and moves out. Ellis wants to come, but she isn't exactly in the army, so she really can't. Chris prepared herbs for the baths and told the girl to continue her training. Chris leaves for the battlefield but notes how things are progressing faster than he expected and it's not going to plan. Chris runs past the homeless man and throws a coin in his bowl. The man sees the shape of a coin and understands that this signals emergency for back dagger members and begins to run off. Chris meets up with Lind and inquires on the situation. Zerk was invaded much faster than before. Chris thinks that they used a certain strategy too early. And from what I can understand, they might be doing something to their horses or have a special breed of them. There's no time to waste and Chris orders Pumpkey to take him to a certain spot where the battle has already taken place. Three recon squads have been wiped out and a single knight is seen chopping the heads of two soldiers in one blow. We now see the same knight at the Eight Gates Tactical Camp informing his commander of his achievement, as expected of the highest class knight, Rinian Wolves. A grey haired man informs the bunch that he's ready for his first mission. The Baron's Triangle may be heavily defended, but the surrounding territories are weak. They will burn every village in their wake in the name of this operation. It's called Rampant Massacre. That's more like an action, not a code name. You're just describing what you're gonna do. Anyways, Chris arrives with a battalion to Fort Sunset Hyde, and Chris's past life, the enemy broke through these thick walls, but this time, the outcome will be different. The soldiers are called to formation, and Baron Van Ludwig stands fully armored, ready to speak to his troops. Chris wonders how this man could be on the verge of death, but he begins to speak. These walls have protected our lands for three generations, and no enemy has ever passed them. Get another foe, we'll try again. There is no need for a long speech. We will crush our enemies. The eight gate troops attack the first village, but find that it's empty. The wells have been filled with dirt, and they won't be able to use the power to meet. And without water, it's going to make it harder to advance. There is nothing to gain from this village, so the troops head out to search for the next one. Another squad runs into them. All of the surrounding villages appear to be in the same state, giving the eight gate troops no opportunities to gain resources. They are perplexed on how the villagers left their homes so quickly. They get a message saying that one village has two wells that are untouched. Chris starts using his seal technique on Digo, which levels up his wise comprehension to 15. He then does this for all the boys and instructs them to develop their seals. A cloaked fox informs Chris that they finished their task. They used a lot of gold from the pure dream operation to bribe the villagers to abandon their homes. It seems Chris was behind all the village's sabotage. They left two wells untouched by Chris's request, so they know the location of the enemy. Chris is a freaking genius, what the hell? All his preparations are done and it's time to make his move. Chris approaches the Baron's tent and a guard yells asking who Chris thinks he is, but the Baron tells the moron to just let him in. Chris kneels and greets the Baron, but the Baron just asks the boy to speak. Chris boldly states that if he assigns him 100 cavalrymen, he will crush the enemy reconnaissance squads. Weehane starts bashing Chris, but the Baron's guards order him to stop, which scares the hell out of Weehane. The Baron thinks Chris is quite confident and approves under the condition that if he fails, he's gonna take Chris's head. Chris has no objections and leaves the tent, and Weehane wonders why his father just let this kid take 100 cavalrymen. It's too big of a responsibility for a boy. The Baron, however, sees Chris's upside potential, and if he succeeds, it'll be a huge factor in the war, and if he doesn't, it'll be low risk and they'll only lose a hundred men. Chris is determined to win no matter what. Chris and Lin lead the forces and Chris wonders where Lin learned to ride a horse like that. He picked it up recently at the camp but is still not too good at it. They order the troops to stop and the troops start to gossip about Chris and Pumpkey. It seems they don't recognize their teen commander just yet. They even start talking shit about Pumpkey, which that's that's going over the line, they gotta be careful. They look over the ridge and analyze the terrain and Chris notes the shores ahead. The enemy will arrive soon, and if he was the enemy commander, what would he do in this kind of situation? Chris thinks the best move is to set traps and divide the enemy, and set out spies to scout further ahead. And as soon as he thinks this, Lin sees the enemy with his hawk eyes, just as Chris predicted. Around 200 enemy soldiers are below them in the ridge. One of the soldiers questions Chris, saying how hundreds of reconnaissance squads died already. Does he really plan? on advancing further. Chris just wonders if his squad is full of morons and this guy is even questioning the map that Chris is looking at. 
Chris is using a map that he made for herbs that shows the topographic features of the area, but he doesn't want to sit there and explain his plan. He tells the man to just shut up and accept his orders. Insubordination won't be tolerated. Another one of the soldiers tries to calm the man down. Chris must know what he's doing, right? Being a commander must be hard, huh? Lynn says. But at least there's always a bright side. Chris feels a strange vibration in his foot and his wise comprehension levels up to 21. A change is happening in Chris's body. He can feel the mana more clearly. He's awakened. Chris takes his men to the ridge and orders them to prepare for battle. The soldiers ask where Chris is going. He's going to attack the enemy's rear and will assist if problems arise. He orders Lynn to continue the plan and the same curious bearded man asks if it's a good idea to leave them like this. What if there's nothing in the rear? Chris elaborates that the enemy has scouted the terrain and established an escape route and if there is nothing in the rear, they will simply attack the enemy from behind. They will have to trust the others until they return. What's important now is to be confident in their victory. Chris asks Digo why he's spacing out, and no matter how much he's practicing wise, he still can't seem to get his head around it. Chris says that Digo won't die today with a smile on his face. Back at the Eight Gates camp, the soldiers are lamenting eating the powdered meat again, and also how much of a pain in the ass their fast horses are to take care of. Pumpkey approaches one of the horses with fire emanating from his mouth. A soldier awakes his commander and is telling him how a wolf is scaring all their horses. The commander can't believe this man can't deal with this kind of stuff by himself. But sir, the wolf breathes fire. Now, the commander is alert. It really does breathe fire. What is that thing? The soldiers are a little confused on what to do, but think a wolf should just be like a stupid mutt, so they should just capture it. They assemble the men to capture Pumpkey, but he's really elusive and escapes. They give chase and the soldiers notice the Zerk forces are in their escape route. They forget about the wolf and order the men to attack the stupid Zerks. The eight gate soldiers approach ready to attack and Chris and Digo wait in the bushes. There's over 20 men, are we really going to be able to win? Chris just tells Digo to be confident in swinging his poleaxe. He is the strongest of them after all. The eight gate soldiers continue the charge thinking that this will be easy, but the men at the rear begin to scream. Digo starts chopping men literally in half, almost like butter, and is shocked at his own strength surprised on how far he's really gotten. Doki is rampaging through the enemy with dual axes, and the soldiers at the rear are in fear. What is going on? They look at Chris, it's impossible to think that this is a mere child. Impossible. This kind of talk just hurts Chris's ears, as he gives the man something to think about by removing his head from his shoulders. They don't know how hard Chris and the boys have worked to get this power. They finish off the enemy and think that they were pretty weak, but Chris tells them that they're not weak, the boys are just strong. Doki raises his axes. Me strong. Nice. Back at the main forces, the enemy won't go down so easily, and both sides are sustaining casualties. One of the men thrusts his spear through an eight-gate cavalryman and thinks the enemy just won't stop coming. No matter how many he kills, they just keep appearing. They need to clear a path. This squad is made of outcasts and troublemakers. They can't hope to receive any reinforcements. The man thinks the boyish commander has already abandoned them, as more enemy units converge from the left side. The terrain is not to their advantage, since the enemy has the more mobile horses. As soon as he curses his luck, an arrow flies into the head of the incoming soldier. The enemy scrambles to identify where that archer just shot from, and the Zerk soldiers scream, wondering if this is their reinforcements. But see Lind atop the hill, sniping people one by one like a savage. Lind jumps down from the ridge, and we see a flashback where Lind is talking to Taikyo. He feels that he'll never catch up to Chris, and compared to Digo and Doki, he's lacking behind. Taikil tells him to pick up a bow and follow him. Lind hits the bullseye from a ways away and Taikil says the boy does have potential. Though it is true, he is lacking something. He lacks power. But on the battlefield, there are many unknown variables, like a sneak attack or a gust of wind. Taikil pulls back the bowstring with some absolutely jacked forearms. These situations are provided to not lose an opportunity to bring an opponent down in a single strike. He lets off the bow, firing a shot and tells Lin not to compare himself to others. His success depends only on him. If you're scared, go back and get your spear. Back in the present, Lin thanks Taikyo for his advice and he continues to use his skill with the bow to chip away at the enemy. Back in the flashback, Taikyo tells Lin that he knows he's not stupid enough to grab a spear when he has such keen eyes. Lin thanks Taikyo for giving him the courage that he needs as he thinks another soldier. He might have a care package by now, he's on a husky kill streak. The soldiers are in disarray, trying to steal each other's shields, but another soldier is sniped. The last man covers his face, but Lin fits the arrow on a thread right in the opening in his face mask, killing this man as well. Lind won't let anyone escape. The Zerk infantry is fighting hard, but doesn't see an end to the wave of soldiers. The man tells the other soldier that they're going to need to buy some time. There isn't many enemies remaining, but reality sets in for the bearded man. He might just die here today. Is this the end, Zipper? As they drift into despair, Chris comes riding by with an enemy horse and yells at the two to get out of his way. They're going to handle the front line. The enemy's rear has been destroyed. Only these losers remain, and the two depressed soldiers realize that they're on the verge of winning. Chris, Digo, and Doki continue the assault, slicing enemies 
enemies down effortlessly. Digo is still chopping people in half and making it look easy. I mean, what the hell is his workout plan? I'm gonna need to get on that. Lind arrives and follows Chris, and the once talkative bearded man from before is in awe of the boy's talent. Lin looks at him and just smiles, saying how, so you survived after all, you did well. Lin tells Chris that the enemy has regrouped and is charging at them again. Chris tells his troop to listen up. The enemy has very mobile horses. Form into two lanes for us not to get surrounded. They will face the enemy right away. The tired soldiers ask if they really plan to charge again. And Chris just tells them, what, are you afraid we're going to lose? At the 8 gates intelligence HQ, a soldier informs the man that the reconnaissance squad has been destroyed, which shocks the commander. And the messenger continues, saying how the Zerk sent a powerful soldier that is night level. Is this a member of Ludwig's personal squad? Just how strong is this man? The messenger goes on saying how his skills even rival an intermediate at night, but he's very young. Wait a minute, very young you say? We see the similar commander with a scar on his head that Chris originally fought and destroyed most of his unit. Was it a brat with dark blue hair? He says menacingly. It seems he wants some payback. Back at the battle, the Zerks clean up the remaining forces and the two soldiers who question Chris kneel in front of them. They apologize for their earlier rudeness. Chris says that it's just all good and it's not the first time he's been judged based on his appearance. The first man introduces himself as Slithy Hanel. He was the previous commander of this squad and the bearded man is named Sephora. He was the second in command. Chris orders the two to assemble everyone they have. There's matters to discuss. The troops gather in front of Chris and he shows off one of the red haired horses that the enemy is using in this war. It is much faster and stronger than the Zerg horses but it has a fiery temper making it harder to control. However, if you feed it bee flowers, the horse will become obedient. Chris is seen riding the horse, which increases his riding skill to 28. Pumpkey seems a little jealous, but Chris tells him there's no boy better than him. Pumpkey, though, still seems a little angry, but Chris apologizes to the wolf and says that they'll go on a scouting mission. Chris enters the forest landscape and recalls from his map that the village with untouched wells lies ahead. And where he is, is the shortest route to that village. He peeks through the trees and sees the enemy camp. Even though he trimmed their numbers down considerably, charging in blind would wouldn't be a wise move. They need to strike unexpectedly. Chris and Pumpkey go back and at night time he orders his troops to ready their horses. Lynn asks if they're gonna go on a night raid, which Chris agrees since they're short on time. Chris asks Slithy if everything is ready and to reiterate the mission code name, which is let's shake him up. The soldiers think this name is a little cringe, but they continue with their orders to split up. Sephora comments if they can really traverse through the thick forest, but Chris just tells the man that he's judging superficially again. If we remove the vegetation, they're gonna find fields of medicinal herbs. This area was scouted thoroughly by Murdoch. The soldiers move silently as possible, and they remove the vegetation. They arrive at the enemy camp, and the unsuspecting soldiers are drinking on guard duty. Tigo wonders if their forces are spread too thin, but Chris just says that everyone is in the right spot. A group of soldiers is watching their route for an invasion, while others just save energy. They spot the supposed enemy commander and Chris asks Lin if he can make the shot. Lin is surprised that he even asked. Next to that commander, a soldier asks him how he can drink at a time like this. This is the second smartest soldier, almost as smart as the guy from the supply camp. Oh my god. These guys, man. These guys. Before the commander can finish giving his lame ass excuse, he's instantly dinked and killed on the spot which scares the world's smartest soldier. Where the hell did that come from? He can't believe what he's seeing right now. Is he drunk too? Or is the enemy riding down on cavalry? The X-shaped scarred general is arriving at the camp and sees some of Chris's forces. He notices that the enemy is riding their horses and assumes that Chris must be nearby. Slithy sees the enemy and remembers Chris's orders. It was only to evade. Their horses are the same so they shouldn't be able to catch up. They only need to shake him up a bit. The camp is now ravaged and the brilliant soldier needs to escape to report the ambush, but Sephora sees him and asks where he's going. Chris pursues him as he finishes up the camp. Chris calls for the boys and it's time to honor their guest. The enemy general is infuriated at their lack of archers. They can't catch up to the enemy soldiers. He now realizes his mistake as he's gone too far and orders his squad to stop. He now knows Chris's resourcefulness and is fearful that he's falling into another one of his traps. One of his men says that a soldier from the camp is coming, and like deja vu, the enemy general thinks he's been had again. The soldiers tell the general that the camp has been assaulted, and the general's face seethes with anger, but he needs to stay calm. If they retreat now, they might get ambushed. He orders his men to split into two groups. The first group follows him, and the second keeps an eye on the surroundings. Chris sees the enemy squad and greets them head on. The 8 gates general swats Lin's arrow, which signals to Chris that he is strong. They are elite soldiers. The enemy general grins, saying how arrows won't work on him. But they do work on his troops though, as Lin starts lighting them up. Both sides dismount, ready for the incoming battle, and the enemy general vows to kill Chris with his own hands. This bastard took everything from me. Huh? I don't even know who you are, says Chris. This makes the man's face turn into a devilish grin. He can no longer hide his anger. Sadly, we don't get to see the fight, but we can assume that Chris 
made short work of him. By his appearance, he was battered into a wall with a sizable dent behind him. Not long ago, the boys needed to team up just to be able to compete with this kind of enemy. But this is a testament to how strong each of them has become. Back at the Zerk's Intelligence HQ, a guy with a questionable hairdo is cursing his failures. He's probably worried that he won't get a promotion at this rate, and if he fails again, his hopes will be down the drain. Suddenly, a soldier alerts the man that a herd of horses is approaching. All of them are red-haired. The commander panics, thinking that the eight gate soldiers are attacking, and he can't believe the gall for them to have a frontal assault like this. The soldier tells the man to get a closer look, and the commander squints his eyes to see his own banners, and Chris is the one leading the troops back to camp. Chris kneels in front of the commander and informed him that they've broken the enemy cavalry of 200 and stolen their horses. And in addition, they destroyed an intelligence HQ in a local village. The commander is shocked that he did so much with only 100 cavalrymen. How did he manage this? Chris says that that's not important, but if he wants more achievements, he should lend him another 300 cavalrymen. In this situation, the commander has no choice but to trust Chris. Chris is now seen leading his brand new troops and finds a good place to rest. He signals his soldiers to make camp and sleep and eat as much as they want. Lin asks Chris what his next move is, but he responds saying that they're gonna do what they do best, a sneak attack. At the Eight Gates headquarters, the soldiers are perplexed on what to do. The gray-haired man notices that Chris has been a constant thorn in their side ever since the White Demon Diversion. It's the same kid over and over again. Just who the hell is he? The commander says that there's no time to waste. They need to get ready to advance their forces. He entrusts the vanguard to Rinian, the knight who was chopping people up in the beginning of this war. General Ilian will take the main forces, and finally, Sir Benatos, which is the coolest looking guy the enemy army has, is in charge of the rear. Before Benatos leaves, the commander asks him to listen. There's a chance that the enemy will attack the rear, and most likely, it will be the same squad that destroyed the reconnaissance HQ, and he suspects they'll use the stolen horses. Now, he may be overreacting, but they need to destroy the leader of that squad. Capture that bastard, no matter the cost. Now, in the Baron's tent, he hears word of Chris's triumphs. The Baron is shocked that Chris actually did what he set out to do. Did he underestimate him? Chris is an excellent soldier, and Weehane mustn't let his emotions make him lose the subordinate. Now is not the time to think of this, however. It's time to make a move. The Baron calls to Weehane, and he leaves him in command, and the Baron sets off to the battlefield. He yells to assemble his personal knights, and the time has come for them to prove themselves. Lin comments that finally both sides have assembled. A clash is imminent. Chris signals his men to leave since the Baron's army is more than capable. The battle begins and soldiers are in the fray, taking lives on both sides. The Zerg forces are being pushed back and the soldiers are losing morale. The Eight Gates infantry is building momentum. As soon as the man gets cocky, Doki sends his head flying with a sharp slice of his axe. Chris leads the charge, spurring his troops to charge forward. Lind is on horseback, letting shots fly, and Chris thinks this situation is perfect. They will continue this diversion and run away. Zerk soldiers continue to struggle, and Chris's second in command calls to him, informing him that the enemy is attacking from behind. They are surrounded. The situation is dire. Zerk soldiers are being chopped and butchered down. Chris is worried seeing his own men being decimated like this, and curses himself for his arrogance. Even though he planned everything thoroughly, it's impossible to avoid casualties completely during a war. Even so, seeing all of his subordinates die is very difficult. He turns into a direction and calls for Doki to clear the way on the left side. They're going to retreat. He doesn't understand how the enemy knew they were going to attack from the rear. But I do. He's only did it like 20 times, alright? They're not that dumb. He orders his squad to retreat and we see Sir Benatos telling his men to give chase. Chris notices this man and assumes that he is the enemy commander. He also notices the emblem on his helmet, which is in the shape of a moon, which means he's from the Desper family. Chris looks at Lind and tells him to proceed with plan B. Lind has a worried look on his face and it appears he doesn't agree, but Chris tells him not to worry. He will do anything it takes to win. Lind, still nervous about the decision, questions if this is the right move. Back at the main battle, we see the forces charging in, led by Baron Van Ludwig. He might be sick, but he's still a freaking savage. He's just spearheading the charge, chopping people down left and right. The General Ilian is cursing the half-dead geezer. How can he still have so much power? The Baron tells him that he's not too young to speak himself, while he's continuing to chop down the eight-gate soldiers. Weehane is now seen taking up the commander-in-chief role, and one of the soldiers comes up to him saying that the enemy squad that attacked Chris is now chasing them through the ravine. Should they send reinforcements? Weehane is a little indecisive and starts thinking on the matter. He wonders if he should call his father but knows that he's in the thick of the battle and the questions what to do. The soldier tells him that they do not have troops to spare and the main battle is here where they are. Weehane thinks on the situation further and notes that whatever situation Chris got himself into, he's going to have to deal with himself. 
since he cannot afford to spare any soldiers. And it might be a little biased because Chris didn't let him be a sugar daddy, but he does have decent enough reasoning. Chris is continuing to evade the enemy troops, but Sir Beneteau smiles thinking that he's finally going to put an end to this annoying brat. They enter a large opening in the ravine and Lynn tells Chris that they arrived. Chris orders his men to throw down smoke bombs. The smoke fills the circular part of the ravine, covering it in a thick blue smoke. Chris orders his men to retreat while he alone remains in the fog. From now on, Lind will be in command. Lind tells Chris to be careful and all the soldiers in the smoke are concerned since they can't see. Sir Benetos notices that even the horses are panicking, making them useless. He orders everyone to dismount and assemble in groups in a circular defense to cover one another's backs. The soldiers assume that the enemy is also blinded, but this is not the case. Due to Chris's intense training with Wise, he sharpened his senses, which allows him to theoretically see in the dark. Though not with his eyes, he can feel the presence and sense the movements of his surrounding enemies. Lin, Digo, and Doki are watching from atop the ridge, and Sephora comes up asking them if it's really okay to leave Chris down there. Shouldn't they help him? Lin is a flashback where we see himself and Taikyo watching Chris training. Taikyo mentions that Chris is unique in his own way, and when he's in the process of learning, he looks insatiable. However, this thirst defines his incredibly fast progress. And he hates to admit it, but this 15-year-old boy has already caught up to him, and he might even climb higher. Taikyo asks Lin if he's envious of Chris, but he responds saying that he's not. Where else could he find someone as such a reliable leader? Lin believes in Chris and he knows that he's going to deal with the enemy. Back in the fog, the soldiers are beginning to panic since they cannot use their senses and one by one, Chris is whittling them down. The screams of men dying left and right and soldiers calling out to each other is deeply affecting the morale of the soldiers that are in the fog. Chris starts bantering with them, telling him that it's very dark, isn't it? This place is called a fog well. There are high walls surrounding this place, and getting stuck here in complete darkness makes it impossible to escape. But why am I even explaining this to you? The soldiers are confused on where this rat is speaking from, but just like that, another one goes down. Without being able to see, the soldiers are in constant fear for their own lives, and they can't even determine where Chris is striking from. And just then, another soldier's head is decapitated. Now, alone, the last soldier in the trio is fending for himself. Chris thanks him, saying how he had quite a good amount of fun with them, but this is not the end. From now on, they'll experience one emotion, fear. Chris is on his horror movie phase because this is just <laughs> scary as hell, for the soldiers at least. The screams of all the soldiers can be heard in the pitch darkness. The last soldier thinks to himself he needs to get out of here. He trips over his comrade's corpse and it realizes that all of his friends are dead. Chris says that he is correct and finishes off the last soldier on that side of the pit. We now see Serenitos surrounded by his men and their morale is shaken. As Chris tries to strike at Benitos from the shadows, he retaliates and parries the strike. One of the men asks if this was the murderer, but Sir Benitos yells at him to shut up so he can focus on sensing Chris. Sir Benitos yells at him, calling him a freaking rat, and this is the end of his petty tricks. But Chris just smiles. No, Benitos, this is only the beginning. Chris throws a dagger into the shoulder of the man flanking Benitos, and before he can get any words out of his mouth, another dagger buries itself in his skull. The fear sets in for Benitos as he realizes that Chris erases his presence while he's throwing daggers. He signals to retreat with the only other soldier remaining, and he asks him, where the hell are we supposed to go? One of the men make it out of the fog, yelling that Chris is the living devil, but is sniped as soon as he exits. Man, Lind is spawn capping these guys at this point, that's pretty messed up. Lind orders all the men to target those who try to escape. We see Benatos' head fly out of the smoke and the soldiers brace for the next man coming out, but it's in fact Chris who emerges, almost looking bored with his achievement. He just decimated a unit of 100 soldiers and one knight, almost single-handedly. Chris informs the group that there's still a few stragglers left, but to let them be since they can be used to their advantage. Chris orders his men to get their equipment and it's time to rest after this long, drawn-out battle. Later in the day, Doki, Digo, and Lin return to the scene and see the pile of corpses Chris is responsible for and are in awe of his skill. They're excited since they also learned how to use Wise and maybe one day they can achieve a similar feat. Two days later, Lin approaches Chris with a letter from the main recon unit. It says how the Baron's Night Squad has reached the enemy camp, but half of his squad died. But in return, the eight gates have also suffered heavy losses. Some rumors begin to spread about Chris, and the enemy commander he killed was famous from the Desper family. The survivors that Chris let escape are spreading the rumors that he is the Black Fog Demon, and that's a pretty sick name. Now, back at the eight gates recon HQ, the leading commander can't believe that the Black Fog Demon even killed Benatos. Is this really the same person who destroyed the recon squad days before? His skills are clearly night level. Eliminating him should be of top priority. 
However, the Baron's forces are quickly approaching. The 8-gauge general prepares his own forces to attack. The next panel shows Slithy asking Chris if it's really okay to send a message in the current condition. Chris says that this message is vital, but thinks to himself that in his past life, an event happened several days after the war started, and since the future is changing, he can't let his guard down. Slithy asks where to send the letter, and Chris tells him to the royal palace. Slithy is shocked, and the next panel shows Sephora informing the man with the message Chris sent, but is perplexed on what he's asking. Sephora was asked to assign some cavalrymen to gather all of the available soldiers. The commander asks what for, but Sephora doesn't know. He's only been ordered to gather troops in front of Sunset Hyde. The commander demands to know where Chris is, but is told that he will meet them in three days. Some time passes, and at night, Chris approaches the Sunset Hyde. Ralph sits atop the walls, actually, and we haven't seen him in a couple chapters. Ralph goes down to meet Chris, and is ecstatic to see his old friend, and tells him about the rumors that's been spreading. Is it true you took out an elite squad of 100 soldiers? Chris says that it's a little bit over-exaggerated, but Chris, no, it literally isn't. You, you did that. We see Ralph's leg is heavily injured, and even the doctors couldn't heal him. Chris's skills aren't enough for this either, but tells Ralph if he needs anything, just let him know. Ralph just asks Chris to buy him a beer after the war is over so he can brag to all of his friends about fighting alongside Chris. Chris smiles and says it's a deal, but thinks to himself since he's gotten here, most of the soldiers are injured. Chris climbs the castle walls and meets Streak at the top and has an urgent message. And he informs Streak that when he was attacking the enemy's rear, he's noticed a small battalion leaving the battlefield and advancing further ahead. Streak is shocked. Why would they come here? Chris thinks how he made all this shit up and he's really just cheating from his past life. But he does know that the enemy will come. Their strategy in his past life was to rush the king and avoid all bishop and knights. And just like that, with typical MC timing, a soldier yells that the enemy has arrived with 2,000 troops. We get a flashback to Chris in the same time as he talks to Lin, saying how if the soldiers of Sunset Hyde didn't try to fight at night and held out for another day, the outcome of the war maybe would have been different. Back to the present, Streak is perplexed on the elite soldiers that are outside his walls. Chris thinks that this timing is awful and his reinforcements haven't arrived yet and won't get here until tomorrow. Chris asks for the number of soldiers in the castle and the total, including the injured, is 200. 200? This is basically all the soldiers that Chris brought and with such forces, they won't even last half a day. Chris notices the banners and instruments of the army and see that it's part of the Wolf Clan, and he thinks to himself that maybe they might have a chance. The Wolf Clan troops begin banging their drums, but as soon as they do this, Chris senses a murderous intention from his right. But as soon as he looks towards the man, it disappeared. Is this just an ordinary soldier? Why is he standing there empty-handed in this emergency situation? Chris now understands the motive behind the drums and moves to intercept the traitor. And before Streak can question him, the fake Zerk pulls his swords. The drums were a signal to kill the commander. Chris disarms the man before he gets a chance and the assassin is shocked at Chris's speed. So you were a traitor after all. The man slashes at Chris but is blocked and Chris lets out a powerful left hook into the man's side, causing him to fly back. His cover is blown. Chris thinks this guy must be a professional because he didn't hesitate even for a moment. Chris tells his boys not to charge in recklessly. Is this person hired? Chris asks if he is a part of Night Dagger and the man responds asking who Chris is. He responds saying that this is his territory and thinks this response confirms that he is a hired assassin. He tells the man to follow the rules of Amnok, which immediately gets the attention of the assassin. He reacted to the rules of subordination between Night Daggers and their superiors. Chris never thought that this random phrase that he heard would ever come in handy. And they're not even trying to hide his plot armor at this point. The man surrenders and willingly is taken to prison, but before he leaves, stares intently at Chris. Streak wonders why the Eight Gate soldiers didn't attack, and Chris tells him that the drums was a signal for his assassination attempt. They must be thinking of a new strategy. Chris tells Streak to rest tonight, and Streak asks for his plan for tomorrow. Chris tells him that they will open the gates to meet them, but the enemy won't get inside. Chris goes to bed and tells Pumpkey to be a good boy while he's gone the next day. Chris reflects on the original man who got through these walls in his past life, the youngest wise user in the eight gates, Perth. The next day comes and Chris goes to see Streak, who hasn't left that spot since last night. Chris admires his stubbornness, but he does look worse than a dead man. Chris asks to lower the drawbridge, but Streak only asks the boy if he's insane. There is 2,000 soldiers out there. Chris tells Streak that the castle will fall anyways. Did you lose all rationality? Streak just doesn't want to let Sunset Hyde fall. Chris tells him that normally he would be right, if 
The Baron's knights were here. Are you willing to let all the citizens of Daybed die in just one day? Streak grits his teeth. What do you want me to do, Chris? Surrender? No, we're gonna face them. Chris is determined and will take all the responsibility. Open the gates. Street curses and obliges. The boys are headed outside the castle and they ask Chris if his plan will really work. He informs the group that the Wolf Clan is part of the eight great families of the eight gates and tells them that they are also the poorest. They aren't true nobles or political figures. They are known, however, for their sense of honor. Four soldiers come to meet the boys led by Alec, the general of the Wolf's Clan. They wonder what four boys are doing, trying to surrender? Chris slams his spear and demands for a duel. This was an order from his commander. If their champions can overpower us, they will surrender and open the gates. A mere knight apprentice demands a duel? Chris smirks and just as he expected, the enemy is taking the bait. I, knight apprentice Chris, am willing to put my honor on the line. Did the famous Wolf Clan shit their pants? Are you scared of only four soldiers? Did you forget about your precious honor? Veins bulge in Alec's face and he wants to make Chris eat his words. Chris takes this answer as a yes and as proof he will leave the gates open behind him. Alec thinks the boy has gone insane and another one of the eight gates smartest soldiers tells him that this has to be a trap and just to attack now. But Alec calls him a freaking donkey and asks the man if he means to bring shame on their honor, the most valuable legacy that their ancestors left behind. If he hears anything like that again, he will remove the man's tongue personally. Alex shouts at which one of his men wants to take the challenge. Knight Apprentice Naptal asks to entrust this duel to him. This thick moron introduces himself and says he serves under Sir Zarin. Digo steps up and introduces himself as a centurion. The challenger is offended that a mere centurion is going to fight him and thinks it should be easy. He rushes towards Digo and tells him to learn his place, but Digo, unaffected and in one swing of his halberd, slashes Naptal in half and asks, who's next? What a savage. Digo just stands next to the lower half of Neptal's body and Alec is shocked at his strength. Another man steps up cursing the knight apprentice who just lost. He charges in at Digo but is blocked. The man thinks to himself that Digo can't maintain this strength for long. As he tries to duck down under him, Digo quickly hits him with a vicious elbow which knocks the man unconscious. Digo says, who's next? This next panel is another one of the funniest scenes I've seen so far. The guy introduces himself as a centurion and immediately his head is sent flying. But why does he have the same expression? Next. Another poor soldier is looking deformed. Next. Digo charges at the new contender, but he asks him to wait. Let me introduce myself first. But Digo does not have the patience and chops him down too. Next. As the pile of corpses is building behind Digo, the enemy soldier's morale is in shambles. This centurion single-handedly defeated five commanders. Chris calls for Digo to return, and now it's Lin's turn. Digo thinks that he can do this all day, but Chris wants to reserve his energy. Lin squares up with another enemy, and Chris thinks that his swordsmanship skills aren't that great. But even so, he doubts that any of his squad mates would lose to guys of this level. The enemy commander smiles thinking how Lind looks very weak and charges at him. He swings but Lind blocks almost emotionless. Another strike is blocked and the man smiles saying how everywhere he goes there's always cowards like Lind. He tries to thrust at him but Lind easily dodges below the strike and stabs the man in the neck with a quick motion. Thus ending the duel. You see Lind always looks to kill in a single strike. The Zerk soldiers are cheering for Lind and Alex orders Payne to go next. Payne introduces himself as a knight from the wolf's clan and Chris notices that the enemy is sending out their stronger men. Chris calls Lind to come back and sends out Doki. Payne asks for Doki's rank which he responds saying centurion. Doki then quickly rushes at Payne and the two exchange blows. Payne thinks if he can stay out of Doki's range he can easily deal with him but Doki is right in his face. Payne dodges down and thinks that Doki is a novice and jumps at him with a large sword. Do you really think you can block this sword with your little axes? Doki barely manages to block the attack but a wound opens up on his forehead. Lind and Digo show their concern for their comrade but Doki just tells him that he's okay. Just very angry. Doki lunges back at Payne with incredible speed. The wolf knight is getting cocky saying how he won't lose to someone like him. Doki throws one of his axes but Payne blocks but he still rushes in with only one axe in his left hand. The man questions if this idiot is really running in with only one axe. Doki drops his remaining axe down confusing Payne but he grabs it again hitting him in the head with the wooden part of it and blocking his sword at the same time. He then picks off his other axe off the ground that he threw earlier and decapitates Payne with a swift motion. After this battle he lets out a primal roar and Lind and Digo are impressed with Doki's strategy. The smartest eight gate soldier yells yet again telling Alec that they need to attack the fortress now but Alec sends a sword through his neck and is enraged. 
he orders for Perth to prepare for combat. Another man volunteers instead and Alec agrees. This is Wolf Knight Raiden. Chris tells Doki to tend to his wound and now it's his turn. Chris squares up against Raiden who has a sword and shield but this is in Perth. Chris thinks that he'll definitely know when he sees the hero who destroyed Sunset Hyde and as he scans the enemy he finds him. Raiden wonders why Chris is staring at Perth and feels a little agitated that he's being ignored. He introduces himself as Raiden Wolves and Chris apologizes for the disrespect and does the same. Raiden assumes that Chris is the strongest of the boys since he came last and rushes at Chris and sends a powerful slash but Chris effortlessly blocks. He goes to jab but Raiden raises his shield. Chris thinks that Raiden has a lot of battle experience for the way that he's fighting. Very well, try and block this. Chris charges energy into the tip of his spear and sends it at Raiden which he also blocks. Chris is shocked that he managed to block this blow. His wise attack, Snakebite. It seems that he underestimated him a little. Maybe it's time to use the dance that Tykeel taught him. Chris closes his eyes and relaxes himself and Raiden tries to shield bash Chris. But Chris is in the flow of a melody. He doesn't even feel the weight of his spear and lightly dances around Raiden. The longer the melody, the faster the pace makes it a deadly dance. Chris sends flurries of different attacks and Raiden has seen this dance before and notices Chris is attacking exactly on beat and if he can't catch up to the pace, Raiden will be quickly defeated. He asks Chris on his connection to the dancing blade, which this was Taiki's name that he got at the age of 20. Chris ducks under another slash and tells the man for a non-wiser, he is sure lucky to survive this long. However, your luck ends here. And Chris shoves his spear into Raiden's neck, ending the duel. Alec can't believe what he is seeing, but now Perth goes to face Chris. Finally, Chris thinks. This is the moment he's been waiting for. A chance to test his skills. A chance to defeat the hero whose name was engraved in history. Perth has a suggestion for this duel. The winner will put an end to this battle, even though it's like they haven't won yet. Chris wonders if he's in a position to go all in, but Alec puts his honor behind Perth's words. Now, the two lock eyes. The man introduces himself as Perth Wolves, the youngest wiser knight, and today he will be the first man to secure Sunset Hyde. The eight gate soldiers are chanting Perth's name, and Chris admires his amazing leadership. Chris introduces himself as well, saying that he's 17, but also managed to become a wise knight. Chris challenged Perth to a duel, and the two square off. Perth starts the battle and immediately appears before Chris and lets off heavy blows towards him. Chris blocks but feels the intense weight of Perth's sword. Perth sends a heavy strike towards Chris which leaves him wondering how strong this man really is. Chris creates some distance but Perth coldly asks where he thinks he's going and sends a powerful stab in his direction which sends Chris flying. The boys call for Chris but the smoke clears. He's still standing. Perth is in awe of Chris, saying how a normal person would have died from that strike. It seems that he's a wise knight after all. We see the sword marks on Chris's bracers, and if the cut was a little bit deeper, his arm would have been severed. They are both wise knights, but Chris can feel the gap between them. Perth is at the third stage of wise comprehension, has acquired the ability double, which doubles his physical strength. They couldn't have thought of any better names for this. I mean, it's still cool, don't get me wrong. Perth sends another stab towards Chris, which he barely evades. But in the same motion, Perth sends an upward slash that gets Chris into the air. Perth hits Chris with a powerful punch in the chest, which sends shockwaves through his body, and asks the boy to show him the dance that he killed Raiden with. Chris staggers back, and even with his armor, a mere punch injured him. Lind has never seen Chris struggle so much, and Alex smiles at his ace. No knight apprentice can be compared to Perth. Chris grits his teeth and knows if he wins this battle, it won't be unharmed. He rushes back in and Perth is shocked that he recovered so fast. Chris sends many jabs in Perth's direction and Perth notices that Chris is fighting with reckless abandon, sacrificing his own defense to continue his assault. The two exchange blows and disperse. You're braver than you look, Perth says. Chris thinks that he managed to see the trajectory of his strikes and reacted instantly. But Chris did manage to get some damage in. But wiser knights have great regeneration, so a wound of that level is insufficient. Chris needs to make a decisive strike to win and starts using the dancing steel technique and he lets off a barrage of strikes at Perth. But Perth has seen this ability once and easily deals with the assault. Chris knows that the dance isn't enough and needs to unleash a secret technique. Chris takes a slash to the abdomen that cuts deep but breaks Perth's sword. Perth is confused. Did Chris just change his attack pattern? What a reckless move. 
We see a flashback to Taikyo's teachings and Chris asks him if he knows how to defeat a wise knight. Taikyo responds saying, you don't try to defeat them. It doesn't matter if one is a wiser or not. No one is immune from death. Therefore, do not try to disarm or defeat your opponent. Look for the opportunity to kill them. It's the only way to survive a fight with the wise knight. Chris unleashes his hidden technique, the lethal dance, death parade melody. His staff glows red, but Perth, still wielding his broken sword, manages to throw Chris's spear away. Perth goes for a kick, but Chris catches him. His death parade is still in effect, and he punches Perth, disarming him as well. He uses the opening to knee him in the stomach, and he draws his dagger. He calls this move piercing light beams, and a wide arc of blue energy cuts through Perth. Alec is lost for words, and Streak and his soldiers yell at the sight of Chris's victory. Perth grabs his wound and asks for the name of Chris's technique. Chris responds with piercing light beams. Incredible, Perth says as he falls to the floor, unconscious from the attack. Alec runs towards Perth, and Streak sends his own soldiers in as well. Chris tells Alec to stop. What does he think he's doing? He begs to take Perth, but Chris asks if he means to tarnish their duel but Alec begs him and he kneels. Perth is the one to lead the next generation. He begs Chris to let him take Perth. Chris is enraged. Did this man think to put his clan's honor on the line and kneel before his enemy because of a single soldier? Is this the wolf clan that he knows? Chris grits his teeth, but allows Alec to take Perth and tells him not to forget what happened this day. The boys run to Chris and ask how he is. He suffered some injuries, but says it's nothing, just some scratches. Bro, you almost got sliced at the hip, but if you say so. Chris's reinforcements arrived from Zipper and Zafaro, and the enemy think they are surrounded. Was this a trap after all? Chris yells at the top of his lungs and calls all of his troops to attention. Respectfully escort the wolf clan. They have been fighting in this fierce battle, protecting their honor. Chris won't allow that honor to go to waste. Alec is shocked at this gesture and orders his troops to move out. Slilly asks Chris on what to do now. Chris's wound is worse than he thought, but all of a sudden, the seal on his foot is bursting with energy. He levels up his wise comprehension to 31, and his wounds instantly heal. Is this the consequence of deadly duels? No, this is your plot armor, but go do some more sick shit. That, that fight was freaking awesome. Chris reached the second stage of wise comprehension and unlocked the increased regeneration. Chris gathers the cavalry and orders them to get in formation. It's time to depart to the battlefield. Shriek asks Chris to rest. He's done enough. Treat his wounds. But Chris looks back. The war isn't over. There's no time to rest. Castle walls aren't the only thing they must protect. They need to go back to the main battlefield. We see the Baron absolutely being a beast, slashing enemy soldiers left and right, to the point where he breaks his own sword. Imagine breaking your own sword, hitting it on people's heads. What the hell? Two eight gate soldiers see the opportunity and try to stab the Baron, but he cuts them both down with his broken sword and orders his men to destroy the enemy. But his condition worsens as he coughs up blood. An arrow is shot towards the Baron, but Guillen blocks it. He tells his father not to overextend himself. They both look toward the rear and see the wolf clan forces advancing. Guillen moves to intercept and the Baron wishes him luck. As Guillen leaves, Serenian approaches the Baron. You're finally alone, huh? What a pity for the hero of Sunset Hyde to become so weak. Today, your pathetic life comes to an end. Van Ludwig is enraged and the two stare ready to engage. The next panel shows the wolf clan fighting the Zerk troops. The Zerk foot soldiers are being pushed back as a soldier who oddly looks like Chris gets stabbed in the thigh. He kills the injured soldier who struck him but sees another man charging at him with spear in hand. This Chris lookalike loses all hope Today must be his day to die. But just then, the real Chris comes in hot and chops that guy's head off, saving the fake Chris. The boys begin chopping down eight gate soldiers and the fake Chris is shocked at their arrival. Lin tells the soldier to wake up. What's your name? Fake Chris replies that his name is, and Lin tells Suxin not to give up. It's not your time yet. The sun will soon rise. Chris is rushing to help the Baron and running through hordes of soldiers. Chris thinks he came just in time, but his horse is shot down, and in the same moment, he sees Serenian piercing Van Ludwig's body. Serenian smiles, and the two men are battered from their intense battle. Serenian slashes the sword away from the Baron and pierces him through the stomach. It's over, Graf. The Baron, in his last moments, asks the young mutt who decided it was over, and unleashes a devastating right hook to the jaw. The two back up, and Serenian pays his respects to the Graf. Even though he is his enemy, he will never forget his name. May he rest in peace. But before he can decapitate the Baron, Chris sends a smoke bomb. He appears in front of Rinian, and Rinian assumes that this is the Black Fog Demon. Chris, in his anger, sends a strike toward Rinian and leaps in the air. So Rinian wonders what he's doing here, but Chris lodges his spear forcefully into the chest of the knight. He pulls the spear from his corpse and runs towards the Baron. The Baron laughs at the situation. Even in this moment, both of his sons are not here by his side, but rather, Chris is. Chris says he's here for the sake. For the sake of what? For the sake of defending the walls that you have been protecting your whole life. Today, I will take up your duty. The Baron says, if that's the case, 
He owes Chris one. Chris tells him that he can pay him back later. But now, Chris is holding the Baron's lifeless body. The Eight Gate soldiers are in shambles after seeing Sir Rindian dead, and the enemy soldiers try to kill Chris for what he did to their commander. But after witnessing the Baron die in his arms, he brutally starts hacking down Eight Gate soldiers. He stands atop their corpses and yells for attention for all the Eight Gate soldiers. From now on, this area is under protection of Knight Apprentice Chris. For those who don't value their life, cross the line as he swipes his spear on the ground. The foolish soldiers think they have the upper hand since it's only one boy and rush in at Chris. He lets off the dancing steel technique and in an instant kills all the incoming soldiers. A large man approaches him with a huge flail and he says he's Pedro the Knight and he'll avenge Sir Rinian. Chris wraps the chains of his flail around his own arm and pulls the man towards him and punches him in the face with so much force that the large man is now cowering in fear. He hits him with his own flail and says once again, for those seeking Seeking vengeance, come at me. For those seeking glory, come at me. I will crush every one of you. Man, this is one of my favorite chapters in the series. So many twists and emotions in this one. It really went crazy. I want to take a second to appreciate uh, Baron Van Ludwig's character. He was always a scary looking commander, but at the end of the day, he always did what was right. And I'm, I'm going to miss him throughout the story, if I'm going to be honest. Chris, now using both Pedro's flail and his spear, is cutting down numerous soldiers. Two enemy archers shoot towards him, but he crushes the skull of the man in his way and uses his body as a stepping stone. He sends the flail into the face of one of the archers and two more swordsmen appear from behind. But without even looking, Chris cuts them both down. He severs the head of the remaining archer in brutal fashion. Lind and Slily join up and the Zerk men gets the news that the Graf has died. The commander is shocked and concerned that they still have a chance, but is told that they're still pushing the enemy forces back. Who's doing this? The recon squad? No, it's the squad under Knight Apprentice Chris. The boys are hacking and slashing their way through, hundreds of eight gate soldiers. Chris unleashes his death parade and dices up some soldiers like vegetables. The commander looks on and sees how these boys are their new hope. The eight gate troops are losing morale and look towards Sir Anshin for his orders. He grits his teeth angered at this outcome and orders his troops to retreat. They suffered enough today. Chris met the experience point requirement and levels up. The battle is finally over. The troops start screaming at their victory, but look at the lifeless body of Graf and Ludwig. Gien looks towards Chris, but all the soldiers shed a tear. Some time passes and we see the funeral of the Baron, and we see his two sons dressed in all black, mourning their father's passing. The civilians were prohibited from drinking alcohol for three days, and the soldiers all wear a black stripe across their chest as a symbol to their fallen hero. Three days later, the weasel Weehain took over the Graf's title as heir. The panel shifts to Weehain, slamming his chair, asking why his men haven't found Chris. He hears men boasting about Chris's accomplishments. He single-handedly killed 100 enemy soldiers and his squad pushed back a force of 2,000. People even say he's the youngest wise knight. Weehan orders his men to find Chris's whereabouts. Weehan must make him a subordinate, no matter what. Whatever role he gives him, just having his name will boost his family's status. He can't miss this opportunity. The boys are back at the inn, telling Ellis all of their war stories. A man comes in saying he's under orders from Weehane. He needs to know where Chris is. The boys sigh. Another one came in to bother them. Digo is chewing with his mouth open, getting food all up in Lin's face, and Ellis scolds him for his manners. And Lin tells the soldiers that they also don't know where Chris is. The man tells him to stop joking, and these are strict orders. But Lin thinks this guy is going to be annoying. And Doki hurls the axe at the doorway, which stops his next sentence. Ellis apologizes, saying Doki isn't a good drinker. You're too loud, he says, as we get a close-up on the obviously drunk Doki. I have another axe, ha. The group laughs and the soldier runs from the inn. Ellis asks if they truly don't know where Chris is, and they honestly don't. They were told to just wait for him here. Lynn remembers Chris also said he was going to meet a beautiful lady. The scene shifts to the underground prison in Daybed, and a cloaked figure hands money to the guard, gaining entry. We see the assassin from earlier was actually a girl, and the cloaked figure asked her why she allowed herself to be caught. She could have easily escaped. And she turns to see Chris take off his hood. And damn, this chick is bad. Chris is still getting all the baddies. I'm jealous. Even Chris comments on how pretty she is, considering the environment at least. She says her name is Rachel and she was the 26th among the Night Daggers, and without a real name. She's been training to be a mercenary, however, she's been having the same dream. In her dream, her name was not Rachel or the 26th. She's been struggling to figure out who she really is. One day, she met a blind prophet and thought he was just a scammer, 
but he told her that in a night's embrace, she would be consumed by a dark blue flame. She didn't care about life or death and just wanted to understand who she truly is. She wondered what she could do to avoid that dark blue flame and chose not to listen to the prophet. He said the flame would reveal her name. Chris is taken aback and surely she doesn't think that he is the dark blue flame. A flame with dark blue hair and golden eyes will rise above everything after encountering the sword of night. Okay, well, it's definitely Chris now. She asks Chris to let her out and she wants to be by his side. Chris still has doubts about her friendliness, but if it's genuine, it will be a great help in the coming battles. He asks Rachel if she will swear allegiance to him. Rachel just responds saying, if she has to. Chris tells her that when the time comes, he will send someone for her. Wait until then. Rachel asks if he will truly help her find her real name. And Chris just gives her the same answer she gave him, if I have to. The panel shifts to Weehane greeting another Baron, Graf Elouan, the representative of the royal palace. He says his condolences on the death of the hero of the borders and apologizes for the surprise visit. But he came here to inform Weehane that the reward ceremony and crowning of the new Baron will take place at the royal capital. He asks to stay a few days and Wee Hain obliges. Some time passes and Wee Hain is seen on his throne wondering if Elowan really came here just to send a message. He must be planning something. A soldier comes in and informs him that Chris recovered and returned to duty. He's excited at this news and goes to see Chris. Streak asks what he's doing here and he walks past him asking for Chris. Finally, if he can get his hands on Chris, then no one can challenge his authority. The youngest wise knight ever. As he enters the tent, he is startled to see Elowan already sitting there talking to Chris. Elowan laughs at the timing, saying how he meant to tell Weehane something, and this worked out perfectly. Weehane is visibly shocked at what's going on, but Elowan informs him that the third prince requested Chris in the royal palace and they are to depart in 15 days. He also makes sure that Chris hasn't sworn loyalty to anyone yet, and Weehane is sweating nervously. Elowan laughs saying how he can't believe the third prince was admiring a knight rank wiser. This is truly a blessing. And he thinks of courting his daughter to Chris to marry. Chris, yo, we gotta save some women for the rest of us, man. Chris can only think that Weehane should at least try to hide his emotions a little bit as he's seen biting his lip. Chris knows Weehane's future, and it's time for him to leave. This war has taught Chris that even though we can change the future, what's meant to be will always happen. Weehane takes his leave and Elowan notes that this man still didn't learn how to conceal his emotions. He informs Chris that until they leave it will be wise to stay close to him. Chris knew the prince would send a big shot, but who would have thought he would send Graf Elowan? The reason Elowan took this initiative was because he's trying to restrict the power of Dukabis who is gaining influence. Chris doesn't think it's wise to voice his knowledge just yet, but some time passes and we see Chris attending a field of his medicinal herbs, and it asks Elowan if he's bored just following him around. Elowan isn't bored at all however, and is intrigued watching Chris work. He seems to be pretty good at this. Do you make your own medicine, Chris? Chris replies saying that he does, and these days he's focusing on curing the furbrile disease. Elowan thinks to himself that no matter how much he looks at Chris, he can't wrap his head around the fact that this boy is responsible for holding back 2,000 soldiers. Nighttime comes and Chris pets Pumpkey, noting that he's been growing a lot lately and looks pretty tired. Chris thinks that there's only one thing left to do, and he jumps around the city with a cloak on. At the end of the last battle, he remembered that his system told him that he's met the experience requirement, and he's sure that there's some change changes in his body, but he needs to check it out. He arrives at his location and takes off his hood and greets Guyen, who asks him if he really plans to leave this place. Chris mockingly asks Guyen if he plans to hold on to him, but Guyen tells him that he has it backwards. He draws his sword and tells Chris not to faint this time. Oh, here we go, round two. Guyen is excited to see what Chris has got and unleashes his killing intent. Chris seems unfazed and Guyen notes how much he has grown. You'll find a lot more than that, Chris says. Guyen smiles and charges in at the cocky brat. Chris blocks Guyen's strike, which surprises the man, and Chris notices the speed in power and thinks Guyen is a third level wise knight, but Chris just felt it, the second change in his body, something is happening. He's now able to see Guyen's moves as he blocks another strike. Guyen doesn't know if Chris is lucky or not for blocking two of his strikes back to back. He dashes into Chris again and the two send slashes at each other. Guyen smiles since it wasn't luck after all, Chris has gotten much better. Chris on the other hand is just happy that he can keep up. Chris thinks that he can predict when Guyen will attack. But if he keeps blocking like this, he's gonna fall first. He's fighting Guyen, so he needs to go all out and charges back at him. Guyen dodges and creates some distance, noting on Chris's weird tricks. Chris launches from the ground, disappearing in an instant, and Guyen dodges, but Chris flies right through the rock, separating them. Guyen seems to be on the defensive, and Chris hints back to the hunt from the first chapters. He points his spear against the face of the man, but Guyen just smiles and grabs Chris's spear, leaving him shocked. A red electricity envelops Guyen, asking Chris if he's underestimating him. You see, Guyen isn't a third level 
but a fourth level wise knight and has the skill Overhuman, a trait that gives superhuman strength and speed to the user. The scene shifts to Elowan standing outside waiting. For him to be helpful in this situation, he needs to get all the information on the Ludwig family, and his main goal was to secure Chris. Chris approaches and Elowan asks on what's the matter. Just like the first season, Chris got messed up by Guillen and is now down 0-2 in duels. Chris says he overdid it a little and fell during training, but his face says otherwise. Elowan is concerned if Chris will be alright for their trip tomorrow, but Chris says he will and just enters his tent. He pets Pumpkey a little bit and Ellis enters the room and asks Chris if he really plans to go to the royal capital. She came to give Chris a message from Tykeel, don't underestimate the nobles and don't pick a fight recklessly. Chris assures her that he'll be alright and Chris tells Ellis by the the time he comes back, she better be a knight apprentice. The next day comes and the group prepares for their long trip and Weehane stares at Chris, but he just tries to avoid his stare. Chris enters the carriage next to Elowan and the man asks Chris if he's nervous. It's actually quite the opposite and Chris is very excited. Elowan smiles and thinks to himself that Chris just might be a fox pretending to be a squirrel. Chris arrives at the country's capital and is welcomed by the celebration of many citizens. It seems our boy is a hero nationwide, the hero of the castle walls, they chant. Chris is still not used to being praised like this and just thinks they're overdoing it a little. We hear a familiar voice in the crowd telling people to get out of his way or else, and we see the third prince, looking a lot thinner by the way, trying to greet his best friend. Chris kneels and acts formally, but the prince tells him to knock that off. He's prepared something for him. The two arrive at a table with a large assortment of food. Chris is getting spoiled for real. The prince tells Chris to eat up and even calls him his knight, even though Chris hasn't made the oath yet. We fast forward to the next day and Chris was told that his audience with the king would be in four days. The prince tells him that he will be busy and leaves. And finally, Chris is free. It's time to explore. One of the guards asks him where he is going, and I just want to know if this guy is not reading the story. The four times this happened, at least three of those times, someone got messed up. Chris tells him he wants to go look around, but the soldier tells him that his orders are to not let Chris leave without an escort. Chris wonders if this is the third prince's order and smiles to himself. He lets out a menacing aura that locks the two soldiers in place and leaves the castle. He tells the man that if anyone asks him on how he left, just tell them he left by force. Chris thinks that the members of the royal family are anxious about him and don't want him to get close to other nobles. Chris is wanted by both sides, and if he can play his cards right, he can stand to gain a lot. Chris explores and marvels at the capital shops, and buys a little bit of everything from a herb shop. The man says it's interesting that Chris isn't poor, and that's a weird way to greet his customers I guess. The man thanks Chris for the payment, and Chris asks the man if he heard of a tradeswoman named Yavarin. The man thinks, but can't recall. But then remembers someone with a similar name is selling south toward the outer gates. Chris ventures in this direction and finds a short girl selling some mysterious candles. There's a large crowd all around intrigued on these items. A thug approaches the girl and asks her what the use of these candles are in a city that's lit by magic. He wants to buy them for one copper coin, but Yavarin doesn't relent. She only accepts gold coins. Chris is also in the crowd and asks the man next to him about the situation. The guy tells him that some thugs are trying to steal the child's goods. Chris asks the old man if he plans to sit here and watch, but this guy has no choice. Those thugs are subordinates of Yup. Chris has no idea who this is, but it seems that he has quite a powerful influence to get this kind of reaction out of the citizens. Chris thinks that he's gonna need to investigate further, and recalls in his past life there was a very powerful trade organization, the White Flag, which was also an independent military force. Chris wonders how the future of the White Flag will solve the current conflict. Yavarin is the future leader of this group, although she is a child at the moment. The thug gets in her face and tells her to be grateful that he'll even pay for these items. She pulls out a knife and tells the man not to come any closer, which angers the thug. He pulls his sword and justifies his own actions, saying how she was aggressive first. Chris thinks that three men against one girl is not an ideal situation. He is sure that the future Yavarin wouldn't die here, but the future has changed due to Chris's actions, and he can't gamble with her life, so he cannot just ignore this situation. As he walks forward towards the group, Chris asks the men if they really plan on ganging up on a little girl. The thugs turn back to get into Chris's face, asking the boy what he plans to do about it. Do you plan to kill her? Chris asks. The thug responds saying that he's a thoughtful person, so he would only rough her up a bit. Chris isn't pleased. The thug swings his sword on Chris, but this is light work for our boy. He grabs his wrist and forces the man to yield, and knocks him out with a chop to the neck. Chris asks the other two men if they want to attack, 
together since one is not enough. A boy in the crowd recognizes Chris as the hero from the war, and the crowd is shocked that this is the man who stopped 2,000 soldiers with only his squad. This isn't good news to the thugs, however, who throw down their weapons and beg on the floor for forgiveness. Smart move. Chris smiles and is happy that he resolved the problem so easily. Chris asks Yaviren if she's okay, but she doesn't answer. The third prince approaches and asks Chris what he's doing out here. Chris is a nervous sweat and wonders what the prince is doing here. His guards told him what happened at the gates, but he tells Chris it's time to go back. There's things to discuss. The young girl begrudgingly tells Chris that she will pay him back, and Chris wonders if it's alright to leave her like this. The prince waves his finger and says that Chris has many people to duel. They think his knight is weak. Chris is confused and wonders if he was really scheduled to fight in duels. And the prince said of course he was. Chris is the youngest wise knight. They need to show off his power. Chris sighs but follows the happy prince and they arrive at the prince's chamber. And he asks Chris if there's anything that he wants. Chris tells him that he always did have a dream and it was to own some land. The prince smiles. So you want to be a feudal lord, huh? No worries, I can give you that the largest and most fertile fields in my possession. Chris isn't so greedy, however. He just wants a small piece of land. It reminds the prince on his promise to deliver him the first fortress of the eight gates. But before he does this, he wants to get a chance to show his ability to solve some of the kingdom's troubles. The prince tells him just to get it out already. Chris wants the land of Proudman. Proudman? That place is utterly abandoned. The feudal lord of that province joined a cult and abducted his own citizens and held an unknown ritual. Monsters often roam those lands and it's tainted with the smell of blood. The prince is confused but gathers himself. Wait, Chris, if you want land, then that means you're gonna be a noble. You said you're gonna be my knight. Chris continues that he heard from Elowan that there are two major powers fighting in the royal palace. Proudman will be an excuse for Chris to serve as a part of the royal faction. And if the prince will allow it, Chris wants to be a small part of this battle. Eric is shocked at this and doesn't really understand but pretends to follow along. A servant rushes into the room, telling the two that the Grand Duke has arrived. We see some panels of this guy still in his armor with blood stains all around him. The prince looks a little nervous at this news and Chris looks behind the servant to see this absolute unit of a man. So this must be the Grand Duke. The man apologizes for his attire since he was in a hurry and didn't have time to change. This is the head of the aristocracy, the Duke Bentharium Rolled Gauche. The servant tries to reason with him to not confront the prince with such clothes, but the Duke just looks at him and asks the man if he's crazy. Do you know who I am? Even if I wanted to kill the prince, there is no one who would stop me. This is such a Chad move, what the fuck the hell? This leaves both Eric and Chris stunned. No one can oppose me in this kingdom. I am the most devout subject. He calms his voice and comments that maybe a god would need to descend to challenge him. Chris is so confused on how this guy can speak so reckless in front of the prince like this. Just how powerful is this man? The pressure is immense. He is also a wise knight. Chris steadies himself and says he can't believe all the rumors he hears. Who knew the duke could joke around so much? Rold has no comment at first and Chris wonders if he made the wrong move. Then all of a sudden, the duke bursts out with laughter. He tells Chris that he sure is a hero alright, since he has the guts to talk to him like that. The prince chimes in asking what Rold is doing here, but the dude just straight up ignores him, which is funny as hell to me for some reason, and continues to ask Chris if he's really the youngest wise user at only 17. Chris agrees and the duke says that he was first able to acquire wise at 25, and he admires his speed. The prince is worried that the duke came here just to see Chris, and yells at him telling him that Chris is his knight and to back off. The duke just continues to ignore the prince and asks Chris what he was promised. Gold? Women? Honor? Chris can't believe he's talking so frankly in front of a member of the royal house, but Rold continues. I will give you even more than that. Join me. The prince continues his protest, but to no avail. Chris can't muster an answer, but Rold questions if it's really that hard to answer. It seems pretty simple to him. Chris thinks that this man does not care about following others. His appearance and power brings others like him around. It's just as Chris expected. This man is a monarch. The prince tries to get Chris back on his side and tells him if it's Proudman that he wants, he will convince his father to make it his. Now the scene arrives at the Circado Palace and Chris is walking towards the king. He kneels and the king begins saying that this is Chris, the man who blocked the eastern wall. Raise your head. Chris is confused because he can't feel the spirit in the king's voice. He notices his blurry eyes and droopy wrinkles. He can tell that the king is sick and tired from just a glance. Is this really the king who led Circado for generations? This must be the reason the duke's power continues to grow day by day. The person on his other side must be the actual leader of the royal faction, the first prince, Dacilio. King says that Chris looks too young to be a hero and questions if he can even lift a spear. 
Duke Roll tells the king that there's many people who died assuming Chris's skills by his appearance. Decilio continues that this is the youngest wise knight that blocked a force of 2,000 with four men. It's not easy to judge him by his age. The king heard about his accolades and knows there's something that Chris wants. Is it true that you want Proudman? Roald and Decilio are shocked at this request and Chris agrees. And he says he wants to farm crops and make that area inhabitable again. The surrounding guests gossip wondering why he would want to go there. Is he dumb? Duke Roald likes Chris's decision and his interest in him grows and urges the king to allow it. Chris can solve the problems there. Decilio catches the Duke's gaze at Chris and knows that he wants him. The king accepts the proposal and grants him the title of Baron and gives him the Proudman Castle. The prince is back with Chris and they're talking about what just happened. Chris is a little disappointed that he's being treated the exact same though since he's a noble. The prince set up duels and now we see Chris looking at his first challenger and doesn't seem to be interested. And also wonders why the prince invited Decilio and royal knights here as well. This is too much attention for our boy. His first challenger, Mide Basin, the firstborn of Viscount Basin, introduces himself and looks down on Chris. Chris grits his teeth annoyed at this entire situation and asks the man if he uses a sword. He agrees and wonders who Chris thinks he is looking down on his superior. Chris asks for a sword and receives a wooden one, and Mide asks Chris if he's mocking him. Take your spear, not a fake sword. Chris says that he's talking way too much and he won't say it again. This wooden sword is enough. Mide is enraged and pulls out his real sword, ready to put Chris in his place. Chris is fighting a former member of the Royal Guard and introduces himself as First Knight and Baron. This further infuriates Mide. Not anyone can become a knight. He will show him the true difference. Mide launches off the ground right at Chris. Chris is analyzing his movements and is slightly impressed. Mide shifts directions and goes into Chris's blind spot. Chris can understand why he was a royal knight, but he's still no match. Mide stabs his sword towards Chris, but Chris uses his opportunity to kick his leg from under him, catching Mide off guard. Chris just thinks that this man is just like all the others and bonks him on the head, knocking him out. He asks who will show him swordsmanship that will be used on the battlefield. You are all royal knights, yet none of you are risking your lives. What kind of hypocrisy is this? All the surrounding knights are enraged at these words and start challenging Chris one by one. Chris continues saying today he will honor himself as a knight. The surrounding soldiers are seething with anger that this boy just declared himself a knight. Chris yells that he hopes everyone will bear witness to his new title and if anyone disagrees, raise your sword and challenge me. Prove your power. The men rush down to challenge Chris and Chris starts whooping everybody's ass. He was challenged by 28 knights, 5 left with broken arms, 3 with broken legs, and 2 with fractured skulls. And Chris was not defeated once. This might be the start of our boy's villain arc for real. Um, what the hell? We now see the attendant talking to Eric and telling him that their plan is going smoothly. The prince then busts into Chris's room, happy that the rumors are spreading. 28 wins and 0 losses. The undefeated knight in duels against the royal guard. Chris is busy putting on some drip and even the prince says he's looking pretty good. They have a banquet to go to today. At night time, we see an unknown man trying to riz up this girl, Lady Agatha, from outside her house. Inside the room, she's talking with her sickly brother and she tells him that she has to entertain these nobles. Her sick brother tells her not to go, but she has to for her family. The only thing these siblings were left behind was an incredible debt, and the only male in the family is bedridden. Agatha has to step up. She smiles at her brother and she'll be back soon. The scene shifts to the banquet hall and some girls are talking about Baron Mayhew and how handsome he is. One of the girls brag that tonight she's gonna leave with him, but she spots Marquis Zighall. Trust me guys, I'm confused with all these characters too, I'ma just try to go with it. If Zighall is here, then that means Circado's beauty, Emilia Zighall, is here as well. And we get a shot of this absolute dime. Mayhew approaches the Marquis and greets him, and compliments the beautiful Emilia. The Zighall family has no heir, so Emilia is a hot commodity. To become the head of a Marquis family, a gentleman signals to introduce the main star of this banquet, Count Weehane Ludwig, the guardian of the Eastern Walls. Following him, the hero of the battlefield, the youngest knight apprentice and baron of Proudbund, Chris. Weehane is completely enraged that Chris just stole his thunder and tells Chris it seems that he's quite successful now. But Weehane can't believe that even with Chris's big brain, he still wanted a place like Proudman. Chris can only think that these people do not know the true value of the area that he selected, but he will show them in due time. Weehane, with the creepiest face I've seen all day, offers some advice. But Elowan comes right in time to stop the conversation, wondering if Chris is the same person since they got here. The Marquis Zighall comes to shake Chris's hand and completely passes up Weehane. It's crazy. This further pisses him off. Chris exchanges pleasantries with the Marquis and asks to take a look around. This is his first banquet after all. 
Marcus is browsing and just like that, a baddie comes up to him named Margaret and greets the battlefield hero. She starts touching him up and everyone here knows about the new Baron. As she's trying to get Chris to smash, he overhears a drunk man scolding the Lady Agatha from before. Her family, the Yelnovans, only survive on handouts. He's waited a long time, so don't push him any further. I assume he wants to do the deed. But Agatha seems very uncomfortable. Chris asks the baddie next to him on who that is, and she says that he's the Baron Holdman, a loan shark. Getting close to him won't be a good idea. He was divorced three times, and rumor has it he beats his last wife. Mayhew approaches and greets Chris and asks if he's enjoying the banquet, and tells him that he needs a partner to dance with. Chris didn't think about that, and Margaret just stands there smiling. Now, Amelia approaches and says that she too was curious about who to dance with. Yo, Chris, you better chill, man. What do you want me to freaking end myself right now? God damn, man. She introduces herself, and Chris tells her that it's quite an honor to meet the beauty of Sir Carl. Margaret is pissed off that Amelia just came here to steal her man, and Mayhew can't believe that Amelia said hello to Chris first. Margaret is seething and asks Chris to go outside, but we hear another scream from Agatha, which gets Chris's attention. He excuses himself from the two girls, and the drunk Baron is still forcing himself upon her, but she tries to calm him down. He says if she sleeps with him tonight, he will clear all of her family's debt. Think about your sick brother, Agatha. Man, this guy is disgusting. The man starts groping her, which enrages Chris, but Agatha grabs a bottle, do you think I'm that easy, and whacks the man on the head, knocking him out. But I don't know if that was a good idea for her family debt. Chris is in awe of her actions. Who is this? Agatha yells at the man for touching her in such perverted ways, and Chris admires her bravery. The drunk man gets up cursing the woman, and Chris approaches him from behind with a wave of killing intent, telling the Baron that that's enough. If he continues this farce, he will be held accountable. Make your next decision carefully, Baron Holdman. Holdman can't muster any words, and Agatha apologizes to the new Baron of Proudman for making a fuss at his banquet. He says it's fine, admiring her amazing bottle strike, and asks the girl if he can have a dance with her. Chris is the Riz Lord, I swear to God. Chris and Agatha begin to dance, and Chris thinks she's quite good, and asks her if she's the only heir to the Yelnovan family. She tells Chris about her bedridden brother, who was supposed to be a great knight, but his condition is holding him back. Chris smiles as he thinks he's finally meeting him, Royce Yelnovan. The next day comes and we see Chris next to a horse, as the prince runs up to him asking where he's going. To Agatha's house? Chris thinks that the prince is just bored and wants to come for some entertainment. Chris offers to take him along, which Eric agrees, and the attendant wonders if he should get the carriage. But two horses are fine. He is accompanied by the strongest knight after all. The two are riding and the prince wonders why Chris likes her. She's not even that cute. Chris says that beauty is not everything, and in his eyes, she is more than enough. The prince wonders if he knows the right way, but Chris always knows where he's going. The prince laughs that Chris is quite aggressive in getting women. Agatha, however, is not having a good time, because the Baron brought his boys to deal with her for what happened at the banquet. He demands the girl to pay all of her debt now, and she argues that he knows their situation and they don't have the money. If she doesn't have the money, she'll have to pay with her body. He signals his men to grab her, but her brother Royce comes outside, telling the men not to lay a single finger on her. But he begins coughing and falls to his knees. The Baron orders the men to grab Royce as well, but Agatha stands defending her brother. The Baron is moved but wonders where she found the courage to act like this. She should be thankful of how he has treated her so far, but now it's time to collect. Chris comes in the picture and asks the man how much Agatha owes. The Baron is confused on why Chris is here, but obviously he's here to see his girl. The first henchman approaches Chris asking what he's doing, interrupting business, and the Baron is actually a smart guy and tells his man that he can't handle Chris and to back off. He asks Chris if he really means to pay her debt, and as a matter of fact, he will. Chris will pay the debt of the family and the Baron is enraged at this, but no matter, the debt totals 10 platinum eagles, or a thousand gold coins. Can you afford that, boy? Chris says he'll write him a check, but the Baron wonders if he can trust his words. But his best friend, the Prince, pops out behind him saying that he can trust him, which completely takes the Baron off guard. Eric says if he doesn't trust Chris, then he can pay him himself, and the Baron is forced to yield and the situation seems resolved. Chris says it's good to see Agatha again, and she's confused on why Chris keeps helping her. Riz Lord Chris says he can't leave a beautiful girl like her in danger. And by the way, even though you are gorgeous when you cry, you're even more beautiful when you smile. So please, stop crying. Yeah, I'm about to take some notes. Royce isn't so trusting and grabs his sword to confront Chris. Chris introduces himself as the Baron of Proudman, and he tells Royce of his situation, which startles the sick man. Of course. Of course he knows Royce. Royce is Lewis. If he didn't have a lung disease, then Chris would have never met him. Royce changed his name to Lewis out of shame for being in a family that was so in debt. We saw Royce all the way back in chapter 1. 
This was one of Chris's longtime friends who even joined him on his mercenary mission. Chris hands the man a bag and tells him to take it. It's some medicine called fish smell. Royce is perplexed on why Chris is giving him something so precious, and Chris tells Royce that he's about to go to the forsaken land of Proudman, but he's gonna try to change the land so people can live there. It won't be easy, and I need people to support me. Will you join me, Royce? Chris even offers to look after his sister as well. He promises Royce a life with no regrets, but in return, he asks for his sword. Will Royce use it for the Baron of Proudman? Royce is moved by these words and kneels in front of Chris, swearing his loyalty until his dying breath. Chris smiles. Everything is going according to plan. He is no longer a private, a squire, or a hero. Chris is now a baron. The scene shifts to Yaviron and Chris asks her to join him as well. He's going to a new land and needs people with talent to join him and he wants her to trade there. Chris originally planned to only get acquainted but no longer. Will he sit on the sidelines? He will amass all the power he can. He won't lose such a talented girl. Yaviron says she seeks fair trade. She values the word of a covenant over 100 gold coins. Chris needs someone who can trade and abide by those mottos. Those are the only two rules of the white flag. Come with me, Yaviron. Chris is now seen eating with the prince, but something feels off. Eric is sad that his friend is leaving the next day because he had so much fun with him in the capital. But Chris has things to do. The prince fakes a smile, and even if he tries to hold him, he'll still go, right? Chris is lost for words, but the prince gets up and leaves the room, but tells him to make some time for tonight. Chris was confused at the prince's actions and questions what he's really up to, but Eric just tells him not to worry about it and just meet him later. We fast forward to this meeting and the attendant is seen escorting Chris into a long corridor. Chris was worried about why the prince summoned him so late. Is he planning to trap him here? Considering the prince's personality, this might be possible. He is shown to the room and Chris enters and Chris can't help but notice the strong stench. The prince says he knows it smells, but it's only a little. He used eggs to make some paint. And behind the prince, we see many paintings that we can assume he was working on. Chris is perplexed on what he is seeing and asks the prince if he really was the one who painted all of these. Who else you think did it? This is one of the prince's closely guarded secrets. Only a few know about this. Since he doesn't have any friends, in his boredom, he comes here to paint, and it's become one of his great hobbies, even though he thinks he's not so talented. Chris, however, is in awe of his skill and tells the prince that his paintings are amazing. Chris didn't expect to see this here. It's even famous to Chris who isn't familiar with fine art. He sees a painting called The Run by an artist Emil in his past life. To Chris's knowledge, the prince disappeared a few years from now and is never found and it's said that he died. But what if that isn't true? What if he hid his identity and lived as an artist? If Chris's guess is right, then this little prince is the renowned artist Emil. The prince wonders if his paintings are okay, but Chris seems to be staring intently and can't hold back his amazement. These are all so great, almost perfect. The prince can't believe those words, but Chris tells him that he can prove it. Aren't you curious what price your paintings can reach? This excites the prince and he tells Chris that he'll leave that to him. But don't you dare lie to me about the amount you get. The prince reaches into some cabinets to give something to Chris, and he throws him something wrapped up. That is bluefish, a magic weapon. It has a power of enchantment. How can Chris call himself a knight without a proper weapon? Chris bows and is grateful for his gift, and the prince tells Chris to take great care of that weapon and himself. Some time passes and Chris takes Agatha, Royce, and Yavarin to the carriage and Royce offers to sit shotgun but Chris tells him to just get in the back and rest. After two months of a long journey, the group arrives to the barren looking landscape and right on cue, a group of goblins attacks. Chris orders Royce to take care of the girls as he confronts these beasts. He needs to try out his new spear. Every swing is tearing multiple goblins apart and Chris marvels at the power of his new weapon as he excitedly slices the remaining goblins. One goblin gets by him but before he can get to it, an arrow is lodged in the side of its head. It looks like the boys have been waiting here for Chris this whole time. And what a sick shot of the group getting back together again after such a long time. The boys are curious on Chris's new last name, Proudman. Chris has been promoted to Baron and they're happy for their boy and can't believe that he's actually a noble. And also ask Chris about the people that he came with. Royce and Agatha introduce themselves and Doki and Yavarin give each other a one word introduction. Chris tells the group that it's time to get moving. They make camp and Chris prepares some food and Chris asks Lynn to fill him in on the situation. There's about a thousand goblins roaming this land, and that's about the amount that Chris expected. Chris asked the boys to clear the monsters in Proudman. Lynn thought that this would be an easy task, but quickly changed his mind after seeing the goblin base. All the goblins ran away upon seeing the three boys. They must have an intelligent leader. Chris ponders on who this could be, but hears a familiar sound from outside. It's Pumpkey. Chris rushes outside to see his boy, and it's been a while since the two were with each other. Pumpkey is freaking huge now and tackles Chris, and he pets him and asks his boy if he wants to go on a walk after so long. 
Pumpkin gets down to signal Chris to get on his back, and Chris gets on, but Pumpkin starts taking off, a little too fast for our boy. They arrive at the abandoned castle of Proudman, and Chris recalls that the previous lord conducted experiments in this castle. Chris thinks that the sudden disappearance of goblins can mean two things. They either flew away, or went into the ground. Chris finds a passageway down to the basement, and Chris gets the boys to start killing the goblins hiding in these holes. They clear their way and enter one of the passages that lead into a large room. Chris orders to block the exit, and doesn't seem interested in following the goblins. They could have gone anywhere. Chris asks Lin on the status of the migrants he plans to bring, but Lin's having a hard time since this isn't exactly an ideal living spot, and the land isn't good to farm on either. Chris thinks that that's fine, and he has bigger plans for Proudman than just farming. A few days later, the migrants start arriving at the castle and shake Lin's hand and thank the boys for clearing all the monsters. The old citizens will try their best to turn this place back into usable farmland. Lin thinks he knows why Chris sent him and the boys first, but Chris interrupts him and tells the migrants that they need to set up some temporary lodges. Lodging, and he asks if anyone in the crowd has experience in carpentry. Several men raise their hands and one man approaches Chris and lists his skills. He asks the man to make a large wooden house, then he asks the group if there's any miners among them. A few more men raise their hands as well, and Chris likes the situation. He has about 20 useful people, and this will help speed things up. Some time passes and Chris and the boys are traveling up the mountain, and Lynn comments that if they plan to come this way often, they should probably build a road. Digo asks Chris if they need to call him Baron now. Now, but Chris really never cared about such things. Digo asks him why he brought them to the Blade Mountain, and Chris tells the boys it's time to mine some gray gold. Gold? Does this mountain really have gold? Chris thinks that in his past life, this land was occupied by the Eight Gates, but his victories in war helped change that. They arrive at the location and Chris tells the group to be on guard for goblins. He examines all the gray crystals that he sees around. Chris takes a piece and tells Lynn to eat it. Eat it? Digo takes a bite and says it tastes almost like salt. Well, Digo, you would be right. This is a rock salt mine. About one month passes, and later in Daybed, we see Murdoch talking to Jack, the medicinal plant merchant, and one of his men asks him if there's any news on Lord Chris. But how is he supposed to know anything? And he shuts the door abruptly. He thinks to himself that Chris went to his new land and eliminated all the monsters and took immigrants, but didn't take him. Is it because he's a thug? Is he not worth keeping around? He curses Chris, and maybe it's better that he didn't go to that shitty land. It's not like he wanted to anyways. One of his men tell him that he has a visitor, and Murdoch wonders on who it is. And one boy says that he was sent by Baron Chris. The boy tells him that Chris has invited Murdoch to join him in his new land, which startles Murdoch. He doesn't know what to make of this, but the the boy tells him that he's leaving in three days. If he wants to come, meet them by the front gate. Also, Chris told the boy to leave a message. Don't lower yourself too much and do what you want. We shift back to Proudman and we see goblins hiding in the bushes. An arrow flies into the arm of one and Lind and Chris are seen hunting them down. Lind spots the hobgoblin and assumes that it's their leader, but they let him go. Lind wonders if this is a good idea, but Chris tells him that it is because he's an intelligent creature and is unlikely to attack them again. Lind worries about this as well since they'll probably just attack somewhere else. But this is also a part of Chris's plan. Chris sighs, if being a noble would be this troublesome, he wouldn't have asked for this. Digo and Doki are seen helping the villagers lifting logs that normally four people need to lift. They almost finished the first wooden house and Chris is happy with its progress. Also, the castle wall is being repaired. Chris sees something else going on, and the woodworker didn't get the chance to ask him something, and he wonders what Chris's position is. He's young, so maybe like a manager? Chris thinks that he used up all of his herbs and he needs to venture back into the mountains, but just as he thinks this, it seems he doesn't need to do so, as he sees Murdoch and his crew arrive. Chris welcomes him, but apologizes that he's going to put him to work pretty soon, since they're low on workers. Murdoch is excited to start, and Chris hands him a map of the herbs in the area, and tells him that he should be familiar with this kind of job. Chris asks Murdoch if he knows how to make medicine, which he doesn't, but another voice says that he will make the medicine for three silver coins, and it's Jack, the medicinal merchant from Daybed. It seems he can't let his VIP customer get away from him that easily, so he's going to come here as well. We aren't the only ones who came for you. As Chris turns, he sees Taikio, Ralph, and Ellis with a hundred infantry soldiers who fought alongside Chris and swore allegiance to him. Another voice yells out to Chris, cursing him for leaving him. It seems Streak wanted to come along as well. Nobody in this story can get enough of Chris. Streak tells him that if there's no discipline around here, nobody's gonna think of him as a baron. Chris still thinks that Streak is as noisy as ever, and the villagers around finally understand that Chris is their feudal lord. Streak bows to Chris and swears an oath of allegiance to protect this land to the very end. All of Chris's allies bow. All of the villagers begin to bow as well. Lin takes a look at Chris as well, 
and also makes a vow to swear allegiance, and urges Chris to let him swear this oath. Chris speaks up, thanking everyone for following him, and with the power vested in him, he accepts their oath. And we see one of the coolest panels of the entire story, of Chris being surrounded by all his friends and everyone who's followed him since the beginning. This is making me a little emotional right now. Inside the castle, all of our favorite characters are awaiting their new orders from Chris, because he's going to start assigning some jobs. Streak is going to be in charge of the barracks and troop management. Yviron will lead the trade negotiations in nearby territories. Royce and Ellis will be Chris's new knight apprentices and will take turns patrolling the land. The three OGs will help Baxter in rebuilding the castle until they're needed for combat. That is all for everyone. Streak stays in the room and talks to Chris on the situation. It's going to be hard to defend the castle if they send troops to the salt mine. They're going to be lightly defended. Chris is thinking of using the salt mine later on, however, since even if they do want to, they're going to need permission from the Empire, and on top of that, they're going to be charged a hefty tax. Streak continues to list the problems with handling troops, and Chris only understands one thing. He needs money. He tells Streak to send invitations to the lords close to his territory. Streak asks if he means to invite them to Proudmund when it's in a terrible condition. But Chris just jokingly tells him if it would be better to paint the castle gold instead. They are not in the position to be worrying about appearances. Chris is then seen going to the training grounds and sees Royce almost on his deathbed being trained by Tai Kiel. Chris tells the man that he's looking more dead than when he was sick. And Royce looks towards Chris hoping for a rescue. And Chris notes that the medicine is very effective. And it should be okay for Royce to train hard. No time for rest however as Tai Kiel yells at the boy to continue running. Tykeel isn't too fond of Royce, but he'll do this training as a favor to Chris. But Chris just tells the man that in time he will see Royce's true potential. Tykeel wonders what the busy lord is doing just talking to him, and Chris came here not as the lord, but as Tykeel's student. He's feeling stuck with his current abilities, and Chris can't afford to get lazy now. He needs to get stronger more than ever. He asks Tykeel to teach him all the experience that he's built up, and Tykeel smiles. He thought Chris would become arrogant after becoming a noble, but it seems he doesn't need to worry. From now on, they will spar once a day. Chris says it will be an honor, but Tykeel is much more grateful. A few days pass and a carriage arrives to the castle. Baron Van Saknad arrives. He seems to be a little jealous of this so-called hero of the battlefield, and wants to find out what kind of player Chris truly is. The scene shifts to the men sitting around a table with all the barons that Chris invited. He introduces himself and apologizes for the poor state of his castle. Chris sets some pretty basic food on the table and said, due to the condition of Proudman at the moment, he thinks they should eat the same as the residents of the territory. Baron Vangtes's son wonders if Chris expects him to eat this garbage. But Guillen is also in attendance and says the food is actually quite good. Chris knew Weehane wouldn't accept his invitation, but to think Guillen would come was a surprise to him. There are three key members, the Baron Saknad from the west, Viscount Dutch from the south, and the Count Vangtes from the southwest. These are the three territories that border Proudmund, and by them accepting this invitation, it means they expect something out of Chris. Baron Saknad is the richest and closest one to Proudmund. Chris wonders what his true goal is, but feels an intense energy from that Baron's knight who's staring a little too intently at our boy. Chris thinks that he might be the strongest fighter in their province, so bringing him along means a peaceful agreement might be out of the cards. The most important person to Chris, however, is the Viscount Dutch. And Chris asks him if he's been suffering from goblin attacks. It seems he's been having a hard time. The Viscount thinks that Chris is mocking him, but instead Chris offers to help him with the situation. He asks for 30 gold coins a month for his help. The Viscount thinks that's a pretty hefty sum, but Chris sweetens the deal and includes that he will also handle the thieves that appear every year from the West as well. This shocks the Viscount that he was even aware of this fact. Chris says that as a gesture of goodwill, he will even take the payment after he's completed the task. Guillen smiles, thinking that Chris is a few steps ahead of these local lords. The scene shifts to the fat lord leaving thinking that Chris was nothing special, and wonders why his father even sent him here. His knight, who seems to be a pretty smart guy, comments that this place has very hard-working citizens, and the foundation might even be complete before the summer. 
But this fat lord says no matter what they do, it's still a dead land. A man runs into the fat guy's servant and apologizes, but the lord doesn't want to let this slide. He asks the man to come back and apologize to his servant, even though he did and the servant seems pretty much unharmed. The lord wants to escalate the situation and tells his servant to shut up. He pretends that his servant's arm was broken in this little exchange and with a wicked smile demands compensation. We now see Ellis patrolling the town, thinking her job isn't so bad, but hears a commotion going on and rushes to check it out. We now see the fat lord ordered his knight to kill the man who just bumped into his servants. Oh, he's about to get messed up for real. The scene shifts and we see Chris conversing with Guillen, asking him why he really came. Guillen says that Chris has gotten a lot bolder lately and asks him about the hundred soldiers that came with equipment and weapons. Did you really think that Wee Hain would turn a blind eye? Chris counters, saying that he never really asked them to do it, and that's a bit harsh. But Guillen just laughs, saying how he's kidding. Consider the soldiers a gift. Weehain is too busy with adult entertainment to even care. The reason Guillen came here is that daybed is just too boring for him. Chris thinks to himself that if possible, he wants Guillen to join him, but that might be a little challenging at the moment. Guillen asks Chris if his skill has gotten a little bit better. A little, I guess, Chris responds. Guillen lets out a menacing aura, telling Chris that he's been itching for a fight. Shall they spar? Chris accepts, but soon a soldier bursts into the room, informing Chris of what happened outside. Chris rushes to the scene, and back in the town, the fat lord wonders what everybody is staring at. Ellis curses herself for being too late because the man is already dead. She asks the lord why he had him killed, but this fat ass just smiles saying how he asked his knight to do it, and then immediately after starts trying to hit on Ellis. She is enraged at his arrogance and the man asks her to sleep with him. She asks again why the man just killed one of their villagers, and the fat lord says he's tired of this. That guy just broke his servant's arm and didn't apologize. Even though he did, but the fat lord says that that's good enough reason to end his life. Ellis' frustration is now visible and tells the fatty that he needs to come with her for an investigation. The guy readies his knight and tells Ellis that if she can best him, then maybe he will consider it. Ellis tells everyone to step back and thinks what the right move in this situation is. What would Chris do? We get a flashback to Ellis being trained by her father. He tells her that her sword is powerful enough and it's time to move on to the next step. But keep in mind, Ellis, that you will now have responsibility. Being a knight isn't easy. How you swing your sword will impact the people around you. And sometimes you will be put in difficult situations. If you cannot make a decision fast enough, know this. If it's hard to judge, just follow your beliefs. Ellis taunts the knight to come at her, and then the knight obliges by rushing in. Ellis readies her rapier, but doesn't want to underestimate a knight who protects an aristocrat. But Ellis quickly ducks down and dodges, sending a quick jab of her rapier at the man, cutting his eye. He can't even see her sword, he thinks. Ellis smiles. What's the matter? You seem a little slow. The man jumps in again for another attack and winds back his sword, but Ellis seems to be done with his amateur and dashes past him, leaving him in a barrage of her sword cuts, with blood gushing from all over his body. The fat lord is enraged that his knight has just died, but Ellis tells the arrogant brat that that guy died the moment he accepted the duel. The fatty keeps rambling on that he won't forget this and how dare a mere peasant girl talk back to him. But now, Chris arrives and tells Ellis she did a good job. Chris is accompanied by Lind and Guillen and notices that the other barons haven't left yet. They seem to be keeping a keen eye on Chris. The fat lord is actually thankful that Chris arrived and tells him that Ellis has just killed his knight. Ellis breaks down the whole situation and Chris walks to the dead villager, mourning his passing. This person shouldn't have died today. He apologizes to him because this is due to Chris's short-sightedness. Chris calls out to Yord Vangtest. If a knight died in a fair duel, then there is no compensation, but Chris has yet to receive payment for the loss of one of his people. The fat lord is shocked at hearing this. What are you talking about? Chris says that since he killed somebody, he's going to have to pay the price, and throws a sword and formally challenges the fat lord. This is for an innocent person's death. He will not accept no for an answer. This shocks all of the onlookers, and Gien smiles. The fat lord fumbles his words, and his knight, 
who would have fought for him, is dead. He can't possibly pick up a sword. Chris letting out the full extent of his anger, yells for the fatty to shut up. This is Proudmund. They respect their citizens here. How dare you come in here and harm anyone? Hold your weapon, Yord. Show that you're an aristocrat. The man is under stress and asks anyone around them if they can fight for him. He will reward them, please. But no one seems to answer. Chris holds his sword next to him, telling him to fight or else. The Lord pleads with Chris. He's never held a sword before in his life. Please spare me. He's sorry. But Chris, with a murderous look in his eyes, tells the Lord again to pick up the sword. But the fat Lord just yells, Is this all because I killed that meager peasant? Why are you doing this to me? Wrong words, fatty. Chris gives the man a haircut and tells his floating head that this is the price for playing with his people's lives. Baron Saknod has a nervous sweat. He can't believe that Chris just killed him. Though it was justified, he is a noble after all. He thinks to himself that Chris has made a terrible mistake and he won't let this go. Lynn tells Chris that their main goal should be to reconcile with the Lord and send the body back carefully, but Chris doesn't want to hear any of it. Lind continues that a conflict right now wouldn't be good. They don't even have a castle wall to defend themselves. But Chris suits up and asks the boy who said anything about defending. Lind thinks that it's impossible to strike first when they aren't even in the situation to protect their own castle. But Chris responds saying that five of them will be enough. Tonight they will go. And the strategy they will use should be in Lind's book of military tactics. An ambush using a small number of elites. The Vangtes is the weakest among Chris's neighbors, and five men who can use wise should be enough to deal with them. Lin likes the plan since they are now in an era of peace, but Gien steps in the room and hopes Chris has made some room for him and this plan. Chris asks the man if he's sure he doesn't stand to gain anything from helping, but Gien just lets out his insane aura and says he'll cover his face so it'll be fine. He can be pretty useful. Yeah, anyone stronger than our plot armor MC is definitely welcome in my book. The guy masks up and we see the group traveling through the forest. Chris notes that the other lord saw the incident, so they need to handle this fast, before word spreads. Guillen thinks that Chris has changed a lot lately. His words, his action, and spirit are totally different now. But maybe he's not different. Maybe he was hiding his true intentions all along. Guillen turns to Chris's companions and notices that he can feel wise from all of them. Outside the entrance to the Vangtes territory, the boys, not giving a damn, just walk up and the guards ask him to stop. But Chris tells Lind to shut this guy up and Lind rushes in and in a blink of an eye kills one of the guards. The other raises his sword to retaliate but Lind is too fast and strikes him down too. Other guards start pouring in calling for reinforcements but Lind is single handedly taking care of several knights with his sword. Who knew he was so badass? The commander orders to close the gate, but it's too late. Digo rushes in through a group of soldiers, overpowering them with ease, and stands under the gate like an absolute savage holding it up. The men are confused on why the gate isn't closing. Push it down, what are you doing? Chris tells Digo that he did a good job, and Gien is a little shocked that he's holding the gate up with his brute strength. And now, I definitely need his workout plan, because what the hell am I looking at? The commander orders his archers to kill the intruders, but Ellis is wrapped around their flank and starts using her wise ability, Flow, to decapitate all of the soldiers with water coming out of her rapier. Chris tells his group not to kill any villagers, they're heading to the inner castle right away. A group of soldiers charge at Chris, but he sends a few jabs of his spear decimating them all. Guillen is chopping people down and thinking on the reason that Chris let him come. Chris wanted to stage this whole event to show off the power of the new Lord of Proudmund. If he truly wanted to keep it a secret, then he wouldn't have let him come, and it even pains him to think what would happen if Chris attacked Ludwig's territory. Count Vangtas is wondering what all this commotion is about, but is informed that they're being attacked. He asks who's attacking, but the messenger doesn't know. The enemy has already broken through the outer wall. How many are they? But the messenger doesn't know either. The Count yells at the man, asking what the hell he even knows, but the guy just trembles in fear, telling his lord that the men they are fighting are beasts. The Count orders Jackson, his knight, to assemble all the troops, and the messenger tries to go outside to get more information, but he hears soldiers dying on the other side. Digo busts through the thick wooden door with ease, and the Count is shocked that the enemy is already upon him. Chris and the boys pull up, looking absolutely clean, and Chris thinks if this is the Count's elite soldiers. If so, then this is the final fight. 
Chris asks if this man is the Count, and he replies saying that he is. He in turn asks who the intruder is, and Chris introduces himself. The Count is shocked that his neighbor is already invading him. Chris tells him that there was an incident yesterday, and one of his residents was killed. The person who caused this incident was the eldest son, Jord. Chris menacingly looks at the Count and tells him that he killed his son as payment for the loss of life. The Count is enraged at these words, how dare you kill my son? But Chris yells at all the knights and tells them if they want to live, drop your swords and leave this land. If you think otherwise, then come at me. The Count orders his men to bring him Chris's head and they charge in, but this elite squad led by Chris makes quick work of them in this insane shot. Chris is just walking casually and his team just slaughters the enemy soldiers. The Count and Jackson are trembling in fear. The Count, in a last ditch effort, orders Jackson to stop him, but Chris with a murderous blue aura tells the man to think rationally. He won't give him another chance. Jackson, trembling with fear, drops his sword. The Count is all alone. Chris steps atop him and fills the room with killing intent. If you want revenge for your son, come at any time. I'll treat you to death. Man, this is the coldest line I heard. He really is on his villain arc. Some time passes and we see all the boys back in Proudman, and Lynn tells Chris that the Royal Palace will start investigating soon. They will need to take precautions before it's too late. Chris just says that when it's the two of them, Lynn doesn't need to speak so formally. Lynn relents and Chris begins telling him his plan. The aristocrats will try to take down Chris, but the royals don't want to lose their newfound power and will naturally side with Chris. They will stage an event that Count Venktes was planning to defect to the Eight Gates and say that his son tried to contact them through Proudmund. This is enough justification to keep those nobles at bay. Lind is very anxious about this plan, telling Chris if he's found out, it will be the end of him. But Chris just jokingly says if it's the end of him, that it's also the end of Lind. So make sure you fake that letter well. Lind curses Chris as the devil and begins to write. He asks Chris how he plans to hide the fake evidence but Chris has the perfect woman for the job. We see a shot of Rachel dashing through the trees overlooking the Vanktes territory. The scene shifts to Saknad conversing with his men. How the hell did Chris kill an aristocrat and invade the Lord's territory in the same day, and get rewarded for it? The men informs him that there were documents proving that the Count was communicating with the Eight Gates and heard that the reward was for catching a traitor. The Baron thinks that this has to be some kind of trick and Chris is more dangerous than he thought. Damn, Chris really just ended a whole noble bloodline and invaded his goddamn castle just to avenge one person's life. Talk about caring for your people. Chris is seen walking around the town greeting his villagers and they offer him all sorts of fruit, vegetables and bread. Chris thinks that if there's no villagers, there is no feudal lord. These people are the backbone of his territory. Just because they're weak doesn't mean they need to die. Something like that should never happen again. Chris needs to focus on strengthening the security of the village. He needs more troops. Chris approaches Murdoch and notes the dirt on his hands. He seems to be a herbalist after all. Murdoch smiles and is happy with his new role, but Chris asks the man if he plans on digging herbs for the rest of his life, which leaves him confused. Chris tells Murdoch and his boys to become rangers and protect his territory. He won't force him, so he can remain a herbalist if he likes, but the men bow and gracefully accept their new responsibility. Chris tells Royce to take them to the training ground, he's already informed Taikil. Yavarin approaches telling Chris that she spread the reward out to the people in the form of food and necessities, and Chris thanks her for her hard work, and tells the girl to rest for now. He notes that her English is getting better, and she's learning every day to better her training skills. Chris closes his eyes and thinks to himself that the time has come, and he goes up to Doki and asks him for a spar. Toki follows him into the forest, but Chris tells him that this isn't training, and he asks the man why he's been following him all of this time. Toki says no reason. No reason, eh? Then why did you come to the central continent? Toki is confused on the question, and Chris elaborates. You were the southerner, Toki. Why are you hiding your identity? Yavarin is from a similar place, and told Chris that she could tell that Toki is also from the south. What is your real name? Who are you? Doki is sweating nervously at this question. This is the most he's had to think in like the last 60 chapters. Doki just stands there and says, I am Doki. Chris knew that this would happen, so getting this out of him will be quite difficult. 
Chris says that he heard long ago that there's a special difference separating people from the central and southern continents. The central people worship a god, while southern people worship humans. To be exact, they worship the strong who win duels. Doki, I challenge you to a duel. If you win, I will never ask you about your past again. But if I win, you have to answer my questions. Doki readies his axes and agrees, and the two friends lock eyes. Doki dashes towards Chris with a swing of his axe. The two exchange tens of blows in a matter of seconds. Chris sends an upward slash, but Doki drops down and hits Chris with a heavy blow. Chris blocks and tells Doki to trust him, while they disengage. Chris winds back his spear and sends a powerful attack that Doki blocks with both of his axes. I will help you, Doki. Tell me your real name. Doki is struggling emotionally, and we see a flashback on our silent brute. We see a young Doki watching his village burn. The Roaring Elephant tribe is invading, one of the boys yells, asking everyone to run away. A young Doki asks Zelid if he has seen Yen. Zelid says he'll look for her and just run away as an enemy barbarian prepares his axe down on Zelid. Zelid tells Doki to hurry and stabs the man through the chest, but Doki doesn't listen and runs into the flames, wanting to save his mother Yen. A hulking barbarian stands in his way, saying that the kid is quite unlucky. The weak always die, just accept your fate, as he prepares to plunge his spear into the young kid. But out of nowhere, Yen appears killing the man. She tells Doki that they need to run, but the young boy says tribe warriors never show their backs. But Zen tells her son that he's just a kid, not a warrior. More barbarians approach the two, but Zen and Doki's father appear cutting the men down. The Roaring Elephant tribe has changed, and if the chief knew they would be like this, he would have done something sooner. But Zen begs Doki to run away. He wants to stay alongside his family and fight. But his father, the chief, commands him to leave quickly and tells the boy to sharpen his axe and come back with vengeance. Doki tries to refuse, but his father tells his son to live on. He is too young to have his story end here. Please, live, son. Zen hugs him close and tells the boy to run north where it's warm. Forget your name and tribe. Zen tells her son that in these situations, between an honorable death and life, always choose life, and tells her son to please run away. Doki screams and cries as he runs away from the burning village, knowing this might be the last time he will ever see his parents. Some time passes and two travelers stumble upon an unconscious Doki. It seems he was running until his body gave out. One of the travelers gives him some food to eat and tries to politely ask him to put his axe down. But the other traveler notes that the kid looks like he's been through a rough time, so it might be better to leave him alone. They ask for the kid's name, and Doki looks at his axes, and this is how we come to know him as Doki. Back to the present, the two are continuing their epic duel. Chris says that this can only end with one of them being unconscious or yielding. That's how it works in the south, right? Chris continues his barrage of spear attacks, but Doki blocks it all. Chris is impressed with his agility, he's on another level than Lind and Ego. He was born with this latent ability, his rapid heavy attacks. Chris notices that he started using Wise as well. Chris is backed into a tree and Doki leaps ready to bring his axes down. But it isn't like Chris was sitting around getting weaker, so he dodges and Doki continues his assault. Chris leaps over the man and hits him with a powerful strike to the arm. Damn, Chris wanted to knock him down with that one but it seemed to only anger the barbarian even more. If Chris doesn't go all out, he can't win this duel, and the two continue trading blows. And right as Doki swings his axe, Chris parries it, sending his arm back, and uses his free arm to hit Doki with a devastating punch to the gut, sending a shockwave behind him, and launching him into a nearby tree. Chris is happy with the result, but failed to control his power. Maybe he overdid it a little. You're not dead, are you? Chris asks, as Doki coughs, seemingly defeated. Chris continues, if you need a place to grow your roots, then I will be the land for those roots. Chris has studied the southern language briefly, and roots is related to one's tribe or identity. Doki looks up at Chris and asks him why he wants to know his name. Chris smiles, I told you already, I want to help you. Doki says he now serves his tribe chief Chris, and he bows. He says he was born in the south, but lost his roots and abandoned his name. Doki tells his real name. Yenrid, the last wingless hawk and only breathing hawk left. Chris gets close to Yenrid and puts a hand on his shoulder. You're not alone anymore. 
A little disclaimer in this uh, webtoon I'm going to be reading. Doki's name shifts from Doki and Doko and now Yenrid. But I'm just going to keep calling him Doki for the rest of the story. Just to be like, you know, uh, similar with what I've been doing so far. If you want me to change it, just let me know. Back at the camp, Chris sets out to help Doki on his mission to avenge his family. Lind is worried since Chris is only going with three people. And Chris tells him that Pumpkey's coming too, so technically it's four. So they should be alright. Lin tells Chris that he's not a normal foot soldier anymore. He's a baron now, he can't be doing these type of things. Chris says this is exactly the reason he must go, and tells Lin not to worry. If something goes wrong, he'll figure it out, just like he always does. He can't just move his whole army for this. Agatha tells the baron to take care, and their first stop is the Viscount Dutch. A few days pass and Chris arrives at the outer castle, but is shocked to see an encampment outside. It seems Southerners invaded the Viscount's territory, and the numbers are beyond what Chris expected. That's about 1,200 soldiers. Chris wonders if the tents on the cliff are the headquarters, and thinks that the Southern Federation has not been founded yet, so a group of this size puzzles him. Does this mean that multiple tribes are camping out there? Inside the Viscount's castle, he greets Dutch and tells him they might need to alter the contract, which startles the Viscount. There's over a thousand men outside those walls. But Dutch argued that they never discussed about the enemy numbers. But Yavar encounters saying their contract technically is verbal, so they still have a right to change it. Chris asks bluntly if the Viscount can handle this problem without him, which puts him in a tough situation. Yavarin says that they will need three platinum coins for dealing with the southern troops and goblins. Dutch is shocked at the price, but has no other choice and agrees. He signs the contract and Chris is free to start his mission. The Viscount asks how many men he has prepared, but Chris shocks him, saying only three. Dutch thinks his boy must be playing with him. How can a knight apprentice take on a group of 1200 with only three people? And I mean, there was that time he took on 2000 with four, so the math is working out here. The Viscount faints, thinking that he's doomed, and Chris turns and lets a smile. Trust me, Viscount, I won't let you die. The group leaves the castle, and Yvarin asks Chris if he seriously wants to fight the southern army with three of them. Of course not. Doki will handle it. This puts an even more stressed look on the poor girl, thinking her lord is a moron. Chris watches atop the castle wall as Doki walks to confront the army, and with the Viscount next to him, wondering why he's provoking the enemy like this. Chris asks the man how well he knows southern traditions. Dutch replies that he's traded with them hundreds of times, and he knows they should not be provoked. Chris smiles and thinks to himself, it seems this man doesn't know them that well, but tells the Viscount not to worry. His knight will write a new chapter in history in this place. Doki just strolls up to the enemy camp, and two men question who this guy is, just walking up here like that, and they ask for his business. And they notice that he's also a southerner. Doki just tells them bluntly to go home. Doki, like an absolute chad, just stands in front of the entire enemy army. The bald guy asks him if he's a southerner and wants to know the terms of the negotiation, but Doki just savagely says that there is no terms. Leave right now. The man goes and talks to his superior with a scar over his eye, and the man relays his orders. The bald man says that they won't leave, in fact, they want to live here, and tell Doki to get out of his eyesight. The still emotionless Doki says, nah, make me, and the man yells at Doki to die and charges at him, but Doki just one-shots him and tells all the men to come at him at once. He will take care of them all. Another one of the men tells the leader Kang that this guy is insulting them, but Kang just stares at Doki, asking what route he is from. Doki says he doesn't talk to weaklings. This enrages Kang, who orders his men to kill him. Multiple men charge in at Doki, but are also one-shotted, leaving Kang awestruck. Doki yells at the men, saying he's disappointed that they're all so weak. Now, all of the men charge at Doki at once, the real battle begins. Chris overlooks the brawl and thinks Doki is finally started. The Viscount is visibly stressed at the situation and Chris thinks that honestly, he is a little worried for Doki. He might need to go help him. Chris orders Pumpkey to keep a lookout on Doki and bring him back if he's in trouble. Chris thinks that Doki needs to handle this himself and for his past and trusts him. Doki is besting all of the southern warriors without killing them, but a new wave of them approach. Doki uses his wise powers, one-shotting all the men in an instant, leaving the remaining soldiers scared to even approach. A soldier goes up to Kang, telling him this guy is no joke. Everyone who's attacked him has been knocked out. He hasn't killed a single soldier. 
This puts a shocked look on Kang as he orders his men to stop. Today's fight has ended. He orders his men to fall back and Kang tells Doki not to get cocky. Doki returns and Chris asks him if he's alright and tells him he did a good job. He asks for more on the situation but Doki wasn't able to get through to them yet. But it wasn't bad at the end of the day. Chris hands him a drink to help his recovery and the next day Doki goes back ready to mess them up again. And in two days Doki defeated 150 men. And in three days he defeated 300. Kang is worried and one of his men thinks he must be tired by now. Surely they'll get him this time. Tomorrow is the end of this. Baron from the Fangless Wolf tribe vows to kill Doki and rushes at him. The Viscount is worried that this has been going on for four days. Is there anything that they can do? Chris tells the man that this isn't just a fight. This is part of their tradition. The Southerners must realize it by now. Even after four days and hundreds of battles, Doki still isn't tired. With the elixirs Chris gives him and his wise power, he's able to stay in peak condition. To the southern soldiers, Doki looks like some kind of miracle. Doki finishes off Baron and another man, Vorte, asks him to fight. Which the next panel shows he was easily defeated. These men have never seen such a display of power in their lives. One of the men looks towards Doki in awe, the unwavering one who walks the earth. Now Kang approaches Doki. None of these men have ever witnessed a miracle like this. <laughs> Kang bows towards the unwavering one and all the soldiers follow suit. In these last five days, Doki has become a legend. Kang asks for the name of this legend and Doki responds, Yenrid the Wingless Hawk. Hearing the clan Wingless Hawk brings shock to the faces of the southerners. Chris looks on to see the men bowing at Doki in awe of his dear friend, but Pumpkin senses something in the mists and growls behind Chris. Chris asks what Pumpkin is seeing and then all of a sudden a scout appears informing Chris that the southern army's reinforcements have began to move and there is at least a thousand of them headed this way. Chris needs to get a closer look. He puts wise energy into his eyes and sees the southern men charging in on their position. Chris recognizes this event as a southern uprising where the tribes fought amongst themselves and the winner conquered the lands. Chris orders Yavarin to stay here and the Viscount tries to offer Chris his troops but Chris declines saying that the southerners are not after the castle. The Viscount wonders what Chris will be able to do by himself but he seems pretty confident. Down back at the grounds Doki gets the news that the enemy is coming and in fact it's the same tribe that attacked his village and killed his family. It's time for payback. Chris approaches on the back of Pumpkin, and the southern army gets defensive, but are shocked to learn that Chris is Doki's chieftain. Chris tells Doki that it's time to deal with his past, which he agrees. He raises his axe and orders the men who now look up to him to charge into battle alongside him. Doki crouches down and activates his wise and in a blink of an eye dashes into the front lines of the enemy. The commander sees a flash of blue light before his head is chopped off. Doki dives into the enemy lines making quick work of them. Tens of men try to stop him from moving but they cannot quell his rage. With a swing of his axe he separates 20 men's torsos from their legs. The men try to surround him but he leaps into the air and smashes down with his axes creating an explosion in the center of the southern army. Doki's newfound comrades see this spectacle and scream ready to charge in to help their new leader. The battle commences between the two sides and casualties are felt. Chris enters the battle as well saving Kang from an impending death. Doki is still enraged killing one after another and Chris is assisting with spear in hand. The enemy is losing troops fast and orders what's left of their army to retreat. Doki has done it. They repelled the enemy. All the southerners begin to scream at their victory and even lift Chris's hands in the air to join in on the fun. Doki stands victorious with one axe in the air. Now we shift to night time and the celebration commences. Everyone has a full cup of alcohol and the Viscount is in awe of how Chris used only one man to completely flip an entire army to their side. It's nothing like he has ever seen. Chris did tell him he had nothing to worry about. He continues that the Viscount was once a merchant so he should be open to negotiations and Chris likes competent leaders. The Viscount is still in awe of Chris and thinks to himself that nothing can stop this boy from reaching the top. Chris tells Doki that he did a fine job and some of the southerners comment on Chris's hair and even challenge him to a fight but Doki warns them not to. Not even he could best Chris in a fight. This revelation shocks the southerners who think Doki is a god. 
Kang approaches Chris and has a request. The Elephant Tribe has rounded up some of their tribesmen, and he wants Chris to fight with him to get them back, and also informs Chris and Doki that they have a guide who is also a wingless hawk. We fast forward to two days later, and Chris is leading the way. The soldiers are still questioning how Chris managed to become Doki's chieftain, still doubting his strength. But don't worry guys, you're gonna find out soon enough. Chris, Kang, and Doki overlook the Elephant Tribe camp from atop a high ridge, and Chris is a little worried seeing how many people are actually captured. It's much more than he was led to believe. But before they can think any further, a scout informs them that the Elephant Tribe is near. Kang orders his troops to prepare for battle, but Chris calms him down. He tells him not to charge in recklessly. They must defend before attacking. Kang doesn't understand this way of fighting, but Chris tells him that he's going to need to learn. He reminds Kang that they're not here to fight, but to save his people. Doki puts his hand on Kang's shoulder, and he understands. Kang's men try to hold the defensive line as the elephant tribe rushes into attack, but that defense doesn't last forever as the men start charging in to meet the enemy. Chris notices that even Doki can't keep up his stamina for this long, and even though he has wise, he's been fighting for days on end. He orders Doki to save his energy, and charges in himself. He lands right in front of the enemy army, and uses one man's face as a stepping stone. Man, Chris loves that move. And in midair, he unleashes a barrage of stabs that decimates the foes underneath. As soon as he lands, he is surrounded, but a twist of his spear, he cleaves down countless soldiers around him. Chris wants to draw the attention of everyone around him, and he continues to slaughter the enemy, as Doki and Kang join the fight. Chris stands alone in the center of hundreds of dead men. Kang's men think they won, but another wave of elephant tribe approaches. Chris orders everyone not to cross the line that he is standing on, and orders Doki to enforce that order. Chris brings his spear close to his face, and we flash back to his training with Taikyo. Before we get to see the result of that training, his wise comprehension levels up to 30, and right as the endless wave of soldiers descends on Chris, he unleashes a killer attack, dashing through the entire army, sending hundreds of men in the air. Kang and Doki are both left stunned, and so am I. What the hell just happened? The men realize that they won and start cheering on Chris. All the prisoners are released and join back with their families. Chris is happy with his work, but sees Doki reunite with someone that he thinks is his sibling. They embrace and were introduced to Jared. Jared stares at Chris, asking if he's the leader here. Doki introduces Chris as his chieftain, but Jared has a menacing stare. They begin drawing some maps on the dirt, analyzing the situation. But Chris notices that they have more than 5,000 troops, so they should try to avoid a direct battle. Chris asks Jared if he understands if they fight the enemy, most likely everyone will die. Chris thinks that they should secure an escape route, but Jared declines, saying that southerners never run away, and asks Doki to come talk to him alone, and asks who the hell this Chris guy is, and gets mad at him. Doki is a hawk, but he's some mainland's dog. The elephant tribe is right in front of them, and they're responsible for killing their entire family. Men for the south, Never forget their revenge. Jared is seemingly overwhelmed with emotion, but asks Doki if he trusts Chris, and tells him that he's changed, and walks off. Chris orders the men to take the tribesmen to a safe place. The enemy will soon be upon them. Chris kneels in front of a boy who claims to know the mountains well. He says he does, then his name is Ern. Chris tells the soldiers that himself and Doki will be at the front lines and orders everyone else to take the rear. Some time passes and we see the group traveling in the forest, and Ern asks Chris why he's doing so much to help southerners. Chris responds saying that he never discriminates and only looks for one thing from anyone, whether or not they are on his side. Doki tells the boy that Chris is only interested in the good of the people. But something interrupts the group, as Chris and Pumpkin notice something approaching. The enemy is here. Chris orders the men to stay back and only elite soldiers will fight. Don't break the formation. Chris and Doki begin slaughtering the enemy, and even Pumpki gets in on the action, taking a man's arm off, and then lets out a huge fire breath, taking out many soldiers at once. The enemies start running, and this confused Chris, because they're retreating so easily. Something isn't right. Some forces are at the rear, and Jared looks to chase, despite Kang's order not to break the formation. But Jared doesn't want to let any of them escape. But this was a trap. He is ambushed, and his weapon is flung to the side, and the wound on his leg opens up, making him unable to grab his axe. The situation is dire and the man closes his eyes, ready to accept that this place is his grave. But Doki comes flying in. He won't let any more members of his family die. He lets out a flurry of slashes and decapitates all the surrounding soldiers. He tells Jared not to give up. Live on. 
though he wants them to survive together. All of a sudden, the enemy soldiers disperse, leaving Chris confused on why they ran away. They numbered less than a hundred men. Chris is concerned on the tactics that the enemy is using. The leaders of the southern army is the chief of the elephant tribe, who has gathered all of the scattered southerners, and he seems to be quite the leader. And he has a reason to send his soldiers like this. And all of a sudden, Chris has an epiphany. He mounts Pumpkey to do some reconnaissance. He assumes that attacking with this little amount of soldiers must be a distraction. If Chris is right, there must be another group nearby. Chris puts wise into his eyes and spots the enemy from a distance. He sees a massive force of men headed towards the castle. If they breach that, they'll be able to get into unimpeded. Chris doesn't remember this event from his past life, and maybe his actions have started to change the future. Even if Chris joins the Viscount's troops, it still won't be enough to handle that many men. And he's too pressed for time to think of a viable strategy. But he isn't our MC for nothing, as an idea strikes him. He now knows what he must do. He looks towards a mountain that is connected with Proudman, and it might be the best direction to send the Southerners. And he also has to inform the Viscount and prepare to defend the walls. He hands Pumpkey two letters and instructs the dog to deliver them to both the Viscount and to his men at Proudman. He orders Doki to gather the troops, and they're gonna head back to Proudman as well. We shift to the Viscount reading Chris's letter, with sweat beating down his face. He's wondering if this plan will work out. He doesn't know if he can trust this information, but feels he needs to take a leap of faith, especially for Chris. He decides to believe in him and orders his men to deliver the message to the capital. We time skip to about four days later, and southern troops are staring at the Viscount walls, but are surprised to see this allied force staring them down. Duke Rold and his men eagerly await the fight. The Duke even curses himself, saying he should have arrived a little later so he could relish in combat. We are introduced to the first and third sword under Rold, Valmung and Withran. The swords of the Grand Duke are powerful wise users that follow Rold. Lin sits behind them nervously since he can feel their strength emanating from their aura. Rold asks Lin if he really thinks the Southerners will retreat after hearing their warning. Lin informs them that the enemy morale has dropped and the way their army is moving is signaling that they want to minimize casualties. So most likely they will try to negotiate to get out of the situation. Rold understands and rides out by himself and starts talking. He approaches a lackey who tells him that they want to make a deal. Rold, confi Rold confidently tells the man that if he doesn't want his army slaughtered to turn back. The man agrees, but Rold unleashes a wave of killing intent, telling the man if any southerner steps on this land again, they will be attacked without warning. The lackey basically shits his pants and goes back to inform his superiors. Rold asks Rydos, the knight next to him, if he has seen Chris before, and he says he has when Chris was just a spire. Rold's interest in Chris continues to grow, and he seems to always be involved with him now. We shift back to Proudman, and Deagle looks to see Chris returning with all the southerners that he saved. Chris smiles at Digo as he returns and immediately goes back to business. Screet wants to put the southerners to work operating the salt mine, and Chris agrees since they can't put off not occupying it any longer. Chris puts this conversation on hold and he has something else to handle, as Doki and Jared enter the room. Chris asks Jared if he likes Proudman so far, but if he wants to go back to the south, he will prepare all the materials that him and his men need to return, and they won't have to pay it back. But if they choose to leave, Chris can't guarantee their safety. Jared has a different idea. They're not strong enough to go back to the south, so they'll live here until they are, but pay a price to do so. It isn't exactly what Chris wanted, but it's going to be good enough for now. But Chris questions the wound on Jared's leg, but Jared says that the healers haven't had any luck. Chris thinks that fixing it is easy, but Jared protests that his leg is not the important thing now. Chris tells Jared the price of living here is that his people will be citizens of Proudman, and as such, they will need to follow his rules. Jared agrees, and Doki smiles to himself. Chris lets the Southerners, that are now his citizens, deal with the Viscount's goblin problem, and over the next coming days, Proudman has become a place where Southerners and Central people can coexist, and has become the second most powerful territory, with Ludwig being the first. Damn, Chris ain't fucking around. Is enraged after hearing Chris allowed Southerners into his land thinking the boy must be crazy. His knight tries to actually explain the full situation, but the Baron just thinks everything out of Chris's mouth is a lie. He is now worried, since now his territory is growing so rapidly. His knight investigated deeper and found out about Chris's salt mine, and this further enrages the Baron. He curses Chris. Who would have known that dead land would have had a rock salt mine? He tries to calm down and see what he can do in this situation. He knows he must build a friendship with Chris to take advantage of the benefits. However, it enrages him to the core that a mere commoner is having his way. He yells at Jerome, saying salt is an exclusive product of the royal family, and orders him to report this offense, but asks him to do another thing, send a letter to the duke. We shift back to the barracks and Proudman, and men are seen training. Streak sits with Lind, worried since it seems that they messed up some calculations, 
He curses himself that he'll have to spend another full night fixing his errors. Lind is also terrified because he can't ask Yvarin for help, and curses Chris for going on vacation when the rest of them are dying from being overworked. A man enters the room and tells Streak that a guest has arrived. Metix introduces himself and says he was employed by Chris himself. Streak is confused, but Metix is an accountant and will be handling the work here from now on. Streak is relieved that the weight is finally taken off of his shoulders, but Lind is more curious. He can't just believe this man out of nowhere. Metic says Chris saw this coming and says Lin's first name and also told him if Lin was suspicious to tell this story. He starts telling the story that seems to be an embarrassing one of Lin peeing his pants, which makes him stop Metic immediately saying that he trusts him and thinks Chris is one crazy bastard. Another boy is at the door looking for Lin as well and Lin greets him. He says that the Baron sent him to deliver this message and shows him the stamp that will be used as the design of his family crest. Lin is astonished asking if the boy made it himself and is in awe of his skill, even though it appears that he's blind. The boy says he can prove that Lin can trust him and starts saying the same story that Medic was using, but Lin quickly shuts it down. We shift to Chris and Royce on their little vacation, and Royce asks where exactly they are going. Chris says they're looking for a very important person, a secluded sage. Royce is confused, but we see two boneheads blocked away, saying that Chris and Royce need to pay the toll to get through this area. Chris sighs since this is the fourth time that this has happened on his trip, but orders Royce to deal with these morons. But before he does so, a knight dashes out of the woods, dealing with these thugs, and he asks if Chris and Royce are travelers. Chris answers vaguely and the knight introduces himself as Paul Royer from the Marquis Zighal's castle, but thinks to himself that Chris was very calm in the situation. He offers them transport to High Spire, and that area is owned by Zighal. Chris agrees to be escorted and they make some small talk, and Royce reveals that he is a squire, which makes Paul laugh. But Chris thinks they shouldn't reveal themselves just yet. They arrive at the town and Chris overhears someone begging for mercy. A man is getting rocks thrown at him. Paul says due to the Lord's kindness, even freaks like him get into this land. And he also wants to join in on the torture, for making their land look bad in front of a guest, and tells the hunchback blue-haired boy if he doesn't stop complaining, he will be executed. Paul continues to escalate the situation, even pulling out his sword to get rid of this trash, even while the boy's mother runs to defend her son. Paul is now enraged, but Chris asks him to stop saying that that man is his friend. Paul tries to grab Chris, asking what he means, but his hand is grabbed by Royce, who has a murderous expression. Don't, fuck, don't touch his boy, man. Might die. Chris kneels down and asks the boy's mother for a favor. He's invited inside, but unfortunately, the family is poor and has nothing to serve. Chris gives the boy some herbs to quickly heal his skin, which he accepts. Chris orders Royce to bring the things that they bought from the market, and Chris prepares some food. The mother questions if Chris is a chef since the food is so good, but the hunchback boy notices that Chris specially prepared the food to eat since his mouth was injured. The crippled and Chris have the same thought, they feel each other being tested. Some time passes and the boys are outside staring at the moon, and the boy asks Chris why he's taking care of a freak like him, but Chris just jokingly asks him to guess. The man says that only nobles are able to restrain a knight the way Chris did, and his skills in cooking and botany are not seen in aristocrats. So he only has a single guess, a young man who has title and experience. Are you by chance Chris Proudman? Chris smiles and thinks that this guy truly is a sage from his past life. Chris says that he is correct, which takes the boy off guard. We finally get his name and he is introduced as Grappe. He asks Chris why he came here, but Chris tells him that it was solely to meet him. Grappe is confused on how he heard about him, but Chris makes up a lie saying that he heard a prophecy of a hunchback sage. When Chris saw him, it reminded him of an old friend who has lost his arm in a battlefield. In order to make up for that loss, he worked tirelessly and tried everything, all the while dreaming about a different life. Do you have that same dream, Grappe? Grappe agrees and Chris tells him his struggles. This whole time he tries to gain more influence, but lately, as he grows, more things happen unexpectedly, slowing him down. And because of this, he needs more capable people in order to achieve the life that he desires. This is why he is here. Chris says he isn't greedy and won't force Grappe to come, but they're leaving in two days. Some time passes and Grappe's mom asks if the knights left but he just asks her if she wants to go on a trip with him. Two days later, Paul confronts Baron Zighal, claiming Chris is currently in High Spire. The baddie herself is here as well, overhearing the conversation, wondering how Chris came here even though her father is absent due to the royal assembly. That must mean he came here to visit her, and asks Paul to make preparations. She ventures out in her carriage, but is regretfully informed that Chris has already left. What you think, woman? My man ain't no simp. She is enraged that Chris didn't show her any attention and visited her land without visiting her. 
playing hard to get, huh? I think we can all learn a little something from Chris's Riz. We shift back to Chris as he arrives at Proudman, and Lind is eager to have a spar. After Chris told everyone his embarrassing story, Chris turns to run away and orders Royce to handle this psycho, but Lind tells him to get out of the way. But he's under orders. But Lin takes a cheap shot and whispers into his ear that his sister has a boyfriend. This saying alone leaves Royce frozen as Lin rushes right past him, almost on Chris. Chris sweats, asking why Royce is ignoring his orders. I love that scene. Lin looks crazy as hell. Some time passes and Chris is in his chambers with Grappe and he asks his impressions of the place. Grappe says it's actually pretty great. The castle walls are strong and the infrastructure is well made. All of this took him by surprise. But a messenger bursts into the room, saying that they get a letter from the royal palace. It seems like the rock salt mine was figured out, and they had been ordered to stop development. Chris thinks that he never really tried to hide it, but the royal family acted too fast. Someone might be snitching on him, and only one person comes to mind. We shift the barons having a meeting with the Sarkato's noble union. They ask if he sent a message to the royal palace, which he replies saying that he did. But he cannot trust the royal palace. Chris will find a way to work around them, and if the royal family isn't enough, they will strike Proudman themselves. This shocks all the nobles in attendance who ask if this man means to start a war. But he says if they win and control that salt mine, it could mean a huge payday. Another man interjects that Chris is a knight rank wiser, but Savna just points out Jerome saying that they have nothing to worry about. Yeah, but you do know that it isn't just Chris, right? There's like 20 other of them. Okay, never mind. Just go die. I don't care. Another member of the union questions the motive they will have to go to war. But the Baron tells that man that Chris also created a reason, especially in the case of Count Bang Tess. They just need to do the same. And most importantly, they are backed by the Grand Duke. Jerome asks his father what he plans to do. If the royal family sanctions appease the noble union, his plan to fight Chris might be ruined. But the Baron has had enough of Chris. He will do anything to get rid of this peasant trash. And if he leaves Chris alone one day, he will come after him. There is only one chance to get rid of him before he becomes too powerful. The Baron asks if the people that they requested are arriving, and Jerome confirms that they are. And the spies have already blended in with the citizens. Chris is now seen talking with Lind and Grappe on a most optimal way to pay taxes. Chris thinks on Grappe's point and agrees that it does make sense. It's impossible to completely avoid paying the capital since the salt mine has been discovered. And he asks if the inspector from the capital has arrived and knows it's time to make some preparations. Royce bursts in telling Chris the investigators are already past the gate. Chris wonders if Eluan is leading the group, but Royce informs him that the Cilio has come himself. Chris goes to greet him and he says it's a pleasure Chris goes to greet him and Decilio says it's a pleasure to see him again. Elowan joins the two around the table as they discuss the affairs. Elowan starts the conversation stating that as Chris knows, salt is the country's monopolized product. But Decilio chimes in saying that he has the authority to solve this problem. And Chris has already received leniency from the royal palace. Chris says he's thankful for that, but now there will be no more privileges. Elowan announces the tax and 80% of the profits will be taken by the country. 80%? Chris is shocked by this number. In order to really manage these lands, there's no way Chris can accept this proposal. But thankfully, the most influential person in the royal capital is sitting right next to him. He asks to speak and Decilio allows it, and Chris asks if the man enjoys a good hunt. We shift to this exact activity and Lind wonders what Chris is planning, and Decilio chimes in as well. They traveled quite far, but still haven't seen a single goblin. But Chris's goal here was not to hunt goblins, but to show the first prince what he really needs. In times of power transitions, the most important thing for the prince is to restrict the influence of the Grand Duke. He asks Decilio if he sees anything in the distance, and he responds asking if that's the famous Wolf Clan stronghold. Chris says it is, and they're able to see it from the back of the mountain which is in Proudman. The unbreakable walls of the wolf den. To capture this castle? would be more than the first prince would ever dream of. Chris confidently states that he won't be paying taxes for the salt and gold, which enrages the Salia, wondering if Chris is trying to commit treason, even after all the things the royal family has gifted him. But Chris retorts, he did not gain nobility in order to mine salt, and to express his gratitude towards his country, Chris will gift them the stronghold Wolf's Den. He will do so next autumn. Desileo has his interest piqued and wonders if Chris can really keep his promise. He sighs but will trust Chris this time. Do not let me down. Chris thanks him and it seems the situation has been handled. The next day, Grappe asks Chris if he's really confident in his success. But Chris tells him not to overthink it. He has a plan, but he's going to share the details later. He takes a sip of his soup, but starts feeling the effects. 
and immediately orders everyone to stop eating and for an attendant to bring the antidote from his room. He begins coughing up blood, causing everyone to panic, but he just calmly tells them not to touch the food. It's been poisoned. It seems Chris recovered just fine from this assassination attempt. He took the antidote just in time. But notes that it really was some high-grade poison. He orders Ellis to bring the cook to him, and she apprehends him. It's the same guy that we saw in the shot of the spies being sent, and Ellis caught him trying to escape. Chris simply asks who sent him here, but gets no reply. He tries asking more questions, but gets the same treatment. Chris orders Lynn to put his sword close to the man's neck, and they will only have one chance for his life to be spared. Who sent you here? The man has sweat beating down his face, but smiles, asking to be killed already. Chris happily obliges and orders Lynn to finish him off. He talks to the rest of the team, telling them for now they will strengthen their defenses and properly identify migrants. He orders Grappe to spread rumors that Chris is bedridden due to poison, and based on who reacts to this news, will alert Chris to the culprit. We shift back to Baron Savnan, and as he suspected, Chris found a way around the tax. But Jerome brings up a rumor to his attention, that apparently Chris is sick due to his spies. The Baron thinks that everything is going to plan, and they should pick up the pace. Later that same night, Rachel visits the Baron's quarters. The Baron wonders if it's okay for an assassin to reveal her face, but Rachel isn't worried. She is a master of appearances. She asks who this man wants killed, and the Baron tells her. Chris Proudman. He's a knight level wiser, but he should be injured, and he will pay one platinum eagle. Is this too big of a task? Rachel says it isn't, but that payment isn't enough and points towards a very valuable looking gemstone that the Baron reluctantly agrees to give away, having hope in the fact that he will own the salt mine. Before Rachel leaves, she asks if this man is preparing for a war, but he doesn't give her that information. She vanishes into the night, and we flash back to Chris sending Rachel to take commissions from the nobles in order to have his own spy of sorts, and Rachel may choose her own rewards. Chris only needs the information. Two days later, Baron Savanad gathers his troops, ready to march on Proudman. The nobles are still worried, but the Baron is confident. He even has some of Duke Rold's best men. He orders his son to begin marching the troops. As they approach, a scout informs the Baron that the Proudman troops are awaiting their arrival, taking him off guard, and even sees Chris standing there. What is this? He was told that Baron Proudman was sick, yet here he is, suited up. What about the assassin he hired? Unfortunately, he sees the reward he gave her in Chris's hand, alerting him to this betrayal. We see Chris rising up Royce's sister, telling him to make some undergarments out of the silk that he's giving her and hold up. What the hell are you trying to make her do, bro? Agatha is excited for her task, but interrupting the group, Amelia walks in. She tells Chris that she was offended that he stopped by her territory and didn't even say hello. Chris apologizes, but Amelia says it's okay, and even offers her family's help in taking the wolf's den. But Chris confidently tells her he doesn't need any help. Amelia is taken aback, but asks Chris how he's so confident to take this stronghold without royal support. Chris sips his drink and can tell that Amelia is smarter than she seems. In his past life, Chris knows that the Ziggall family survived even after the royal family's collapse, and this was due to Amelia's magic called intuition. So Amelia, you are the one-stringed wizard. There must be a symbol on your body. Chris ponders the reason why she is here, but Amelia asks if she can stay for a few days, and even requests to be called my lady. Chris says he'll call her that if she formally introduces herself as Lady Amelia, which shocks her. She takes back her previous statement and tells Chris that he can call her whatever she wants. Guys, Chris is teaching Rizonomics over here, like what the hell? Time passes and Grappe tells Chris that the wolf's den has responded to the declaration of war. Chris reads the response and thinks that it's quite aggressive. Grappe asks Chris if he's ready and they begin getting a lot of pressure from the royal palace. Chris tells the man that they're almost ready, just a little bit longer. Grappe is shocked thinking to himself that Chris is really confident on taking this fortress. We shift to Desolio talking to an elder who asks if he really thinks Chris is up to the task. The elder isn't convinced and in all of his years, no one was able to take that fortress. This time will be no different. But even if Chris fails, the salt mines will be in their possession. But Desilio doesn't even know what outcome he even wants from Chris. We shift back to Proudman as Pumpkey is barking at Chris and Ego. The clouds are getting dark and this signals to Chris that it is time. As he calls all of his knights, they wear light armor and Chris tells the group not to pack many weapons. Take only what you need. Everyone suits up and Agatha wishes Chris well. Amelia watches the two lovebirds talking but looks at all the wise knights in front of her, shocked at Chris's influence. Chris puts on his hood, telling Amelia to watch closely. She feels the mark on her leg and thinks that Chris might actually take the fortress. It's time to go, but Grappe still doesn't understand how six of them will take the entire fort. This is too reckless. But Shriek tells the boy that he had his times doubting Chris. 
and he knows if there's one person who can find a way, it's him, Chris Proudman. He will be successful this day. We see the Wolf's Den stronghold getting some heavy rain. A commander is informed that the recon team hasn't found anything yet. Fedora, the commander, smirks with confidence. Just how long does Chris plan to hide? The soldiers tell their commander that this heavy rain is making it hard for their scout teams to continue. And maybe they should ask for assistance. But in this story, no smart soldier's advice is ever taken. As the commander tells him, it's not needed. This stronghold has only one path to it, a front road. And it's exposed, so any number of troops will instantly be spotted. The back of the castle faces a steep cliff. Fedora thinks that no matter how clever Chris is, he won't ever take this stronghold. The commander goes to take a nap, telling his soldier to update him, and we shift back to Chris and the boys. They are Naruto running through the forest, and Lin notices the rain getting stronger, and Chris thinks to himself that this is the only chance that they will have. We go back to Fedora, who's waken up by his soldier's screams, and the fort is overflowing. But as he wakes up, he notices his room is almost full of water. The heavy rain is filling the entire fort. The man orders his troops to get everyone to try and get rid of the water. And back to our heroes, the storm is getting worse for them as well. Their oiled cloaks are now wet. Chris tells everyone to remove the cloaks, and now they're going to run towards the fortress. As they approach, some soldiers see them coming, but assumes, since it's only six of them, that they can handle it. Chris doesn't want to let anyone escape and calls for Digo and Doki. They dash in, ending the two soldiers with ease. Chris tells everyone to stop and orders Doki to make a hole for everyone to climb in. And when Chris gives a signal, they will dive in. He overlooks the stronghold and reflects on his life. A lot of things have changed for him and those around him, but some things will never change. On this day in the year 899, even without Chris attacking, the wolf's stronghold was destroyed by the wrath of God, and the men inside are panicking. The water is overflowing and the commander locks himself in a tall room, despite his soldiers begging to go with him. Please open the door. He hears their screams as they drown and the man asks why this is happening here. He needs to get out. He enters the next room to see it full with more of his men. He tries to get them to move, but despite his orders, the next hallway fills with water, seemingly ending all of their hopes. Chris sees the tide approaching and orders his own men to get inside of the hole they made. They do so and begin holding their breaths, and Chris knows when the vibration stops, it'll all be over. The storm clouds soon clear, and somehow, Fedora has survived, as a hand extends to bring him up. But it's not one of his men, but rather, Chris, asking if the man doesn't recognize him, the mole hiding behind a wall. The fort was completely destroyed, as Chris now sends for his troops to occupy it. Grappe wonders if Chris received the revelation from God or something, but Chris just lies and says it was all luck. Grappe wants to ask more, but has work to do. Chris orders his archers to enter the fort and take positions, and the rest of his forces to begin repairs. Grappe watches on and thinks that Chris really might end up being a king. Nighttime comes, and Lind is joking around with Chris, but they see someone approaching. But it's Streak. He quickly enters the castle, telling Chris that they have an emergency. The king is dead. And at the same time, a rebellion began. The Grand Duke has raised his banner. Chris thinks on the situation, and he has been commanded to return to the palace. He bites his lip, and this is happening way too fast. What a disaster. Now, they won't be able to get extra troops from the capital. And on top of that, they need to withdraw their own troops from this territory. Right now, even after taking the stronghold. But Lin yells at Chris that another army is approaching. He is relieved to hear, however, that this is the Marquis Zighal's men. They are approaching saying that they are here for their lady's orders, and Chris smiles. She's making it really hard for him not to like her. Chris orders Lin, Digo, and Royce to stay here with Zighal's men and defend the fort. The rest of them will return to join the war. We shift back to Proudman and Agatha is worried on what will happen. Chris says everything will be fine and asks Agatha if she made the clothes that he asked her to. Chris wears his cool new shirt and talks to Yaviron, telling her it's time to make a deal with the Eight Gates. She is shocked. How can they trade with them right after taking their stronghold? Chris says it will be fine and he puts on his armor. The wolves are a money-hungry faction and they sell salt to the gold family, so they can strike a favorable deal. Yvarin asks what to say if they don't accept and Chris tells her to remind those bastards what happened when he spared the green-eyed boy, referring to Perth. Yvarin thinks Chris is insane and, ask where he's, and asks where he's going, but he gets pumpkin and is off to make another ally. We now see Wee Hain sipping some wine thinking that both powers want his support and asks his knights what they think. Gideon thinks that they should wait and observe the situation before making a decision, but Jophil says the decision is quite easy. They just need to join the side with the most military power, and Weehane is in an opportunity to gain power. Now Sir Cardo rests on him, and it seems it's his time to become king. As the man smiles, Weehane Ludwig will rule the continent. Gideon wonders if this is the right path, 
Wei Hain is not a worthy leader, but Wei Hain asks if there's any information on Guyen. It seems he sent word that he was training, but this just means he's avoiding his brother, which makes Wei Hain angry. He orders surveillance to be increased around the tower. If Gan appears, kill the woman. Chris is riding through the forest and tells Pumpkin to stop. Long time no see, Chris. And it's motherfucking Canary. Oh shit. They talk a bit, and we see Guyen sitting by a tree. Chris walks up to see his longtime friend, and Guyen is impressed. You actually took the stronghold, huh? Not too bad. But what's the deal? Chris asks Guyen what he plans to do during this war. He just sighs, and it seems his moron brother wants to become king. Chris has been keeping tabs on the situation and knows why Guyen is still tied to Weihain, asking if he plans to keep his oath to his lady. Guyen turns around furious, sparking his aura, but Chris yells at him. How long are you going to be dragged around and leave that person trapped in that damn tower? Guyen tells Chris to watch his mouth, and he draws his sword. If he talks anymore, he will have to kill him. Chris unleashes some of his own aura. He's not the same boy he was before, and the two face off. Guyen dashes in, but Chris blocks his strike, and the two send a flurry of attacks at each other. That causes the earth around them to distort. Guyen is taken aback by how far Chris has gotten. What the hell are you? Kennery approaches, telling the two to calm down, and Pumpkin lets off a huge fire blast, separating the two. Even your dog breathes fire. What the hell? Fox comes, asking if Guyen is alright, and Chris says hello. Guyen calms down, and Chris asks if he really plans on doing nothing. Guyen doesn't want to get involved, but Chris asks him, how many people are in Daybed? Guyen answers that there is about 10,000, and Chris firmly tells the man that 10,000 lives will be lost if they don't stop Weihain. Kennery and Fox start to sweat, but Guyen doesn't seem interested in others, and tells Chris that Weihain is also targeting the South. Chris wonders why he would go there, but is informed that his target is Proudman. He's going to use this opportunity to make peace with the Eight Gates, and have them back him for the throne. Chris thinks Weihain is a crazy bastard, and even plans to sell out his own country. Chris can't waste any more time, and he's going to save that person that Guyen is sworn to, and tells him to take care of Weihain. Guyen takes a moment, and then asks Chris why he's going this far. The boy answers that it's all for this country. Guyen tells Fox to follow Chris, and thinks that right now, he doesn't even know what to do, and has a flashback. We go to his younger days where he used to get into fights in the streets, and how he would come home beaten and battered. But one woman would always be there for him, ready to treat him. But Guyen treated her like shit, pimp slapping her away. But even doing so would not turn the woman away, as she always would care for him. In his flashback, Guyen gets up from the bed and overhears the girl who is introduced as his mother talking to a man who's begging her to come with him, leaving Guyen behind. But she will never leave her son. Daisy is his mother's name, and not once does she ever betray Guyen. But one day, as he comes back to his home, he sees his mother being surrounded by a group of thugs. Guyen can't control his rage, and this is the first stage of his power awakened. He slaughtered all of the thugs holding his mother now, and Baron Ludwig enters the room, amazed at what he saw. Daisy wonders why the Baron came here, but he ignores her words, asking Guyen where he learned to fight. Guyen says that no one taught him, and the Baron asks if the boy wants to become a knight and be able to protect his mother. Three years pass and Guyen was finally promoted to a knight, and his mother is so proud of him. He gets on one knee, swearing to the heavens that his sword will be hers, and for the rest of his life, he will protect her. Back to the present, Guyen looks on towards the tower that holds his mother. He can't get involved, but he trusts Chris will be able to save her. Please, let my mother be safe. Fox and Chris stand in the forest talking about Weihain mobilizing his forces, but it's time to move as they approach the tower. Fox fills Chris in on the layout of the tower, and the lady is confined on the top floor. And if anyone comes near, the maids have orders to kill Guyen's mother. Chris thinks that this is tricky. They can't walk into the front. But out of nowhere, Chris's ninja girlfriend appears, telling him that it's impossible. She could bring him a corpse, and that's the only thing she can guarantee. Fox gets angry at what she said, but Chris tells him to calm down. Rachel, let's talk about this for a moment. Rachel lowers her mask and says that Chris can use her, but she can't use him. Huh? Promise me that after this job is done, you will make an effort to find my name. Chris promises and asks if she has a plan. Rachel says that the two of them can infiltrate the tower on a bright night. Three days pass and the two are on top of a tree branch and they begin scaling the tower with their bare hands. One of the soldiers hears something, but Pumpkin comes up with a good idea and makes noise in the bushes. The man thinks that it's just a stupid dog and Rachel tells Chris that he's pretty good at climbing. But he did used to be in a thieves guild, so it's only natural. They continue to climb and Rachel asks if Chris is concerned about Proudman. The situation seems urgent. Chris knows that his back is to the wall, but Fortunately for him, he has friends that he can trust, as you see Digo, Lind, and Royce bravely defending the stronghold as they hold down the defenses. The Eight Gates commander is getting impatient, asking about the troops that they sent towards the rear. We shift to this group as Bozo number one walks into a thin wire. 
Next, a smoke bomb explodes, and the men are being taken down one by one, as Chris's old herbalist friend steps out of the smoke, asking where these bastards plan on going. We shift back to Chris, and the two approach a window. Chris looks inside and sees Daisy, with a maid attending to her, and another one by the door. They can't enter like this. They need to draw away the maid that's next to Daisy. We shift to inside the room and the lady asks to meet her son, but the maid tells her that she can't, and she just has to trust the Count. Daisy says that the Count that she knew is dead, and now Weehain is in control. So now she is forbidden to meet her son. Is that how it is? The maid has a wicked smile, telling the lady to please believe her. Guillen is just really busy. Daisy is tired and she wants to die, and prays to see her son one final time. But all of a sudden, in the mirror, she notices Chris waving his hand. She knows what's going on and asks to get some fresh air. The maid tells her that she can't leave, but Daisy yells for her to at least open the window. The maid walks towards it, warning the lady not to come close. They don't want to repeat what happened last time. But as she creaks open the window, Rachel comes flying in and Chris enters as well, kicking the shit out of the maid by the door, holding her down. They secure the lady and the soldiers catch on as they hear the commotion upstairs. Bozo 1 knocks on the door but is cut down, and now the soldiers begin flocking up the stairs. Chris takes care of them one by one, and if he can handle them like this, he should get out of here easily. A soldier goes to the commander, which is actually Mikoy, and the two are shocked to see each other again. Mikoy grits his teeth but knows that no one in this tower is strong enough to challenge Chris, and he orders his men back. His soldiers don't agree, but Mikoy starts yelling, telling them that he is a wise knight. They have no chance. The troops should fall back and wait for reinforcements. Chris tells Mikoy that it's been a while, and he's changed quite a bit. We shift to Weehain as Guillen stands in front of him, and Weehain yells, telling Guillen to drop his sword and take a vow to serve him. But all of a sudden, a soldier bursts into the room, telling Weehain that someone assaulted the tower. The man is now stressed as he curses his brother, and he orders his men to capture Guillen. But he ain't no bitch, as he gets into his stance and draws his sword, dismembering everyone around him. He will keep this short. Anyone who stands in his way will die. We shift back to Chris, escorting Guillen's mother down the tower. He looks out the window and sees Guillen arrive. The soldiers outside the tower are confused. Weehain and Guillen are here. Guillen opens the doors to the towers and sees his mother. Emotion overflows as the two hug each other. Guillen promises to never let something like this ever happen again. Chris looks at his friend and tells him that it's time to go. Guillen can't find the words to say, but Chris yells at him, asking how long he plans to stand idle. Is seeing your mother enough? Will you let Van Ludwig's legacy die in vain? Accept your fate and continue forward. Guillen Ludwig. The man now has a new look of determination, asking Chris what they should do about Weehain. Chris says that they can't kill him just yet, but the two need to leave. Guillen tells his mother that he will be back. She cries, asking him to please return safely. Chris tells Daisy not to worry. Her son has grew up into a fine man. Guillen opens the doors to see Weehain surrounding the tower, and the cocky brat orders his crossbowman to fire at Guillen. Guillen just walks with no pressure and swats down every arrow. Weehain orders his knight to catch the traitor, but Guillen yells asking Weehain, who is he calling a traitor? As he opens up a decree showing the knights that Weehain has been dealing with the eight gates and planned to betray their kingdom. Weehain calls himself a king, and I, Guillen, proclaim, I will not let the land my father spent his life protecting to be sold to the enemy, and hereby banishes Weehain from this land. Weehain tries to order his troops to defend him, but the uncertainty starts to creep in, as Gideon himself starts to doubt his leader. Half of their troops are with Jodfil, and now some of Weehain's soldiers are beginning to turn on him, asking if what Guillen is saying is true. Long have they suffered because of his selfish ass. Gideon kills the soldier and tells Weehain they need to leave now, and orders his men to retreat. We now shift to the first front, the Salio's military headquarters. The man asks if Chris is here yet, but is informed of Ludwig's aggression on Proudman. The older man thinks that the situation suits them. Chris is busy taking care of someone who betrayed the crown. The Salio is concerned on that situation, but the older man watches him, thinking that every event that is happening is pre-planned. The first prince is strong but lacks intelligence, the second prince is too weak, and the third prince has a strong body but lacks character, and a country without a king is destined for destruction. The only relief is that the first prince listens to those who can persuade him. So the elder tells the prince to calm down. The duke started a war without justification, and this is treason. They are not alone in defending the royal family, and soon their allies will arrive and this war will turn out as a total victory. We shift back to Ludwig's territory and Chris and Guillen are roaming the streets. Weehain ran with his tail between his legs and some nobles begin to shit talk Guillen. They agreed to follow his father, not him, and unrest begins to build. But Guillen won't force anyone to stay. 
Chris asks if this is a good idea, but Guillen says he can't hold anyone back, and asks Chris what he plans to do. Chris has his own problems and needs to amass his forces, but in the meantime, wants to have a duel. Guillen just laughs, thinking how Chris can ask for a duel in a situation like this. But Chris's real goal is to level up his wise proficiency, and right now, he's at 38. And every 10 levels, it's a huge boost to his strength. Guillen is a 4th level wiser, so Chris needs to catch up in order to fight the Duke. We shift to Weihain completely destroyed over what's going on. One moment he was a lord and now he's running for his life. Weihain has the bright idea to join Jodfil and Proudman, but Gideon sees something coming out of the bushes and tells his lord to step back. But arising is Jodfil and his troops, all beaten and battered. He was unable to do much against Proudman's defense, but he took minimal casualties and decided to retreat hoping to regroup, but it seems Weihain's hopes are starting to disappear. A few days pass and Chris is meeting with all of his knights and overlooks his troops. He has his personal squad along with 200 soldiers, but we see Guillen and Kenry on horseback. Guillen dismounts and takes a deep breath and yells to the whole crowd that he is Guillen Ludwig. And after the death of his father and banishment of his brother, who lied with the enemy, he will now inherit the throne of the Count. And from this moment forward, he will serve only one man. Gien gets on one knee and swears his allegiance to Baron Chris Proudman. And even if his body becomes old and rusty, he will fight on any battlefield for his lord. Chris is taken aback by this display, but accepts Gien's oath, and he will guide his sword. He tells his men to rise and points his spear to the sky, ordering everyone to prepare. They're riding into battle. We are taken to the battlefield in question as a soldier is running for his life, but is splatted like a bug by Valmung. He's getting bored of these weaklings, and he orders his men to clean this up. Rold watches from a nearby cliff, and his knight is getting excited. Ryzen, Ryzen informs him that the general of Tegis has come to support the royal family, and this news makes Rold smile. It doesn't matter who stands in his way, he will destroy them all. Rold asks about that brat, Chris, and is informed that he's fighting Ludwig's troops. He doesn't think he's going to be able to get out of Proudman, but Rold has a confident look. He is almost certain that Chris will arrive to face him. We shift to the Elder, who is introduced as the Earl of Hydo, and he is told that the Duke's men are advancing north, and this is faster than they anticipated. The Salio still questions where his reinforcements are, but right on cue, Tegas' troops arrive. The Salio walks out and has a pleasant surprise. He never would have thought that this man would come himself, as we're introduced to another badass, the General of Tegas. Lance King, Abel. The Earl is shocked at his arrival, and his presence is heavy, and this man is known as the strongest in the Central Continent, despite his age of 70 years. His strength was invaluable, even to the King. But Abel interrupts, asking if Chris will be here. He kinda wants to spar him, at least once, and man, everybody wants a piece of our boy. We shift back to Chris, and Lind asks if he has a plan. He knows that the Duke's army is steamrolling the Saleo's men, and their first stop should be Rold's estate. Chris and his men are on the move, and he tells Guillen to hold his position and scan the surroundings. They are approaching a castle, as the men notice the hundreds of horses coming around. The man on top of the wall sees the Proudman insignia, and is shocked. Aren't they supposed to be fighting Ludwig? Did he already defeat that large army? When interrupting his thoughts, Lin lets off an arrow from a couple hundred meters away, but the captain manages to catch it a centimeter before his neck. Lind is disappointed, but the captain breaks the arrow and sees a note tied to it. Stick together. The captain has to calm himself. He needs to defend this castle for his lord. Chris is a man that was recognized by the duke. He can't take him lightly. He orders his troops to ignore them for now. Lin sees what's going on, and Chris knows that this is to be expected of the knight who doesn't bleed. With man, fade us. Something like this won't shake him. It's time for plan B. He orders his men to set up camp, and Withron begins reading a book as one of his soldiers comments on how bold Chris is. They just need to be patient and wait for their lord's return. Three days pass, and he sees Chris just partying with his men, drinking to their heart's content. Withran wonders if Chris really is a baron, but all of a sudden, some troops are approaching from the west gate, as we see Weihain's remnants arriving. And this confuses Withran. Weren't these the two armies that were just fighting? Chris is alerted to Weihain's arrival, and this is just as he planned. It's time to begin. Right now, Withran feels surrounded, and needs to prepare an escape route, and thinks that he'll have his cavalry break through the east side and destroy the enemy. Digo is sent alone to meet this force. Chris can't lose any more troops, but it's time to show them the strength of Proudman. As Digo unleashes his transcendental fear, he lets off a huge slash, taking out dozens of horsemen. Withran is in all. Chris sent one man to deal with his cavalry. How far will he insult Withran's strength? The man starts to become furious and is falling right into Chris's trap. Digo continues his assault, killing one after the other with ease. Withran can't believe that Digo just walked into the center of his cavalry without a second thought. How reckless. Even if he is strong, Digo is just a simpleton. And Withran still believes that he can escape. 
He orders his archers to fire and Deagle's horse is shot down. Chris's troops are unable to assist and Royce wants to go in and help, but Chris holds him back. He knows with Rand's personality, if he can't win, he will run, and Chris is familiar with his thought process and his experience in war, but believes in Deagle but believes that Digo will break their foolish delusions. We shift back to when Chris was training his knights and they need to unlock the wise skill, double. Their enemies are on the fourth stage, over human, and they're already behind. Digo is sparring Royce, but Digo is starting to overpower him. Chris knows that this man's strength is not affected by double yet, and he's just naturally this strong, and he's slowly becoming a monster. Withran orders his men to surround Digo, and they begin to encircle him. But his wide slashes prevent them from coming close. But a spear is hurled, charged with wide energy. It doesn't connect, but grazes Digo's side. And Withran is among his troops. The assault, the assault combines the troops and Withran's spear throws, and is starting to take its toll on Digo. He's losing ground. He knows he has only one chance. After taking hit after hit, Withran thinks that he has him now. He has to make sure. His spears start to do more damage, and Digo kneels to the floor, coughing up blood. Withran comes confidently and hurls another spear, and it pierces Digo's side, causing Royce to yell out. Chris is worried, and Withran holds his spear, telling Digo to be proud. He is quite the fighter. But Digo isn't done yet. He uses his strength to hold the spear into his body. I got you now. Withran starts to panic, and Digo breaks the spear and charges his wise energy. We shift back to Tykeel saying that if Digo can reach double, his strength will be comparable to overhuman, as Digo unleashes his aura and dashes in. Withran's soldiers try to block him, but they are removed with a single strike. Withran looks over at Digo as the light of his halberd reflects off of his helmet, and all he can do is apologize to his lord. And Digo doesn't just remove his head, but half of his body, and the boy begins to yell at the top of his lungs. Digo has reached a new level. This display crushes the morale of Withran's troops. Even if they are outnumbered, Chris has the upper hand. He moves forward, yelling to the duke's forces that their commander is dead. If they hand over the castle, he will let them live. The next in line was informed by Withran already that if he died, to save his strength and join the main army. He orders his men to abandon the fort. Lind wonders if it's okay, but Chris is also worried about preserving his own fighting force. And a siege would definitely not end without casualties. In a civil war, the more bloody it is, the weaker the nation becomes. They need to end this soon, for Sir Cardo's sake. They have only one goal now, to eliminate the Duke's forces. And just as expected, Weehane hasn't negotiated with the Duke. Chris puts on a helmet and calls for Guillen and Royce. Weehane is at the west gate getting impatient and turns to leave. But a man comes out of the gate ready to meet them and relay the information. We see Weehane's tent as his soldiers let these people in. But now another soldier comes in informing Weehane that something's off. The Duke's men are escaping the castle and the men they're meeting right now are completely different. Weehane is in despair as a familiar voice is heard. It's been a while, huh? The guards try to protect their lord, but they are easily handled. Weehane grabs a sword, asking who this man is, but Chris just laughs. You're busy following me around, yet you don't know who I am, huh? He removes his helmet, and Weehane is seething with anger, and calls to Jodfil, but his boy's a little busy with a sword in his stomach. Gien tells Gideon to step back, and now the rat is cornered. Weehane puts the dots together, and Chris is responsible for everything, freeing Gien's mother and driving him into the situation. He tries to rush in with his sword, but Chris easily just pimp slaps it out of his hand, sending him to the ground. Chris will end this pathetic man's life. But Weehane yells out for his own brother to save him. Please, they're related, right? Chris is disgusted by this act and removes Weehane's head. The rest of Weehane's troops don't even know what's going on, but Gideon walks out of the tent with a sword to his neck. The troops are now shocked. What's going on? But they now see Gideon and Chris exit the tent, with Chris holding Weehane's head. He raises it to the sky and tells everyone that Weehane is dead, and throws it to the feet of these traitors. And it only took 90 chapters, but finally this motherfucker is out of the story. Chris reminds the nobles who fled with Weehane that he's eliminating evil from his country. And never in his life did he expect to see Count Ludwig's men like this. Is this really the army that once defended these borders? Are you not the guardians of the castle wall, the fence of Cercado? Are you not the men who defended it down to your last breath? Are you the same soldiers who fought alongside me against the eight gates? One of the nobles tries to speak. Why is Chris talking and not Gien? But Gien says that he serves Chris now. Chris continues his speech. Don't fight for me, but fight for yourself. Don't run anymore. Become the sword that ends this civil war. You are the wall that protects this country, the Ludwig army. Gideon drops to the floor with tears streaming down his face. He cries to be reinstated as a guardian of the castle wall. Please give me one more chance. Chris turns to the rest of the Ludwig army and tells them that it is time to end this chaos and to end this war. There's no more time to talk. 
They are hunting the Flying Tiger's Beard, which is a nickname for Duke Rold. We shift back to the royal family army, and the fight is not looking good for them as Duke Rold's men begin pushing forward. The Earl is thinking to himself about what the General Tegus is planning. His movements are too passive. The Cilio is placed in a hard spot, and we now see Chris sparring with Guillen. His wise proficiency isn't improving, and it's still stuck at 39. Is 40 that big of a leap? Chris calls for Ellis next, but Lind interrupts, informing him that the scouts are back with a report. Chris orders Guillen to supervise the training and he tells his knights to hone their skills as much as possible before their final battle. Chris looks over at a battle map and sees the royal army has retreated and General Tegas has joined, but it seems they still can't deal with the Duke's army. Lin thinks that now would be a great time to attack Roll's rear, but Chris's real objective is to attack the Salio, but he can't just yet. Their first objective should be to end the civil war. They need to stick to the plan. Duke Rold is overlooking his army and is informed that Withran is dead. Rold wonders if they Rold wonders if it was a mistake to leave him behind. But now their problem is Chris, who could be attacking their rear at any moment, and they run the chance of being surrounded. The Duke isn't scared, however, since the royal army won't move. They have no communication with Proudman. Ryzen asks how he can know this, but Rold tells him that he knows the Salio like the back of his hand. The Earl of Hydo won't let him move so easily. Rold Rold unsheathes his sword and pumps it full of aura, excited for his encounter with Chris. The two armies are now facing each other as Valm begins to charge. Lind orders his troops to stand by and his flanks to spread out. They're going to surround them. Valmung enters the battle first but is met by Digo. It's been a while, huh? Nice to meet you again. Ellis interrupts the reunion and causes Valmung to dismount. He lands and warns the young knights that today they won't be spared. Lind is still coordinating the troops and Rold's commander is trying to counter their movements but is hit with the real plan. Chris is aiming directly for the duke and at this rate he's going to reach him. He tries to order his troops but Guillen appears from behind, unleashing his blade. Did we meet before? Well, not like it matters now. Can you please step aside? I have a duke's throat to split. Guillen's aura begins to rise but Ryzen begins to get angry. In the center of the duke's army, a smoke bomb goes off. The troops rush to defend their lord, but Doki just comes in flying with two axes like a goddamn savage. He hits the ground, causing hundreds of men to be displaced. He begins his assault, ripping them to shreds, but behind him stands a towering presence, as the duke himself tells his barbarian to get out of his way. He slams his weapon down, aggravated that Chris is so cocky to meet him like this. But we see Chris intercept his strike, saving Doki. The duke begins to smile. He is happy to see Chris again, and Chris is too. It's been a while, your highness. Chris tells Doki to join the main force and hold his back, but he has his hands full as the duke slowly approaches. This encounter reminds him of the first time he met Chris, and now he understands the boy's determination and tells him that he is his rival. The duke lets off a heavy blow, but Chris blocks. Chris says that he hates obsessed old men, and the two disengage. Chris lets off a barrage of spear stabs. Rold parries them with ease and rushes in. Chris is sent back with one blow, and the Duke warns the boy not to disappoint him. And as expected, he has overhuman. The Duke is way stronger than Guillen, and his weapon has a wide range. Chris needs to level up as he fights, and can't hold back. He unleashes his maximum aura and dashes in behind the Duke. He prepares his aura into his dagger and stabs at the Duke's weapon, cutting it in half. But Rold isn't impressed and unsheathes his real weapon. Chris notices the frost on his armor. An artifact? The Duke has an artifact? Snow White, an ice element sword. We shift to Desilio and he wants to help Chris, but the Earl tells him to think about it. Is Chris even on their side? Chris was easy to ally with the Southerners and Ludwig. When this war is over, he will be a thorn that will haunt them. Desilio isn't decisive and agrees, and the Earl doesn't care who wins. Both are his enemies. We see Digo still in the heat of the battle, trading blows with Falmung. Fighting him on horseback is annoying, so Falmung chops the horse's head off. But Ellis comes in from behind, which makes Valmung turn to defend. Digo comes in again, but is elbowed back a few meters. Ellis tries to help, but she manages to barely dive under a huge sword slash. Digo tries to get up, but Valmung is stronger than he thought. It's hard for him to move. Valmung looks over at Digo, and from what he remembers, Digo wasn't this weak. Are you injured? Well, doesn't matter. You're gonna die anyways. Right before Digo is hit, Royce comes flying in, and Valmung gets annoyed and begins chasing after the two. But an arrow stops his assault, as we see Lind firing charged shots at him. Ellis is also in the fight, using her water aura to strike as well, cutting his cheeks. It seems Valmung has his hands full, and his anger begins to build. Heads are being chopped off everywhere, as Kennery himself is on the battlefield, killing motherfuckers left and right. Doki joins him, and he was sent by Chris. Kennery yells, asking who is gonna defend Chris 
if Doki is here. Have you lost your mind? But Doki isn't much of a talker, and it was Chris's order. Kenry orders his men to break through. They are joining the Baron. Gien and Ryzen continue their fight, and Ryzen is impressed. But if Gien listened to his master, he would have conquered the continent. And today, Chris will die. Gien just smirks, and the two disengage. You don't know anything about Chris, so stop talking. He's the man that I've chosen. Gien charges up and dashes back in, sending a quick upward slash that separates Ryzen's chin. But it wasn't enough to kill him. And now we see Chris and the Duke sizing each other up. Chris analyzes the Duke's sword, and it cannot be easily broken. But he will need to block his strikes with his own spear. The Duke asks if Chris is scared, but our boy never backs down as he rushes into the fight. The Duke's attacks now send frost strikes with it, and Chris notices the difference in their strength. He can't win with force, but interrupting his thoughts, Rold appears to his side and slashes at him, sending the boy back. Chris coughs up blood, and his left arm is starting to be paralyzed from the frostbite. The situation is dire and Chris can't think of a way through. But for some reason, Chris is enjoying every moment of this fight as he smiles, asking the Duke if he feels the same way. The two men clash swords, and it seems finally Chris understands what Rold has been feeling. Chris is an opponent he will never face again. The two send strikes that cause shockwaves, and Kennery and his men are rushing, worried about Chris. Not that he doesn't have faith in him, but he knows the monster that is the Duke. But as Kennery approaches, he sees the Tiger King's troop watching the battle shouting the Duke's name, making Kennery think that Chris is dead. But when he arrived, the soldiers began to forget about the battle for a second and get mesmerized by something. They start shouting, and in the center of it all was Chris and Rold. Kennery looks on, and this is no longer the boy that he once knew. He is now a monarch whose time has come. Kennery was overwhelmed by emotion and screams at the top of his lungs, Chris, hang in there! Kennery was letting out years of resentment hidden inside of him. Chris, the king of the castle wall. The crowd of thousands of men goes silent, and even Rold is taken aback. But Chris's men begin to join Kennery, yelling for Chris the hero, the king of the castle wall. Rold now knows Chris's true goal, to become king. You bastard. Chris tells the Duke that if all the people who believed in him and fought with him don't call him a king, then who deserves to become their king? That's a sick line right there. This is the coolest part of the manhwa, I swear. I hope you guys are enjoying it. Rold is impressed that Chris is finally showing his true colors, and Chris smirks, asking if the man is anxious. But Rold is happy and is delighted seeing his fighting spirit. Chris feels his left arm starting to give up, and there's no time left to hesitate as he rushes back in on Rold. Rold switches the hand he's using to grip his sword and meets the strike, sending Chris back. The two's auras flare up as the battle gets intense. But what's this? Rold is being pushed back. How can this bastard, who's at his limit, be holding me back? And he keeps getting stronger, as you see Chris's spear technique level up to 79. Roll tries to get an overhead slash, and Chris manages to block it, but knows he's being pushed back, as Kennery and Doki yell for their comrade. Roll stands over him, and unfortunately, his left arm won't be usable anymore. It's all over. Chris kneels on the ground, but asks, over? How was this over? Who decided that? Rold is even more impressed as he comes to find that Chris is ambidextrous. He wished that he wasn't this brave and the two rush back in at each other. Chris sends a barrage of spear strikes that takes back Rold and he knows it will be difficult to defeat this man, but still he'll never give up. The two send strikes back and forth and disengage. Chris runs back in knowing he can't give up. He has to protect everyone that has risked their lives and changed everything in time to be by his side. Chris rushes in and it seems he's pushing Rold back as the man dashes back dodging a wide slash. Chris knows that he has a bright future ahead and he charges the aura into his foot and into the tip of his spear and he's going to make everyone's dreams become a reality. His wise proficiency levels up to 40 and he will put his life on the line to defeat this man. Rold starts to get impressed and charges up his own energy and vows to end this. The two with their aura surging rush in at each other but in a single strike they dash past each other. Chris's spear is still lighting up with aura, and the soldiers watch on in awe. But Rold is missing his side. He gets down on one knee, feeling the effect of this wound. His soldiers call out to their majesty, but Rold tells them to step back as blood oozes from his mouth. He stands up with this giant gash in his side. What a savage. And he walks up to Chris. Do you really think you'll become king? Chris just says that he doesn't know, but he's going to try. Rold tells him not to put off that decision. Kill Prince Desileo. But please... Don't kill Sir Cardo. Chris knows why the Duke was worried and says that he will. With his last breaths, Duke tells everyone to listen up. I, Betharium, Rold, Gauche, order you. From this moment forward, all the knights and military commanders under his command will now be led 
by Rido Spen. If Rido Spen dies, then Chris Proudman will take over his legacy. And with this statement, Rold falls to the ground. His eyes begin to fade. He can't believe that it's over. But still, it was fun. Chris tells him to rest well, Tiger Duke. Now, footsteps are heard as the Royal Army begins to charge. Finally, the Civil War is over. But Chris looks over and sees something is weird. The mounted troops are not slowing down. He overhears what they're saying, and they're saying it's time to wrap up this war. The disgusting rebels of the kingdom and the traitors who are shamelessly enough to communicate with the Eight Gates kill them all as Desilio leads the charge, attacking his own men. Chris understands the betrayal that is now happening, but, you know, he wanted to kill Desilio too, so it's only fair. The men are back in the heat of the battle, and Chris yells at the top of his lung, cursing the First Prince. The men are being taken down one by one, and even Desilio is in the battle. He tells them not to miss a single person, pick out all the roots of revolution. Chris yells asking how much blood did they have to shed to end this war. But the after effects of the battle are beginning to take its toll on Chris as he gets a shock and he falls to his knees. Kennery yells towards Chris asking if he's alright. He yells towards the men taking care of the Duke's body and tells him to get out of this place. The men yell that they're soldiers of the Tiger Duke. Retreating is not in their vocabulary and they'll fight till they end up dead. Chris yells telling them that no good will come out of their death. Don't let the demise of their duke go to waste. And tells his own men to pay attention. The special force will retreat and they will join with the main force. But interrupting his thoughts is a purple aura enveloping a spear that crashes down sending a huge explosion. It's the Lance King Adel as he yells for Chris Proudman. Finally, he gets to meet him. Is that the Tegus' armor? Then this is the old commander? The Lance King? Why is he here? Lance King Adel tells Chris to bring it on. He came all this way to fight him and dashes in at Chris. The man tries to send the strike but Doki ends up blocking. Ah, two-handed axe technique. Are you a southerner? This world really is full of interesting bastards as he sends Doki back with a single slash. Chris realizes the strength that he had in that one strike. He must be a fourth stage wiser or higher. Abel asks what the hell is going on with Chris. Why is he so beaten and bruised? This must be the cause of his battle against the Tiger Duke. Oh, so you're exhausted, huh? I won't get anything if I fight you like this. I'll give you one day. Come back to a state where you can fight me on equal footing. Mind this, this isn't a simple request, but we won't just be sparring. It will be better for you not to run away. If you do that, I will turn my forces on Sir Cardo and your county of Proudman. Abel just gets disappointed and asks Chris to leave. It's embarrassing that so many people are watching. Chris turns and thanks Abel, but Doki says he's ready to kill this bastard. Chris calms him down, saying that they can't do anything yet. Kennery doesn't know what this guy is planning, and neither does Chris, as he thinks to himself that if he was really aiming for his life, he would have ended it right then and there. But maybe Abel's goal is different from the royal family. Chris sees enemy soldiers rushing in, but the first guy is sniped by Lind. Chris tries to regroup as more enemies start to descend on him, but Gian comes slashing them down in front of him. He calls out to Chris and tells his troops to protect their lord. Chris asks Lind what the current situation is, and is told that both of the Duke's swords have been destroyed. They succeeded in crushing the Duke's army in one day. Chris asks about his knights, but is told not to worry. Everyone is saved, though they are quite injured. Chris mounts on Lin's horse and he tells Lin that the royal army has joined Tegas' forces and they'll soon come after them. Doki and Gien are ordered to clear the way. They're leaving this place. The first prince's troops try to stop them, but they can't. They're being overpowered. Some time passes and the Earl is screaming at Abel. How did he let this happen? They could have had Proudman. They could have had the Baron. Abel just laughs, saying that he was faster than he expected. And the Earl turns towards the first prince. They should chase them immediately. Abel says that they can't do that. His soldiers need time to recover. And says that they'll advance tomorrow instead. The Earl is getting annoyed how he can say that after he barely fought for even a second. But Abel, just like a savage, says that it looks like they don't need his support anymore. And threatens to leave. The Salillo tells the two to calm down. And asks the Lance King if he's sure he can end the Baron's life tomorrow. And is told that he can. The Salillo says that it's decided. And they will march in 24 hours. The Earl is getting annoyed and wonders what this bastard is up to, and he can't trust him any longer. He's going to kill Chris with his own hands. We now see Chris's forces link back up in their camp as Chris rejoins his squadron. He sees Digo inside, but he's completely battered. Chris asks if everyone is okay. Digo got the worst of it, but he's injured resting inside of the tent. Chris looks at the situation, and it's far worse than he anticipated. Everyone is exhausted, and at this rate, Chris wonders if they can even win tomorrow. He tells his men that the arrows of war are rushing towards us, and this war won't end until the royal family obliterates us. The allied army is now joined by Tegas' forces, and they're going to catch up tomorrow. But before he can finish, Ellis just smiles. Don't worry, Captain. I'll smash him tomorrow. 
None of his men are even feeling an ounce of doubt, as even Guillen says that no one can match up to Chris. Don't tell me you're afraid now. Chris has a soft smirk, and it seems that he was the one that lacked motivation the most. But thanks to all of his friends, his mind is clear. He will always be in their care. And this time tomorrow, they're going to fight like their lives depend on it. Nighttime comes and Chris is all bandaged up and he lays back in his tent, thinking about the Lance King. He's a stubborn motherfucker and only lives to fight against any rival. That's the only thing he's heard about him from his old master. Desilio pulled his hidden car to deal with Chris, but it turned out to be a complete waste of time. All Abba wants to do is have a battle with Chris. And Chris is sure he's not even interested in operating with the Royal Army. He needs to make full use of this loophole as Chris begins charging and harnessing his aura. The next day comes and Chris mounts, seemingly rejuvenated, and Lind by his side. Their forces are behind them and the Salio approaches. Both men yell for their troops to charge in and the battle continues. All of Chris's knights are in the thick of things, cutting soldiers down left and right. Abel and Chris walk immediately to each other and Abel asks how his body is doing. You're not gonna die after one hit are you? Chris thinks to himself that he's only recovered around 40%. He will make sure that Abel doesn't regret the decision he made the other day. Abel gets excited and tells the kid to bring it on, and the two lunge at each other. Abel sends heavy swings of his lance that Chris barely manages to dodge. Chris sends his own spear, but Abel, even at 70 years, is able to do an acrobatic move backward to dodge it, commenting on how quick the boy is. Chris picks up some daggers from his back pocket and throws them at Abel. Abel comments on the technique, but easily blocks him. Chris rushes in, spear in hand, but Abel continues to easily parry his attacks. He kicks Chris back and has his own strike and sends a wide slash that Chris ducks under. Abel stops for a second, thinking that Chris is quite remarkable, but he's lacking in some areas. Chris is excited, and he's indeed the Lance King that he heard about. He fights on a whole different level. We shift back to Desilio, and the Earl tells him he's also going to participate in this attack. Desilio is shocked. Are you really about to step forward? The Earl tells him not to worry. He knows the best method in order to end this civil war, and this Leo allows him. The Earl ends up riding thinking that Abel was a fool for missing Chris, and he's sure now that the only reason he's even on their side is for his personal entertainment. But the Earl doesn't want any more distractions, and he's going to end everything with his own hands, and he will take over Sir Cardo as he has a wicked smile. Chris's fight with the Lance King is continuing as he throws more knives, but these kind of tricks won't work on him. But Along the knives is a thin thread. The Lance King tells him to do something to entertain him as he takes his lance and he hurls it back, slamming it into the ground, creating a huge crater. Chris dodges and turns back, and but the Lance King is right on his tail. His spear proficiency levels up to 80, alerting him to this rise. He leveled up with the spear still in his hands. If this is the case, then something might be possible. As he dashes away, Abel chases him, telling him that he can't run. This is futile, but... Chris finally has him in his trap as he yanks all the strings that had all the knives from the floor. He calls this move in the visible wire Spider Hell as all the knives that Chris thrown were strategically placed in different areas. The wires are pulled and the Lance King is tripped, surprising him to what happened. Chris takes advantage of the opportunity, jumping above the Lance King ready to end him. But this man isn't no pushover as he uses his own lance to strike the ground, causing an explosion propelling him another way. Chris is taken aback to how he manipulated his wise, and the Lance King just stands there laughing. How many steps did you plan ahead? That was truly a masterpiece, Chris. Chris thinks to himself that he still can't win against this guy, not with his current skill. His own skin is solid like armor, and this might be a wall that's impossible to cross. Abel is a fifth stage wiser, with a nickname, The Wall. Chris notices something interrupting the fight, however, as a huge fire spell is thrown at Chris. He dodges back and the Earl tells him that they're both dumbass knights, and he will make them kneel before the power of magic as he stands preparing another spell. A wizard? Chris notices that this is the Earl of Hydo, the wizard who appeared during the Civil War in his past, and now he has two enemies. This might be bad. Abel stands there and is annoyed. How dare you intervene in my fight? As the Lance King's aura flares up into the sky, he's gonna rip this man apart limb from limb. Chris can't believe that Abel is this angry. And one of the soldiers even comes in commenting that don't they have an agreement? They can't just attack each other. But Abel asks why he can't. And now, this sentence alerts Chris. An agreement, huh? So Abel can't harm the royal family right now. So it's time to utilize this piece of information. Chris asks if the Lance King can leave this to him. He's not going to step in their way if he steps forward and kills him. So please, let me do this. The Lance King smiles and it seems that Chris is onto something. He says he's lost his excitement and now he will take his leave. Chris says he'll learn a few more cool tricks to use in the future. And the Lance King hopes that he keeps his promise and orders his troops to withdraw at once. The Earl is shocked at what's going on. How can you do this? 
but he fires another spell. But Chris is at his side. The Earl prepares his hand and motions another blast towards Chris. Chris thinks that this is annoying. This wizard is making it hard for him to get close. He keeps running around, dodging these spells one by one. But Lind comes and throws Rold's artifact towards Chris. Chris thanks Lind for the good work and tells him that it's time to go and tells him that they'll attack at the same time. Lind lets off a volley of arrows, but the Earl is still confident, thinking his magic will overtake them. He is Hido, the only sorcerer in Zircardo. Chris rushes in at the spell, but slices it away with the artifact. The Earl is taken aback, and it looks like all he can do is play with fire, as Chris ends his life with a single slash. Desilio, after seeing this display, is in despair that his only comrade was killed. Lin points over towards the First Prince and tells the troops where he is. Doki is now chasing after him as Desilio tries to regain himself. Doki jumps in the air with two axes ready to kill this man. Desilio tries to intercept, but Doki cuts his arm off in a single slash, causing him to scream in agony. One of his soldiers comes up and orders his men to protect their majesty. He makes a makeshift bandage, telling Desilio that he needs to retreat. Someone needs to survive. They can rally the troops and fight again. At least he should make it out of this. He gets the first prince on the horse and tells him that he'll buy him some time. But as he's trying to let him escape, Doki's axe politely sits him down. Desilio is shocked after seeing this and begins running away, yelling for someone to save him. And I mean, he was looking badass for like half a chapter, but you know, yeah, it is what it is. Guillen orders his troops to chase after him. The enemy is escaping as Desilio thinks on how things turned out like this. He was supposed to win this war. What on earth went wrong? Lin asks Chris if they should chase him, but Chris tells him there's no need. This war is already over. The only thing left is Desilio's decision. We see Desilio return to his nobles and they're concerned of what happened to his arm. Desilio says the rebel army is going to attack soon. They need to start acting before they put them into a siege. He tells them to gather all the royal ministers and prepare a countermeasure. We now see them inside of the palace and the nobles try to come up with a solution. They need to fight to the very end. Desilio has his hand on his head. He has no idea what he should do. Maybe they should run and take refuge with Tigis. Desilio doesn't like this idea. What will people think of him then? This country needs a king, but Desilio is back into a corner. A man says that the preparations for Tigis have finished, and Desilio tells the man to prepare a carriage. He now sits at the table alone and sighs, but hears footsteps behind him. Rachel comes asking if the man was planning on leaving. Desilio gets up, asking, who are you? How did you get in here? Rachel says her orders were to kill everyone who tried to leave and spare those who stayed. Desilio tries to argue with Rachel, please don't come any closer, what's wrong with you? What did I do wrong? But in his screams, Rachel dashes him, slashing his throat in a single strike. And with that, the civil war was over. And apart from the news regarding the deaths of the Tiger Duke and Desilio, another report was sent of the demise of the second prince in an unexpected event. The only surviving members of the royal family were the two queens and the third prince, Eric. So, the only direct bloodline, Eric Sercardo, sat on the throne. Chris is called up to the throne, and he's the hero who brought the end to the civil war. He will be granted fiefs including the estates of Savonad and Vangtes, and he will be appointed as Duke. We shift to Chris back in Proudman and all of his boys congratulate him on the promotion. But Chris tells him to get ready. From now on, things will get busy. And now that they're controlling more territory, there's going to be more for them to worry about. And besides, they don't know when war might start up again, so they need to increase the number and strength of their army as soon as they can. He recruited some more soldiers, and he said that he did. He sent some circulating announcements throughout Sercardo, and the ones who have been recruited are currently on standby. Chris has a sigh of relief, but before he can get to the next topic... Tykeel is at the door, telling him that there's something he needs to tell him. Tykeel's veins begin to bulge, and there's a scar on his beautiful daughter's face. How should a father feel about that? Chris starts to get scared and says that that scar has nothing to do with him, but Tykeel just drags Chris out of the room, saying that he has a special training regiment for him. All the boys start laughing and wish their duke good luck. After Chris was beaten to a pulp, he goes with Grappe to see all of the new recruits. Grappe tells Chris the plan is to reinvest all the revenue from the sales of the salt for war preparation and recruitment of more soldiers. Chris overlooks this squad of men and asks if they received basic training. Grappe says that they've been trained already for a month. Chris raises his arm and tells the soldiers it's time for their first mission. All of you get a shovel and assemble. Grappe looks a little nervous and asks Chris what he's planning to do. But Chris just smiles. He's trying to find the treasure. The group begins digging holes outside and Chris is starting to get annoyed. He was sure that the thing he's looking for was somewhere around here. A man asks what the hell Chris is doing. And even if he is a duke, this might be pushing it for some people. Chris asks if this man is the feudal lord of this region, and the guy says he's Viscount Cloester. Chris says, as far as he knows, this is a barren land, and he can't cultivate anything whatsoever. 
and if he can allow Chris to continue his work, he will grant him a fertile land where he can farm. The man is shocked at his proposal. Chris says he only needs two days, but all of a sudden, screaming is heard. Did you see a soldier with bright red eyes? Chris smiles. It seems like they found it already. The soldier starts to pick a fight and looks at his fellow comrade, saying that he's about to kill him, and the two men begin to fight. Chris watches on and tells Digo that those two can't hear them. This is a brainwashing effect. It's pretty strong, isn't it? He tells Digo to go in there and stop them. Digo whoops their ass and carries them back. Chris orders for all of the soldiers except for Digo and Royce to evacuate the pit immediately. Chris asks for a shovel and starts to dig. After a while, he found what he was looking for. Chris calls for Digo and asks if he wants a cool weapon instead of his old crappy one. Digo says that he's up for it and Chris tells him to put his hand in the hole. Chris thinks the name of this land is the Bloodstained Plains. While cultivating, a farmer found an artifact in this region, and it turned him into a berserker. And according to legends, he killed hundreds of people, before he was finally subdued when the Wise Knights stepped in. All of a sudden, Digo's arm begins to swirl with a blood-like texture, and an axe forms in his hand. This is a cursed artifact imbued with an evil spirit. Executioner Guillotine. It starts to flood Digo with negative thoughts. I need blood. Kill all humans. But Digo isn't impressed, and is actually happy happy that this axe is for me, and thanks Chris for the gift. And this shocks the axe, and I guess it has a personality. Chris smiles and tells Digo that that's all his. With his fortitude, he won't be brainwashed too easily. Royce gets a little discouraged and asks if there's any other weapons, maybe something for me. Chris tells him not to worry, they're gonna look for another one as well. Chris thinks to himself that they're going to reclaim all of the artifacts that were found in the land of Sercardo in his past life. We shift back to the royal palace, and the nobles try to throw some shade on Chris, saying that all the local lords are complaining about him. He's trespassing, doing whatever he wants. The nobles start to complain, telling him that he can't just ignore this problem. They need to take Duke Proudman and punish him. Eric doesn't seem amused and asks if they have a problem with Chris, then maybe he should send them as an envoy to the dukedom to resolve the grievances. Marquis Fortens, the head of the aristocracy, tells the prince that the duke is abusing his power. He gets serious and asks if Eric is the king or is it Chris? Elowan coughs in awkwardness as Eric says that of course he's the king. The Marquis says if that's the case then why don't you summon Chris here at once? Eric just sighs and he was planning to do that anyways and he knows that Chris is busy but he should at least pay me a visit. He relays the order for the duke to come here and if the nobles have a problem with him they need to tell him in person. The Marquis has a wicked smile and says he will do as his lord commands. We shift back to Chris and Royce, and they're in a cave somewhere, and they uncovered another artifact, the sword Quake. It was made by an expert craftsman. Royce starts to get excited and asks if this is for him, but Chris lets him down, saying that it's for Ellis, because it is a rapier after all. Royce asks when he is going to get something. We see Chris's men clearing the way from some low-level monsters, and Chris tells him not to retreat, attack all of the goblins. All of a sudden, a huge ogre appears, and Digo rushes in. The ogre yells, but with one slice, Digo chops the monster's head in two. Amazed at his new weapon, Chris thinks to himself that everyone here and Digo need to ingrain this experience into their minds, because soon, they will face a war entirely of a different magnitude. Two years from now, they will be here. The great invasion that will shake the entire continent, the Orc Wave. We see the meeting of the nobles that are trying to fill the power vacuum caused by Desilio's death. It's now their chance to rise to power, and they even have the queen backing them. They toast the good times ahead, and now the world will finally know their names. We shift back to Chris looking at a weird cave entrance, and this is the dungeon that has various monsters inside. Royce wonders if there's a weapon for him in this cave, and he really wants to get a cool one already. Chris tells him to be patient, they're not going to go through that entrance, but a secret one on the back of the mountain. This dungeon has only one entrance, and if you dive in looking for treasure, you will surely fail. Even the Dungeon Hunter Guild gave up on it. Digo asks how Chris even knows about this. He just says a crappy lie, not wanting to give up his main character buff. He was actually in the guild who challenged this dungeon countless times in his previous life. The group approaches a tree with red roots, and Chris thinks that the entrance that is shown is actually a trap. The treasure is in the back of the dungeon. He orders his boys to start digging at the tree, and they do so and stumble upon a box. Chris opens it and sees a chain with a cross, a hero artifact that was made by the dwarf. It has some magical properties. Royce is begging to have it, but Chris tells him to back off. This is mine. 
Roy starts to get angry, begging Chris to get him something cool already. But interrupting the two, Murdoch comes delivering an important message. The royal palace ordered the presence of Duke Proudman. We shift to Chris walking into the palace, not giving a fuck, and he's ordered to go in alone. Chris enters the hall and is immediately hit with slander on all sides, calling him a traitor. Chris defends himself and he said he never tried to kill anyone or tried to betray his kingdom. He is solely focused on restoring his land. Chris begins to smile. Surely he wasn't called here just for this, right? And asks who the man is who called him. And we are introduced to the Marquis Poltens, brother of the Queen. We see a fan favorite, Eric, laughing in the room. The Marquis tries to order his men to capture Chris, but Chris isn't having any of it and starts to yell at this bozo. Stop abusing your power in front of the prince. The Marquis tries to call for his guards, but they aren't stupid enough to attack Chris. He is the battlefield hero. Chris gets to the point and says that the General of Tegas isn't fully allied with Sarcardo, and the Eight Gates are aiming for Sunset Hyde. We are on the brink of destruction. Is this the time to be worried about power? What the hell are you nobles even thinking about? Putting yourselves before your country. Don't think the wealth from Tegas will save your lives. Because I, Chris, declare that anyone who betrays this country will be punished severely. Chris slams the table, causing all the nobles to be taken aback. We shift to a meeting with Count Elowan, Zighal, and Chris. The two counts support what Chris said, and Zighal asks about his daughter. Chris tries to take a sip of his tea, but notices a scent. He brings out a packet and confirms that his tea has indeed been poisoned, shocking the counts near him. Chris knows that this is a high-end poison, and only one clan can be responsible. But before he can think any more, some assassins come breaking through the door and start aiming their crossbows. Chris flips over the table next to him for cover and throws it at the assailants. Two more assassins try to impale Chris with spears while he is dodging arrows. But Chris catches the arrows in midair to save his two comrades. But saving the two counts, he is hit with two more arrows. But they deflect off him. It seems that Chris has prepared his vest to be resistant to projectiles. The assassins are now stunned as Chris breaks an arrow and throws it out of the window. The assassins try to attack again, but Chris remembers that he has his own assassins under him, as Rachel and the Hundred Daggers come in and deal with these amateurs. Rachel inspects the bodies of the assassins and is shocked to find out that they are from the Eight Gates. Elowan and Zighold are shocked, and Fox tells Chris that there were no guards patrolling this area. When Chris hears this news, he is disgusted. These nobles will sacrifice their own country for power. Chris hoped that these men would have understood the situation they were in due to the Civil War. But it seems Chris has to do something else. He can't just kill these officials, but instead, he'll put them on a leash. We see the Marquis walking with a guard, and don't have an update on the assassination attempt just yet. The Marquis enters his room and tells the guard to be on standby. But as soon as the man closes the door, Rachel puts a dagger to his throat and kicks him to the floor. The man mistakenly thinks that Rachel is a part of the Eight Gates assassins that he sent and asks if the job is done. Rachel doesn't answer the Marquis and tells him to listen to everything that she says or else. Send a raven saying the operation was successful, and also in the message say that the duke is missing. The Marquis is worried about what will happen if he does this, but Rachel doesn't give him any choice, and the only way he will live is to comply. The next day comes and Eric gets the news that Chris has gone missing. Erewhon confirms this news and tells Eric that an assassination attempt has occurred. The prince is now furious and orders for his army to be mobilized. All forces will search for Chris, and the bastards who are responsible will pay. We shift to Zighal talking with the Grand Master of the Royal Guards, who is shocked to hear that assassins from the Eight Gates attacked them. How can their defenses be so weak? Zighal tells this man that his daughter has the ability to spot any traitors, but he needs his support in order to enact it. The man thinks about it and agrees. This is to protect the royal family. Zighal thinks that if the Grand Master colluded with the Marquis, he would not have accepted this offer. So right now, suspicion is off of him. Everything is going according to Chris's plan. We shift to the Eight Gates city, Wolfziano, and a surge of pilgrims are arriving as the soldiers watch on. We see a familiar face, Perth, and he notices someone in the crowd. He asks the man to remove his hood, and he does so, and introduces himself as Nora Devon. Is there a problem? Perth says the man is good to go, but thinks that he felt an insane amount of energy emanating from this stranger. Perth thinks that someone like that also is an Ediniano. We shift to this new city location, and we're in the Blue Dragon Clan's castle. A messenger tells the king that they need to retake the wolf's den as soon as possible. The king, Sorte the Eighth, sighs. They lost a sizable amount of troops in their last expedition, and right now they need to conserve their strength. But his advisor is still advocating for war. 
How can they sleep with Sir Cardo right on their doorstep? Another matter is pressing. They need to stop the rivalry between the Blue Dragon and the Gold Clans. They need to figure this out before they invade other countries. The man thinks to himself, and if he can convince the king to lead his country into war, then he will fulfill his mission and will return to the Northern Empire to report his success. And no wonder the Eight Gates sucks balls. They're getting played from the inside. The man walks off, but it seems our king isn't so gullible. Three days pass and three hooded figures enter a room, and a girl guides them to their destination. They walk down a set of stairs and meet the king of the eight gates. The man takes off his hood and it turns out Yvonne is actually freaking Chris. And why does he look so weird? This is kind of bothering me. We shift back to Elowan's mansion and he hands an item to Royce, saying it's from the duke. Royce is excited that he finally gets a cool weapon, and this was something Elowan got a long time ago. But due to the weapon's weird shape, no one ever wanted to use it. Royce pulls out his new red katana and is amazed, and names it Single Edge. Erewhon hands a message from Chris that his orders are to relay the message. We shift back to Chris's weird face, meeting with the King of the Eight Gates. This man thinks that Chris looks different from all the tales, but Chris manipulated his appearance with herbs. And the king tells Chris that he's been a thorn in his side, and someone from a different state wanted to take care of this thorn, but wanted the wolf's stronghold in return. Do you think I should take this deal? Chris isn't amused and switches to a serious tone, and tells the king to cut the bullshit. If he trusted that man, this meeting would have never happened. The king's attendant is angered by the disrespect, all the king wants to do is get rid of a green-eyed stranger. It is revealed that 10 years ago, a man appeared, the so-called green-eyed stranger, Junberg, and he revived the Eight Gates. He is the disciple of the frozen-blooded strategist, Angzing Lissonis. The king knows this man pretends to fight for the glory of the Eight Gates, but he is slowly expanding his influence in the country, and soon the land will be lost. Chris is amazed by the king's intellect, and it seems that Sorte the Eighth was in fact a great man. He would have been a great king if it wasn't for the orc invasion. Chris says he has one condition, and if the king will agree to this, he will make this stranger leave on his own two feet. The king obliges. Chris says the first step in this plan is restoring the relationship between the Eight Gates and Sir Cardo. Sorte thinks Chris means a non-aggression pact, but actually Chris wants an alliance. The king knows there might be pushback from allying with the enemy, but right now they need to stabilize the region in order to prosper. The king smiles and welcomes Chris Proudman to the Eight Gates. We shift back to Proudman's men racing up a hill, and soon they're going to arrive at their destination. Lin recalls the orders given by Grappe, and Royce, Digo, and Ellis were sent the train and used their artifacts freely, while Lind was sent into the mountains with a group of men to nurture elite warriors. In these mountains, there is a mission. Lin reaches the top and tells his men to organize the supplies. Lin looks at the map knowing his objective is here, but quickly snipes a bird out of the air. Lin sniped a messenger crow. He splits his men into two groups. One will bring supplies every night, and the other will shoot arrows, until they can hit the crows, and train until they can hit these targets while running. One of the soldiers asks how long they will have to stay here, but Lin just looks back and smiles. At least six months. We are now at the Green Dagger Clan's Ars Jundberg's mansion, and it's been days since his crows have been returning his messages, not only from Sir Cardo, but also from the entire Northern Empire. Also, the king's movements have been unusual. The man thinks that he may have made a mistake. He turns to a woman behind him, asking if she pulled some kind of trick. The woman says she has always followed his orders, but the green-eyed man shuts the door, telling the girl that if she ever betrays him, he will feed her to the dogs. Interrupting Junberg is his attendant saying that a guest has come to see them, as you see Chris using the alias Nord. He greets Sir Junberg. Ars quickly notices the green eyes and hand gestures coming from Chris, and assumes that he is from the Northern Empire. Ars asks why Chris is here, and he lies saying that he's under orders. This makes Ars start to think that what happened is the Empire is planning to get rid of him because of his failure, or maybe he's being replaced. He comes back to his senses and tells Chris to come back later. Chris starts to notice the anxiety from this man. He won't need to prepare a poison, because even a meeting as simple as this has poisoned the man's mind. The poison of insecurity. We shift to a town in Oaken in the eastern continent, and a farmer is plowing the fields, as his wife asks him when they think their children will return. The man thinks that it must be several months, because it takes a while to reach the central continent. A man in the distance walks towards the two, but as they wave, they get a chilling sight, seeing the man on his last legs, with blood dripping from his face. He tries to warn the older couple to run away, but he falls to the floor. Instead of listening, they run towards him, and the husband gets an axe to the mouth. The wife is in shock seeing her husband dead, and an orc emerges from the forest and screeches at the top of its lungs. But we can only assume what happens to that poor lady. The green-haired stranger starts to get worried. It's been three weeks since Chris arrived. If he is the new agent sent by the Empire, does that mean I failed? And why have they not ordered for me to be eliminated yet? 
he asks his attendant what Chris is doing and is informed that he met with the gold clan a while ago. And right now we shift to see Chris sparring in the blue dragon clan's outdoor training field. We see the leader, Nova Dragon, surprised by Chris's spear technique. A man wants to know who this is, but Nova whispers to the girl next to him that Chris's identity is hidden. So they just say he is an envoy from the Northern Empire. Chris stops sparring with one of the men and they shake hands after an intense match. The arrogant young knight asks Pike if he's not ashamed. If he lost in the Blue Dragon clan would be ashamed. Elaire, the girl next to Nova, steps up and asks Chris to spar. But he just says that he's tired. We shift back to Ars, stressing over Chris. He is sparring with the Blue Dragon Knights? This clan has been rejecting my offers this entire time. And this new guy won them over like that? The king of the Blue Dragon clan must have heard something about Nord. Ars tells his attendants to prepare his carriage. Chris sips his tea with the king, thinking about Ars and how he had someone tailing Chris to gather information. But this only works to Chris's advantage. The more he is watched, the more anxious Ars will become. Ars arrives at the king's chamber, but the guards don't let him in and tell them that there is a private meeting, which shocks the man even more. Chris sips his tea as his masterful plan evolves. Another envoy from the Northern Empire will gain influence while Ars won't be able to hear from his own country. The pressure is starting to get to him, and, he, and the thoughts that he is abandoned by his country are starting to seep in. We time skip to six months later and Chris is seen whooping the young knight's ass as he begs for another round. Pike just laughs at his little brother and Nova asks Chris for a word. The time has come. Ours is looking for you. We shift to the meeting between the two and Ours looks like he hasn't slept in weeks and tells Nord that this is a safe space. Chris notices the people waiting behind the curtains and knows that this is an ambush. Ours is getting reckless. The man starts and says for the past six months, he has been here, and the Empire must want you to gain all of my power, right? Chris doesn't answer, knowing that Ars will convince himself on the truth that he ultimately believes. The man rattles on that this is like their master, to punish me for my mistakes. It's been so long, and he still doesn't have control of the Eight Gates. Ars thinks that Nord was sent here to join forces with him, to seize the capital, right? But before he can continue, Chris tells Ars that the Empire is waiting for him. This is from Lord Angzing. He said to judge the situation, the Empire is aware of your hard work. Ars starts to smile. No way his Empire forgot about him. He agrees and will return. Chris smiles and nods, but asks for one more favor. Can you hand me the captive in that room? Ars agrees and he doesn't need that bastard anymore, and hands Chris the key. Chris enters the room and the person immediately notices that Chris is a specialist with herbs. Are you here to release me? Chris is and knows this person's real name, Pin Srey. Chris introduces himself and this girl is a half-elf, who will become the most respected pharmacist of her time, and the teacher of Chris in his past life, who taught him herbalism. A few days pass and Ars returned to the Northern Empire and he arrived at the gate. The soldiers don't recognize him and Ars starts to get mad, but Lord Angzing looks over from the walls, asking why he is here. The confusion starts to settle in as Angzing reveals the truth. There is no new envoy, and now... Both of them know that they have been fooled. We shift back to Chris and the king who laugh over their small victory. Chris asks where the blue dragon knights are, but Sorte tells him that they were dispatched a little while ago. Chris is shocked to hear that they were sent. But what shocks Chris is when he hears that they were sent to deal with an orc group in the east, and he starts to get worried. He asks for more information. Sorte says that a great number of orcs are charging from the east, but Nova is leading the men in order to defend. Chris asks when they left, and it was about three days ago. Chris starts to get stressed, asking if at any point in the last three days did Sorte lose contact with Nova. This confuses the king, which makes him ask Chris why it matters. But now that he thinks about it, they haven't replied to any messages just yet. This news causes Chris to fall into a deep despair. Chris needs to calm down. There should be another full year before the orc's main force arrives. But he needs to get involved to make sure that nothing has changed from his previous life. Sorte asks if something's wrong, but Chris needs to be careful about what he says. Too much information could confuse the king. Chris tells him that it's nothing, but he's interested in the orcs and asks to go himself. Sorte tells Chris that he can do whatever he wants, but before Chris can leave, he turns to tell the king not to forget the agreement with Sir Cardo. Sorte says that he won't, and we shift to Fix eating some cookies that Chris made, and she's loving them. Chris is writing a letter to Proudman, and this might be the last letter he ever sends, if he doesn't make it back. Fix asks Chris why he's so kind. He doesn't even owe her anything, and yet he's feeding her cookies and released her from her bindings. Chris can't tell her the real reason she was released, but just tells Fix that she's pretty cute. 
This girl gets closer and wants to remove Chris's costume. It's almost about time to change it. But Chris doesn't have time to worry about these things. He suits up ready to leave, a shocking fix. She notices the poison that he has and asks who he needs to kill. Chris looks serious and says there's one thing he's preparing to do and prays that it doesn't happen. We shift to Nova and his men outside Edeniano, one of the eastern cities, looking at a huge army of orcs. They've been there for three days and the orcs haven't moved. Nova just hopes that this year the battle will go smoothly and Arthur suggests that they attack first. The intellect of the orcs is low. They won't charge in until they're hungry. Nova asks about the messages he was sending, but still, there is no reply. Something has to be up. It's never taken this long to reply. But shocking the men is siege equipment being rolled out. Nova yells for his men to prepare the ballistas and is shocked on how the orcs manage to get their hands on things like this. We shift to Chris making his way to Nova and calls for Pumpkey. He rides in for a distance and then hops off. He spots some orcs. They are killing the messenger crows. How do they know these advanced tactics? The orc wave started faster than he planned. In the past, Emiliano, the capital, was captured in 10 days. And this was significant because Emiliano is a supply point for all routes throughout the eight major cities of the eight gates. So in other words, the entire country was lost. And now, Chris is a race against time. Chris prepares his weapon and Pumpkey hops out of the bush, biting one of the orcs. Chris comes behind another, smacking him in the face with a cloth. He won't be able to kill them with a dagger. He needs to kill them by aiming at their vital points. Two more orcs appear and Pumpkey charges up a fire shot. Chris dives in and dodges a fist and wraps his cloth around the orc's foot. He takes the opportunity to put Wise into his dagger to finish the monster off. Chris continues riding and thinks that if the orcs are cutting off messengers, then it means Adiliano is still safe and the wise knights of the Blue Dragon Clan are strong warriors. Chris spots more orcs and is shocked to the large army that they've amassed. Dealing with these foes himself will be too much, but why are they heading in the opposite direction of Eden Liano? But then it hits him. If the orcs are heading to the capital right now, they're using the army at the eastern city as bait. Their main force is heading for the capital and that's the reason it fell so quickly in his past life. The blindfolding tactic. This was their goal from the start. Five days pass and a group of orcs are being baited to the smell of meat. One of the orcs says that they'll be punished if they eat it, but his friend will just hide the evidence by eating everything. But this is actually Chris's trap, as you see the meat has been poisoned. The two orcs immediately die after consuming it, and this was all of the poison Chris had, and he's running out of tricks. Also, his eye color will soon revert. Chris needs to hurry up and move the Blue Dragon Knights back to the capital. There's only five days left. We see Nova looking at the orcs and they still aren't moving. What on earth are they planning? The girl next to him noticed the decreased number of orcs, but Arthur spots someone coming to the north gate. It's Nord. They see Chris and know he's been fighting orcs. Nova asks for the situation, but Chris says that thousands of orcs are advancing to the capital right now. This news shocks Nova, and Chris tells the group that these orc bastards are going for an advanced tactic. They're gathering troops here to distract you, with their main target being Emiliano. Nova starts not to believe Chris's words, but Chris yells at the man telling him that this is urgent. If Emiliano falls, the entire country will follow. Arthur puts his sword next to Chris's neck, but Chris calmly explains that the orcs are intercepting the messenger crows. Come on, Nova, you can feel it. We need to do something. Nova asks Alaire to bring his spear. They will put down these orcs first and return to the capital. Chris says that he will join them. The gate opens and Nova's force charges at the orcs, and they retaliate, and the battle commences. Both sides are losing men, and Chris activates his wise powers, telling these orcs to shut the fuck up. He ducks under a swing from one of them and dashes around the hulking monster. The orc tries to slam its fists on Chris, but he dodges again. The orc smashed the ground. What strength? What the hell is this? But Chris has no time to think, as another orc is ready to cut him down from behind. But saving Chris is Nova, using his spear to impale the orc in the face. Nova won't let Chris die here. He then yells for his men to show these monsters the true meaning of fear. Another wave of orcs call for their god, Holon, and start turning red. They've gone berserk. The army retreats and uses their castle defenses to snipe down the orcs. And suddenly, Pike returns, telling Nova that there's grave news. The orcs are headed towards Emiliano. We shift back to the capital, and a rock is hurled at the castle wall, killing the poor soldiers who thought they'd have an easy day. The orc invasion shocks the king. How are they here? Another report says a large army from Sercardo was seen in front of the western city. Sortan thinks that this must be the duke's doing. He orders the Platinum and Black's clans at Wolvesiano to confirm Sercardo's army, and the other clans to protect the capital. He needs to think calmly. No matter which enemy he needs to face, Chris and Sorte will protect their country, no matter what. Chris continues slaughtering the orcs and is getting more XP than usual. 
Maybe this means that the system treats orcs as more high-end opponents. And if that's the case, Chris will need to make an effort to kill as many as he can. Nova and his boys are not relenting and start targeting the siege equipment. The orcs turn to their captain for orders and they begin to retreat. Nova knows that this is not the time for celebration and tells his men that they need to go back to protect the capital. Pike and his men are ordered to stay and defend the gate, and the rest will return. Nova knows that the path back to the capital will be infested with orcs, but Chris knows a shortcut. We shift to the wolves' gate border, and Sorte and his knight move to see the army that are at their gates, and is shocked to see Chris's large force. Did he foresee what is about to happen? Perth wonders if Duke Proudman is here, but obviously he isn't. Sorte wonders who the representative will be as he opens the tent, and he's shocked to see Eric, as this little bastard greets the king of the eight gates. We shift back to four days ago, while Erewhon was explaining the situation to Eric. He begins getting angry, ready to invade the Eight Gates, but Erewhon tells him to calm down, and explains Chris's plan. We shift back to the present and see the fruits of Chris's labor. Perth and Digo exchange glances and make some small talk. They did meet on the battlefield before. Perth wanted to see Chris and beat him this time, but it looks like that won't be happening. Digo flares up his aura and tells the man that he needs to go through him first. We don't see the conversation between the kings and we go back to Chris leading the troops through the forest. The young knight questions why an envoy of the Northern Empire is doing this, and even Nova is listening to his advice. Chris charges in with the 200 cavalrymen, wondering if it'll be enough to buy time. But his experience bar is continuing to rise. What's going on? All he is doing is riding Pumpkin. Arthur turns to see Chris's makeup start to fade. We shift to Emiliano's outer castle gate, and the defenses are being smashed. Rocks continue to be catapulted, destroying the castle walls, making some holes for the orcs to pour through. The men retreat into the inner castle wall, but over the horizon, the men spot Chris and his cavalry charging in. Chris is making his way, but feels his body begin to change with every step. He's overflowing with energy. This must be from the experience that he's gaining, and right now, he might be able to use it. Chris throws his spear to Elaire and rides forward. A huge orc sees the troops coming and throws a huge boulder right at Chris. It hits him dead on, but Chris is unfazed. He takes off his helmet and holds his necklace. This is an artifact sealed by shape-changing magic. Chris starts to channel his aura into it, and suddenly, a spear bursts from its restraints, and Chris uses it to cut the towering ogre in two. This is the legendary spear, Dragon Slayer. The Blue Dragon Knights support Chris, and Arthur knows that Chris is hiding his real identity. But at least he's not an enemy. Chris just smirks at Arthur and the two are surrounded by enemies. They slash down the orcs one by one, but another wave is flooding in. Chris is cutting down orcs left and right, but there are too many. They are losing ground. The blue dragon knights are starting to fatigue. At this rate, they might face some casualties. Arthur is pushed to the ground as an orc is sending the finishing blow, but a familiar figure comes dashing in as Royce uses his new weapon to kill the orc in a flash. Digo's axe comes flying in, triggering a rage in all of the surrounding orcs. Chris's backup has arrived, and they let Chris know that a peace treaty between Sercardo and the Eight Gates has been signed. All allied forces gathered at the gate. Duke Proudman's army joined the battlefield. We see Erwan riding in with Eric and Guillen behind him. Sorte is also charging in with his troops, and the allied force is ready to repel this threat. The orcs are not going down without a fight, as they call to their god, and start smashing into the allied army. Nova yells for his troops to protect their king, and Lind approaches with his elite unit, apologizing for being late. They begin raining down arrows into the orcs, but Nova thinks that normal arrows are useless against these creatures. But Lin's men have been trained vigorously, and their accuracy is second to none, as they pierce through the eye sockets of all the incoming orcs. Digo uses Lin's volley to charge in with Ellis and starts chopping down orcs with ease. Lin continues to fire and Gien and Doki are also showing off their moves, leaving Nova in awe. Is this the famous army of Proudman? These guys are making the orcs look like cannon fodder. Nova uses this sight to boost the morale of his own troops. They won't lose to these Sercardo bastards. Chris is feeling himself and now the tide has been turned. But right as he thinks to continue, he falls to the floor. His vision starts to blur. His wise is at its limit. Lin helps his boy up, but a jacked orc with a huge sword begins to roar, for it's God, a giant orc. Chris thinks that these types didn't appear into the second wave. Why is it here now? Lin tells Chris not to worry. His knights will take care of this. Chris tells Lin to be careful. It might be on par with a wise knight. But Lin just laughs, telling his lord to have more faith in the Knights of Proudman. All of Chris's boys gather around the humongous creature, and Lin calls out to them. Digo, Gien, and Doki will take care of the smaller orcs, and the rest will focus on this raid boss. The three vanguard chop the orcs down with ease, and Lind and Royce dash in with weapons in hand. The giant orc raises its sword, ready to squash these insects, and it slams its weapon down, causing the earth to rupture. Lind uses Duke Rold's artifact and freezes the ankle of the giant orc. Royce follows up, slicing its leg in two. 
The orc lost its balance and begins to fall on its face, and the last thing that it sees is Ellis ramming her artifact into its head, killing it in one blow. Ellis receives praise from all the Sercardo troops, calling her Bellona, a mythological figure, the warrior goddess. These compliments make Ellis blush, so flattering. Ellis raises her artifact and tells the troops to follow Bellona to battle and kill these orcs. The orcs ended up being defeated and the remnants retreated. Chris watches on exhausted, but he did it. He stopped the first wave. Some time passes and both kings along with Chris and the blue dragon knights are sitting at the strategy table. Eric is laughing telling Sorte that now he owes him one city, just like they promised. But Sorte just sighs. That wasn't part of the deal. Nova tries to calm Sorte down, but Eric keeps bugging him. Come on, you have eight cities, just give me one. The two start barking back and forth at each other, ready to fight outside. Sorte can't stand Eric's relaxed attitude, and Eric dares Sorte to square up. Chris tells the two of them to calm down. The orcs are not done their invasion. This army came through Oaken of the Eastern Continent. And now that they made a path, they're going to keep coming. And just like humans, orcs also have their hierarchy. They have three classes, and each level has stronger warriors. The wave they experienced right now was second class warriors, and they can fight up to wise knights. First class warriors were not even involved in the raid. And after seeing the second class warriors fail, the first class might begin their assault. They need to prepare. Some time passes and Chris is back in his tent and Lind walks in, asking him if he's okay. Chris says he is, but knows that his body is reaching his limit. If he doesn't rest, the wise energy will continue to destroy his body. Wise isn't something you can use without consequence. It will have repercussions one day. Chris wants Nova to teach him the wise technique of the Blue Dragon Clan, but Lin thinks that that's impossible. Just because they're allies now doesn't mean that he will give away the clan secrets. Chris laughs. If he won't give them to me, then I'm going to have to steal them. Lin gets worried about what Chris is about to do, but Chris just smiles. He's confident in his plan. Eric asks Chris if he's serious about sending him back, but Chris knows that if Eric stays any longer, he might ruin the peace that he tried so hard to establish. Chris comes up with some witty excuse telling him that the citizens of Sercardo wouldn't be at peace if their king wasn't there. Eric blushes and agrees with Chris, so tells Erewhon that it's time to return. Chris bows and says goodbye to his majesty and actually sets off himself. He turns towards Nova and tells him to come along. Nova uses this opportunity to speak privately with Chris, asking if he can speak freely. He knows that Chris has some great knights that are all able to use the wise ability double and asks Chris if he has reached the fifth stage. Chris tells him that he hasn't yet and the fifth stage is the wall for most wise users. And only two people in the continent have surpassed that wall of being a superhuman, Guillen and Abel. Chris has been training ever since the Civil War, but his wise is stuck at level 48. But his goal right now isn't reaching the fifth stage. Wisers are gifted with a unique power depending on their training method. Chris and his wise knights have the power, Tempest Tower. It's its biggest strength that it can be used to get instant explosive power. But there's a limit to using it continuously. And currently, Chris's physical condition can't sustain this power for a long time. And right now, it's causing him a lot of damage. Chris can't keep pushing himself the way he is. But... On the other hand, the Blue Dragon's clan's wise, Dragon Rose, creates two emblems on the wiser's back, and it specializes in prolonged use of wise as it steadily releases power. And that's the kind of wise technique that Chris needs to learn now. You'll have to get it, no matter what. We shift back to the troop assembly area, and Chris is meeting with two of the officials, asking if everyone has gathered yet. The Platinum Shield clan and the Black Lion clan are not here yet, and they're having a hard time fighting the Orc army. Chris understands and gets the news that a scout was sent to the terrain around Ediniano, and Orcs are headed that way, about 10,000 of them. Chris knows that at this speed, they'll arrive by tonight. One of the commanders tells the group that they should not fight the Orcs at night due to their adapted eyesight. But Chris doesn't agree. He wants to start the battle as soon as possible. And he has a plan. And asks Lin if he brought all the materials that was entrusted to Grop. Lin says that everything is prepared. And Chris quickly turns to Nova, telling him to gather straw and dried grass until the sun sets. Nova is confused but sends his men to work. We shift to nighttime and the orcs sound their horn and begin their charge. Nova stands ready to intercept and tells his men to light the fires. All of a sudden, tens of torches start lighting up in front of the castle wall, illuminating the area. The orcs are stunned momentarily and the soldiers use this opportunity to charge at them. Nova and his men start making quick work of the orcs and even Perth charges in to join the fight. Nova tells his men to hold their positions and not to get pushed back. He flashes back to Chris's instruction as he told them to get as much attention as possible. The orcs are getting enraged as they start targeting the torches. They start to push the eight-gate army back. The men are starting to get slaughtered as the eight gates cannot withstand much longer. 
Nova sees what's going on and tells his men to retreat to the castle gate. We shift back to the original plan as one of the commanders says that fighting the orcs at night is suicide. Darkness is like a living room for the orcs. Chris thinks they need to do something because they won't win the war by only attacking the orcs in the sunlight. But suddenly a rumble is heard in the distance as the orcs turn to see an army compiled of chariots. Chris starts to smile. If they can win in the darkness, then they'll really have an edge on this war. The first chariot rides in, slashing many orcs in its wake. And Chris arrives with the chariot troops. They charge in and start decimating the orcs. The people on the chariots also have an order to throw straw on the corpses of the orcs and light them on fire. This creates a natural wall of fire, separating the orcs from their reinforcements. Chris looks past this wall and tells the orcs to hurry up. Come and get us. The leader of this troop wonders if that was the man who killed the previous army. One of the lackeys tells him that it is, and the leader tells the orcs that it's time to retreat. The troops watch on, and it seems they won this night. Tigo wonders if they should chase down the orcs, but Chris knows that they won't gain anything from that. He thinks to himself that this orc had superior judgment. He saw that he was losing the battlefield and didn't rush in recklessly. And that scares him, because orcs are not supposed to have such a high intelligence. This war definitely won't be easy. We see the orcs returning, and now there's a change of plan. They're only going to be able to win this war after they kill the strategist, Chris, the man with golden eyes and bluish black hair. They need to kill him at all costs. An axe is hurled onto the ground, but Roy dodges. He slices the head off of the orc, and this battle has lasted for four days. The orcs keep coming. Chris and his men are desperately holding the defense. But in these four days, Chris has managed to copy two wise techniques. Nova's dragon wise and another technique that focuses wise into the legs that Perth utilizes well. The battle comes to an end for the day, but it seems the orcs have a plan to tire out the soldiers. The chariots are starting to break down, and Chris is noticing that his side is being hit harder than the others. We see Chris meeting with Nova, and the man brings up the idea to chase the orcs out. Surely they can win in a battle in an open field. Chris thinks that this would be possible, because as it stands, they are not winning this war of attrition. The main problem is, there has to be some sort of plan behind the orcs' attacks. Chris needs to find out what that plan is. He tells Nova not to be hasty, they need to wait for their remaining troops, before making this decision. The next day comes, and like the previous, the orcs charge in again. Chris notices that he himself is being targeted by the orcs. He uses his wise powers to chop tens of orcs in half. Chris's boys see him struggling and move in to help. And then Chris is escorted back to the tent. He curses himself. It's happening again. Most of the orcs are just flocking towards him. Are they aware that Chris is the mastermind? Because right now his wise is reaching its limit. His body won't hold up if he uses any more. The only thing that he can do is imprint the seal of the blue dragon. Chris starts the process and he has read all the books related to wise, but has never heard of someone being able to use more than one wise seal. This might be a gamble. But if it works, Chris's power will skyrocket. Chris starts to have new emblems envelop on his back, but there's no response. Chris gets discouraged that he won't make it work, but maybe it will just take some time. Suddenly, Lind opens the tent and calls for an emergency meeting. The orcs are moving. All the reinforcements have arrived, and we're introduced to the leaders of the Black Lion and Platinum Shield families. The orcs number 50,000, and it's the largest force that they have faced so far. The combined allied force meets them head on. Nova comments on the strange behavior the orcs have been displaying, and they were aiming directly for Chris. Perhaps they see Chris as the leader of this army. Chris says that they should have the same plan. They need to target the orc leader. He should appear once he believes the troops are exhausted. Chris thinks the orc leader will be in a place where he can survey the battlefield. So he wants to organize a special squadron to take his head. The leader of the Black Lions asks if this squad will be able to break through the orc's lines. Chris tells Gien to come in, and he's wearing some pretty badass armor. The men are shocked. Gien is donning a special set of wise knight armor. This can't be worn easily. Yen Ludwig is the strongest wise knight in Proudman. The squad to hunt the orc leader will be compromised of the strongest knights from each army. The soldiers from the eight gates will choose theirs accordingly. We shift to Proudman Castle and we see Agatha prick herself with a needle. She feels anxious but begins to pray to her god to bless Chris and his army. Chris stands in the pouring rain facing the countless number of orc savages. Chris thinks that the leader he is looking for won't be with the army, since before the army was composed of different species like trolls and goblins. Chris knows who the leader should be, and it was someone who caused a lot of damage in his past life, the one-eyed orc, Blacksword. The two armies start sizing each other up, with Chris's force making up the center, the Proudman army on the right, and the Eight Gates army on the left. And we see Gien in his chatted up armor leading the special task force. Chris hasn't mastered the blue dragon technique, but he doesn't have time to think about that. As his troops are called to be ready to engage, the two sides begin to roar and the battle 
commences. Men and orcs alike are dying left and right, and like always, they are targeting Chris. But this time, he has Pumpkin by his side. The dog sets some orcs ablaze, and Chris needs to save his energy, and fight without wise, at least for now. His knights are taking care of the orcs, but Nova and Ellis spot some mysterious black orcs. These are orcs that can use wise. Digo and Lin are holding their own, and Guillen charges in with the black and platinum leaders. Two orcs stand in Guillen's way, but he turns them into mince meat. Doki and Ellis are fighting some of the black orcs, and they are much stronger than the regular ones. Black Sword is overseeing the battle and calls for the real battle to begin. Yen can't spot the orc leader, but all of a sudden, a mysterious fog fills the arena, and Black Sword tells Chris to stop. He's been surrounded. Chris notices that he's been separated from his help. He quickly turns to tell Royce to hold down this position, and he rushes through the smoke to meet Black Sword. But as he's rushing through the smoke, a sword strike almost pierces his head. Ah, boy, you have some good reflexes. Royce tries to reconnect with Chris, but four wise orc warriors stand in his way. Royce is going to be their target for now. Black Sword emerges from the fog. He knew Chris would be here, and now he will die. Royce knows the situation that he is in. He's surrounded by four second-class warriors. He might have to use that technique. We flash back to Chris instructing his men of the arrow tactic. This is what is happening to Royce right now. The stronger warriors group up and annihilate key targets of their enemy. The basic composition is four second-class warriors. The fight begins as the four orcs dash into Royce, and he knows that he is their target. Royce defends each strike. He's being pushed back. He remembers Chris's words. If you find yourself in this situation, use your full strength or run away. We shift back to Chris being face to face with Black Sword, confused on why he's here. Black Sword picks up on the confusion. Why, did you think I was hiding like some coward, you arrogant human? I can also target your back. Black Sword charges up his wise energy and prepares a strike for Chris. Chris blocks, but the blow causes him to cough up blood. Pumpkin tries to defend his master, but is smacked across the field. Chris yells out for his dog, but Black Sword appears behind him, telling Chris that he is weak. Chris barely parries the attack and has already sustained some heavy damage. Black Sword is the best warrior out of the orcs and is at a similar level to Chris. If Chris doesn't use wise, he won't win. We ship back to Royce, barely hanging in there, as he dodges another incoming fist. A spike club swings, sending him back a few feet. He can't see an opening. What can he do? It seems hopeless. Royce realizes that the true objective of these orcs are Chris, and that means he needs to hold them here to not interfere with Chris's battle. Royce's demeanor changes, ready to take on these savages. They charge in again, but Royce is more prepared to parry their strikes. He's interfering with their attack strategy. Louis Ilnovan. He's been wielding the sword since he was a boy. And after his parents died, he swore to be strong, to protect his sister. Maybe it was due to this desperation that drove him to train even through his terminal sickness. But he truly is the gem of the Ilnovan family. He awakened the ability judgment, which gives him the foresight to make the best decision in any situation. He took that latent ability of his family and made it his own. He can block an attack from any direction, in the most efficient way, as we see him take the orcs off balance, which each blow they try to send his way. The orcs are starting to get frustrated and charge in together. Right now, Royce is blooming like a flower, and this is the perfect training ground for him to perfect his special determination. He easily maneuvers out of their attack, and Royce tells these stupid orcs that they are the ones who fell into a trap, and Royce will keep them here until his life runs out. The orcs continue their assault on Royce, but still aren't able to get a clean hit. The anger is starting to build, and we shift back to Chris's fight, as he is using his full strength to take on Black Sword. The orc narrowly dodges Chris's spear, and comments on his nice weapon. Chris can't see an opening in this guy's defense. He has no wasted movement. And Chris still can't use his new wise powers. He needs to settle this now. He unleashes a barrage of stabs at the orc, but it has no effect. The two get into a fierce melee, but Chris slips a dagger right towards the orc's eye. Black Sword raises his hand to defend and Chris uses this opportunity to slash the orc with his artifact. He was aiming for Black Sword's eye, but he missed. Chris needs to exploit the orc's blind spot, but this just makes Black Sword laugh. Do you think those weak tactics will triumph over me? Pathetic. Show me your next move. We turn back to Royce, who's been defending against these orcs for 10 minutes now, and the fatigue is starting to build. Humans aren't as physically gifted as orcs. Royce is starting to fade. The orcs capitalize on this chance, and a swing is coming down on our poor boy. Royce tries to dodge it, but he can't move out of the way, so he parries it instead, and the strike sends shockwaves through the air. But Royce still stands. He's missing part of his shoulder. The orcs praise Royce for his strength, but it wasn't enough. And now, it's all over. Royce falls into the wet ground, apologizing to his lord Chris and to his sister. I pray you don't grieve too much. Two orcs appear right in front of Royce, ready to end his life. But a flash of red intercepts as Guillen appears. Four orcs. An arrow tactic, huh? Guillen tells Royce he did an amazing job holding out this long. 
but now he'll take over. Black Sword is starting to savor the fight with Chris. He loves Chris's expression. His face is full of fear. It's the only face these pathetic humans can make. Chris blocks another attack, but his wise is starting to rip apart his body. He can't hold out any longer. Chris tries to get into position, but Black Sword dashes in again, striking Chris once more. Chris managed to dodge, but sees little hope in winning. He sends another powerful stab, but Black Sword sidesteps it with ease. The orc tells Chris that he's in a hurry, so he's going to wrap this up. He sends Chris flying into the air, as he promises him that the orcs will rule this land. Chris hits the floor hard, battered and beaten. He can't move. His whole life flashes before his eyes. Is this how it ends? Chris starts to fade. He's so tired. He just wants to rest. Black Sword is going to take Chris's spear as a trophy. But Chris manages to get back up, telling the orc that this fight isn't over. Are you sure that this is enough? Black Sword is confused. Are you sure you tried everything? Because I still want to reach higher. Black Sword is amazed that Chris can still use energy and charges back in to rip the boy's head off. Chris pours all of the remaining wise energy he has and uses it on himself, shocking Black Sword. The surge of energy causes Chris to cough up blood as this intense force is ravaging his insides. He's trying to force his new powers to awaken, and all of a sudden, Chris disappears from Black Sword's sight. And now his body feels amazing. It's so light. It was like he was born again. His wise leveled up, and he's gained a new skill, as his aura changed to a bright yellow. His new power awakens. Dragon Rose. Black Sword rushes in at Chris, but in a single strike, Chris breaks both of his swords. Even Chris is baffled by his own speed, wondering if Black Sword is moving in slow motion. He dashes back in, making quick work of this once mighty orc. And now, Black Sword's expression changes, as he fears for his own life. He yells and charges back in at Chris, but Chris twists Black Sword's words back at him, asking why he's dodging all of his attacks. Chris slams down on Black Sword, telling him that he likes his daggers, and he will take them as a trophy. This enrages Black Sword as he calls out to his god and goes berserk. The two combatants' swords meet, and a huge explosion of black and yellow fills the area. The dust settles, and Royce rushes towards his lord, but he is shocked to see Chris a hair away from Black Sword's dagger. But his own spear impaled the mighty orc. Chris said that he will not run, but he never said that he was going to take the hit. The Proudman army erupts in cheers. Chris killed the enemy leader. These screams fill the battlefield, and the orcs lost morale. And after two days of combat, they were eventually defeated. We time skip to a few days later, to Chris chilling with Pumpkey and Pixie, and she prepared some food for the good boy. Lind interrupts, telling Chris that they have a message from Amelia Gates. The king is looking for him. Chris is riding Pumpkey, but all of a sudden, his foot lights up with Tempest energy, and his dragon rose energy starts flaring up as well. These two auras are fighting for control over Chris's body. But after a short delay, Chris's wise comprehension levels up to 50, and he is astonished. Wise powers can grow while stimulating each other? What a discovery. If he can imprint other wises, he'll be the strongest man to ever live. We shift to the meeting between Sorte and Chris, and Sorte thanks Chris for his help. It wouldn't have been done without him, and asks how he can repay this debt. Chris says that he needs something from the royal treasury to prepare for the future. Sorte wonders why Chris needs to prepare since the war is over, but Chris reminds the king that the orc lord still lives, and their fight is not over. The king of the orcs rules not only over his kind, but also over goblins, trolls, ogres, and giants. Defeating him will put an end to this war once and for all. Sorte agrees and Chris bows in thanks, but notices Sorte's distressed look. Sorte says that after this war, he wants Chris to serve him. Chris just smiles and tells the king that he should already know the answer to that question, and Sorte smiles. He's surprised that he actually said that out loud, and he wonders if he wants Chris that badly, or is he just scared of having him as an enemy? Chris is escorted to the treasury, but not long after, he finds what he was looking for. He takes some armor that looks like trash, and the attendant is confused on why he's taking this. It's just junk. We shift to nighttime, and Chris took two things from the treasury. The first is a magic powder that can heal any wound, called Extra Life, and the other is the armor. He throws the armor into a fire and thinks that there are rumors that the descendant of the dwarf who made dragon's flesh resides in the Eight Gates treasury, and this treasure has to be purified by fire to reveal its true nature. Chris dons the now bright armor, Wise Knight Armor, Dragon Lin. The nickname of Stage 5 Wise is called Forgotten Weight, and this allows one to bear the weight of this exclusive armor. The armor finishes transforming to fit Chris's body, and it looks pretty sharp. Pumpkin notices something, and a dagger is thrown at Chris. He manages to dodge, but in the forest he sees a fairy, who greets Chris. Chris asks who this is, but the fairy just laughs and thinks Chris is a funny guy. He's not actually here to fight, but wanted to meet Chris Proudman. You see, someone wants to see you. Have you heard the name Angzing Leonis? 
Chris says that he is quite busy and the fairy starts to get serious, telling Chris that he will regret this decision. Make an answer. Chris stays silent and dashes towards the fairy, sending his spear inches from his face, telling him that this is his answer. The messenger gets to the point and goes to relay the message. Chris is concerned now because Anzing is the leader of the Northern Empire. And what would he possibly want from him now? The next day comes and Ellis is training in the Eden Gate Blue Dragons facility. And Alaire approaches, telling Ellis that he likes strong women and wants to duel. And if he wins, he wants her hand in marriage. But damn bro, how about you take her to lunch first? The fuck's your problem? We see Chris returning to camp and he passes Royce. And he asks about his injury. It's getting better day by day and Royce should be okay. Chris asks where everyone went and we shift back to Ellis' duel. And she wipes the floor with the lair. Ellis mocks the man, but the leader of the Black and Platinum families arrive, asking to spar as well. Ellis gets fired up by the challenge and Doki also wants in. And now the four start fighting all at once. They dash in quicker than the eye can see and their battle begins. Chris arrives and watches on, to this impressive display of wives. Royce comments that the battle looks pretty even. The leader of the Black Lion spots Chris and thinks that this is a perfect opportunity to show him the power of the Eight Gates. He sends Doki flying and Ellis turns to call for him, but the Platinum Leader is right behind her. She dodges the strike and goes to fight Delchen, the master of the Black Lions, with Doki. Chris is impressed that Delchen is holding his own against the two of them. That man is said to rival the Lance King. He sees the Black Lion engraving on his hand, and the Platinum Shield crest on the abdomen. Both sides go in for a deciding strike, but Nova arrives, yelling at them to stop. A war is still looming. What are you guys doing? Dalchen sighs and says that it was just a friendly spar, and she's his sword. He's quite disappointed that he couldn't show the difference in their power. Ellis says that if this was a real battlefield, the outcome would be different. But Dalchen just laughs. Ellis sure has guts after all. We shift to the Edindiano defense meeting. Anova starts the conversation, saying the orc's movements have been shrinking, and their main objective now is finding the orc lord. Chris thinks that they need to find some info on the king, and he can't use his past life anymore since so much has changed. He has to use his own rationale. What is the best way to kill as many humans at one time? Interrupting his thoughts is a soldier bursting into the room, telling the group that a new report details a huge army of orcs on the move, and they've passed through the Red Canyon. Chris analyzes this situation, and the canyon is a passageway to the central continent. It seems the orcs don't want to drag this out. Delchen orders his men to move out and thinks back to Nova's message. The King's Sorte specifically ordered Delchen to retrieve the Orc Lord's head. They cannot let Sir Cardo take all the credit. Chris meets with Pixie thinking about what is going on and notices a box and asks Pixie what's inside. She says it's something from Sir Cardo and Chris unboxes Moonlight and Sunshine, two prized artifacts, and he is happy with their arrival. Pixie is disappointed that there wasn't any food in the box and honestly, I can relate to that. But Chris asks her for a favor. The war is going to be more fierce and he's going to need her help. We shift to the orc's base as a huge ocean of orcs stand in front of their king. The king tells his men to calm down. They can't get too excited. And he asks the, he asks the elder next to him how the preparations are going and is informed that everything is ready. The king calls for all the chieftains to meet and we now see some new characters arrive and they're ready to trample all over these weak humans. Chris brings Doki and Gien and gives them their new artifacts. Gien is gifted the sword Moonlight that got its name from its mysterious shine. And Doki is gifted the Poleaxe Sunshine. Both are special weapons that can harness the power of wise. Lin rushes into the tent telling Chris that the orcs appeared in front of Edeniano. Chris is now worried. What is the orc king after? The Eight Gates or Sir Cardo? Why are they splitting their forces? These plans are getting more and more complex. He doesn't want to fall into a trap. The orc king is not an easy opponent. Chris calls for his men to prepare because they're leaving to the Red Canyon. Nova left Elaire and some men to join Chris, but Elaire's real objective is to see if the orc lord is where Chris is going so he can inform Delchen. Elaire doesn't like his orders but swears by them. Chris is riding with his men through the forest and he is about half a day away. A new report arrives telling Chris that the orcs are waiting in the Ren Canyon, possibly setting up an ambush. Chris thinks that he can't waste any more time and tells Pixie that it's time for her to go to work. They will start once they reach the forest. We shift to some orcs waiting in the forest and ambush, bored out of their minds, but all of a sudden, a green fog fills the area. It's a poisonous herb called green light. And this is what Chris and Pixie have been working on, to thin out the orcs. Now they won't have to waste time on these petty ambushes. Chris plans to utilize Pixie's talents from here on out. She was once the best poisoner in the northern continent. Chris continues riding and the orc army is right in front of him. He tells his troops to prepare for battle. The two sides engage and Chris and his men make quick work of this orc army. Gen and Doki test out their new weapons and they are in awe of their strength. The battle wraps up pretty easily and Chris is taken aback. This army is smaller than he anticipated. But all of a sudden, a beat-up eight-gate horseman appears from the rear, telling Chris that they have a problem. 
The orcs are breaking down the walls of Ediano. We ship to the battlefield and see some black orcs wreaking havoc on the poor soldiers. Nova is holding the line, but he's being pushed back. A goblin tries to stab him, but Delchen intercepts. They sent the envoy to Chris and are praying for backup. But in the distance, a murderous dark aura fills the battlefield, even shocking both of the Grand Knights. They can't move due to this intense killing instinct. This must be the Orc King. The King asks one question, who is your leader? Chris is now worried that he's been had by this distraction. The Orcs were never planning on attacking Sir Cardo. This was a plot to divide Chris's forces. And if mutant monsters are attacking Ediano, then the Orc Lord has to be there. Chris tells his men that there's an emergency, and they need to return back now. Everyone begins riding back, and Alaire is now worried for his comrades. Chris tells them to relax and have some faith in his family. Chris thinks that they can return fast. But right as they exit the valley, a huge ogre blocks their path. An elite force springs an ambush. Chris's forces are being decimated, and one of the orcs points at Chris. But Digo rushes in ready to take care of this bastard. Chris orders for Lind, Digo, Ellis, and Royce to take care of these enemies, and the rest of his troops to follow him. Chris sees the damage his army is sustaining and vows that this time he will end this war. We shift back to Nova and Delchen facing the orc lord, confused on his question. The orc lord says that this war is meaningless, and he rules over every continent, and will make every leader of every race bow before him, and take full control over their species. This war has shown me that humans are quite resourceful, therefore I'll show you guys some generosity. Only the leader has to die, and the rest will be taken as my slaves. Dalchan gets enraged and tells Nova that now there's a chance. Chris is not here. They will take this head together. The two dash in to either side of the Orc King, but the attacks don't phase him. Nova activates his wise, but the Orc King sends him flying with one strike. Delchun takes his chance to send a slash right at the king, but he blocks it with ease. Delchun is shocked by this monster's skill, but Delchun thinks that if him and Nova work together, then they can win. The Orc King laughs. Do you pathetic humans think you can kill me? The ground around the king erupts with his energy, taking both men off guard. The Orc King dashes into Nova, sending his weapon flying into the air. Nova is now helpless as the king bids him farewell, sending him flying into a nearby wall. The man coughs up blood, and the king asks if Nova thinks he's lucky to be alive. There is no luck. You only survived because I controlled my energy. You are merely a demonstration of my power. The monster turns towards Delchan and knows that this is the stronger knight. So maybe you're the leader. So I'm going to start with you. Then I'll make my way through all of the human leaders. Chris's knights are now fighting the orc ambush. But these are no weak foes. Second class at least. And the three-headed orc is a chieftain who is giving them some trouble. The monster blocks one of Lin's arrows, and another orc tries to strike Lin from behind. Royce intercepts and cuts his arm off, but to his horror, the orc regenerates a new arm right in his face. Digo is taken aback. This orc has insane regeneration. They need to finish him in a single blow. This battle won't be easy. We shift back to Delchen's fight as the orc king rushes back in, wanting to take care of the leader of the Black Lions. The barrage leaves Delchon speechless at this orc's power, but he has no time to think. As the king leaps in again, the blow cracks the ground, but Delchon dodges. He won't last long at this rate. He needs to make a decisive blow. The orc king slashes his huge axe, but Delchen uses his chance to dash behind the king. But the orc just laughs and uses the same move back on Delchen, asking if this is what you call a surprise attack. Delchon manages to block the strike, but the sheer force sends shockwaves through his body. A follow-up punch sends Delchon flying towards a nearby rock, leaving a trail where his body was sent. The king thinks that this is the limit of the human body, and the difference between their species. Humans were never destined to win. The weak will always be ruled by the strong, and because of destiny, I will kill you. Farewell. But interrupting the party is a blue spear that flies right past the king's face. He turns to see Doki save Eight Gate Soldier, and Chris and the reinforcements came just in time. Chris stands looking at the Orc King in his new badass armor, looking like a freaking boss. I love it. The Orc King recognizes his blue hair, and wonders if this is the one who annihilated his first army. Chris smiles, thanking the Orc King for recognizing him. Delchan yells for Chris to be careful. This Orc is on a different level. Chris tells Pumpkin to stay back, as these two titans stand ready to face off against each other. Chris assures the king that he won't break that easily, and he's going to make him regret ever invading this kingdom. The fight commences, and the king thinks that Chris isn't stronger than Delchan, and what he needs to be cautious of is that spear. The two exchange blows, but Delchan comes out of nowhere, trying to land a blow on the king. He tells Chris to be wary of the orc's fist. It can break almost any weapon. Chris analyzes the situation and knows that the orc king is very fast. It's going to be hard to find an opening. Chris tells Delchan to look for any opportunity to strike. He will keep the orc busy. Chris dashes in again, and the two let off strikes at each other that send shockwaves into the air. The orc has a higher overall wise level than Chris, so he's not going to win with sheer power. 
He uses a jumping technique to take the orc off guard, and Delchan uses his chance to cut at the orc king. But he doesn't get deep enough, even after using his full strength. The orc king gets annoyed at these pesky flies, and swats them away. Chris notices that the king changed his target to Delchan, and he has his weapon ready to end him. Chris puts all of the Ys into his legs and intercepts the strike, but he fell for the king's trap, as he is punched hard into the stomach, and is sent flying. He gets back up, but is damaged from that strike. The orc tells these humans that their fatal flaw is that they always help the weak, but he is impressed that Chris could withstand that punch. But... This changes nothing. The orc charges in to finish Chris, but Pumpkin dives in and takes the slash meant for Chris. In a desperate attempt, it lets off a flame attack that sends the king back. Chris goes to Pumpkin's aid, but the cut is deep. The orc king isn't amused by this display, and if that wolf didn't grow up with humans, it would have been the leader of a pack. If only it wasn't infected by your weakness, Chris. Chris gets up with his aura oozing, and he tells Delchon to watch Pumpkey. The orc asks Chris if he plans to fight him without a weapon, but Chris tells the orc to shut that mouth. The orc is shocked, and Chris's energy starts to rise. He gains a new skill. He dashes in with a speed that is faster than the orc king, and his power continues to rise as two more skills are unlocked. His blue and yellow aura are starting to combine, and even Delchon is in awe of Chris's sheer strength. He is now at a stage where he can manipulate Wise onto any part of his body at will, and Chris has reached the sixth stage of Wise as we see his proficiency raised to 60. The Orc King's demeanor changes, as now this fight is becoming more troublesome. Chris got a sudden power up, and now the King thinks that his Wise might be weaker by comparison. He starts to flare up his own aura, thinking that he will never be outdone by a mere human. Both combatants grab their weapons and lunge back in at each other. Their swords meet, and Chris mocks the Orc King. What happened to your calmness? Did you let a little human punch blow you away? The Orc King continues to become enraged, and his own power is starting to grow. The two disengage briefly and continue the fight. The battle is at a stalemate, with neither side getting an advantage. Chris gathers energy into his fist and punches the Orc King in the stomach, which makes him spit up some fluids. Chris asks him how he liked that one, huh? You think all humans are weak? The Orc King can't believe that he's being pushed back. He doesn't want to stay trapped because of these humans. And we flash back to when the Orc King was younger. And he asks his master why they are trapped in the outskirts of the continent. The old Orc tells the boy that the humans are scared of their existence and do not want them roaming around their territories. Their species also rules over land and form groups together. It would be wise not to underestimate them. This started the Orc's King's vendetta against the humans, and he promised to kill them all for trapping him and his people in the barren wasteland. He will conquer the world. Back to the present, the Orc King is enraged, yelling for Chris to die. No living being has ever survived against me, and that's how I conquered everything. Chris is blocking the barrage of attacks as the Orc tells him that there is no human that he can't crush. Chris tells him to shut up. He wants to protect his people and everything that he risked his life to build. He will never back down, no matter what kind of monster shows up. We shift back to the ambush in the canyon, and Chris's knights are being pushed back. But as long as each and every one of them have something to protect, they will never give up. The orc and Chris get ready to give a final exchange, both screaming at the top of their lungs. Their powers meet and create a huge vortex, but Chris's slash removes one of the orc king's arms. And now, the mighty monster is left speechless. I, the supreme being, lost to a mere human? Chris wastes no time and removes the head of the orc king. Delchan is amazed. Chris actually did it. He beat that monster, despite being a human, the hero of the battlefield, Chris Proudman. With this, the war with the orcs ended, and the death of the orc lord made all the remaining forces retreat. Mankind also suffered many casualties. Thankfully, our boys didn't die in the canyon ambush, as they dealt with the orcs there. But in the end, humanity was protected. Chris ended up using his special healing powder on Pumpkey, and honestly, very worth it. This show can't go on without our good boy. Pixie is amazed by watching this miracle medicine work, but Chris tells Pumpkey from now on he can't join him in battle, and promises to protect him. Two weeks pass and they meet with Chris once again. He asks again if Chris would join the Eight Gates, but Chris tells him that Sorte would entrust him if he betrayed his own nation. Sorte agrees but thinks to himself that he must absolutely never make an enemy of Chris. He wants to reward Chris with something, but Chris says he already has what he wanted. Sorte smiles and says that he already prepared a gift, and he will see it once he gets back to Sir Cardo. We see Chris with Pixie on his way back looking for Pumpkey, and he appears in the distance, looking at Chris. Pixie thinks that the wolf might want to stay for a while, as he feels he is holding Chris back. Chris has a sad expression, but understands, and tells Pumpkey that he will see him again. The orc elder is surprised that the orc king failed. His skin starts to melt away as the disguise is shown, and it's the same fairy that encountered Chris, and he knows now that his real target 
is Chris Proudman. Man, why why they get why Pumpkin gotta leave, man? man? It's my favorite character. I don't know. How, is Pumpkin gonna train? Is he gonna get stronger, man? I don't know. We'll, we'll have to see what happens. But that makes me really sad. Thank you for joining us on Manhua Assassin today. If you enjoyed our Manhua manga recaps and want to stay updated on all the latest releases, don't forget to hit that subscribe button and ring the notification bell. Your support means the world to us. Grappe is seen slithering around and enters Lin's office and asks how his day's going. Lin is tired of having to do Chris's work and is getting quite busy, but today is the day, the coronation. After the orc wave ended, Proudman was a land that operated with the scale of a national budget and became comparable to the nation capital Daybreak. Chris also brokered peace between Sir Cardo and the Eight Gates and was looked at as the mediator between the two sides. The country signed a 10-year peace agreement. After the war, we shift to the capital and Chris is walking up to Eric, all dripped out, almost like he's the king. Eric says that Chris is the hero that saved the continent and helped this country secure peace, and as such he needs to be rewarded. Starting today, his dukedom will be recognized as a country ruled by a prince, and now Chris has been promoted to Prince of Proudman. We shift to a few months later and Grappe is freaking out over some blue spots on his body. Pixie tells him to relax, they just use too many blue herbs. It seems Pixie is experimenting on Grappe despite his concerns. He begs Chris for some help for his suffering, but Chris did promise Pixie a test subject, so suck it up Grappe. Digo comes into the room telling Chris that the info he asked for is here, and the two leave despite Grappe's cries for help. We see Chris and Digo getting ready to leave and Chris gives a message to the rest of his knights, telling them to train hard at the places he secured for them. Alice comes running out asking for a spar with Chris, but Chris just ignores this request and tells her to go to Guienne and learn some real swordsmanship. Alice is hesitant to go, but Chris tells her that this is an order from the prince. Now go. Chris heads off and says bye to his boys for now. As they're walking, Digo says that Chris's armor is quite heavy, and that's the reason they're going on foot, because no horse can withstand the weight. Chris tells Digo that they're headed to Voltus, the city with the greatest craftsman for forging iron. There's a blacksmith that Chris needs to meet, and only this craftsman can fix Chris's armor. Chris asks Digo if he can run, and the two start sprinting. And after a while, Chris informs Digo that they have another two days until they get there. But Chris can never go on a peaceful walk as an arrow is fired at him. Chris catches the arrows and spots some young kids that fired it, who are in awe of Chris's strength. They try to run, but Digo comes flying in, and one of the kids bravely tries to face Digo, to give his friends enough time to escape. His skills aren't that good, and he whiffs one slash and gets knocked out. The rest of the kids try to run, but Chris makes a line in the ground with his sword, and tells the kids that if they pass this line, they won't be spared. The kid Digo knocked out is already almost back on his feet, and this actually surprises Digo. Chris can see that this boy is the leader and rounds the kids up. He starts to laugh. Child robbers, huh? Chris is impressed that they try to take him on. The kid's face turns serious. Huge bodies aren't impenetrable to knives. Chris likes his attitude and gives the boy a chance. His head or the head of your friends. Choose who dies. The leader confidently says that he will sacrifice himself all day. And this makes Chris like him even more. Chris asks for the kid's name. And the kid's name is Vans, with no last name. Chris remembers this name and knows that this man will grow up to become a mercenary leader who took advantage of the state of the world after the orc waves. Chris won't take Vans' head, but instead offers him a job. Vans has no idea who this is, but is shocked to hear that this is Chris Proudman, the hero of the war. The kid starts listing the achievements of Chris, and this kind of strokes the guy's ego, but one rumor strikes the wrong nerve. Some people are saying Chris is a eunuch and has no dick, since he's so young and is still single, despite his status of prince. Chris knows that only one person would be responsible for spreading this rumor, Lind, as you see him laughing in the distance. Chris tells Van to get up and make a decision. Will you serve under me? Vance thanks Chris for the offer, but he won't serve under someone else. This is the stigma of a gladiator slave. Chris finally understands what these kids are and they're runaway slaves. Chris assumes that they are from a nearby city, and this is correct. This nearby city is a lawless state that borders Circardo and Tigus, which is controlled by nobles and the Thieves Guild. In this area, the slave trade is permitted, and also a huge part of the economy is the Gladiator Arena. Chris asks Van how he ended up being a bandit, and he was forced into this life since no one would take him in. And due to him being a runaway slave, Chris understands and asks the boy what he wants to do. I'm sure you have some plans. Are you going to rob people for the rest of your life? 
and get captured again? Or do you want a better life? Vance doesn't want to continue down this path and Chris smiles. He hands him an artifact but it's way too heavy but at least he can sort of lift it off the ground. Which is impressive because Vance is similar to Digo in bone structure and muscle density. Chris says that now these kids are actually robbers who stole the prince's spear. We shift to the stateless city and the boys bring a spear to a member of the thieves guild who is impressed with his haul. But interrupting the meeting is Chris and Digo kicking the door down because handles are for losers. The thieves guild commander calls for his men but obviously they're quickly dealt with as one man is sent flying into a wall. The man recognizes Chris and asks why he is doing this. Chris smiles and it seems he knows this place. The man quickly apologizes and said that he didn't know that it was Chris's spear. Chris says that if he's really sorry then shut down the gladiator arena and hand over the kids. Or I could use this as an excuse to blow up your whole city. The man has no choice and follows Chris's orders. We see Chris setting up the kids in a carriage that's headed for Proudman. He gives them a letter saying that if they show this to the guards they're going to be taken care of. Van sticks around and wants to know why Chris is doing this. Chris tells Vans to think about his position. He wants to give opportunity to anyone who has value. Just because you came up as slaves doesn't mean you will die as such. Vance is in awe of Chris and swears to serve him until the day he dies. Before they keep going, Van is tasked with lifting the box of armor. Digo is confused on why they are trying this, but Chris tells him to hold on for a second. After some seconds of struggle, Vance actually manages to lift the box, but only slightly. He falls back down in exhaustion, and Chris is right about his suspicion. He orders Digo to train Vance every day from now on. Vance has the potential to be a wise knight. Two days pass and Chris and Digo arrive at their destination, the city of Valtus. They go to a local inn and get some food and Digo tells Vance to watch his manners. Chris asks a bartender if there's a guy called Half Man, but is told that he's probably out on the sea. This man has been going around telling people that he is going to be a sailor. Chris has met this man in his past life and knows that he has no interest in the ocean and hopefully his personality didn't change. We shift back to the stateless city as a man is talking to a commander from Tegas, explaining the situation. It seems Chris did them pretty dirty and the two wonder if they should follow him. But by now, the bad guys are starting to understand that fighting Chris means certain death. But suddenly, an attendant appears with a letter from the Lord. And it seems that he's not happy with what happened here and is ordered to report back to Glacier Hill. Now, Chris has pissed off some powerful people. We shift to some new characters talking about the northern continent finally making a move and their new target is Proudman. A few days pass and Chris and Digo are strolling around the docks and they notice that someone has been following them since last night. Digo offers to eliminate this pest, but Chris tells him to leave it for now. It's best to let their enemies think that they are unaware of their actions. Chris approaches some workers and asks if the ship with the dwarf on it has returned yet, and Chris is quickly pointed in the right direction. He overhears the dwarf that he's looking for being scolded by the ship captain. He tries to apologize, but it seems the captain is at his wit's end. The dwarf not only tore the sails and almost killed everyone, he also drank all the booze. Get lost. The dwarf tries to beg but is given the boot and quickly after he gives up and curses his own luck. Chris approaches calling the dwarf by his name, Rhindorf, which takes him off guard. Chris cuts to the chase and asks if the little guy is a blacksmith and there's some work that he needs him to do. Rhind looks away and tells Chris to go look for someone else. Chris is a little shocked. The Rhindorf he remembered wasn't like this shy? The Rhindorf he remembered wasn't this shy. Chris asks the young dwarf to show him around the city. It is his first time after all. Rhindorf is confused but doesn't really have anything else to do. And just to sweeten the deal, Chris offers some more booze to the young dwarf, which makes him quickly accept this offer. Quickly accept this offer. We shift to the two sitting in the local tavern as we hear Rhindorf share his side of the story on why he was kicked off of the ship. Chris asks the dwarf, didn't you want to become a sailor to run away to the sea? These words change the air around Rhindorf as the dwarf becomes serious, asking how Chris knows him. Chris thinks back to his previous life and of course he knows him. Rhindorf once saved Chris's life, but it didn't happen this time. Chris makes a belay saying that he once helped the dwarf and instead of receiving payment, the dwarf just said to pass the favor down to the next one that he meets and buy them a drink. Something so strong your nose will turn upside down. Rhindorf is taken aback by the gift that Chris has prepared. It's Tegas' finest liquor, Griffin's Breath. Rhindorf is happy and wonders if he is even worthy to drink something like this. Chris tells him to have at it and once Rhindorf has a couple sips, he gets to the point, asking Chris for his name and is surprised to find out that he is talking to the hero of the war, 
Chris Proudman, and is even more shocked to find out that he is here only for him. Chris tells Ryan Dwarf his plan bluntly. He wants to fight the residents of the glacier. The young dwarf is taken aback by these words, and asks if the box behind Chris is dragon's flesh. And after Chris confirms this, Ryan Dwarf invites him back to his place. We shift to Chris following the dwarf into the mayor of Baltus's residence. He shifts some supplies to reveal a secret passage. The group begins going down the long stairway, and Chris is shocked to see an underground forge. The reason this forge was hidden was to avoid the fairies. This race was always jealous of the dwarf's skill, and as soon as the dwarf Dwarves stopped being useful to them, their race was nearly wiped out, and a few surviving dwarves went into hiding underground. Reindorf started drinking to soothe his mind over the tragic loss of his brothers and sisters. The desire of his people to return to the surface looks impossible to fulfill. Chris turns around looking serious, and it seems the folklore was true after all. We shift back to Chris's past life and he talks to Lind. Lind says that the state of the continent is a result of an elite group. The orc wave, the annihilation of the orcs, and all other wars were all fabricated and have a deeper motive behind them. This group was trying to reshape the world, and everyone is playing into their hands. Chris doesn't believe those words, but Lin doesn't feel the need to make Chris believe him. He goes to tell Chris a secret, but we don't see what he says. We shift back to the present as Lin is staring face to face with an elf, asking why she has come. The elf is surprised that Lin isn't flustered. Lin Sonat, you're calmer than I expected. You have the last name of the Northern Empire, the descendant of the clan exiled from the Northern Empire for not having green eyes. But I have an offer for you, Lind. Lind is not interested and tells this bitch to kick rocks, and the elf tries to convince him. If this conversation goes well, it might be possible for Lind to return if he accepts. Lin asks what the penalty will be if he declines, and the elf starts listing all the names of all of his friends in the Proudman estate. You can't protect them alone, Lind. Lin turns around in anger as the elf asks him to give up information about his comrades. We shift back to Chris telling Reindorf to come with him to Proudman. The elves won't be able to harm you there. You don't have to hide anymore, and in exchange Chris will help him achieve the dream that the dwarves could not. Reindorf asks for a few days to think about it, and Chris agrees. In the meantime, Chris leaves his armor here, and Reindorf is amazed, and gives Chris an estimate of about two weeks that he will need to fix it. But it's doable. Chris is shocked by the talent of this dwarf and leaves it to him. Before he leaves, he hands Reindorf his spear as well and asks to borrow a sword. We shift to the next day and Chris is personally training Vans in the power of Wise. He lets him continue to train and goes out of the town. Digo doesn't see the person following them and Chris is now worried. What was their purpose? Are they not after me? Digo is a little overwhelmed by the sprawling city but Chris tells him that this is the famous market hub. Baltus sells goods all over the continent. Chris starts to think about another person that should be in Baltus around this time. And obviously he has to spend zero time looking for this person because he spots him right away and this is like the fifth time it happened in the story. But I mean, I wouldn't want him to look over and waste time too so I guess it's okay. He leans over to a seller's mat and asks what this item is used for. This malnourished man tells Chris that this is an amulet that protects the body from magic and it works only for one day. Chris wonders how to activate it but apparently it activates once it touches the skin. The seller immediately gets surprised because Chris knew the spell needed to be activated and asks who the hell Chris is. Chris just laughs and says that he knows a little bit about magic and the boy calms down. It's the same as before. This was Chris's cooking teacher and as always he is way too trusting. We are introduced to Vitalia. Digo interrupts Chris telling him that the spy is back on their tail with backup. Chris starts off with Digo telling Vitalia that he will pay later, and the two sprint into an open field. The spies start to panic and wonder how they've been found out. Chris gives them no time to think and dashes in at the elves, asking what these people are doing all the way down here. Chris begins fighting one of the elves and immediately overpowers him. The elf tries to use a spell, Restraint, but Chris uses the amulet that he just got to nullify this effect. Digo slices one of the elves in two and the leader tries to run away. Chris is in pursuit, but as he chases, he is stopped by the third spy. Digo continues to chase as well, but the elf uses a spell to block Digo's path and manages to slip away. Chris analyzes the situation. Was he calling backup? The elves are already on the move, and if it wasn't for Vitalia's amulet, Chris would have been helpless. He tells Digo that they need to move up the schedule. The situation has changed. We shift to Lin chained up in a basement, and he already gave the elves the information they wanted. But why is he still being held hostage? The elf says that she needs to confirm this info first before letting him off the hook. Lin tells the elf to promise not to harm the citizens of Proudman, and this elf is introduced as Gudrun. She orders the assassins to go to Proudman and take care of the key targets. Doki is in the south and is too far for now, and Alice is in Guyen, and that would be too much trouble to deal with at this moment. There's only one target they can go after right now, Louis Yolnovin. We shift to Louis struggling to find the place that Chris tried to send him. Louis continues to look, but is pretty lost. 
We shift back to Chris telling the knight that his sword is actually part of a pair. Someone intentionally split this sword into two halves and hid them away. That's why it has a weird shape. And once the two halves are reunited, the weapon will gain a mysterious power. Lewis is now interested, asking Chris where the other half is. And Chris tells him that it should be along the northern border of the central continent. But Lewis has been searching for days, and apparently, when he's close, the other half will just call to him. But nothing's happened yet. Lewis notices that there are some uninvited guests stalking him, and all of a sudden, Lewis's blade starts to vibrate, leading him in a certain direction. The man ends up in a mountain with a weird dungeon entrance, and there's some weird writing on the wall as well. The sword is urging him to enter. Before Lewis can step inside, a huge rock golem emerges. Lewis apologizes for waking this thing up, but it doesn't really care about his words, and slams its fist into the ground. Lewis evades, but the elves start their attack from behind. Lewis curses them for being so cowardly. The elves tell Lewis that his sister is dead, and this enrages the man, as he kills an elf in a single slash. The elf is shocked. They were told that if they said these words and showed a sample of Agatha's hair, Lewis would become enraged. But the hair that was shown is the wrong color. Now, don't you ever say my sister's name again, trash. Don't think you will return alive. Before Lewis can deal with the last elf, the golem slams the ground hard, shattering the earth, causing the mountain to start a landslide. There's no time to evade, and the only option that Lewis has is to venture inside of the dungeon. Lewis dives inside, but sees the entrance covered with rubble. We shift back to Valtis as Vitalia is waiting patiently for his payment, wondering if he's being scammed again. But is surprised to see Chris walking back up to him. As an apology, Chris wants to treat this merchant to some food and pay for the amulet. Chris sits with his cooking teacher and gives him a special dish, asking if this suits his taste. Vitalia is quite happy with this assortment of food, and it has a sharp spice that melds well with the meat. This is the most delicious thing that he's ever eaten. And ironically, this was the dish that was taught to Chris by Vitalia in his last life. Chris asks for the man's name, and is surprised to see Vitalia give a fake name, Nauri. Chris brings up the western continent, a place full of mages. I once heard that wizards from this place hardly ever communicate with people outside of their world, due to their closed door policy. But sometimes, runaways occur. And these wizards who run must be brought back, sometimes by bounty hunters. Chris has heard that one of these mages is hiding here in Valtis. Vitalia immediately folds under the pressure, asking if Chris is after him. But Chris just laughs saying that Vitalia just gave himself up just now way too easily. Chris tells him to calm down. He is on his side. And actually, Chris battled an elf today and used this amulet. Chris introduces himself and asks Vitalia to join him. Vitalia knows about Chris's identity, but swore to stay away from magic. Chris knows that because this man ran away to pursue his dreams of becoming a chef. Chris says that it's a shame. Vitalia would experience some delicious food in Proudman. Thousands of spices are imported from each country. A place with endless gourmet feasts. Chris pretends to walk away, apologizing to Vitalia, but now he's too invested not to come. He grabs at Chris's leg, promising to serve him with all of his heart. We see Doki traveling with his brother as they are about to cross into another tribe's territory. His brother says that it's okay to enter now. Krape has been up to some diplomacy in the region, and has secured relationships with the tribe. All of a sudden, five armed men appear in front of Doki. The man introduces himself as Haiga the Tongueless Tiger, and he isn't here to fight, but to escort Doki to his king. After a short walk, Doki enters the tent to meet Bratang, the Roaring Elephant, king of the current federation. The king asks Doki what brought him to the south, and Doki answers. He is here to enter the Hawk's Den. Bratang grabs his axe and tells Doki that right now the tribes are not united, and the Northern Empire promised them peace, and if they refuse, they will be attacked. The elves want your head, Hawk. Bratang tells Doki to calm down though. He's gonna honor his agreement with Grappe, but he can't refuse the request from the elves, so he has a suggestion. Stay here for two months. Doki understands and agrees, and the two bump axes, which is the most viking shit I have ever seen. They shift to the elves meeting, and they assume that Doki is dead, but for some reason the elephant tribe won't hand over the body. The lead elf knows that she can't trust the southerners, and also she can't come in contact with the assassins that she sent after Lewis. They should have been reported back already. Shortly, a knight approaches the captain, telling them that the assassins that went to Proudman have returned, and it seems they were met by Rachel and the Hundred Daggers, and quickly dealt with. Only one was allowed to return. The elf Elf returns to Lin, asking when he planned this, and Lin begins to laugh, asking if this elf really thought that something like this could ruin everything that Chris built. Lin never planned to give up anyone, but I guess the jig is up. Right, Taikil? Taikil. Who are you talking about? And right out of the ceiling comes our favorite teacher, dashing through, 
bashing through the walls. The elf leader is now in disarray. How did you find this place? We shift back to Lin telling Grappe about his travel. He notices the strange way that Lin is talking. He is doing this due to the elves honed hearing. Before Lin left, he winked and says he entrusts his work to Taikyo. And this was the secret message, for Taikyo to trail Lind. Back to the present, Lind is released as more elves barge into the room. Lind unsheathes his artifact, ready to show these northerners their punishment. Both sides flare up their wise and a brawl ensues. Lind connects with the leader as Taikyo takes the two underlings. But as the captain is getting focused on Lind, Taikyo hits her with a chop to the back of the neck, preventing her from using wise. Taikyo interrupted her flow, and now the situation is looking dire for the northerners, as they are sent hurling out of the building. They call for a retreat and watch on. Lind grits his teeth. The war has started, and there's nothing more for them to do. The Captain Elf returns to Aang Zing, apologizing for her mistakes. Aang Zing tells her not to worry, as he thinks that Chris is more powerful than he once thought, and he can and he can even neutralize magic. Another report tells the leader that Chris is on the move, headed towards Wixus. These words intrigue Aang Zing. That's right, Wixus. He hired a mage and used talisman to counteract magic. If Chris manages to connect with the mages, this will be trouble. Aang Zing summons Gaedrin and tells her to take the Shadow Crass, the Northern Empire's magical assassination unit and to hunt down Chris right away before he can reach Wixus. We see Chris traveling with his new companion and we shift back to their original conversation as Vitalia tells Chris that he is being hunted for leaving Wixus and if he is caught he will never be able to use magic again. Vitalia asks Chris to please sneak him in to meet with his master for permission but the issue is is that Vitalia is returning as a fugitive and it might not be all sunshines and rainbows but it's okay like always our boy Chris has a plan and of course of course, we don't know what this plan is. Back to the present, Chris is running but thinking about his strategy. It's gonna be close. We shift to Gaedrin taking the assassination unit to find Chris. They need to end him now. If he gets the Wixus, it'll be too late. We shift to Ellis and Guillen having a friendly spar and of course Guillen is showing her who's boss. Ellis begs for another round but Elowan arrives with a letter for Guillen. He reads it and immediately tells Ellis to return to Proudman. Guillen has his own mission. He tells Elowan to gather the Knights of Ludwig. We shift back to Aang Zing, who has Guillen and his knights approaching their border, and they're setting up lodging. We see some Northern Empire scouts approach the group asking why they are here. Guillen walks up to them asking what the problem is. This is still Sir Cardinal territory. The scouts try to talk shit, but Guillen fires up his aura, scaring the shit out of them, and tells them that the next time they appear in front of him like this, they're gonna die. Thinks on this on this peculiar situation and assigns some guards to keep watch. Back to Gaedron and the assassins, they're in hot pursuit as one of the knights activates a special wise ability, which allows him to see Chris's position. Chris feels the presence, and now he is surrounded by the group of assassins. They plunge onto Chris, but Digo offers to hold them back. Chris tells his party to keep running. The assassins start sprinting at full speed, but right before they can catch up, they smack a barrier. A cloak man approaches, asking if these elves forgot about the unbreakable vow between Vixus and Glacier Hill. The elves can't think of a good excuse and continue their chase, which makes the mage erupt in anger. A barrage of spells are hurled back and forth with combination of elements, as two more mages stand by ready to fight. The elf tells these people that an intruder just entered Wixus, and they need to capture them now. If they handle this together, the elves will leave. The head mage calls for Nauri, and she confirms the intruders. The man asks if they can be brought alive, but it's not looking good right now because Chris is holding Vitalia hostage. The man understands and tells the elves that what they want is impossible. The elves start to get defensive, but the mages give no explanation and continue casting spells, repelling the assassination squad. If you cross this line again, it'll be war. Gaedron. Gaedron orders the troops to retreat. Vitalia yells at Chris, calling him a fraud, but Chris whispers for him to be quiet. This is all a part of the plan. Chris starts to negotiate with the mages, asking for payment for this captured mage. He doesn't trust that he will be paid. The mages agree and release, a and release the fog surrounding Chris, telling him to follow close. The group walks and Vitalia greets Nauri. The man tells him to shut it. You're not the friend I once knew. Until the council passes judgment, you are nothing more than a fugitive. The group arrives at Wix's square and a barrage of lights appear. Chris gets defensive, but the group of mages tells him to stand down. Ectalia, the master of Wixus, appears. He sees the weird group of bounty hunters compromised of two wise knights and a boy, and Vitalia looks too well fed to be a hostage. It seems he was treated well. Chris is surprised that his plan has already been seen through and stops this little charade. Chris introduces himself as Chris Proudman and gets to the point. The King of the North is trying to take over the continent. Ectalia is shocked and asks Chris for proof. Nari informs the master of what just happened at the border, and they've been in pursuit for some time. Chris tells Ectalia that if his country falls, Wixus will be next. Chris asks the mage, Vitalia, to accompany him to the north and deal with the situation. Ectalia asks if this is true, and his old friend Nari thinks something is off. 
There's no way Vitalia has been noble. There's no way Vitalia has a noble cause like this. He's always been skeptic about wizard wizards. We shift to the memory between the two as we see Vitalia stealing some bread, looking to skip class. Nauri tries to question what's going on, but the master sees Vitalia with the bread. He shoves a loaf into Nauri's mouth and continues to run, now making Nauri an accomplice. We see the two make it to a cliffside as Nauri tries to urge Vitalia to take his studies more seriously. Vitalia, however, doesn't want to be kept in Wixus. He wants to see the world. Nauri tells the boy that their destiny is here in their hometown, his wizards. But Vitalia is not interested in having his story written for him. Back to the present, Vitalia coughs up the real reason he is here with Chris. But there's another reason why he decided to join Chris in the end. A talisman that he created saved someone's life. And once something like that happened, a fire lit inside of the young mage. And not even he can explain it. Now he wants to accept his destiny as a wizard and use the power that he's been given to protect the world. Chris is shocked by hearing these words and Ectalia grants Vitalia permission to leave and fulfill his duties. The leader of the mages knows that the north can shake up the continent at any moment. So Vitalia will be in, will be in charge of reconnaissance. There are some regulations in the western continent, so Vitalia will only be able to use Meister's magic, which is the magic to create special tools. Chris smiles and agrees, because this is what he wanted from him anyways. Hectalia places his hand on his student and says that the spell is done. Vitalia thanks him once again before leaving, and Nari smirks at his childhood friend, telling him not to embarrass the world of wizards. Hectalia starts a teleportation spell, and Vitalia waves goodbye to Nauri and the rest of his comrades. In a flash, the group is transported miles away, and now Vitalia has a surge of determination. We shift to Chris returning to the city to meet the dwarf and his armor is looking brand new. Even his dragon slayer is in perfect condition. Chris asks what Reindorf plans to do and he stutters briefly. Chris continues that he will make sure that in his state there will be a place that the dwarves can gather and hide away from the eyes of the elves. Chris swears it upon his name. Reindorf thinks on it for a moment but decides to put his trust into Chris, shaking his hand in agreement. A carriage arrives to take the group back to Proudman but Chris still has work to do so he's gonna stay for now. He hands a letter to Digo telling him to take this to Grappe. Vitalia bids farewell to Chris and the group is on their way. Chris watches and his demeanor changes. It's time for him to get going too. The failed assassins return to Angzing in defeat, and his anger is becoming hard to hide. He's given Proudman a reason to wage war, and because of this, the western continent that once wasn't an issue will likely back Chris. Angzing wouldn't be surprised if someone came for his head at this very moment. He's even being watched by the border. He orders his men to gather all of the supplies gathered at this location and return to base, and be on standby. A few days pass and Chris meets up with Fox and he's looking for a certain person, and Fox is leading the way. Chris thinks that Angzing should be aware that Wixus is cooperating with Proudman, and he must be starting to prepare some precautions. Chris needs to find a weapon to help counteract this, and he needs this girl's help. Chris approaches a girl chilling on a rock that laughs at the boy's young age. Are you really the hero of the battlefield? This is another one of Chris's previous mentors and partner and one of his partners from a previous life, the treasure hunter, Jennifer Rosar. We shift back to Proudman and Digo is talking with Grappe and it seems Pixie is still experimenting on him, but nothing seems to be working. Grappe changes the conversation and asks about the two new arrivals behind Digo. Digo explains that Chris let them join their union and hands him the letter Chris wrote. Grappe takes a glance and knows that he has a lot of work to do now. Tykeel is overseeing the training of the Proudman army, while Digo trains his new student. Vitalia and the dwarf are hard at work constructing their creations, and Ellis is guarding the gate. She spots Royce and Digo returning, and one year has passed. Grappe is starting not to be a hunchback, and it seems the brace is actually working. A crow enters the room with a letter from Chris, and it seems that he has returned. All of Chris's knights bow before him, and Chris immediately looks at Lind, wanting to get payback for the prank that he played earlier. But out of the corner of his eye, Punky comes charging in, and oh my god, he's back. Let's fucking go. Chris is overjoyed seeing his longtime friend, and begins walking around with Grappe, asking him for updates regarding the elite soldiers, and the weapons that he was building. Everything is almost complete, and Gia is also finishing up his watch at the northern border. Chris asks if there have been any incidents, but there only been a couple of small skirmishes, mostly handled by the hundred daggers, and Amelia has been weeding out spies trying to enter the territory. Chris is pleased and hands Grappe a bag full of maps. It's all of the terrain surrounding the northern empire. Chris wants Grappe to, to put together a military map. Some time passes and Chris meets with Agatha and tells her he needs to leave again. But the Riz Master isn't done yet, and tells her that when he returns this time, he's gonna take her on a little trip. Agatha gets flustered and can't possibly accept this from her lord, but Chris tells her to think about it, and to give her answer once he returns. Chris suits up in his Chad armor and begins the military gathering. He stands atop his podium and calls out to his men. Together, we have crafted the most beautiful, 
peaceful, and magnificent nation, and we will continue to build upon this grace, so our descendants can prosper in this land. However, there is a group that threatens that very prosperity, and they've been attacking for over a year. These elves try to eliminate our knights and infiltrate our lands. Chris pulls out a document and presents it to the crowd. This is a list of all the crimes the Northern Empire committed while Chris was watching over for a year. Threats, bribery, assassinations, countless clans and countries have been oppressed by these people. The dark clouds are threatening to overtake not only our kingdom, but the entire continent. Rise, my warriors. It's time to put an end to this tyranny. I, Chris Proudman, declare war with Glacier Hill and the Northern Empire. At the Northern Empire border, the elves see some dust gathering in the distance and are in awe to see Chris leading his army to their very gates. Lind orders his archer units to take aim and they start firing, unleashing a volley of deadly fire onto the Northern soldiers. Chris orders his men to charge and Aang Zing gets the news that they are under attack. It seems the war has finally reached its pinnacle. Chris Proudman. Digo, in his new badass armor, starts mowing down soldiers and even breaches the castle wall. Soldiers begin rushing in and Digo uses a strange magic device in his hand to relay information. Gien, Ellis, and Doki all use the same device to signal their breaches in the wall as well. Gudrun tries to defend but her comrade tries to tell her that all is lost, they need to retreat. Gudrun is baffled. Proudman is strategically striking their weak points, almost like they know their movements. The hell is going on? Chris delays his orders to keep advancing, and with Vitalia's stone attached to everyone's gauntlets, this is going to allow some long distance communication. Chris smiles, and the battle is in his hands. Godrun orders his troops to retreat, and Chris's men are being held back. He orders for the heavy armor unit to advance into the archer fire. They begin scaling the hill, and the northern archers try to defend, but, but retreat quickly after. This day ends in a complete victory for Proudman. Most of the enemies are half breeds, and now the remaining force is made up of elf soldiers. The northern continent is called the Glacier. Hill it is a plateau made of four distinct terrains. The front is a forest that acts as a gateway, and Chris needs to make it through this forest with little casualties. Chris orders the logging unit forward to secure a safe area. Nighttime comes and elves are trying to set an ambush, but Lin stands by with his bow in hand, sniping the elves with his wise powers. Godrun orders his troops to fall back, and two days pass. The enemy has yet to make a move on Chris's men. Royce questions what they should do. Elves have the advantage at night due to their heightened senses, and Chris knows this. What are they thinking? Two men are watching, but two mutated creatures emerge from the brush, killing the lookouts. A signal alerts Chris to Lin's squad. A large group of goblins is attacking. Goblins? Chris is shocked. It's just too many goblins should be just a group. But then Chris remembers that there was an army of goblins occupying the mountains near Proudman, but they suddenly disappeared. This is where they were the entire time. Chris begins to sweat. Something's off. These aren't normal goblins. They aren't afraid of death and don't feel pain. They're like soulless corpses. They're brainwashed, as we see elves using magic to control them. Chris and his knights are chopping down the creatures left and right, but there is no end in sight. Lin tries to see a way to end this, but looks deep into the trees, to see Godrun controlling the goblins with her eyes. Lin relays this information and asks for Ellis's unit to support, and they go for the elves. Godrun is informed of this attack, and Ellis and Lin team up to try and kill her. Ellis asks if he is seeing anybody, and maybe after the war, they can go on a date. Lind is absolutely stunned, telling Ellis that this is not a good time for jokes. Ellis tells Lind that she isn't joking, and, and Lind isn't, isn't too shabby, and is pretty fit to be her husband. Lind gets flustered, but the battle takes back his focus. He tells Ellis that they'll talk about it after this. The enemy tries to retreat, and Lind calls for his bow. His wise has a limit, and although he's not as strong as everyone else, Lind has developed his very own secret weapon. Steel arrows that the dwarf help him helped him craft. Lind is putting all of his power into this shot. Hurricane Arrow. The shot is sent at incredible speed, and it strikes Gudrun, taking half of her body with it. Gadrun watches her sister be taken apart by the arrow, and now Ellis catches up. Gadrun tells the troops to run away as she engages Ellis, but her weapon is quickly launched into the air, as the difference between the two shows. Before Ellis can make the finishing blow, Gadrun throws a smoke bomb. But from the smoke, Lind appears with Roll's artifact, telling the girl he won't miss this time, and slices her head clean off. Lin reports back about the death of the enemy commanders. Two more days pass and the goblins were dealt with, but Proudman has suffered considerable damage, and all they have to show for it is two commander elves. The main force hasn't even been sent out yet. Chris tells his men to prepare. The battle isn't over. Aang Zing asks one of his men if the reinforcements are coming. A messenger came today and it seems they will arrive on time. Tells Haling to get ready. There is a mission. Aang Zing tells his oldest daughter Padron to prepare, because now is the time for her to avenge her sisters. Chris scales the forest and sees the massive field of snow, the White Lands. The elf army stands across with weaponized mantises, and Chris finally sees the main force, and the battle 
commences. Tigo is ripping the elves to shreds, but both sides are sustaining damage. Doki slashes his axes down into a mantis, and the battle is becoming intense. One of the commanders is sure that this will be a victory, but out of the corner of his eyes is the general of Tigus, ripping apart the Proudman army. Abel smiles, and finally it's his time to kill Chris Proudman. Man, these guys can't fight fair, but I, I guess it's even if you think about it because Chris does have a lot of information he's not supposed to know, so I guess it's even, we can say. We shift back to the elves' negotiation with Tegas as they are promised the central continent. Back to the present, and his men are ripping through the front lines. But as Abel tries to kill the commander, Delchan appears, and it seems our boy Chris has some reinforcements of his own, as the eight gates are here to back him up. The Spear King and the King of Swords stare at each other ready to see who is superior. Chris is continuing mowing down troops as the news is relayed to him. Chris orders the Ludwig Knights to engage. He needs to win the war here and now, while Tegas is busy. And for some reason, Angsing and his mage troops are, are nowhere in sight. But all of a sudden, a spell is cast, as bugs are warping around the Proudman soldiers. Chris tries to help these soldiers, killing the elves surrounding them, but Chris doesn't see any bugs. And now he knows that this must be some sort of hallucination magic. Chris sees the unit of mages and orders for their destruction. But a huge force begins weighing down on our heroes. The mages can stimulate the five senses in humans, causing extreme pain. Even wisers can't escape this spell. With this magic, I am a god. Now bow before me. We shift to Lind and his unit, and Chris left the responsibility of killing Ed to him. But even after searching relentlessly, Lin still can't find him. But all of a sudden, Lin's horse is chopped in half, as Padron looks at him. It's you, Lind Sonat the murderer of my sisters. Don't think he'll return alive. We see Chris still struggling to stand as the soldiers try and kill him in this state, but Digo comes flying in seemingly unaffected by the spell. But each step he takes is giving him unfathomable pain. He continues forward anyways as more mage troops try to engage, but Digo splits them apart with one strike. Digo continues to step forward despite the hallucination wave. We shift back to Digo asking Chris for some advice. He doesn't know how to train his new apprentice, telling Digo that he is the knight with the strength of a hundred people. What are you so worried about? Digo sighs and tells Chris to stop playing around. Other knights develop characteristics that relate to their personalities, but all Digo knows is his strength, and I feel like I'm remaining stagnant. Chris tells Digo not to feel that way. Strength is your talent. Use it to your advantage. Back to the present, Digo's face looks devilish and walks to this elf unit, making Howling tremble in fear. Chris lets Digo know that he is his sworn knight, and no matter what, always push forward. The spell is increased to its maximum levels, but Digo continues to endure. Howling calls for Digo to stop, but Digo grits his teeth to the point blood surges from his mouth. He raises his halberd into the air, gathering lightning at its tip, slamming it down and slicing Howling in half and decimating the mage force behind him. Chris washes on, simply amazed at the knight with the strength of a hundred people. Digo yells in triumph after slaughtering the mage unit. We shift back to Lin as he squares off against Padron. Lin's demeanor changes, because he knows this won't be an easy fight. One of his archers tries to fire at Padron, but a quick movement from the elf kills all of Lin's surrounding soldiers, in front of his very eyes. Lin tells his men to retreat as he stands alone to duel this elf juggernaut. Padron rushes in and the blades meet. The elf tells Lin that his death won't be graceful, and he will die in the most painful way. Padron sends an upward swing that separates the two, but rushes back in, letting a flurry of attacks that Lind barely blocks. Each blow is heavy, and Lind can't take much more of this. A slice connects with Lind that hits Vitalia's stone, and now he can't call for backup. Lind calms down and tries to come up with a plan. He can't win with sheer strength. Should I try and run away? No, that's impossible. Padron is too fast. Lin knows that there's nothing that he can do, as Padron rushes back in and asks if this human has given up already. Lin takes the strike to his body, but starts to smile. If I have to struggle, and even if I die today, all I need is one hit, one small scar for my comrades who will come. Lin charges up his artifact, but Padron sees through this attack and slices Lin vertically, calling him pathetic. You were the one who killed my sister? You're so weak. Lin lays on the floor lifeless as Padron lifts her sword to finish the job. But in the blink of an eye, Elish dashes in at the very last second, stopping the blow. She sits next to Lin, telling him to hang in there. Padron tells Ellis that her only chance to live is to leave that night, but Ellis stands up with her veins bulging, saying that this is her husband. We shift to Tigus and Delchen, but it seems Delchen put up a decent fight, but he's overmatched. Tigus gives him a compliment and says he'll spare his life, since this was such a good fight. Delchen doesn't need this pity, and Abel laughs. Well, I tried to save you. I'll at least remember your name, Sword King. Before Abel can finish off Delchen, Gien appears with his red aura. Abel sees this arrival and knows that Gien is also on the sixth level. Abel laughs. The Duke made a mistake sending his strongest knight here, and calls for his griffin unit to attack. 
soldiers flying strange beasts begin to attack the Proudman army. Nova looks up and sees these mutated griffin and pegasus. The knights of the sky are tasked with bringing Chris's head. Guillen tries to react, but Abel comes rushing in. Guillen barely blocks the strike, and Abel tells him not to get distracted. Your focus is on me. Back to Ellis and her fight with Padron, they're exchanging blows, and both of them are feeling the effects of the battle. Ellis tries to stab at the elf, but it misses. Lind begins to stand up again despite his grave injuries. He looks over at Ellis as the rescue squad moves to pick him up. Padron sees this happening and doesn't want to let Lind escape, but Ellis blocks Padron's path. The two continue their duel, but Ellis is continuing to get faster with each swing. He flashes back to Ellis and her father, and Ellis feels like she's hitting a brick wall. She's sparring again, but isn't making any progress. Takil asks his daughter why she wants to be strong. Ellis responds saying that she just wants to defeat the enemy, that's why. But this makes Taikil laugh. If that's it, then you still have a lot of room to become stronger. And back to the present, Ellis finally understands what her father meant. And now, she's not swinging her sword just to kill the enemy, but for Lind. She continues her barrage and gets into her stance. Eight wings appear from her back and she uses her ability, the Sword of Speed. She dashes past Padron, ripping her apart, taking one arm clean off. Ellis knows now that she is fighting to protect the people precious to her from, as her sword glares from her eyes. Chris rushes to Digo, asking if he's okay, as Royce holds him up. But to Chris's surprise, the Sky Knights start their assault on Chris, killing his men. Chris is shocked by seeing Tegas' troops, and Chris watches his men die horrible deaths by fire. He grits his teeth and, and tells Vans to collect all of the spears from the ground. The Sky Knights are starting to get cocky, but a blue aura fills the sky, as Chris starts sniping them one by one. Chris is throwing spears using his wise energy. Energy. The Sky Knight spot Chris and attack as one, but Pumpkey wasn't slacking off either as a huge fire breath separates the two groups. Chris stands in a stance gathering his wise energy, and the Sky Knight captain is in awe of Chris's aura. We flash back again to Chris with his treasure hunter mentor, looking down the ominous cave. Chris overhears his mentor telling him of the horrible creatures that live down here. But to Chris, this is the perfect place to train. He tells Jennifer that if he doesn't return in three months, consider me dead, and leaps into the pit despite his mentor's warning. Chris lands at the bottom as the horde of creatures start to surround him. In complete darkness, Chris welcomes the challenge. He was starving as well, and he wasn't playing around in this last year. Chris Chris's energy overflows onto the spear, and he surpassed his limits yet again, a level that only appears in stories. Level 7 wise. Sight. Chris lets off his move, Thunder Spear, clearing the Sky Knights and the clouds around them. Some Sky Knights survive as Chris begins to mock them and continues his assault. The enemy troops start to lose morale and Digo and Royce join in on the fight. The Sky Knights are starting to get pushed back. Bar Vans uses his wise to slice fire that is approaching Chris. Chris compliments the young knight as he charges another spear. One of the Sky Knights charges up his aura, ready to kill Chris, and charges at him. But Pumpkey blocks his path. Chris yells for Pumpkey to get out of the way, but the wolf's mark lights up, and its body turns bright yellow. And with one claw attack, Pumpkey eviscerates the wise knight. Chris is amazed. Pumpkey's whole body turned golden. And this must be his awakening, and I'm fucking hyped. Pumpkey just went super saiyan. Let's fucking go. The knight tries to fly away with one arm missing, but Pumpkey he blocks his path with his fire breath. Chris stands there mocking the knight, who dared to join the wrong side. Chris tells this man to atone for his sins, even in hell. He unleashes his thunder spear and disintegrates the Sky Knight. Olgadin has fallen, and the Sky Knight's morale is shattered, and they begin their retreat. Chris's wise levels to 78, but the battle isn't over. Him and his knights continue to slash down the enemy, but everyone is getting tired. We see Digo about to collapse and Chris knows that they need to finish this now. A wizard unit appears in front of Chris out of nowhere, and Chris knows that Angzing might be with him. An owl spots Chris and says the target has been found, and the trap is sprung. And Chris is teleported to a different location, surrounded by mages. Angzing tells Chris that finally they meet. And alright guys, that is the end up to chapter 135, and at the time of this recording, that is the last chapter that I have available to read. Uh, they took a little bit of a break in February so I think they're starting up again um, they're gonna release a chapter probably the week after I release this but um, I don't think this whole war arc is gonna end for probably another like 10 or 15 chapters so unfortunately we're gonna have to wait for them to to pump it out but as soon as it's all wrapped up I'm definitely gonna make a recap on it and uh, I thought I'd leave a little bit of my own personal thoughts on the story so far uh, I'm definitely loving it um, I do think uh, the writing is getting a little sloppy in the whole grand scheme of things it is moving very fast I felt like towards the beginning, Chris's growth was very slow and steady, and you kind of were there at every stage, and now a lot of weird shit's happening. I mean, it's cool, don't get me wrong, but the story definitely isn't perfect, but regardless of that, I still love it. Chris is an awesome main character. All the 
protagonists in the story are all awesome. The villains are awesome. But um, I'm just excited to see what we got in store. I mean, Abel is fighting Gien, which is probably one of the coolest fights we're going to get to watch. It might be up there with uh, Rold and Chris's fight. We'll see. Chris, I don't know how he's going to get out of this trap. I mean, we're going to have to find that out. Um, and yeah, I hope Lin's not dead. I can't forget about him. Like, if anyone was going to die, I was like praying it's not Lin. I need to see him with Ellis, man. Like, there's no love in this story, man. Chris is just about to get with Agatha and Lin's about to get a wife, man. That's some fan service right there. But uh, yeah, I hope you guys are liking the story. Let me know what you think in the comments below. And uh, in the coming weeks when the next chapters come out, uh, I'll continue the story. Thank you so much for keeping up with me. I'm going to release a, a multiple hour video of this entire story. And if you got all the way to the end, thank you. Please like and subscribe and I'll see you next time.